Hello, my name is Dan Bonnet, and I'd like to welcome you to my course on cryptography that I'll be teaching at Stanford University this quarter. This quarter I'm experimenting with recording the lectures and having the students watch the lectures online. In fact, anyone is welcome to watch the lectures and join the course. This is an experiment, so we'll see how it goes. My goals for this course are basically to teach you how cryptographic primitives work. But more importantly, I'd like to teach you how to use cryptographic primitives correctly and reason about the security of your constructions. We will see various abstractions of cryptographic primitives and we'll do some security proofs. My goal is that by the end of the course, you'll be able to reason about the security of cryptographic constructions and be able to break ones that are not secure. Now, I'd like to say a few words on how I would like you to take the class. Uh, first of all, I'm a big believer in taking notes as you listen to the lectures, so I would really encourage you to summarize and take notes in your own words of the material that's being presented. Also, I should mention that on the videos, I'm able to go much faster than I would go in a normal classroom, and so I would encourage you to periodically pause the video and think about the material that's being covered and not move forward until the material is clear in your mind. Also, from time to time, the video will pause and pop-up questions will come up. These are intended to kind of help you along with the material, and I would really encourage you to answer those questions by yourselves rather than skip them. Usually, the questions are about the material that has just been covered, and so it shouldn't be too difficult to answer the questions. So I would really encourage you to do them rather than skip them. Now, by now, I'm sure everybody taking the class knows that cryptography is used everywhere computers are. It's a very common tool that's used to protect data. For example, uh, web traffic is protected using a protocol called HTTPS. Wireless traffic, for example, Wi-Fi traffic is protected using the uh, WPA2 protocol that's part of 802.11i. Cell phone traffic is protected using an encryption mechanism in GSM. Bluetooth traffic is protected using cryptography, and so on. We're going to see how these various systems work. In fact, we're going to cover SSL and, in fact, even 802.11i in quite a bit of detail and you'll see how these systems work in practice. Cryptography is also used for protecting files that are stored on disk by encrypting them, so that if the disk is stolen, the files are not compromised. Uh, it's also used for content protection. For example, when you buy DVDs and Blu-ray discs, the movies on these discs are encrypted. In particular, DVD uses a system called CSS, the Content Scrambling System, CSS, and Blu-ray uses a system called AACS, uh, we'll talk about how CSS and AACS work. It turns out that CSS is a fairly easy system to break, and we'll talk about how we'll do some cryptanalysis and actually show how to break the encryption that's used in CSS. Cryptography is also used for user authentication and many, many, many of the other applications that we'll talk about in the next segment. Now, I want to go back to secure communication and talk about the case where here we have a laptop trying to communicate with a web server. This is a good time to also introduce our friends, Alice and Bob, who are going to be with us throughout the quarter. Uh, essentially, Alice is trying to communicate securely with Bob. Here, Alice is on the laptop and Bob is on the server. Uh, the protocol that's used to do that is called HTTPS, but in fact, the actual protocol is called uh, SSL, uh, sometimes it's called TLS. And the goals of these protocols is basically to make sure that this data travels across the network, an attacker, first of all, can't eavesdrop on this data, and second of all, an attacker can't modify the data while it's in the network. So no eavesdropping and no tampering. Now, as I said, the protocol that's used to secure web traffic, called TLS, actually consists of two parts. The first part is called this handshake protocol, where Alice and Bob uh, talk with one another, and at the end of the handshake, basically a shared secret key appears between the two of them. So both Alice and Bob know this uh, secret key, but an attacker looking at the conversation has no idea what the key K is. Now, the way you establish this secret key, the way you do the handshake, is using public key cryptography techniques, which we're going to talk about in the second part of the course. Now, once Alice and Bob have the shared key, we can use this key to communicate securely by properly encrypting data between them. And in fact, this is going to be the first part of the course, which is essentially once the two sides have a shared secret key, how do they use that secret key to encrypt and protect data that goes back and forth between them? Now, as I said, another application of cryptography is to protect files on disk. So here you have a file that happens to be encrypted, so that even if the disk is stolen, an attacker can't actually read the contents in the file. And if an attacker tries to modify the data on disk, the data in the file while it's on disk, when Alice tries to decrypt this file, that will be detected, and she'll then basically ignore the contents of the file. So we have both confidentiality and integrity for files stored on disk.
Now, I want to make a minor philosophical point that in fact, storing encrypted files on disk is very much the same as protecting communication between Alice and Bob. In particular, when you store files on disk, it's basically Alice who stores a file today wants to read the file tomorrow. So rather than communicating between two parties, Alice and Bob, in the case of a stored disk encryption, it's Alice today who's communicating with Alice tomorrow. But really the two scenarios, secure communications and secure files, are kind of philosophically the same. Now the building block for securing traffic is what's called symmetric encryption systems. And we're going to talk in the first half of the course extensively about symmetric encryption systems. So in a symmetric encryption system, basically the two parties, Alice and Bob, share a secret key K, which the attacker does not know. Only they know the secret key K. Now they're going to use a cipher which consists of these two algorithms, E and D. E is called an encryption algorithm, and D is called a decryption algorithm. The encryption algorithm takes the message and the key as input, and produces a corresponding ciphertext. And the decryption algorithm does the opposite. It takes the ciphertext as input along with the key and produces the corresponding message. Now, a very important point that I'd like to stress, I'm only going to say this once now and never again, but it is an extremely important point. And that is that the algorithms E and D, the actual encryption algorithms, are publicly known. The adversary knows exactly how they work. The only thing that's kept secret is the secret key K. Other than that, everything else is completely public. And it's really important to realize that uh, you should only use algorithms that are public because those algorithms have been peer reviewed by a very large community of hundreds of people for many, many, many years. And these algorithms only begin to be used once this community has shown that they cannot be broken, essentially. So in fact, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I have a proprietary cipher uh, that uh, you might want to use, the answer usually should be that you, know, you stick to standards, to standard algorithms, and uh, not use a proprietary cipher. In fact, there are many examples of proprietary ciphers that as soon as they were reverse engineered, they were easily broken by simple analysis. Now, even in the simple case of symmetric encryption, which we're going to discuss in the first half of the course, there are actually two cases that we're going to discuss in turn. The first is when every key is only used to encrypt a single message. We call these one-time keys. Okay, so for example, when you encrypt email messages, it's very common that every single email is encrypted using a different symmetric key. Yeah, different symmetric cipher key. Because the key is used to only encrypt one message, there are actually fairly efficient and simple ways of encrypting messages using these one-time keys, and we'll discuss those actually in the next module. Now, there are many cases, in fact, where keys need to be used to encrypt multiple messages. We call these many-time keys. For example, when you encrypt files in a file system, the same key is used to encrypt many, many different files. And it turns out if the key is now going to be used to encrypt multiple messages, we need a little bit of more machinery to make sure that the encryption system is secure. So in fact, after we talk about one-time keys, we'll move over and talk about encryption modes that are specifically designed for many-time keys. And we'll see that there are a couple more steps that need to be taken to ensure security in those cases. Okay, the last point I want to make is that there are a couple of important things to remember about cryptography. First of all, cryptography, of course, is a fantastic tool for protecting information in computer systems. However, it's also very important that cryptography has its limitations. First of all, cryptography is really not the solution to all security problems. For example, if you have software bugs, then very often cryptography is not going to be able to help you. Similarly, if you're worried about social engineering attacks, where the attacker tries to fool the user into uh, taking actions that are going to hurt the user, then cryptography is very often actually not going to help you. So it's very important that although it's a fabulous tool, it's not the solution to all security problems. Now another very important point is that cryptography essentially becomes useless if it's implemented incorrectly. So for example, there are a number of systems that work perfectly fine, and we'll see examples of those systems that in fact allow Alice and Bob to communicate, and in fact messages that Alice sent to Bob, Bob can receive and decrypt. However, because cryptography is implemented incorrectly, the systems are completely insecure. And actually, I should say that I like to mention an old encryption standard called WEP, WEP, that's used for encrypting Wi-Fi traffic. WEP contains many mistakes in it, and often when I want to show you how not to do things in cryptography, I will point to how things were done in WEP as an example. So for me, it's very fortunate to have an example protocol I can point to for how not to do things.
And finally, a very important point that I'd like you to remember is that cryptography is not something you should try to invent and design yourself. As I said, there are standards in cryptography, standard cryptographic primitives, which we're going to discuss at length during this course. And primarily, you're supposed to use these standard cryptographic primitives and not invent things, these primitives yourself. They have, the standards have all gone through uh, many years of review by hundreds of people, and that's not something that's going to happen to an ad hoc design. And as I said, over the years, there are many examples of ad hoc designs that were immediately broken as soon as they were analyzed. Before we start with the technical material, I want to give you a quick overview of what cryptography is about and the different areas of cryptography. So the core of cryptography, of course, is secure communication that essentially consists of two parts. The first is secure key establishment, and then how do we communicate securely once we have a shared key? We already said that secure key establishment essentially amounts to Alice and Bob sending messages to one another, such that at the end of this protocol, there's a shared key that they both agree on, shared key K, and beyond that, beyond just a shared key, in fact, Alice would know that she's talking to Bob, and Bob would know that he's talking to Alice. But a poor attacker who listens in on this conversation has no idea what the shared key is. Uh, and we'll see how to do that later on in the course. Now, once they have a shared key, they want to exchange messages securely using this key, and we'll talk about encryption schemes that allow them to do that in such a way that an attacker can't figure out what messages are being sent back and forth, and furthermore, an attacker cannot even tamper with this traffic without being detected. In other words, these encryption schemes provide both confidentiality and integrity. But cryptography does much, much, much more than just these two things, and I want to give you a few examples of that. So the first example I want to give you is what's called a digital signature. So a digital signature basically is the analog of a signature in the physical world. In the physical world, remember when you sign a document, essentially you write your signature on that document. And your signature is always the same. You always write the same signature on all documents that you want to sign. In the digital world, this can't possibly work because if the attacker just obtained one signed document for me, he can cut and paste my signature onto some other document that I might not have wanted to sign. And so it's simply not possible in a digital world that my signature is the same for all documents that I want to sign. So we're going to talk about how to construct digital signatures in the second half of the course. It's really quite an interesting primitive, and we'll see exactly how to do it. Just to give you a hint, the way digital signatures work is basically by making the digital signature be a function of the content being signed. So an attacker who tries to copy my signature from one document to another is not going to succeed because the signature on the new document is not going to be the proper function of the data in the new document. And as a result, the signature won't verify. And as I said, we're going to see exactly how to construct digital signatures later on, and then we'll prove that those constructions are secure. Another application of cryptography that I wanted to mention is anonymous communication. So here imagine user Alice wants to talk to some chat server Bob. And perhaps she wants to talk about a medical condition, and so she wants to do that anonymously so that the chat server doesn't actually know who she is. Well, there's a standard method called a mixnet that allows Alice to communicate over the public internet with Bob through a sequence of proxies such that at the end of the communication, Bob has no idea who it just talked to. The way mixnets work is basically as Alice sends her messages to Bob through a sequence of proxies, these messages get encrypted and decrypted appropriately so that Bob has no idea who it talked to and the proxies themselves don't even know that Alice is talking to Bob or that actually who's talking to who more generally. One interesting thing about this anonymous communication channel is it's uh, bi-directional. In other words, even though Bob has no idea who it's talking to, he can still respond to Alice, and Alice will get those messages. Once we have anonymous communication, we can build other privacy mechanisms. And I want to give you one example, which is called anonymous digital cash. Remember that in the physical world, if I have a physical dollar, I can walk into a bookstore and buy a book, and the merchant would have no idea who I am. The question is whether we can do the exact same thing in the digital world. In the digital world, basically, Alice might have a digital dollar, a digital dollar coin, and she might want to spend that digital dollar at some online merchants, perhaps some online bookstore. Now, what we'd like to do is make it so that when Alice spends her coin at the bookstore, the bookstore would have no idea who Alice is. So we provide the same anonymity that we get from physical cash. Now the problem is that in the digital world, Alice can take the coin that she had, this $1 coin, and before she spent it, she can actually make copies of it. 
And then all of a sudden, instead of having just one dollar coin, now all of a sudden she has three dollar coins, and they're all the same, of course. And there's nothing preventing her from taking those replicas of the dollar coin and spending it at other merchants. And so the question is, how do we provide anonymous digital cash, but at the same time also prevent Alice from double spending the dollar coin at different merchants? In some sense, there's a paradox here where anonymity is in conflict with security because if we have anonymous cash, there's nothing to prevent Alice from double spending the coin. And because the coin is anonymous, we have no way of telling who committed this fraud. And so the question is, how do we resolve this tension? And it turns out it's completely doable. And we'll talk about anonymous digital cash uh, later on. Just to give you a hint, I'll say that the way we do it is basically by making sure that if Alice spends the coin once, then no one knows who she is. But if she spends the coin more than once, all of a sudden her identity is completely exposed and then she could be subject to all sorts of legal problems. And so that's how anonymous digital cash would work at a high level and we'll see how to implement it later on in the course. Another application of cryptography has to do with more abstract protocols. But before I state the general results, I want to give you two examples. So the first example has to do with election systems. So here's the election problem. Suppose we have two parties party zero and party one, and voters vote for these parties. So for example, this voter could have voted for party zero, this voter voted for party one, and so on. So in this election, party zero got three votes and party two got two votes. So the winner of the election, of course, is party zero, but more generally, the winner of the election is the party who receives the majority of the votes. Now, the voting problem is the following. The voters would somehow like to compute the majority of the votes but do it in such a way such that nothing else is revealed about their individual votes. Okay, so the question is how to do that. And to do so, we're going to introduce an election center who's going to help us compute the majority but keep the votes otherwise uh, secret. And what the parties will do is they will each send a funny encryption of their votes to the election center in such a way that at the end of the election, the election center is able to compute and output the winner of the election. However, other than the winner of the election, nothing else is revealed about the individual votes. The individual votes otherwise remain completely private. Of course, the election center is also going to verify that this voter, for example, is allowed to vote and that the voter has only voted once. But other than that information, the election center and the rest of the world learn nothing else about that voter's vote other than the result of the election. So this is an example of a protocol that involves six parties. In this case, there are five voters and one election center. These parties compute amongst themselves, and at the end of the computation, the result of the election is known, but nothing else is revealed about the individual inputs. Now, a similar problem comes up in the context of private auctions. So in a private auction, every bidder has his own bid that he wants to bid, and now suppose the auction mechanism that's being used is what's called a Vickery auction, where the definition of a Vickery auction is that the winner is the highest bidder, but the amount that the winner pays is actually the second highest bid. So he pays the second uh, highest bid. Okay, so this is a standard auction mechanism called the Vickery auction. And now what we'd like to do is basically enable the participants to compute, to figure out who the highest bidder is and how much he's supposed to pay. But other than that, all other information about the individual bids should remain secret. So for example, the actual amount that the highest bidder bid should remain secret. The only thing that should become public is uh, the second highest bid and the identity of the highest bidder. So again, now the way we will do that is that we'll introduce an auction center. And in a similar way, essentially everybody will send their encrypted bids to the auction center, the auction center will compute the identity of the winner, and in fact, uh, he will also compute the second highest bid. Uh, but other than these two values, nothing else is revealed about the individual bids. Now, this is actually an example of a much more general problem called secure multi-party computation, and let me explain what secure multi-party computation is about. So here, basically, abstractly, the participants have a secret input to themselves. So in the case of an election, the inputs would be the votes. In the case of an auction, the inputs would be the secret bids. And then what they'd like to do is compute some sort of a function of their inputs. Again, in the case of an election, the function is the majority. In the case of auction, the function happens to be the second highest largest number among x1 to x4. 
And the question is, how can they do that such that the value of the function is revealed, but nothing else is revealed about the individual votes? So let me show you kind of a dumb, insecure way of doing it. What we do is we introduce a trusted party. And then this trusted authority basically collects individual inputs, and it kind of promises to keep the individual inputs secret so that only it would know what they are, and then it publishes the value of the function uh, to the world. So the idea is now that the value of the function became public, but nothing else is revealed about the individual inputs. But of course, you got this trusted authority that you got to trust, and if for some reason it's not trustworthy, then you have a problem. And so there's a very central theorem in crypto. It really is quite a surprising fact that says that any computation you'd like to do, any function f you'd like to compute, that you can compute with a trusted authority, you can also do without a trusted authority. Let me at a high level explain what this means. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the authority. So the parties are actually not going to send their inputs to the authority. And in fact, there's no longer going to be an authority in the system. Instead, what the parties are going to do is they're going to talk to one another using some protocol such that at the end of the protocol, all of a sudden, the value of the function becomes known to everybody, and yet nothing other than the value of the function is revealed. In other words, the individual inputs is still kept secret. But again, there is no authority. There's just a way for them to talk to one another such that the final output is revealed. So this is a fairly general result. It's kind of a surprising fact that this is at all doable, and in fact it is, and towards the end of the class, we'll actually see how to make this happen. Now, there are some applications of cryptography that I can't classify in any other way other than to say that they're purely magical. Now, let me give you two examples of that. So the first is what's called privately outsourcing computation. So I'll give you an example of a Google search just to illustrate the point. So imagine Alice has a search query that she wants to issue. It turns out that there are very special encryption schemes such that Alice can send an encryption of her query to Google and then because of the property of the encryption scheme, Google can actually compute on the encrypted values without knowing what the plaintext are. So Google can actually run its massive search algorithm on the encrypted query and recover an encrypted results. Okay, Google would send the encrypted results back to Alice, Alice would decrypt, and then she would receive the results. But the magic here is all Google saw was just encryptions of her queries and nothing else. And so Google, as a result, has no idea what Alice just searched for, and nevertheless, Alice actually learned exactly what she wanted to learn. Okay, so these are magical kind of encryption schemes. They're fairly recent. This is only a new development from about two or three years ago that allows us to compute unencrypted data even though we don't really know what's inside the encryption. Now, before you rush off and think about implementing this, I should warn you that this is really, at this point, just theoretical in the sense that running a Google search on encrypted data probably would take a billion years. But nevertheless, just the fact that this is doable is already really surprising and is already quite useful for relatively simple computations. So in fact, we'll see some applications of this out later on. The other magical application I want to show you is what's called zero knowledge. And in particular, I'll tell you about something called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So here, uh, what happens is there's a certain number n, which Alice knows, and the way the number n was constructed is as a product of two large primes. So imagine here we have two primes, p and q. Each one, you can think of it as like a thousand digits. And you probably know that multiplying two thousand digits numbers is fairly easy. But if I just give you their product, figuring out their factorization into primes is actually quite difficult. And in fact, we're going to use the fact that factoring is difficult to build public key crypto systems in the second half of the course. Okay, so Alice happens to have this number n, and she also knows the factorization of n. Now, Bob just has the number n. He doesn't actually know the factorization. Now, the magical fact about the zero-knowledge proof of knowledge is that Alice can prove to Bob that she knows the factorization of n. Yeah, she can actually give this proof to Bob that Bob can check and become convinced that Alice knows the factorization of n. However, Bob learns nothing at all about the factors p and q, and this is provable. Bob absolutely learns nothing at all about the factors P and Q. And this statement actually is very, very general. This is not just about proving the factorization of N. In fact, almost any puzzle that you want to prove that you know an answer to, you can prove it in zero knowledge. So if you have a crossword puzzle that you've solved, 
well, maybe crosswords is not the best example. But if you have like a Sudoku puzzle, for example, that you want to prove that you've solved, you can prove it to Bob in a way that Bob would learn nothing at all about the solution, and yet Bob would be convinced that you really do have a solution to this puzzle. Okay, so those are kind of magical applications. And so the last thing I want to say is that modern cryptography is a very rigorous science. And in fact, every concept we're going to describe is going to follow three very rigorous steps. Okay, and we're going to see these three steps again and again and again, so I want to explain what they are. So the first thing we're going to do when we introduce a new primitive, like a digital signature, is we're going to specify precisely what the threat model is. That is, what can an attacker do to attack a digital signature, and what is his goal in forging signatures? Okay, so we're going to define exactly what does it mean for a signature, for example, to be unforgeable. Unforgeable. Okay, and I'm giving digital signatures just as an example. For every primitive we describe, we're going to precisely define what the threat model is. Then we're going to propose a construction, and then we're going to give a proof that any attacker that's able to attack the construction under this threat model, that attacker can also be used to solve some underlying hard problem. And as a result, if the problem really is hard, that actually proves that no attacker can break the construction under the threat model. Okay, but these three steps are actually quite important. In the case of signatures, we'll define what it means for a signature to be unforgeable, then we'll give a construction, and then, for example, we'll say that anyone who can break our construction can then be used to say factor integers, which is believed to be a hard problem. Okay, so we're going to follow these three steps throughout, and you'll see how this actually comes about. Okay, so this is the end of the segment, and then in the next segment, we'll talk a little bit about the history of cryptography. Before we start with the technical material, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of cryptography. Um, there's a beautiful book on this topic by David Kahn called The Code Breakers that covers the history of cryptography all the way from the Babylonian era, era to the present. Here I'm just going to give you a few examples of historical ciphers, all of which are badly broken. So to talk about ciphers, the first thing I'm going to do is introduce our friends Alice and Bob, who are going to be with us for the rest of the quarter. So Alice and Bob are trying to communicate securely, uh, and there is an attacker who's trying to eavesdrop on their conversation. So to communicate securely, they're going to share a secret key, which I'll denote by K. They both know the secret key, but the attacker does not know anything about this key K. So now they're going to use uh, a cipher, which is a pair of algorithms, uh, an encryption algorithm denoted by E, and a decryption algorithm D. These algorithms work as follows. Uh, the encryption algorithm E takes the message m as input, and it takes as input uh, the key k. I'm going to put a wedge above the key input just to uh, denote the fact that this input is really the key input. And then it outputs a ciphertext, which is uh, the encryption of the message m using the key k. I'm always going to write the key first. Uh, and when I write colon equals, what I mean is that the expression defines what, c, uh, what the variable c stands for. Now, the ciphertext is transmitted over the internet to Bob somehow. Actually, it could be transmitted over the internet, could be transmitted uh, using an encrypted file system. It doesn't really matter. But when the ciphertext reaches Bob, he can plug it into the decryption algorithm and give the decryption algorithm the same key k. Again, I'm going to put a wedge here as well to denote the key input. Uh, and the decryption algorithm outputs uh, the original plain text message. Now the reason we say that these the reason we say that these are symmetric ciphers is that both uh, the encryptor and decryptor actually use the same key k. As we'll see later in the course, there are ciphers where the encryptor uses one key and the decryptor uses a different key. But here we're just going to focus on symmetric cipher where both sides use the same key. Okay, so let me give you a few historic examples uh, of ciphers. The first example, the simplest one, is called a substitution cipher. I'm sure all of you played with substitution ciphers when you were in kindergarten. Uh, basically, a key for a substitution cipher is a substitution table that basically says how to map uh, letters. So here, for example, the letter A would be mapped to C, the letter B would be mapped to W, the letter C would be mapped to N, so on and so forth, and then the letter Z would be mapped, say, to A. So this is one example of a key for a substitution cipher. So just to practice the notation we introduced before, the encryption of a certain message using this key, let's say the message is B, C, Z, A, the encryption of this message using this key here would be, uh, is done by substituting one letter at a time. So B becomes W, 
C becomes N, Z becomes A, and A becomes uh, C. So the encryption of B, C, Z, A is W, N, A, C, and this defines the ciphertext. Similarly, we can decrypt the ciphertext using the same key, and of course, we'll get back uh, the original message. Okay, so just for historical reasons, there's one example of something that's related to the substitution cipher called the Caesar cipher. The Caesar cipher actually is not really a cipher at all. And the reason is that it doesn't have a key. What a Caesar cipher is, is basically a substitution cipher where the substitution is fixed. Namely, it's a shift by three. So A becomes uh, D, uh, B becomes E, C becomes F, uh, and so on and so forth. What is it? Y becomes B, and Z becomes uh, C. It's a fixed substitution that's applied to all plain text messages. So again, this is not a cipher because there is no key. The key is fixed. So if an attacker knows how our encryption scheme works, he can easily decrypt the message. The key is not random, and therefore decryption is very easy once you understand how the scheme actually works. Okay, so now let's go back to the substitution cipher where the keys really are chosen at random. The substitution tables are chosen at random. And let's see how we break this substitution cipher. It turns out to be very easy to break. The first question is, how big is the key space? How many different keys are there, assuming we have 26 letters? So I hope all of you said that uh, the number of keys is 26 factorial because a key, a substitution key, is simply a table, a permutation of all 26 letters. The number of permutations of 26 letters is 26 factorial. Uh, if you calculate this out, uh, 26 factorial is about 2 to the 88, which means that describing a key in a substitution cipher takes about 88 bits. So each key is represented by about 88 bits. Now, this is a perfectly fine size for a key space. In fact, we're going to be seeing ciphers that are perfectly secure uh, or you know there are, are adequately secure with uh, key spaces that are roughly of this size. However, even though the substitution cipher has a large key space of size 2 to the 88, it's still terribly insecure. So let's see how to break it. Uh, and to break it, we're going to be using letter frequencies. So the first question is, what is the most uh, frequent letter in English text? So I imagine all of you know that, in fact, E is the most common letter. And that is going to, if we make that quantitative, that's going to help us break a substitution cipher. So just given the ciphertext, we can already recover the plaintext. So the way we do that is, first of all, using frequencies of English letters. So here's how this works. So you give me an encrypted message uh, using a substitution cipher. What I know is, all I know is that the message is in English, the plaintext is in English. And I know that the letter E is the most frequent letter in English, and in fact it appears 12.7% of the time in standard English text. So what I'll do is I'll look at uh, the ciphertext you gave me, and I'm going to count how many times every letter appears. Now the most common letter in the ciphertext is going to be the encryption of the letter E with very high probability. So now I'm able to recover one entry in the key table. Uh, namely, the letter, namely, now I know what the letter E maps to. The next uh, most common letter in English is the letter T, that appears about 9.1% of the time. So now, again, I count how many times each letter appears in the ciphertext. And the second most frequent letter is very likely to be the encryption of the letter T. So now I've recovered a, the second entry in the key table. And I can continue this way. In fact, the letter A is the next most common letter. It appears 8.1% of the time. So now I can guess that the third most common letter in the ciphertext is the encryption of the letter A, and now I've recovered three entries in the key table. Well, so now what do I do? The remaining letters in English appear roughly the same amount of time, other than some rare letters like Q and X. But we're kind of stuck at this point. We figured out three entries in the uh, key table, but what do we do next? So the next idea is to use frequencies of pairs of letters. Sometimes these are called digrams. So what I'll do is I'll count how many times each pair of letters appears in the ciphertext. And I know that in English, the most common pairs of letters are things like H-E, A-N, I-N. I guess uh, T-H is another uh, common pair of letters. And so I know that the most common pair of letters in the ciphertext is likely to be the encryption of one of these four pairs. 
And so by trial and error, I can sort of figure out more entry, more elements in the key table. And again, by more trial and error, I, this way, by looking at trigrams, I can actually figure out uh, the entire key table. So the bottom line here is that, in fact, this substitution cipher is vulnerable to the worst possible type of attack, namely a ciphertext-only attack. Just given the ciphertext, the attacker can recover the decryption key and therefore recover the original uh, plaintext. So there's really no point in encrypting anything using a substitution cipher because the attacker can easily decrypt it all. Uh, you might as well send your plaintext uh, completely in the clear. So now we're going to fast forward to the Renaissance. And I guess we're moving from the Roman era to the Renaissance. And look at a cipher designed by a fellow named Viginaire who lived in the 16th century. He designed a couple of uh, ciphers. Here I'm going to show you a variant of one of his ciphers. This is called a Viginaire cipher. So in a Viginaire cipher, the key is a, a, a word. In this case, the word uh, is crypto. It's got six letters in it. Uh, and then to encrypt the message, what you do is you write the message under the key. So in this case, the message is, what a nice day today. And then you replicate the key as many times as needed to cover the message. And then the way you encrypt is basically you add the key letters to the message letters modulo 26. So just to give you an example here, for example, uh, if you add Y and A, you get uh, Z. If you add T and A, you get U. And you do this for all the letters. And remember, whenever you add, you add modulo 26. So if you go past Z, you go back to A. So that's the Viginaire cipher. And in fact, decryption is just as easy as encryption. Basically, the way you would decrypt is, again, you would write the ciphertext under the key. You would replicate the key. And then you would subtract the key from the ciphertext to get the original plaintext message. So breaking a Viginaire cipher is actually uh, quite easy. Let me show you how you do it. The first thing we need to do is we need to assume that we know the length of the key. So let's just assume we know that. In this case, the length of the key is 6. And then what we do is we break the ciphertext into groups of 6 letters each. Okay, So we're going to get a bunch, a bunch of groups like this. Each one uh, contains 6 letters. And then we're going to look at uh, the first letter in each group. Okay, So in this case, Yes, we're looking at the first letter, every six characters. Now, what do we know about these uh, six letters? We know that, in fact, they're all encrypted using the same letter in the ciphertext. All of these are encrypted using the letter C. In other words, ZLW is a shift by three of the plaintext letters. So if we collect all these letters, then the most common letter among the set is likely to be the encryption of E. Right? E is the most common letter in English. Therefore, if I look at every sixth letter, the most common letter in that set is likely to be the encryption of the letter E. Aha! So let's just suppose that, in fact, the most common letter, uh, every sixth letter, happens to be the letter H. Then we know that E plus the first letter of the key is equal to h. That says that the first letter of the key is equal to h minus e. And in fact, that is the letter c. So now we've recovered the first letter of the key. And now we can continue doing this uh, with the second letter. So we look at the second letter in every group of six characters. And again, we repeat the same exercise. We find the most common letter among the set. And we know that the most, this most common letter is likely the encryption of e. And therefore, whatever this letter, e, whatever this most common letter is, if we subtract e from it, we're going to get the second letter of the key, and so on and so forth with uh, the third letter uh, every six characters. And this way, we recover uh, the entire uh, key, and that allows us to decrypt uh, the message. Now, the only caveat is that I had to assume ahead of time that I know the length of the key, which in this case is six. But if I don't know the length of the key ahead of time, that's not a problem either. What I would do is I would run this decryption procedure assuming the key length is 1. Then I'd run it assuming the key length is 2. Then I would run it assuming the key length is 3. And so on and so on and so on until finally I get a message, I get a decryption that makes sense, that's sensical. And once I do that, I know that I've kind of recovered the right length of the key. Uh, and I know that I've also recovered the right key and therefore uh, the right message. Okay, so very, very quickly you can recover 
uh, you can decrypt Legionnaire uh, ciphers. Again, this is a ciphertext only attack. The interesting thing is that Legionnaire had a good idea here. This addition mod 26 is actually a good idea, and we'll see that later, except it's executed very poorly here. And so we'll correct that uh, a little bit later. OK, we're going to fast forward now from the Renaissance to, uh, to the 19th century, where everything became electric. And so people wanted to design ciphers that use electric motors. In particular, uh, these ciphers are called rotor machines because they use rotors. So an early example is called a Hebern machine, which uses a single rotor. Here you have a picture of this machine. The, the motor, the, I guess the rotor is over here. And the secret key is captured by this disk here. It's embedded inside of this disk, which rotate by one notch every time you press a key on the typewriter. Okay, So every time you, that you hit a key, the disk uh, rotates by one notch. Now what does this key do? Well, the key actually encodes a substitution table. So, uh, and therefore the, key, the disk actually is the secret key. And as I said, this disk encodes a substitution table. In this case, if you happen to press C as the first letter, output would be the letter T. And then the disk would rotate by one notch. After rotated, rotating by one notch, the new substitution table becomes the one shown here. You see that E basically uh, moves up, and then the re remaining letters move down. So imagine the, this is basically a two-dimensional rendering of the disk rotating by one notch. Then you press the next letter, and the disk rotates again. You notice again N moved up, and the remaining letters moved uh, down. So in particular, if we hit the letter C three times, the first time we would output the output would be T, the second time the output would be S, and the third time the output would be K. So this is how these uh, single rotor machine works. And as it turned out, very quickly after it was uh, advertised, uh, it was, again, broken basically using letter frequencies, digram frequencies, and trigram frequencies. It's not that hard, given enough ciphertext, to directly recover the secret key and then the message. Again, a ciphertext-only attack. So to kind of work against these frequency attacks, these statistical attacks, these rotor machines became more and more complicated over time, until finally, I'm sure you've all heard of the Enigma. The Enigma is kind of complicated rotor machine. It uses three, four, or five rotors. There are different versions of the Enigma machine. Here you see an example of the Enigma machine with three rotors. The secret key in the Enigma machine is the initial setting of the rotors. Okay, so in the case of three rotors, there would be 26 cube possible different keys. When you type on the typewriter, basically these rotors here rotate at different rates. Oh, I forgot to say this is a diagram of an Enigma machine using four rotors. As you type on the typewriter, the, the rotors rotate and output the appropriate uh, letters of uh, the ciphertext. So in this case, the number of keys is 26 to the fourth, which is 2 to the 18, which is actually relatively a small key space. Today, you can kind of uh, brute force uh, search using a computer through 2 to the 18 different keys uh, very, very quickly. You know, my wristwatch can do it in just a few seconds, I guess. And so uh, these, this Enigma machine was already was using relatively small key spaces. But I'm sure you've all heard that the uh, British uh, cryptographers at Bletchley Park were able to mount ciphertext-only attacks on the Enigma machine. They were able to decrypt German ciphers uh, back in, wor in World War II. And that played an important role uh, in many different battles uh, during the war. Uh, after the war, I guess that was the end kind of the mechanical age and started the digital age where uh, folks were using computers. Um, and as the world kind of migrated to using computers, the government realized that it's buying a lot of digital equipment from industry. And so it wanted industry uh, to use a good cipher so that when it buys equipment from, the, from industry, it would be getting equipment uh, with, with a decent cipher. And so the government put out this request for proposal for a data encryption standard, a federal data encryption standard, and we're going to talk about this effort uh, in more detail later on in the course. But in 1974, a group at IBM put together a cipher that became known as DES, the Data Encryption Standard, uh, which became a federal standard for encrypting data. Uh, the key space for DES is 2 to the 56, which is relatively small these days, but was large enough back in 1974. And another interesting thing about uh, DES is rather than, uh, unlike rotor machines, which encrypt one character at a time, the data encryption standard encrypts 64 bits at a time, namely eight characters uh, at a time. And we'll see the significance of this uh, later on in the course. 
Because DES uses such a small key space, uh, these days it can be broken by a brute force search. Uh, and so these days DES is considered insecure and should not be used uh, in projects. Unfortunately, it is used in some legacy systems, but it definitely is on its way out and should not be, definitely should not be used uh, in new projects. Today, there are new ciphers, uh, things like the advanced encryption standard, which uses 128-bit keys. Again, we'll talk about uh, the advanced encryption standard in much more detail later on in the course. There are many, many other types of ciphers. Uh, men I mentioned Salsa 20 here. We'll see why uh, in just a minute. Uh, but this is, this is all for the uh, quick historical survey. And now we can get into the more technical material. Now that we've seen a few examples of uh, historic ciphers, all of which are badly broken, we're going to switch gears and talk about ciphers that are much better designed. But before we do that, I want to, uh, first of all, define more precisely what a cipher is. So first of all, a cipher is actually, the, remember, a cipher is made up of two algorithms. There's an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. Uh, but in fact, a cipher is defined over a triple. So there's the set of all possible keys, which I'm going to denote by script K. This sometimes I'll call this the key space, the set of all possible keys. There's a set of all possible messages uh, and the set of all possible ciphertexts. Okay, so this triple, in some sense, defines the environment over which the cipher is defined. Uh, and then the cipher itself is a pair of efficient algorithms, E and D. E is the encryption algorithm, D is the decryption algorithm. Uh, of course, E takes keys and messages and outputs ciphertexts. And the decryption algorithm takes keys uh, and ciphertexts and outputs messages. And the only requirement is that these algorithms are consistent. They satisfy what's called the correctness property. So for every message in the message space and every uh, key uh, in the key space, it had better be the case that if I encrypt the message with the key K and then I decrypt using the same key K, I had better get back the original message that I started with. So this equation here is what's called the consistency equation and every cipher has to satisfy it uh, in order to be a cipher. Otherwise, it's not possible to decrypt. One thing I wanted to point out is that I put the word efficient here in quotes. And the reason I do that is because efficient means different things to different people. If you're more inclined towards theory, efficient means runs in polynomial time. So algorithms E and D have to run in polynomial time in the size of their inputs. Uh, if you're more practically inclined, efficient means uh, runs within a certain uh, time period. So for example, algorithm E might be required to take under a minute to encrypt a gigabyte of data. Uh, either way, the word efficient uh, kind of captures both notions, and you can interpret it in your head whichever way you like. I'm just going to keep referring to it as efficient and put quotes in it. As I said, if you're theory inclined, think of it as polynomial time, uh, and otherwise think of it as concrete uh, time constraints. Another comment I want to make is that in fact, algorithm E is often a randomized algorithm. What that means is that as you're encrypting messages, algorithm E is going to generate random bits for itself, and it's going to use those random bits to actually encrypt the messages that are given to it. On the other hand, the decryption algorithm is always deterministic. In other words, given the key and the ciphertext, output is always the same. It doesn't depend on any randomness that's used by the algorithm. OK, so now that we understand what uh, a cipher is better, I want to kind of show you the first example of a secure cipher. It's called the one-time pad. Uh, it was de designed by uh, Vernam back at the beginning of the 20th century. Before I actually explain what the cipher is, let's just state it in the, in the terminology that we've just seen. So the message space for the Vernam cipher for the one-time pad is the same as the ciphertext space, which is just the set of uh, all n-bit binary strings. So this just means all sequences of bits, of 0, 1 characters. The key space is basically the same as the message space, which is, again, simply the set of all n-bit binary strings. So a key in the one-time pad is simply a random uh, bit string. So it's a random sequence of bits that's as long as the message to be encrypted, as long as the message. OK, now that we specified kind of what the uh, cipher is defined over, we can actually specify how the cipher works. And it's actually really simple. So essentially, the ciphertext, which is the result of encrypting a message with a particular key, is simply the XOR of the two, simply K XOR M. So see a quick example of this. 
Remember that XOR, this plus with a circle, XOR means addition modulo 2. So if I take a particular message, say 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and I take a particular key, say 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, when I compute the encryption of the message using this key, all I do is I compute the XOR of these two strings. In other words, I do addition modulo 2 bit by bit. So I get 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. That's the ciphertext. And then how do I decrypt? I basically kind of do the same thing. So to decrypt a ciphertext using a particular key, what I do is I XOR the key and the ciphertext again. And so all we have to verify is that it satisfies the consistency requirements. And I'm going to do this slowly once, and then from now on I'm going to assume this is all uh, simple to you. So we're going, to make, we're going to have to make sure that if I decrypt a ciphertext that was encrypted using a particular key, I had better get back the message M. So what happens here? Well, let's see. So if I look at the encryption of K and M, this is just K, X, or M by definition. What's the encryption of K, X, or M using K? That's just K, X, or uh, K, X, or M. And so since I said that XOR is addition modulo 2, addition is associative. So this is the same as K, XOR, K, uh, XOR, M, which is simply, as you know, K, XOR, K is just 0, and 0, XOR, anything is simply M. OK, so this actually shows that the one-time pad is, in fact, uh, a cipher. But it doesn't say anything about the security of the cipher. And we'll talk about security of the cipher in just a minute. First of all, let me quickly ask you a question just to make sure we're all in sync. Suppose you're given a message M and the encryption of that message using the one-time pad. So all you're given is the message and the ciphertext. My question to you is given this pair, M and C, can you actually figure out the one-time pad key that was used in the creation of C from M? So I hope all of you realize that, in fact, uh, given the message and the ciphertext, it's very easy to recover what the key is in particular, the key is simply M, X, or C. And we'll see that if it's not immediately obvious to you, we'll see why that's uh, the case uh, a little later in the, in the lecture. OK. All right, so the one-time pad is uh, really cool from a performance point of view. All you're doing is you're XORing the key and the message. So it's a super, super fast cipher for encrypting and decrypting very long messages. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to use in practice. The reason it's difficult to use is the keys are essentially as long as the message. So if Alice and Bob want to communicate securely, so you know Alice wants to send a message M to Bob, before she begins even sending the first bit of the message, she has to transmit a key to Bob that's as long as that message. Well, if she has a way to transmit a secure key to Bob that's as long as the message, she might as well use that, that same mechanism to also uh, transmit the message itself. So the fact that the key it's as long as the message is quite problematic and makes the one-time pad very difficult to use in practice. Although we'll see that the idea behind the one-time pad is actually qu quite useful. Uh, and we'll see that a little bit later. But for now, I want to focus a little bit on security. So the obvious questions are, you know, why is the one-time pad secure? Why is it a good cipher? Then to answer that question, the first thing we have to answer is what is a secure cipher to begin with? What is it? What makes a cipher secure? OK, so to study security of ciphers, we have to talk a little bit about information theory. And in fact, the first person to study security of ciphers uh, rigorously uh, is a very famous, you know, the father of information theory, uh, Claude Shannon. And he published a famous paper back in 1949 where he analyzes the security of uh, the one-time pad. So the idea behind Shannon's definition of security is the following. Basically, if all you get to see is the ciphertext, then you should learn absolutely nothing about the plaintext. In other words, the ciphertext should reveal no information about the plaintext. And you see why it took someone who invented information theory to come up with this notion, because he had to formalize, formally explain what does information about the plaintext actually mean. Okay, So that's what Shannon did. And so let me show you Shannon's definition. I'll, I'll write it out uh, slowly uh, first. So what Sanders said is, you know, suppose we have a cipher ED that's defined over a triple K, M, and C, just as before. So K, M, and C define the key space, the message space, and the ciphertext space. And we say that the ciphertext, sorry, we say that the cipher has perfect secrecy if the following condition holds. It so happens that for every two messages, M0 and M1 in the message space, for every two messages, the only requirement I'm going to put on these messages is they have the same length. 
Um, yeah, so we're only, we'll see why this requirement is necessary uh, in just a minute. And for every ciphertext in the ciphertext space, okay, so for every pair of method messages and for every ciphertext, it had better be the case that if I ask what is the probability that uh, encrypting M0 with K, whoops, encrypting M0 with K gives C, okay, so how likely is it if we pick a random key, how likely is it that when we encrypt M0 we get C? That probability should be the same as when we encrypt M1. Okay, so the probability of encrypting M1 and getting C is exactly the same as the probability of encrypting M0 and getting C. And this is, as I said, where the key, the distribution, is over the distribution on the key. So the key is uniform in the key space. So K is uniform uh, in K. And I'm often going to write uh, K arrow with a little R above it to denote the fact that K is a random variable that's uniformly sampled in the key space K. Okay, this is the main part of Shannon's definition. And let's think a little bit about what this definition actually says. So what does it mean that these two probabilities are the same? Well, what it says is that if I an attacker, if, if I'm an attacker and I intercept a, a particular ciphertext C, then in reality, the ciphertext, the probability that the ciphertext is the encryption of M0 is exactly the same as the probability that it's, that it's the encryption of M1, because those probabilities are equal. So if I, all I have is the ciphertext C, or that's all I've intercepted, I have no idea whether the ciphertext came from M0 or the ciphertext came from M1, because again, the probability of getting C is equally likely whether M0 is, in, is being encrypted or M1 is being encrypted. So here we have the definition stated again, and I will just want to write these properties again more precisely. So let's write this again. So what this definition means is that if I'm given a particular ciphertext, I can't tell where it came from. I can't tell if, it's, if the message that was encrypted is uh, either M0 or M1. And in fact, this property is true for all messages for all these M0, for all M0 and M1. So not only can I not tell if C came from M0 or M1, I can't tell if it came from M2 or M3 or M4 or M5, because all of them are equally likely to produce the ciphertext uh, C. So what this means really is that if you're encrypting messages with a one-time pad, then in fact the most powerful adversary, I don't really care how smart you are, the most powerful adversary can learn nothing about the plain text, learns nothing about the plain text uh, from the ciphertext. So just to say it in one more way, basically what this proves is that there's no, oops, there's no ciphertext only attack on this on a cipher that has perfect secrecy. Now, ciphertext only attacks actually aren't the aren't the only attacks possible, and in fact, uh, other attacks may be possible. But other attacks may be possible. Okay, now that we understand what perfect secrecy uh, means, the question is, can we build ciphers that actually have perfect secrecy? And it turns out we don't have to look very far. The one-time pad, in fact, has perfect secrecy. So I want to prove to you, this is Shannon's first uh, results, uh, and I want to prove this fact to you. It's a very simple uh, proof, so let's go ahead and, and look at it uh, and just do it. So we need to kind of interpret what does it mean, what is this probability that E k of m0 is equal to c? So it's actually not that hard to see that for every message in every ciphertext, the probability that the encryption of M under a key K, the probability that that's, that's equal to C, the probability of a random choice of key, by definition, all that is is basically the number of keys, K in script K, uh, such that, well, if I encrypt M with K, I get C. So I literally count the number of such keys and I divide by the total number of keys, right? That's what it means that if I choose a random key, that key maps M to C, right? So it's basically the number of keys that map M to C divided by the total number of keys. This is this probability. So now suppose that, suppose that we had a cipher such that for all messages and all ciphertext, it so happens that if I look at this number, the number of K, K in K, such that E, K, M, is equal to C. In other words, I'm looking at the number of keys that map M to C. Suppose this, this number happens to be a constant. So 
say it happens to be 2, 3, or 10, or 15, it just happens to be an absolute constant. If that's the case, then by definition, for all m0 and m1, and for all c, this probability has to be the same, because the denominator is the same, the numerator is the same, it's just this constant, and therefore this probability is always the same for all m and c. And so if this, if this property is true, then the cipher has to have, the cipher has a perfect secrecy. Okay, so let's see what can we say about this quantity for the one-time pad. So the, sec so the question to you is, if I have a message uh, in a ciphertext, how many one-time pad keys are there that map this message M to the ciphertext C? In other words, how many keys are there such that M XOR K is equal to C? So I hope you've all answered uh, one, and let's see why that's the case. For the one-time pad, if we have that the encryption of k of m under k is equal to c, that basically, well, by definition, that implies that k xor m is equal to c. But that also simply says that k has to be equal to m xor uh, c. Yes, I just xor both sides by m, and I get that k must equal to m xor c. Okay, so what that says is that for the one-time pad, in fact, uh, the number of keys uh, in K such that E, K, M uh, is equal to C, that simply is 1, and this holds for all messages and ciphertexts. And so again, by what we said before, this says that the one-time pad has uh, perfect secrecy. Uh, perfect secrecy, and that completes the proof of this, of this trivial, very, very simple, very, very simple lemma. Now, the funny thing is that even though this lemma is so simple to prove, in fact, it proves a pretty powerful statement again. This basically says, for the one-time pad, there is no ciphertext-only attack. So unlike the substitution cipher, or the Vigenere cipher, or the rotor machines, all those could be broken by ciphertext-only attack, we've just proved that for the one-time pad, that's simply impossible. Given the ciphertext, you simply learn nothing about the plaintext. However, as we'll see, this is not the end of the story. I mean, are we done? I mean, basically, we're done with the course now, because we have a way uh, to encrypt uh, so that an attacker can't recover anything about our message, so maybe we're done with the course. But in fact, as we'll see, there are other attacks, and in fact, the one-time pad is actually not such a secure cipher. And in fact, there are other attacks that are possible, and we'll see that shortly. Okay? So I emphasize again, the fact that it has perfect secrecy does not mean that the one-time pad is a secure cipher to use. Okay, but as we said, the problem with the one-time pad is that the secret key, key is really long. So if you had a way of communicating the secret key over to the other side, you might as well use that exact same method to also communicate the message to the other side, in which case you wouldn't need a cipher to begin with. Okay, so the problem again is the one-time pad has really long keys, and so the obvious question is, are there other ciphers that have perfect secrecy and possibly have much, much shorter keys? Well. So the bad news is that Shannon, uh, after proving that the one-time pad has perfect secrecy, proved another theorem that says that if in fact a cipher has perfect secrecy, the number of keys in a cipher must be at least the number of messages uh, that the cipher can handle. Okay, so in particular what this means is if I have perfect secrecy, then necessarily the number of keys, or rather the length of my key, must be greater than the length of the message. So in fact, since the one-time pad satisfies this with equality, the one-time pad is an optimal uh, cipher that has perfect secrecy. Okay, so basically, what this shows is that this is an interesting notion, the one-time pad is an interesting cipher, but in fact, in reality, uh, it's actually quite hard to use. Hard to use in practice, again, because of these long keys. Uh, and so this notion of perfect secrecy, even though it's quite interesting, basically says that it doesn't really tell us that practical ciphers are going to be secure. And we're going to see, but the, as we said, the idea behind the one-time pad is quite good, and we're going to see uh, in the next lecture how to make that into a practical system. Now that we know about the one-time pad, let's talk about making the one-time pad more practical using something called the stream cipher. But before we do that, let's do a quick review of uh, where we were. So let me just remind you that a cipher is defined over a triple of sets uh, called a, a key space, a message space, and a ciphertext pair, space. And a cipher is a pair of efficient algorithms uh, called E and D. E stands for encryption and D stands for decryption. And the only property uh, that we need to satisfy is that uh, decryption is the opposite of encryption. In other words, if I encrypt a message M using a particular key, 
and I decrypt using the same key, uh, I get back the original message. Last time we looked at a couple of weak ciphers, like the substitution cipher and the Vigenera cipher. We showed that all of them can be easily broken, so you should never, ever, ever use uh, those ciphers. Those were just for uh, historical reference. And then we looked at our first example of a good cipher, namely the one-time pad. Now let me just remind you how the one-time pad is defined. Uh, basically, the message space is uh, the set of all bit n bit strings. The ciphertext is the set of all bit n bit strings, and similarly, the key is the set of all n bit strings. And the way we encrypt is by a simple XOR to encrypt the message. We just XOR the message in the key that gives us the ciphertext. Uh, and then to decrypt the ciphertext, we just do the, uh, this XOR again, and it's easy to show by properties of XOR that in fact decryption is the opposite of encryption. Uh, and then we talked about this lemma, in fact we proved it, uh, that says that the one-time pad has perfect secrecy, which means that if you're just an eavesdropper and you just get to see uh, a single ciphertext, you're not going to be able to uh, deduce any information about the encrypted plaintext. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we also said that Shannon proved uh, this lemma, we called it the bad news lemma, that basically says that um, any cipher that has perfect secrecy must have really long keys. In other words, the key length must be at least as long uh, as the length of the message, uh, which means that the cipher is not particularly useful because if two parties have a way to agree on really long keys that are as long as the message, they in some sense might as well use that mechanism to already transmit the message itself. So in this lecture, we're going to take the idea of the one-time pad and try to make it uh, into a practical uh, encryption scheme. So this is called what's called a stream cipher. So the idea in a stream cipher is rather than using a totally random key, we're actually going to use uh, a pseudo-random key. And to explain how that works, I need to uh, define uh, what is a pseudo-random uh, generator, a PRG. So a PRG, really, all it is is just a function and I'll call it G for generator, that takes a seed, so I'm going to use 0, 1 to the S to denote uh, all strings uh, of length S, so this we'll call uh, the seed space. So it takes an S bit uh, seed and maps it into a much larger string, which we'll denote by 0, 1 to the N, and the property is that N must be much, much larger than S. So in other words, we take a seed that might be maybe only 128 bits, um, and we expand it into a much, much larger output uh, string that could be, could be gigabytes long. That's what the pseudo-random generator does. And of course, the goal is that, first of all, uh, the generator is efficiently computable. So the function g, uh, there should be some sort of an efficient algorithm that computes it. Uh, so efficiently computable by a deterministic algorithm. It's important to understand that the function g itself has no more randomness uh, in it. It's totally deterministic. The only thing that's random here is the random seed uh, that's given as input to the function g. And th the other property, of course, is that the output uh, should look random. And the question is, what does it mean to look random? And that's something that we'll define later on in the lecture. Okay, so suppose we have such a generator. How do we use that uh, to build a stream cipher? Well, the idea is that we're going to use the seed uh, as our key. So our short seed is going to be the secret key. And then we're going to use the generator to basically expand the seed into a much, much larger uh, random-looking sequence, or pseudo-random sequence, as it's known. So this would be g of k. And then we're going to XOR, just like in the one-time pad, we're going to XOR the pseudo-random sequence with the message, and that's going to give us uh, the ciphertext. Or if we want to write this in math, we'll write uh, C equals uh, the encryption of the message M with a key K, which is simply defined as M XOR G of K. And then when we want to decrypt, basically we do exactly the same thing. It's basically the ciphertext XOR G of K, just like in the one-time pad, except that instead of XORing with K, we XOR with the output of the generator applied to K. So the first question to ask is, uh, why is this secure? So basically, you know, we only have one notion of security so far, which we called uh, perfect secrecy. And so let's just quickly ask, uh, can a stream cipher have perfect secrecy? Remember, in the stream cipher, the key is much, much uh, shorter than the message. And so nevertheless, can it have uh, perfect secrecy? So I hope everybody said the answer is uh, no. Uh, the key is much shorter than the message. And we said that in a perfectly secure cipher, the key must be as long as the message. And therefore, it's not possible that a that, uh, stream cipher actually has perfect secrecy. So the question is then, well, why is it secure? 
First of all, we would need a different definition of security to argue that the stream server is secure, and in particular, the security property is going to depend on the specific generator that we used. So in fact, the definition of privacy that we'll need to argue security of stream ciphers we'll see in the next lecture. But for now, let me show you uh, one particular property that a generator must have, a minimal property needed for security. This property is called unpredictability. So let's just suppose for one second that in fact a stream cipher is predictable. So what does that mean? Suppose the PRG is predictable. What that means is essentially that there is some i such that if I give you the first i bits of the output, uh, this notation bar 1 to i means look at the first i bits of the output of the function. Okay, so I give you the first i bits of the stream. There is some sort of an algorithm, there's an efficient algorithm that will compute the rest of the stream. Okay, so given the first i bits, you can compute the remainder of the bits. I claim that if this is the case, then the stream cipher would not be secure. So let's see why. Well, suppose an attacker actually intercepts a particular ciphertext, let's call it C. Uh, right? If this is the case, then in fact uh, we have a problem. Uh, because suppose that just uh, by some prior knowledge, the attacker actually knows that the initial part of the message happens to be some known value. For example, you know that in, um, uh, in the mail protocol, uh, SMTP, the standard send mail protocol used in the internet, you know that every uh, message starts with a word from colon. Well, that would be a prefix that the adversary knows that the, cipher, that the message must begin with, from uh, colon. What it could do is it could XOR the ciphertext with the words from colon, with the little prefix of the message that it actually knows, and what that would give it is a prefix of the pseudorandom sequence. So now it would learn as a result of this, it would learn a prefix of the pseudorandom sequence. But then we know that once it has a prefix of the pseudorandom sequence, it, it can predict the remainder of the, of the pseudorandom sequence, and that would allow it to then predict the rest of the message M. Okay, so for example, if the uh, pseudorandom generator was predictable given, you know, five bits of uh, the pad, then every email encrypted using a stream cipher would be decryptable because, again, the attacker knows, it, knows the prefix of the message from which he deduces a prefix of the pad, which then allows him to compute the rest of the pad, which then allows him uh, to recover the entire plain text. Okay, so this is an example that shows that in fact, if a G PRG is predictable, then already there are security problems uh, because a small prefix would reveal the entire message. As it turns out, uh, even if I could just predict one bit of the output, even if given you know, the first i bits, I can predict the next bit, the i plus first bit, already this is a problem because that would say that given, again, the first couple of letters in the message, I can predict I can decrypt essentially and recover the next bit of the message or the next letter of the message and so on. So this predictability property shows that, you know, our, if we use a PRG that's, that's going to be used in a stream cipher, it had better be unpredictable. So what does it mean that a PRG is unpredictable? So let's define more precisely what it means for a PRG to be unpredictable. Well, first we'll define more precisely what it means for a PRG to be predictable. So we say that G is predictable if there exists an efficient... Uh, algorithm, uh, let's call it uh, A, and uh, there is some position, there's a position I between 1 and uh, n minus 1, uh, such that if we look at the probability over a random key, probability that if I generate a random key, and remember this notation means choose a random key from the set K, so this arrow with R just means choose a random key from the set K, Basically, if I give this algorithm the prefix of the output, so I give it the first i bits of the output, the probability that it's able to predict the next bit of the output, this probability is greater than half plus epsilon uh, for some non-negligible, for some uh, non-negligible uh, epsilon. And non-negligible, for example, would be epsilon, which is greater than 1 over 2 to the 30. 1 over a billion, for example, we would consider non-negligible. So these terms, uh, negligible and non-negligible, we'll come back at the end of the lecture and define them more precisely. But for now, let's just uh, stick with the intuitive notion of what non-negligible means. And so this is what it means for an algorithm, for a generator to be uh, predictable, 
basically there is some algorithm that is able to predict the i plus first bit, even the initial prefix. Okay? And then we say that an algorithm that a PRG is unpredictable, if in fact, well, if it doesn't satisfy the property that we just defined, in other words, it is not predictable. But what does it mean uh, more precisely for it not to be predictable? It means that in fact for all positions, for all i, there is no efficient adversary, no efficient algorithm a, that can predict the i plus first bits with non negligible probability uh, epsilon. Okay, and this has to be true for all i. So no matter which prefix I give you, you're not going to be able to predict the next bit that follows the prefix. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Here's a silly, silly example. Suppose I give you a generator and I ask you, is it predictable? Well, this generator happens to have the property that if I XOR all the bits of the output, I always happen to get one. Okay, so I XOR all the bits, bit number one, XOR bit number two, XOR bit number three. If I XOR all those bits, I happen to get one. The question is, is that a predictable generator? And again, I hope everybody answered yes, that essentially uh, given the first n minus one bits of the output, I can predict the nth bit because it would just be the bits that's needed to make the XOR of all the bits be one. In other words, if I give you all but one of the bits of the generator, uh, you can actually predict the last bit of the generator. Now that we've seen that PRGs have to be unpredictable, I just want to mention a couple of weak PRGs that should never ever be used for crypto. This is a very common mistake, and I just want to make sure uh, none of you guys uh, make this mistake. So a very common PRG that should actually never be used for crypto is called a linear congruential generator. So let me explain what a linear congruential generator is. Basically, it has parameters. It has three parameters. Uh, I'll call them A, B, and P. Uh, a and B are just integers, and P is a prime. And the generator is defined as follows. Essentially, uh, I'll say R0 is the seed of the generator. Um, and then the way you generate randomness is basically you set, you iteratively run through the following steps. You compute A times R of I minus one plus B modulo P. Then you output a few bits of the current states, output a few uh, bits of RI. Uh, then, of course, you increment i, and you iterate this again and again and again. Okay, so you can see how this generator uh, proceeds. It starts with a, with a particular seed. At every step, there is this linear transformation that's being applied to the seed. Uh, and then you output a few bits of the current state, and then you do that again and again and again and again. Unfortunately, e even though this generator has good statistical properties in the sense that, uh, for example, uh, the number of zeros it outputs is likely going to be similar to the number of ones and so on it has. You can actually argue all sorts of nice uh, statistical properties about this. Nevertheless, it is a very uh, easy generator to predict uh, and in fact should never ever be used. In fact, just given a few uh, outputs, a few output samples, it's easy to predict the remainder of the sequence. And as a result, this generator should never ever be used. Another example is a random number generator that's very closely related to the linear congruential generator. This is a random number generator in implemented in glibc, very common library, that you can see, I just wrote down the definition here, you can see that it basically outputs uh, a few bits at every iteration, and it just does this simple linear transformation at every step. Again, this is a very easy generator to predict and should never ever be used uh, for crypto. And so kind of the lesson I want to make, just emphasize here is never ever use, never use uh, the function, the built-in glibc function random uh, for crypto because it doesn't produce uh, cryptographic randomness in the sense that it's easy to predict. And in fact, systems like Kerberos version 4 have used random and uh, have been bitten by that. So uh, please don't make that mistake yourself. We'll talk about how to do secure random number generation actually in the next lecture. Before we conclude this lecture, I just want to give a little bit more detail about these concepts of negligible and non-negligible negligible values. So different communities in crypto actually define these concepts uh, differently. Uh, for practitioners, basically these, uh, the terms negligible and non-negligible are just particular scalars that are used in the definition. So for example, uh, a practitioner would say that if a value is more than one over, one over a billion, one over two to the 30, we say that the value is non-negligible. The, the reason that's so is because if you happen to use a key, for example, for, uh, for encrypting a gigabyte of data, a gigabyte of data is about two to the 30, or maybe even two to the 32 bytes. 
then an event that happens with probability 1 over 2, 2 to the 30 will likely happen after a bit about a gigabyte of data. So since a gigabyte of data is within reason for a particular key, this event uh, is, is likely to happen. Therefore, 1 over 2 to the 30 is non negligible. On the other hand, we'll say that 1 over 2 to the 80, which is much, much, much smaller, is an event, an event that happens with this probability is an event that's actually not going to happen over the life of the key, and therefore uh, we'll say that that's a negligible event. As it turns out, these practical definitions of negligible and non-negligible are quite problematic, and we'll see examples of why they're problematic uh, later on. So in fact, in the more rigorous uh, theory of cryptography, the definition of negligible and non-negligible are somewhat different. And in fact, when we talk about the probability of events, we don't talk about these probabilities as scalars, but rather we talk about them as functions of a security parameter. So let me explain what that means. So these functions uh, are essentially are functions that map, that output uh, positive real values, so, or non-negative real values that are supposedly probabilities, but they're functions that act on non-negative integers. Okay, so what does it mean for a function to be non-negligible? What it means is that the function is bigger than some polynomial infinitely often. In other words, for, many, for infinitely many values, the function is bigger than some uh, one over polynomial. Okay, so I wrote the exact definition here, and we'll see an example uh, in just a minute. Okay, so if something is bigger, is often bigger than one over polynomial, we'll say that it's not negligible. However, if something is smaller than all polynomials, then we'll say that it's negligible. So and that what this says here is basically for any degree polynomial, for all d, uh, there exists some lower bound lambda d such that for all lambda bigger than this lambda d, the function is smaller than 1 over the polynomial. Okay, so all this says is that the function is negligible if it's less than all polynomial fractions. In other words, it's less than 1 over lambda d for sufficiently large lambda. So let's look at some examples. And we'll see applications of these negligible and non-negligible concepts later on, but I just wanted to, wanted to make it clear that this is how you would rigorously find these concepts. Basically, either smaller than 1 over poly or bigger than 1 over poly. One would be negligible, one, the other would be non-negligible. So let's look at some examples. So, so, for example, a function that drops exponentially in lambda clearly would be negligible because for any constant d, uh, there is a sufficiently large lambda such that 1 over 2 to the lambda is less than 1 over lambda to the d. Okay, so this is clearly less than all polynomials. However, the function, say, 1 over lambda to 1,000, right? This is a function that grows very, very, very slowly. It barely ever moves. This function, nevertheless, this function is non-negligible because if I set uh, d to be 10,000, then clearly this function is bigger than 1 over lambda to the 10,000. And so... This, this function is bigger than uh, some polynomial fraction. Now let's look at a confusing example, just to be tricky. Uh, what do you think? If, uh, suppose I have a function that for la odd lambda happens to be exponentially small, for even lambda happens to be polynomially small. Is this a negligible or non-negligible function? Well, by our definition, this would be a non-negligible function. And the intuition is, if a function happens to be only polynomially small very often, that actually means that this event, you know, an event that happens with this probability is already too large to be used in a real crypto system. Okay, so the main points to remember here are that these terms basically correspond to uh, less than polynomial or more than polynomial, but throughout the course we'll mostly use negligible to mean less than, uh, than an exponential and non-negligible to mean um, less than one over polynomial. So now we saw the core idea for converting the one-time pad into a practical uh, cipher, namely a stream cipher. And then in the next lecture, we're going to see how to actually argue that the stream cipher is actually secure. That's going to require a new definition of security, since perfect secrecy is not good enough here. Uh, and we will see that in the next lecture. In this segment, we're going to look at attacks on the one-time pad and some things you need to be careful with when you use the stream cipher. But before we do that, let's do a quick review of where we were. So recall that the one-time pad encrypts messages by XORing the message and a secret key, where the secret key is as long as the message. Similarly, decryption is done by similarly XORing the ciphertext and the same secret key. When the key is uh, uniform and random, we prove that the one-time pad has this information theoretic security that Shannon called perfect secrecy. A problem was, of course, the keys are as long as the message, so the one-time pad is very difficult to use.
We then talked about a way to make the one-time path practical by using a pseudo-random generator that expands a short seed into a much larger message. And the way a stream cipher works, essentially using a pseudo-random generator, was uh, in the same way as the one-time pad, basically, but rather than using a truly random pad, we used the pseudo-random pad that's expanded to be as long as the message from the short key that's given as input to the generator. Uh, we said now that security no longer relies on perfect secrecy because stream ciphers cannot be perfectly secure. Instead, security relies on properties of the pseudorandom generator. And we said that the pseudorandom generator essentially needs to be unpredictable. But in fact, it turns out that definition is a little bit hard to work with. And we're going to see a better definition of security for PRGs in about two segments. But in this segment, we're going to talk about attacks on the one-time pad. And the first attack I want to talk about is what's called the two-time pad attack. Okay, so remember that the one-time pad is called one-time pad because the pad can only be used to encrypt a single message. I want to show you that if the same pad is used to encrypt more than one message, then security goes out the window and basically an eavesdropper can completely decrypt encrypted messages. So let's look at an example. So here we have two messages, M1 and M2, that are encrypted using the same pad. So the resulting ciphertext, C1 and C2, again, basically are encryptions of these messages M1 and M2, but both are encrypted using the same pad. Now suppose an eavesdropper intercepts C1 and C2, and he obtains, he basically has both C1 and C2. The natural thing for the eavesdropper to do is actually compute the XOR of C1 and C2, and what does he get when he computes this XOR? So I hope everybody sees that basically once you XOR C1 and C2, the pads cancel out, and essentially what comes out of this is the XOR of the plain text messages. And it turns out that English basically has enough redundancy such that if I give you the XOR of two plain text messages, you can actually recover those two messages completely. More importantly for us, since these messages are encoded using ASCII, in fact, ASCII encoding has enough redundancy such that given the XOR of two ASCII encoded messages, you can recover the original messages back. Okay, so essentially given these XORs, you can recover both messages. So the thing to remember here is if you ever use the same pad to encrypt multiple messages, an attacker who intercepts the resulting ciphertexts can basically recover the original plaintexts without too much work. So the stream cipher key or the one-time pad key should never, ever, ever, ever be used more than once. So let's look at some examples where this comes up in practice. It's a very common mistake to use a stream cipher key or a one-time pad key more than once. And let me show you some example where this comes up so you know to avoid these mistakes uh, when you build your own systems. The first example is a historic example uh, at the beginning of the 1940s where the Russians actually used a one-time pad to encrypt various messages. Unfortunately, the pads that they were using were generated by a human by throwing dice. And so, you know, the human would throw these dice and write down the results of these throws, and the collected throws would then form the pads that were used for encryption. Now, because it was kind of laborious for them to generate these pads, it seemed wasteful to use the pad to encrypt just one message, so they ended up using these pads to encrypt multiple messages, and U.S. intelligence was actually able to intercept these two-time pads, these ciphertexts that were encrypted using the same pad applied to different messages. And it turns out over a period of several years, they were able to decrypt something like 3,000 plaintexts just by intercepting these ciphertexts. The project is called Project Vanona. It's actually a fascinating story of cryptanalysis just because the two-time pad is insecure. More importantly, I want to talk about um, some more recent examples that come up in networking protocols. So let me give you an example from Windows NT in a protocol called the point-to-point uh, -point transfer protocol. This is a protocol for a client wishing to communicate securely with a server. The client and the server both uh, share a secret key here, and they both send messages to one another. So here we'll denote the messages from the client by M1. So the client sends a message, the server responds, the client sends a message, the server responds, the client sends a message, the server responds, and so on and so forth. Now, the way PPTP works is basically the entire interaction from the client to the server is considered as one stream. In other words, what happens is the messages M1 and M2 and M3 are kind of viewed as one long stream. Here, these two parallel lines means concatenation. So essentially, we're concatenating all the messages from the client to the server into one long stream. And all that stream is encrypted using the stream cipher with key K. 
So that's perfectly fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. These messages are encrypted, are treated as one long stream, and they're all encrypted using the same key. The problem is the same thing is happening also on the server side. In other words, all the messages from the server are also treated as one long stream. So here, they're all concatenated together and encrypted using, unfortunately, the same pseudo-random seed. In other words, using the same stream cipher key. So basically what's happening here is you see an effect that the two-time pad is taking place where the set of messages from the client is encrypted using the same one-time pad as the set of messages from the server. The lesson here is that you should never use the same key to encrypt traffic in both directions. In fact, what you need to do is to have one key for interaction between the client and the server and one key for interaction between the server and the client. The way I like to write this is really that the shared key K really is a pair of keys. One key is used to encrypt messages from server to client, and one key is used to encrypt messages from client to server. So these are two separate keys that are used, and both sides, of course, know this key. So both sides have this pair of keys. Okay, and they can both encrypt. So one is used to encrypt messages in one direction, and the other is used to encrypt messages in the other direction. So another important example of the two-time pad comes up in Wi-Fi communication, in particular in the 802.11b protocol. So all of you, I'm sure, know that 802.11 contains an encryption layer, and the original encryption layer was called WEP. And WEP, fortunately for us, is actually a very badly designed protocol so that I can always use it as an example of how not to do things. There are many, many mistakes inside of WEP, and here I want to use it as an example of how the two-time pad came about. So let me explain how WEP works. So in WEP, there's a client and an access point. Here's the client. Here's the access point. They both share a secret key K. And then uh, when they want to transmit a message to one another, say these are frames that they, they transmit to one another, let's say the client wants to send a frame containing the plain text M to the access point, what he would do is he, first of all, he appends some sort of a checksum to this plain text. The checksum is not important at this point. What is important is that then this concatenation gets encrypted using a stream cipher, where the stream cipher key is this concatenation of a value IV and a long-term key K. So this IV is a 24-bit string, okay? This IV is a 24-bit string, and you can imagine that it starts from zero and perhaps it just it's a counter that uh, counts increments by one for every packet. The reason they did this is the designers of WEP realized that in a stream cipher, the key is only supposed to be used to encrypt one message. And so they said, well, let's go ahead and change the key after every frame. And the way they changed the key essentially was by prepending this IV to it. And you notice this IV changes on every packet, so it increments by one on every packet. And the IV then is sent in the clear along with the ciphertext. So the recipient knows the key K, he knows what the IV is, he can rederive the PRG of IV concatenated K, and then decrypt the ciphertext to recover the original message M. Now the problem with this, of course, is the IV is only 24 bits long, which means that there are only two to the 24 possible IVs, which means that after 16 million frames are transmitted, essentially the IV has to cycle. And once it cycles after 60 million frames, essentially we get a two-time pad. The same IV would be used to encrypt two different messages. The key K never changes. It's a long-term key. And as a result, the same key, namely IV concatenated K, would be used to encrypt two different frames, and the attacker can then figure out plain text of both frames. So that's one problem. And the worst problem is, in fact, that in, on many 802.11 cards, if you power cycle the card, the IV will reset back to zero. And as a result, every time you power cycle the card, essentially you'll be encrypting the next payload using zero concatenated K. So after every power cycle, you'll be using the zero concatenated K key to encrypt many, many, many times the same packet. So you see how in WEP, the same pad could be used to encrypt many different messages as soon as the IV is repeated. There's nothing to prevent the IV from repeating after a power cycle or from repeating after every 16 million frames, which isn't that many frames in a busy network. So while we're talking about WEP, I want to mention one more mistake that was done in WEP. This is a pretty significant mistake, and let's see uh, how we might design it better. So you notice that the designers of WEP basically wanted to use a different key for every packet. Okay, so every frame is encrypted using a different key, this concatenation of IV and K. Unfortunately, 
they didn't randomize the keys. And the keys are actually, if you look at the key for frame number one, well, you know, it'll be this concatenation of one and K, this field is 24 bits. And then the key for frame number two is the concatenation of two and K. The key for frame number three is the concatenation of three and K. So the keys are very closely related to one another. And I should probably mention also that these keys themselves can be 104 bits. So that the resulting PRG key is actually 104 plus 24 bits, which is 128 bits. Unfortunately, these keys are very much related to one another. These are not random keys. You notice they all have the same suffix of 104 bits. And it turns out the pseudo-random generator used in WEP is not designed to be secure when you use related keys that are so closely related. In other words, the majority of these keys are basically the same. And in fact, for the PRG that's used in WEP, that PRG is called uh, RC4. We'll talk about that more in the next segment. It turns out there's an attack that was discovered by Fleur, Mantin, and Shamir back in 2001 that shows that after about 10 to the 6, after about a million frames, uh, you can recover the secret key, you can recover uh, K. So this is kind of a disastrous attack that says essentially all you have to do is listen to about a million frames. These frames basically, as we said, they're all generated from a very common seed, namely 104 bits of these seeds are all the same. The fact that you've used such closely related keys is enough to actually recover the original key. And it turns out even after the, the 2001 attack, better attacks have come out that show that these related keys are you know, very much disastrous. And in fact, these days, uh, something like 40,000 frames uh, are sufficient. And so that within a matter of minutes, you can actually recover the secret key in any web network. So web provides no security at all for two reasons. First of all, it can result in a two-time pad. But more significantly, because these keys are so closely related, uh, it's actually possible to recover the key by watching just a few ciphertexts. And by the way, we'll see that when, when we do a security analysis of these types of constructions, in a few segments, we'll start talking about how to analyze these types of constructions. We'll see that when we have related keys like this, in fact, our security analysis will fail. We won't be able to get the proof to go through. So one could ask, what should the designers of uh, web should have done instead? Well, one approach is to basically treat the frames, you know, M1, M2, M3, these, each one is a separate frame transmitted from the client to the server. They could have treated them as one long stream and then XOR them essentially using uh, the pseudo-random generator as one long stream. So, so the first segment of the pad would have been used to encrypt M1. The second segment of the pad would have been used to encrypt M2. The third segment of the pad would have been used to encrypt M3, and so on and so forth. So they basically would never have had to change the key because the entire interaction is viewed as one long stream. But they chose to have a different key for every frame. So if you want to do that, a better way to do that is rather than slightly modifying this IV that just slightly modifies the prefix of the key, of the PRG key, a better way to do that is to use a PRG again. So essentially what you could do is you would take your long-term key and then feed that directly through a PRG. So now we get a long stream of bits that look essentially random. And then the initial segment could be used, the first segment could be used as the key or frame number one. And then the second segment would be used as the key for, you know, key from frame number two, and so on and so forth. The third segment would be used to encrypt frame number three, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the nice thing about this is now essentially by doing this, each frame has a pseudo-random key. These keys now have no relation to one another. They look like random keys. And as a result, if the PRG is secure for random seeds, it would also be secure on this input because these keys essentially uh, look as though they're independent of one another. We'll see how to do this analysis formally once we talk about these types of constructions. Since this two-time pad attack comes up so often in practice, it's such a common mistake, I want to give one more example where it comes up so you know how to avoid it. And the, the last example I want to give is in the context of disk encryption. So imagine we have a certain file, and maybe the file begins with, you know, the words to Bob. And then the, the contents of the file follows. When this is stored on disk, of course, the file is going to get, so here we have our disk here, the file is going to get broken into blocks. And each block will be, you know, when we actually store this on, on disk, you know, things will be encrypted. And, you know, so maybe two Bob will go into the first block. 
and then the rest of the content will go into the remaining blocks. But of course, this is all encrypted, so I'll kind of use these, these lines here to denote the fact that this is encrypted and an attacker looking at the disk has no idea what the contents of the message is. But now suppose that at a later time, user goes ahead and modifies, basically, you know, fires up the editor the, and modifies the file. So now instead of saying to Bob, it says to Eve and nothing else changes in the file. That's the only change that was made. When the user then saves this uh, modified file to disk, basically he's going to re-encrypt it again. And so the same thing is going to happen. The file is going to get broken into blocks. You know, now the file is going to say to Eve. And everything, of course, is going to be encrypted. So again, I'll uh, put these lines here. Now, an attacker looking at the disk, uh, taking a snapshot of the disk before the edit, and then looking again at the disk after the edit, what he will see is that the only thing that changed is this little segment here that's now different. Everything else looks exactly the same. So the attacker, even though he doesn't know what actually happened to the file, what's in the file, or what changed, he knows exactly the location where the edit took place. And so the fact that the one-time pad or a stream cipher encrypts one bit at a time means that if one change takes place, then it's very easy to tell where that uh, change occurred. And that leaks information that the attacker shouldn't actually learn. Ideally, you'd like to say that even if the file changed just a little bit, the entire contents of the file should change, or maybe at least the entire contents of the block should change. Here you can see that the attacker even knows within the block where the change was actually made. Okay, so in fact, uh, because of this, it's usually a bad idea to use stream ciphers for uh, disk encryption. And essentially, this is another example of a two-time pad attack because the same pad is used to encrypt two different messages. This, they happen to be very similar, but uh, nevertheless, these are two different messages, and the attacker can learn what the change was. And in fact, he might be able to even learn what the actual changed words uh, were as a result of this. Okay, so the lesson here is generally uh, we need to do something different for disk encryption. We'll talk about what to do for disk encryption in a later segment. But essentially, the one-time pad is generally not a good idea for encrypting blocks on disk. So just again, to summarize the two-time pad attack, we saw that you're supposed, I hope I've convinced you, that you're never, ever, ever supposed to use a stream cipher key more than once. Even though there are natural settings where that might happen, you have to take care and make sure that uh, you're not using the same key more than once. So for network traffic, typically what you're supposed to do is uh, every session would have its own key. Within the session, the message from the client to the server look as one complete stream. It would be encrypted using one key. The messages from the server to the client would be treated as one stream and encrypted using a different key. And then for disk encryption, typically you would not use a stream cipher because as changes are made to the file, you would be leaking information about the contents of the file. Okay, so that concludes our brief discussion of the two-time pad. Next attack I want to mention is a fact that the one-time pad and stream ciphers in general provide no integrity at all. All they do is they try to provide confidentiality when the key is only used once. They provide no integrity at all. But even worse than that, it's actually very easy to modify ciphertexts and have known effects on the corresponding plaintexts. So let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, this property, by the way, is called malleability, and we'll see what I mean by that in just a second. So imagine we have some message M that gets encrypted. So here, it gets encrypted using a stream cipher. And the ciphertext, of course, is then going to be uh, M, X, or K. Now, an attacker uh, intercepts the ciphertext. Well, that doesn't tell him what's, uh, what the plain text is. But what he can do is now, beyond eavesdropping, he can actually become an active attacker and modify the ciphertext. So when I say modify the ciphertext, let's suppose that he XORs the ciphertext with a certain value P. Let's call this the perturbation P. Uh, well, the resulting ciphertext then becomes M X or K X or P. So now let me ask you, when we decrypt the ciphertext, what is it going to decrypt to? Well, I hope everybody sees that manipulating XORs, basically the decryption becomes M X or P. So you notice that by XORing with this pad P, the attacker was able to have a very specific effect on the resulting plaintext. Okay? So to uh, summarize this, basically you can uh, modify the ciphertext. These modifications are undetected, but even worse, they're undetected. They have a very specific impact on the resulting plaintext. Namely, whatever you XOR the ciphertext with is going to have that exact effect on the plaintext. So to see where this can be dangerous, let's look at a particular example. Suppose the user sends an email uh, that starts from the words from Bob. 
Uh, and the attacker basically gets to intercept the corresponding ciphertext. Well, he doesn't know what the ciphertext is, but let's just, for sake of it, let's pretend that he actually knows that this message is actually from Bob. Uh, what he wants to do is he wants to modify the ciphertext so that the plain text would now look like it came from somebody else. Say he wants to make it look like this message actually came from Alice. All he has is the ciphertext. Well, what he can do is he can XOR it with a certain set of three characters. We'll see what those three characters are in just a second, such that the resulting ciphertext is actually an encryption of the message from Eve. And so that now, when the user decrypts that, all of a sudden, he'll see, hey, this message is from Eve. It's not, he'll think this message is from Eve, not from Bob, and that might cause you know, the wrong thing to take place. So here, the attacker, even though he himself could not have created a ciphertext that says from Eve, by modifying an existing ciphertext, all of a sudden, he was able to make the ciphertext that he could not have done without intercepting at least one ciphertext. So again, by intercepting one ciphertext, he was able to change it so that now it looks like it's from Eve rather than from Bob. So just to be specific, let's look at what these three characters need to be. So let's look at the word Bob, and I'm going to write it in ASCII. So Bob in ASCII corresponds to 42 hex, 6F hex, and 62 hex. So little b is encoded as 62, little o is encoded as 6F. Uh, the word Eve is encoded as 45 hex, 76 hex, and 65 hex. Now when I XOR these two words, I'm literally going to XOR them as bit strings, so Bob XOR Eve, it's not difficult to see that what I get is the three characters 0, 7, 19, and 0, 7. So really what these three characters here are going to be are simply 0, 7, 19, and 0, 7. And by XORing these three characters at the right positions into the ciphertext, the attacker was able to change the ciphertext to look like it came from Eve rather than from Bob. So this is an example where having a predictable impact on the ciphertext can actually cause quite a bit of problems. And this is this property called malleability. And we say that the Muntime pad is malleable because it's very easy to compute on ciphertexts and make prescribed changes to the corresponding plaintext. So to prevent all this, I'm going to do that actually in two or three lectures, and we're going to basically show how to add integrity to encryption mechanisms in general. But right now, I want you to remember that the one-time pad by itself has no integrity and is completely insecure against attackers that actually modify the ciphertexts. In this segment, I want to give a few examples of stream ciphers that are used in practice. I'm going to start with uh, two old examples that are actually are not supposed to be used in new systems, but nevertheless, they're still fairly widely used, and so I just want to mention the names so that you're familiar with these concepts. The first stream cipher I want to talk about is called RC4, designed back in 1987. And I'm only going to give you the high-level description of it, and then we'll talk about some weaknesses of RC4 and leave it at that. So RC4 takes a variable size seed. Here I just gave as an example where it would take 128 bits as uh, the seed size, which would then be used as the key for the stream cipher. The first thing it does is it expands the 128-bit secret key into 2048 bits, which are going to be used as the internal state for the generator. And then once it's done this expansion, it basically uh, executes a very simple loop where every iteration of this loop outputs one byte of output. So essentially, you can run the generator for as long as you want and generate one byte at a time. Now, RC4 is actually, as I said, fairly popular. It's used in the HTTPS protocol quite commonly, actually. These days, for example, Google uses RC4 in its HTTPS. Uh, and it's also used in web, as we discussed in the last segment. But of course, in web, it's used incorrectly, and it's completely insecure the way it's used inside of web. So over the years, some weaknesses have been found in RC4. And as a result, it's recommended that new projects actually not use RC4, but rather use a more modern pseudorandom generator, as, as we'll discuss towards the end of the segment. So let me just mention two of the weaknesses. So the first one is, it's kind of bizarre, basically. If you look at the second byte of the output of RC4, it turns out the second byte is slightly biased. If RC4 was completely random, the probability that the second byte happens to be equal to 0 would be exactly 1 over 256. There are 256 possible bytes. The probability that it's 0 should be 1 over 256. It so happens that for RC4, the probability is actually 2 over 256, which means that if you use the RC4 output to encrypt a message, the second byte is likely to not be encrypted at all. In other words, it'll be XORed with 0 
with twice the probability that it's supposed to. So 2 over 256 instead of 1 over 256. And by the way, I should say that there's nothing special about the second byte. It turns out the first and the third bytes are also biased. And in fact, it's now recommended that if you're going to use RC4, what you should do is ignore basically the first 256 bytes of the output and just start using the output of the generator starting from byte 257. The first couple of bytes turned out to be biased, so you just ignore them. The second attack that was discovered is that in fact, if you look at a very long output of RC4, it so happens that you're more likely to get the sequence 00. zero. In other words, you're more likely to get 16 bits, two bytes of 00, zero than you should. Again, if RC4 was completely random, the probability of seeing 00, zero would be exactly 1 over 256 squared. It turns out RC4 is a little biased, and the bias is 1 over 256 cubed. It turns out this bias actually starts after several gigabytes of data are produced by RC4, but nevertheless, this is something that can be used to predict the generator, and definitely it can be used to distinguish the output of the generator from truly random sequence. Basically, the fact that 0, 0 appears more often than it should gives a distinguisher. And then in the last segment, we talked about related key attacks that were used to attack WEP that basically say that if one uses keys that are closely related to one another, then it's actually possible to recover the root key. So these are the weaknesses that are known about RC4, and as a result, it's recommended that new systems actually not use RC4 and instead use a modern pseudorandom generator. Okay, the second example I want to give you is a badly broken stream cipher that's used for encrypting DVD movies. When you buy a DVD in the store, the actual movie is encrypted using a stream cipher called the Content Scrambling System, CSS. CSS turns out to be a badly broken stream cipher, and we can very easily break it, and I want to show you how the attack algorithm works. We're doing it so that you can see an example of an attack algorithm, but in fact, there are many uh, systems out there that basically use this attack to decrypt encrypted DVDs. So the CSS stream cipher is based on a, something that hardware designers like. It's designed to be a hardware stream cipher that's supposed to be easy to implement in hardware and is based on a mechanism called a linear feedback shift register. So a linear feedback shift register is basically a register that consists of cells where each cell contains one bit. And then basically what happens is there are these taps into certain cells, not all the cells, certain positions are called taps. And then these taps feed into an XOR, and then at every clock cycle, the shift register shifts to the left, the last bit falls off, and then the first bit becomes the uh, result of this XOR. So you can see that this is a very simple mechanism to implement in hardware. It takes very few transistors, just a shift right, the last bit falls off, and the first bit just becomes the XOR of the previous bits. So the seed for this LFSR basically is the initial state of the LFSR, initial state of LFSR, uh, and it's the basis of a number of dream ciphers. So here are some examples. So as I said, DVD encryption uses two LFSRs. I'll show you how that works in just a second. GSM encryption, uh, these are algorithms called A51 and A52. That uses three LFSRs. Bluetooth encryption is an algorithm called uh, E0. These are all stream ciphers, and that uses four LFSRs. Turns out all of these are badly broken and actually really should not be trusted for encrypting traffic, but they're all implemented in hardware, so it's a little difficult now to change what the hardware does. But the simplest of these, CSS, actually has a cute attack on it, so let me show you how the attack works. So let's describe how CSS actually works. So the key for CSS is five bytes namely 40 bits, 5 times 8 is 40 bits. The reason they had to limit themselves to only 40 bits is that DVD encryption was designed at a time where US export regulations only allowed for export of crypto algorithms where the key was only 40 bits. So the designers of CSS were already limited to very, very short keys, just 40-bit keys. So their design works as follows. Basically, CSS uses two LFSRs. One is a 17-bit LFSR, in other words, the register contains 17 bits, and the other one is a 25-bit LFSR. It's a little bit longer, 25-bit LFSR. And the way these LFSRs are seeded is as follows. So the key for the encryption basically looks as follows. You start off with a 1, and you can catenate to it the first two bytes of the key. First two bytes of the key. And that's the initial state of the LFSR. And then the second LFSR basically is initialized the same way. One concatenated the last three bytes of the key. 
three bytes of key and that's loaded into the initial state of the LFSR. You can see that the first two bytes are 16 bits plus leading one, that's 17 bits overall, whereas the second LFSR is 24 bits plus one, which is 25 bits. And you notice we used all five bits of the key. So then these LFSRs are basically run for eight cycles, so they generate eight bits of output, and then they go through this adder that does basically addition modulo 256. Yeah, so this is an addition box modulo 256. There's one more technical thing that happens. In fact, what's actually also added is the carry from the previous block, but that is not so important. That's a detail that's not so relevant. Okay, so every block, you notice we're doing addition modulo 256, so we're ignoring the carry, but the carry is basically added either at zero or one to the addition of the next block. Okay, and then basically this output one byte uh, per round. Okay, and this byte is then of course used, it's XORed with the appropriate byte of the movie that's being encrypted. Okay, so it's a very simple stream cipher, it takes very little hardware to implement, it'll run fast even on very cheap hardware, and it will encrypt movies. So it turns out this is easy to break in time roughly 2 to the 17, in roughly 2 to the 17 time. And let me show you how. So suppose you intercept a movie, so here we have a, an encrypted movie that you want to decrypt. So let's say that this is all encrypted, so you have no idea what's inside of here. However, it so happens that just because DVD encryption is using MPEG files, it so happens that you know a prefix of the plain text. Let's just say maybe this is 20 bytes. Well, we know that if you XOR these two things together, so in other words, you do the XOR here, what you'll get is the initial segment of the PRG. So you'll get the first 20 bytes of the output of CSS, the output of this PRG. Okay, so now here's what we're gonna do. So we have the first 20 bytes of the output, and now we do the following. We try all two to the 17 possible values of the first LFSR, okay, so two to the 17 possible values. So for each value, so for each of these two to the 17 initial values of the LFSR, we're gonna run the LFSR for 20 bytes. Okay, so we'll generate 20 bytes of outputs from this first LFSR, assuming for each one of the two to the 17 possible settings. Now, remember, we have the full output of the CSS system, so what we can do is we can take this output that we have and subtract it from the 20 bytes that we got from the first LFSR, and if, in fact, our guess for the initial state of the first LFSR is correct, what we should get is the first 20 byte output of the second LFSR, right? Because that's, by definition, what the output of the CSS system is. Now, it turns out that looking at a 20-byte sequence, it's very easy to tell whether this 20-byte sequence came from a 25-bit LFSR or not. If it didn't, then we know that our guess for the 17-bit LFSR was incorrect. And then we move on to the next guess for the 17-bit LFSR, and the next guess, and so on and so forth, until eventually we hit the right initial state for the 17-bit LFSR, and then we'll actually get, we'll see that the 20 bytes that we get as the candidate output for the 25-bit LFSR is in fact a possible output for a 25-bit LFSR, and then not only will we have learned the correct initial state for the 17-bit LFSR, we will have also learned the correct initial state of the 25-bit LFSR, and then we can predict the remaining outputs of CSS, and of course using that we can then decrypt the rest of the movie. We can actually recover the remaining plain text. Okay, this is things that we talked about before. So I said this a little quick, but hopefully it was clear. We are also going to be doing a homework exercise on this type of stream ciphers, and uh, you'll kind of get the point of how these attack algorithms work. And I should mention that there are many open source systems now that actually use this method to decrypt CSS encrypted data. Okay, so now that we've seen two weak examples, let's move on to better examples. And in particular, the better pseudo-random generators are, come from what's called the eStream project. This is a project that concluded in 2008, and they qualified basically five different stream ciphers. But here I want to present just one. So first of all, the parameters for these stream ciphers are a little different from what we're used to. So these stream ciphers, as normal, they have a seed, but in addition, they also have what's called a nonce. And we'll see what the nonce is used for 
in just a minute. So they take two inputs, a seed and a nonce. We'll see what the nonce is used for in just a second. And then, of course, they produce a very large output. So n here is much, much, much bigger than s. Now, when I say nonce, what I mean is a value that's never going to repeat as long as the key is fixed. And I'll explain that in more detail in just a second. But for now, just think of it as a unique value that never repeats as long as the key is the same. And so, of course, once you have this PRG, you would encrypt, you get a stream cipher just as before, except now, as you see, the PRG takes as input both the key and the nonce. And the property of the nonce is that the pair k comma r, so the key comma the nonce, is never, never repeats. It's never used more than once. So the bottom line is that you can reuse the key, reuse the key, because the nonce makes the pair unique, because k and r are only used once. I'll say they're unique. Okay, so this nonce is kind of a cute trick that saves us the trouble of moving to a new key every time. Okay, so the particular example from the e stream that I want to show you is uh, called Salsa 20. It's a stream cipher that's designed for both software implementations and hardware implementations. It's kind of interesting. You realize that some stream ciphers are designed for software, like RC4, Everything it does is designed to make software implementation run fast, whereas some other stream ciphers are designed for hardware, like CSS, using an LFSR, that's particularly designed to make hardware implementations very cheap. Salsa, the nice thing about that is that it's designed so that it's both easy to implement it in hardware, and its software implementation is also very fast. So let me explain how Salsa works. Well, Salsa takes either 128 or 256-bit keys. I'll only explain the 128-bit version of Salsa. So this is the seed. And then it also takes a nonce, just as before, which happens to be 64 bits, and then it'll generate a large output. Now, how does it actually work? Well, the function itself is defined as follows. Basically, given the key and the nonce, it will generate a very long, well, a long pseudo-random sequence as long as necessary. And it'll do it by using this function that I'll denote by h. This function h takes three inputs, basically the key, the, well, the seed k, the nonce r, and then a counter that increments from step to step. So it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, as long as we need it to be. Okay, so basically by evaluating this h on this kr, but using this incrementing counter, we can get a sequence that's as long as we want. So all I have to do is describe how this function h works. And let me do that here for you. The way it works is as follows. Well, we start off by expanding the state into something quite large, which is 64 bytes long. And we do it as follows. Basically, we stick a constant at the beginning. So there's tau zero. These are four bytes. It's a four byte constant. So the spec for salsa basically gives you the value for tau zero. Then we put k in, which is 16 bytes. Then we put another constant. Again, this is four bytes. And as I said, the spec basically specifies what this fixed constant is. Then we put the nonce, which is eight bytes. Then we put the index. This is the counter zero, one, two, three, four, which is another eight bytes. Then we put another constant, tau two, which is another four bytes. Then we put the key again. This is another 16 bytes. And then finally, we put a third constant, tau3, which is another 4 bytes. OK, so as I said, if you sum these up, you see that you get 64 bytes. So basically, we've expanded the key and the nonce and the counter into 64 bytes. Basically, the key is repeated twice, I guess. And then what we do is we apply a function. I'll call this function little h. OK, so we apply this function little h. And this is a function that's one-to-one, -one, so it maps 64 bytes to 64 bytes. And it's a completely invertible function. Okay, so this function h is, as I say, it's an invertible function. So given the input, you can get the output. And given the output, you can go back to the input. And it's designed specifically so it's A, easy to implement in hardware. And B, on an x86, it's extremely easy to implement because x86 has this SSE2 instruction sets which supports all the operations you need to do for this function. It's very, very fast. As a result, Salsa is a very fast stream cipher. And then it does this basically again and again. So it applies this function h again, it gets another 64 bytes, and so on and so forth. Basically, it does this 10 times. OK, so the whole thing here, I'll say, repeats 10 times. So basically, apply h 10 times. 
And then by itself, this is actually not quite random. It's not going to look random because, like we said, H is completely invertible. So given this final output, it's very easy to just invert H and go back to the original input and then test that the input has the right structure. So you do one more thing, which is to basically XOR the input and the final output. Actually, sorry, it's not an XOR, it's actually an addition. So you do an addition word by word. So there are 64 bytes, you do a word by word addition, four bytes at a time, and finally you get the 64 byte output. That's it. That's the whole pseudorandom generator. So that's the whole function little h, and as I explained, this whole construction here is the function big H, and then you evaluate big H by incrementing the counter i from 0, 1, 2, 3 onwards, and that will give you a pseudorandom sequence that's as long as you need it to be. And basically, there are no significant attacks on this. This has security that's very close to 2 to the 128. We'll see what that means more precisely later on. But it's a very fast stream cipher, both in hardware and in software. And as far as we can tell, it seems to be unpredictable as required for a stream cipher. So I should say that the eStream project actually has five stream ciphers like this. I only chose Salsa because I think it's the most elegant. But I can give you some performance numbers here. So you can see these are performance numbers on a 2.2 gigahertz, you know, x86 type machine. And you can see that RC4 actually is the slowest because essentially, well, it doesn't really take advantage of the hardware. It only does byte operations. And so there's a lot of wasted cycles that aren't being used. But the eStream candidates, both Salsa and another candidate called Sosa Manuk, I should say these are eStream finalists. These are actually stream ciphers that are approved by the eStream project. You can see that they achieve a significant rates. This is 643 megabytes per second on this architecture, more than enough for a movie, and uh, these are actually quite impressive rates. And so now you've seen examples of two old stream ciphers that shouldn't be used, including attacks on those stream ciphers. You've seen what the modern stream ciphers look like with this nonce and you see the performance numbers for these modern stream ciphers. So if you happen to need a stream cipher, you could use one of the eStream's finalists. In particular, you could use something like Salsa. In the next three segments, we will change gears a little bit and talk about the definition of a PRG. This definition is a really good way to think of a PRG, and we will see many applications for this definition. So consider a PRG with key space K that outputs n-bit strings. Our goal is to define what does it mean for the output of the generator to be indistinguishable from random. In other words, we're going to define a distribution that basically is defined by choosing a random key in the key space. Remember that uh, arrow with R above it means choosing uniformly from the set script K. And then we output basically the output of the generator. And what we'd like to say is that this distribution, this distribution of pseudo-random strings, is indistinguishable from a truly uniform distribution. In other words, if we just choose a truly uniform string in 0, 1 to the n and simply output this string, we'd like to say that these two distributions are indistinguishable from one another. Now if you think about it, this sounds really surprising because if we draw a circle here of all possible strings in 0, 1 to the n, then the uniform distribution basically can output any of these strings with equal probability. That's the definition of the uniform distribution. However, a pseudo-random distribution generated by this generator G, because the seed space is so small, the set of possible outputs is really, really small. It's tiny inside of uh, 0, 1 to the n, and this is really all that the generator can output. And yet, what we're arguing is that an adversary who looks at the output of the generator in this tiny set can't distinguish it from the output of the uniform distribution over the entire set. Okay, that's the property that we're actually shooting for. So to understand how to define this concept of indistinguishability from random, we need the concept of a statistical test. So let me define what a statistical test on 0, 1 to the n is. I'm going to define these statistical tests by the letter a. And a statistical test is basically an algorithm that takes as input an n-bit string and simply outputs 0 or 1. Now I'll tell you that zero, we're gonna think of it as though the statistical test said, the input you gave me is not random. And one, we're gonna think of it as saying that the input you gave me actually is random. Okay, so all the statistical test does is it basically takes the input X that was given to it, the n-bit string that was given to it, and decides whether it looks random or it doesn't look random. Let's look at a couple of examples. 
So the first example basically will use the fact that for a random string, the number of zeros is roughly equal to the number of ones in that string. In other words, the statistical test is going to say one if and only if basically the number of zeros in the given string x minus the number of ones in the given string x is these two numbers are not too far apart. In other words, the difference between the number of zeros and the number of ones, let's just say, is less than 10 times square root of n. Okay, so if the difference is less than 10 times square root of n, the statistical test will say, hey, the string x looks random. If the difference happens to be much bigger than 10 times square root of n, that starts to look suspicious, and then the statistical test will say, hey, the string you gave me does not look random. Okay, so this is our first example of a statistical test. Let's look at another similar example. We'll say here, the statistical test will say one, if and only if, say, the number of times that we have two consecutive zeros inside of x, well, let's think about this for a second. This basically, again, counts in the string of n bits, it counts the number of times that we see the pattern zero, zero, two consecutive zeros. Well, for a random string, we will expect to see zero, zero with probability one fourth, and therefore, in a random string, we'll expect about n over four zero zeros. Yeah, n over four blocks of zero, zero. And so, what the statistical test will do is it will say, well, if the number of zero, zeros is roughly n over four, in other words, the difference between the number and n over four is, say, less than 10 square root of n, then we will say that x looks random, and if the gap is much bigger than n over 4, we'll say, hey, this string doesn't really look random, and then the statistical test will output 0. Okay, so here are two examples of statistical tests that basically, for random strings, they will output 1 with very high probability. But for strings that, you know, don't look random, for example, think of the all 0 string. For the all 0 string, neither one of these tests will output a 1. And in fact, the all 0 string does not look random. Let's look at one more example of a statistical test, uh, just to kind of show you that basically statistical tests can pretty much do whatever they want. So here's a third example. Let's say that the statistical test outputs one, if and only if, uh, say the biggest block, so we'll, we'll call this the maximum run of zero inside of the string x. This is basically the longest sequence of zeros inside of the string x. In a random string, you expect the longest sequence of zeros to be roughly of length log n. So we'll say if the longest sequence of zero happens to be less than 10 times log n, then this test will say that x was random. But if all of a sudden we see a run of zeros that say is much bigger than 10 log n, then the statistical test will say the string is not random. Okay, so this is another crazy thing that the statistical test will do. By the way, you notice that if you give this test the all one string, so one, 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 this test will also output one. In other words, this test will think that the all one string is random, even though it's not. Yeah, even though the all one string is not particularly random. Okay, so statistical tests don't have to get things right. They can do whatever they like. They can test, they can decide to output random or not, you know, zero or one, however they like. And similarly, there are many, 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 many other statistical tests. There are literally hundreds of statistical tests that one can think of. And I can tell you that in the old days, basically the way you would define that something looks random is you would say, hey, here's a battery of statistical tests, and all of them said that this string looks random. Therefore, we say that this generator, the generator of the string, is a good generator. In other words, this definition that uses a fixed set of statistical tests is actually not a good definition for security, or more generally for crypto. But before we talk about actually defining security, the next thing we talk about is how do we evaluate whether a statistical test is good or not. So to do that, we define the concept of advantage. And so let me define the advantage. So here we have a generator that outputs n-bit strings, and we have a statistical test on n-bit strings. And we define the advantage of this generator, I'll denote it by advantage sub PRG, the advantage of the statistical test A relative to the generator G, I'll define it as follows. It's basically the difference between two quantities. The first quantity is basically we ask, how likely is the statistical test to output one when we give it a pseudo-random string? Okay, so here, k is chosen uniformly from the seed space. 
and we ask how likely is the statistical test to output 1 when we give it a pseudo-random output generated by the generator. Versus, now we ask how likely is the statistical test to output 1 when we give it a truly random string. So here R is truly random in 0, 1 to the n. Okay? And yeah, we look at the difference between these two quantities. Now you realize because these are differences of probabilities, this advantage is always going to lie in the interval 0, 1. So let's think a little bit about what this advantage actually means. So first of all, if the advantage happens to be close to 1, well, what does that mean? That means that somehow the statistical test A behaved differently when we gave it pseudo-random inputs, when we gave it the output of the generator, from when we gave it truly random inputs, right? It somehow behaved differently. In one case, it output 1 with a certain probability, and in the other case, it output 1 with a very different probability, okay? So somehow, it was able to behave differently, and what that really means is that the statistical test can basically distinguish the output of the generator from random. Okay, so in some sense we'll say that the statistical test broke the generator G because it was able to distinguish the output from random. However, if the advantage is close to zero, well, what does that mean? That means that basically the statistical test behaves pretty much the same on pseudo-random inputs as it does on truly random inputs. And basically there we would say that A could not distinguish the generator from random. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of intuition about why this concept of advantage is important. It basically tells us whether A was able to break the generator, namely distinguish it from random, or not able to break it. So let's look, first of all, at a very silly example. Suppose we have a statistical test A that simply ignores its inputs and always outputs zero. Okay, that always outputs zero. What do you think is the advantage of the statistical test relative to a generator G? So I hope everybody said the advantage is zero. Let me just explain why that's the case. Well, if the statistical test always outputs zero, that means that when we give a pseudo-random input, it will never output one. So the probability that it outputs one is zero. Similarly, when we give a truly random input, it still will never output one. And so the probability that it outputs one is zero. And so zero minus zero is zero. So its advantage is zero. So basically, in a statistical test that ignores its, its input is not able to distinguish truly random input from a pseudo-random input, obviously. Okay, so now let's look at a more interesting example. So suppose we have a generator G that satisfies a funny property. It so happens that for two-thirds of the keys, the first bit of the output of the generator happens to be one. Okay, so if I choose a random key with probability two-thirds, the generator will output one as its first bit. Okay, so that's the property of the generator that we're looking at. Now let's look at the following statistical test. The statistical test basically says, if the most significant bit of the string you gave me is one, I'm gonna say one, meaning I think it's random. If the most significant bit of the string you gave me is not one, well namely zero, I'm gonna say zero. Okay, so now my question to you is, what is the advantage of the statistical test on the generator G? Okay, so remember I just wrote down the definition here again and I'll let you think about this for a second. So let me explain. Suppose we give the statistical test pseudo-random input. By definition of G, we know that with probability two-thirds, the first bit in the input will start with the bit one. But if it starts with the bit one, then the statistical test will output one. In other words, the probability that the statistical test outputs one is exactly two-thirds. Now let's look at the case of a random string. If I give you a random string, how likely is it that the most significant bit of the random string is one? Well, for a random string, that happens exactly half the time. And so in this case, the statistical test will output one with probability one half. And so the overall advantage is one six, and one six is actually a non-negligible number. That's actually a fairly large number, which basically means that this A was able to distinguish the output. We'll say that A breaks the generator G with advantage one six. Okay, which basically means that this generator is no good, is broken. Okay, so now that we understand what statistical tests are, we can go ahead and define what is a secure pseudo-random generator. So basically we say that a generator G is secure if essentially no efficient statistical test can distinguish its output from random. More precisely, what we'll say is that basically for all efficient 
statistical tests A, statistical tests uh, A, it so happens that if I look at the advantage of the statistical test A relative to G, this advantage basically is negligible. Okay, so in other words, it's very close to zero, and as a result, this uh, statistical test was not able to distinguish the output from random, and that has to be true for all statistical tests. So this is a very, very pretty and elegant definition that says that a generator is secure not only if a particular battery of statistical tests says that the output looks random, but in fact, all efficient statistical tests will say the output looks random. Okay? One thing I'd like to point out is that the restriction to efficient statistical tests is actually necessary. If we ask that all statistical tests, regardless of whether they're efficient or not, not be able to distinguish the output from random, then, in fact, that cannot be satisfied. So in other words, if we took out the requirements that the test be efficient, then this definition would be unsatisfiable, and I'll leave this as a simple puzzle for you uh, to think about, but I'll, basically the fact is that restricting this definition to only efficient statistical tests is actually necessary for this to be satisfiable. Because now that we have a definition, the next question is, can we actually construct a generator and then prove that, in fact, it is a secure PRG? In other words, prove that no efficient statistical test can distinguish its output from random. And it turns out that the answer is we actually can't. In fact, it's not known if there are any provably secure PRGs. And I'll just say very briefly, the reason is that if you could prove that, is, that a particular generator is secure, that would actually imply that P is not equal to NP. And I don't want to dwell on this because I don't want to assume you guys know what P and NP are. But I'll just uh, tell you as a simple fact that in fact, if P is equal to NP, then it's very easy to show that there are no secure PRGs. And so if you could prove to me that a particular PRG is secure, that would imply that P is not equal to NP. Again, I will leave this to you as a simple puzzle to think about. But even though we can't actually rigorously prove that a particular PRG is secure, we still have lots and lots and lots of heuristic candidates, and we even saw some of those in the previous segment. Okay, now that we understand what is a secure PRG, I want to talk a little bit about some applications and implications of this definition. And so the first thing I want to show you is that in fact a secure PRG is necessarily unpredictable. In a previous segment, we talked about what it means for a generator to be unpredictable, and we said that basically what that means is that given a prefix of the output of the generator, it's impossible to predict the next bit of the output. Okay, so we'd like to show that if a generator is secure, then necessarily it means it's unpredictable. And so the way we're going to do that is using the contrapositive. That is, we're going to say that if you give me a generator that is predictable, then necessarily it's insecure. In other words, necessarily I can distinguish it from random. And so let's see, this is actually a very simple fact, and so let's see how we would do that. So suppose you give me a predictor. In other words, suppose you give me an efficient algorithm such that, in fact, if I give this algorithm the output of the generator, but I give it only the first i bits of the output, it's able to predict the next bit of the output. In other words, given the first i bits, it's able to predict the i plus first bit, and it does that with a certain probability. So let's say if we choose a random k from the key space, then clearly a dumb predictor would be able to predict the next bit with probability one half, simply just guess a bit. You'll be right with probability one half. However, this algorithm A is able to predict the next bit with probability half plus epsilon. So it's bounded away from a half, and in fact we require that this be true for some non-negligible epsilon. So for example, epsilon equals 1 over 1000 would already be a dangerous predictor because it can predict the next bits given a prefix with non-negligible advantage. Okay, so suppose we have such an algorithm. Let's see that we can use this algorithm to break our generator. In other words, to show that the generator is distinguishable from random and therefore is insecure. So what we'll do is we'll define a statistical test. So let's define a statistical test B as follows. Basically, B given a string x, what it will do is it will simply run algorithm A on the first i bits of the string x that it was given. And statistical test B is simply going to ask, was A successful in predicting the i plus first bit of the string? If it was successful, then it's going to output 1. And if it wasn't successful, then it's going to output 0. Okay, this is our statistical test. Let's put it in a box. 
So we can take it wherever we like, and we can run the statistical test on any n-bit string that's given to us as input. So now let's look at what happens. Suppose we give the statistical test a truly random string, so a truly random string r, and we ask what is the probability that the statistical test outputs 1. Well, for a truly random string, the i plus first bit is totally independent of the first i bits. So whatever this algorithm a is going to output is completely independent of what the i plus first bit of the string r is. And so whatever a outputs, the probability that it's going to be equal to some random bit xi plus 1, random independent bit xi plus 1, that probability is exactly 1 half. In other words, algorithm A simply has no information about what the bit xi plus 1 is, and so necessarily the probability that it's able to predict xi plus 1 is exactly 1 half. On the other hand, let's look at what happens when uh, we give our statistical tests a pseudo-random sequence. Okay, so now we're going to run uh, the statistical test on the output of the generator, and we ask how likely is it to output 1. Well, by definition of A, we know that when we give it the first i bits of the output of the generator, it's able to predict the next bit with probability half plus epsilon. So in this case, our statistical test B will output 1 with probability greater than half plus epsilon. And basically what this means is if we look at the advantage of our statistical tests over the generator G, it's basically uh, the difference between this quantity and that quantity. And the difference between the two, you can see, is clearly greater than an epsilon. So what this means is that if algorithm A is able to predict the next bit with advantage epsilon, then algorithm B is able to distinguish the output of the generator with advantage epsilon. Okay, so if A is a good predictor, B is a good statistical test that breaks the uh, generator. And as we said, the contrapositive of that is that if uh, G is a secure generator, then there are no good statistical tests, and as a result, there are no predictors. Okay, so, and which means that the generator is, as we said, unpredictable. Okay, so so far what we've seen is that if the generator is secure, necessarily it's impossible to predict the i plus first bit given the first i bits. Now, there's a very elegant and remarkable theorem uh, due to Yao back in 1982 that shows that, in fact, the converse is also true. In other words, if I give you a generator that's unpredictable, so you cannot predict the i plus first bit from the first i bits, and that's true for all i, that generator, in fact, is secure. Okay, so let me state the theorem a little bit more precisely. So here we have our generator that outputs n bit outputs. The theorem says the following, basically, for all bit positions, it's impossible to predict i plus first bit of the output given the first i bits, and that's true for all i. In other words, again, the generator is unpredictable for all bit positions. Then that, in fact, implies that the generator is a secure PRG. I want to paraphrase this in English, uh, and so the way to, to kind of interpret this result is to say that if basically these next bit predictors, these predictors that try to predict the i plus first bit given the first i bits, if they're not able to distinguish G from random, then in fact no statistical test can distinguish G from random. So kind of next bit predictors are in some sense universal uh, predictors when it comes to distinguishing things from random. This theorem, by the way, it's not too difficult to prove, but there's a very elegant idea behind its proof. I'm not going to do the proof here, but I encourage you to think about this as a puzzle and try to kind of prove this theorem yourself. Let me show you kind of one cute implication of this theorem. So let, let me ask you the following question. Suppose I give you a generator, and I tell you that given the last bit of the outputs, it's easy to predict the first bit of the outputs. Okay, so given the last n bits, you can compute the first n bits. That's kind of the opposite of predictability, right? Predictability means given the first bits, you can produce the next bits. Here, given the last bits, you can produce the first ones. And my question to you, does that mean that uh, the generator is predictable? Can you somehow, from this fact, still build a predictor for this generator? So this is kind of a simple application of Yao's theorem, and let me explain to you, the answer is actually yes, let me explain why. Uh, how do we build this generator? Well, actually, we're not going to build it. I'm just going to show you that the generator exists. Well, because uh, the last n over 2 bits imply the first n over 2 bits, that necessarily means that the generator, here, let me write it this way, that necessarily means that G is not secure. Because just as we did before, it's very easy to build a statistical test that will distinguish the output of G from uniform. So G is not secure. 
But if G is not secure, by Yao's theorem, that means that G is predictable. So in other words, there exists some I for which, given the first I bits of the output, you can build the I plus first bit of the output. Okay, and so even though I can't quite point to you to a predictor, we know that a predictor must exist. So that's a one cute, simple application of uh, Yao's theorem. Now, before we uh, end this segment, I want to kind of uh, generalize a little bit what we did and introduce a little bit of important notation that's going to be useful actually throughout. So we're going to generalize the concept of indistinguishability from uniform to indistinguishability of two general distributions. So suppose I give you P1 and P2, and we ask, can these two distributions be distinguished? And so we'll say that the distributions are computationally indistinguishable, and we'll denote this by P1 is quigly P, uh, P2. This means that in polynomial time, P1 cannot be distinguished from P2. And we'll say that they're indistinguishable basically just as before, if basically for all uh, efficient uh, statistical tests, statistical tests A, it so happens that if I sample from the distribution P1 and I give the output to A versus if I sample from uh, the distribution P2 and I give the sample to A, then basically A behaves the same in both cases. In other words, the difference between these two probabilities is negligible. And this has to be true for all statistical tests, for all efficient statistical tests. Okay, so if this is the case, then we say that, uh, well, A couldn't distinguish, its advantage in distinguishing two distributions is negligible, and if that's true for all efficient statistical tests, then we say that the two distributions are basically computationally indistinguishable, because an efficient algorithm cannot distinguish them. And just to show you how uh, useful this notation is, basically using this notation, the definition of security for a PRG just says that if I give you a pseudo-random distribution, in other words, I choose k at random and then output a g of k, that distribution is computationally indistinguishable from the uniform distribution. So you can see this, this very simple notation captures the whole definition of pseudo-random generators. Okay, so we're going to make use of this notation in the next segment when we define uh, what does it mean for a cipher to be secure. In this segment, I want to give a few examples of stream ciphers that are used in practice. I'm going to start with uh, two old examples that are actually are not supposed to be used in new systems, but nevertheless, they're still fairly widely used, and so I just want to mention the names so that you're familiar with these concepts. The first stream cipher I want to talk about is called RC4, designed back in 1987. And I'm only going to give you the high-level description of it, and then we'll talk about some weaknesses of RC4 and leave it at that. So RC4 takes a variable size seed. Here I just gave as an example where it would take 128 bits as uh, the seed size, which would then be used as the key for the stream cipher. The first thing it does is it expands the 128-bit secret key into 2048 bits, which are going to be used as the internal state for the generator. And then once it's done this expansion, it basically uh, executes a very simple loop where every iteration of this loop outputs one byte of output. So essentially, you can run the generator for as long as you want and generate one byte at a time. Now, RC4 is actually, as I said, fairly popular. It's used in the HTTPS protocol quite commonly, actually. These days, for example, Google uses RC4 in its HTTPS. Uh, and it's also used in WEP, as we discussed in the last segment. But of course, in WEP, it's used incorrectly, and it's completely insecure the way it's used inside of WEP. So over the years, some weaknesses have been found in RC4. And as a result, it's recommended that new projects actually not use RC4, but rather use a more modern pseudo-random generator, as, as we'll discuss towards the end of the segment. So let me just mention two of the weaknesses. So the first one is, it's kind of bizarre, basically. If you look at the second byte of the output of RC4, it turns out the second byte is slightly biased. If RC4 was completely random, the probability that the second byte happens to be equal to zero would be exactly 1 over 256. There are 256 possible bytes. The probability that it's zero should be 1 over 256. It so happens that for RC4, the probability is actually 2 over 256, which means that if you use the RC4 output to encrypt a message, the second byte is likely to not be encrypted at all. In other words, it'll be XOR with zero with twice the probability that it's supposed to. So 2 over 256 instead of 1 over 256. 
And by the way, I should say that there's nothing special about the second byte. It turns out the first and the third bytes are also biased. And in fact, it's now recommended that if you're going to use RC4, what you should do is ignore basically the first 256 bytes of the output and just start using the output of the generator starting from byte 257. The first couple of bytes turned out to be biased, so you just ignore them. The second attack that was discovered is that in fact, if you look at a very long output of RC4, it so happens that you're more likely to get the sequence 00. zero. In other words, you're more likely to get 16 bits, two bytes of 00, zero than you should. Again, if RC4 was completely random, the probability of seeing 00, zero would be exactly 1 over 256 squared. It turns out RC4 is a little biased, and the bias is 1 over 256 cubed. It turns out this bias actually starts after several gigabytes of data are produced by RC4, but nevertheless, this is something that can be used to predict the generator, and definitely it can be used to distinguish the output of the generator from truly random sequence. Basically, the fact that 0, 0 appears more often than it should gives a distinguisher. And then in the last segment, we talked about related key attacks that were used to attack WEP that basically say that if one uses keys that are closely related to one another, then it's actually possible to recover the root key. So these are the weaknesses that are known about RC4, and as a result, it's recommended that new systems actually not use RC4 and instead use a modern pseudorandom generator. Okay, the second example I want to give you is a badly broken stream cipher that's used for encrypting DVD movies. When you buy a DVD in the store, the actual movie is encrypted using a stream cipher called the Content Scrambling System, CSS. CSS turns out to be a badly broken stream cipher, and we can very easily break it, and I want to show you how the attack algorithm works. We're doing it so that you can see an example of an attack algorithm, but in fact, there are many uh, systems out there that basically use this attack to decrypt encrypted DVDs. So the CSS stream cipher is based on a, something that hardware designers like. It's designed to be a hardware stream cipher that's supposed to be easy to implement in hardware and is based on a mechanism called a linear feedback shift register. So a linear feedback shift register is basically a register that consists of cells where each cell contains one bit. And then basically what happens is there are these taps into certain cells, not all the cells, certain positions are called taps. And then these taps feed into an XOR, and then at every clock cycle, the shift register shifts to the left, the last bit falls off, and then the first bit becomes the uh, result of this XOR. So you can see that this is a very simple mechanism to implement in hardware. It takes very few transistors, just a shift right, the last bit falls off, and the first bit just becomes the XOR of the previous bits. So the seed for this LFSR basically is the initial state of the LFSR, initial state of LFSR, uh, and it's the basis of a number of dream ciphers. So here are some examples. So as I said, DVD encryption uses two LFSRs. I'll show you how that works in just a second. GSM encryption, uh, these are algorithms called A51 and A52. That uses three LFSRs. Bluetooth encryption is an algorithm called uh, E0. These are all stream ciphers, and that uses four LFSRs. Turns out all of these are badly broken and actually really should not be trusted for encrypting traffic, but they're all implemented in hardware, so it's a little difficult now to change what the hardware does. But the simplest of these, CSS, actually has a cute attack on it, so let me show you how the attack works. So let's describe how CSS actually works. So the key for CSS is five bytes, namely 40 bits, five times eight is 40 bits. The reason they had to limit themselves to only 40 bits is that DVD encryption was designed at a time where US export regulations only allowed for export of crypto algorithms where the key was only 40 bits. So the designers of CSS were already limited to very, very short keys, just 40-bit keys. So their design works as follows. Basically, CSS uses two LFSRs. One is a 17-bit LFSR. In other words, the register contains 17 bits. And the other one is a 25-bit LFSR. It's a little bit longer, 25-bit LFSR. And the way these LFSRs are seeded is as follows. So the key for the encryption basically looks as follows. You start off with a one and you can catenate to it the first two bytes of the key. First two bytes of the key. And that's the initial state of the LFSR. And then the second LFSR basically is initialized the same way. One concatenated the last three bytes of the key. 
three bytes of key, and that's loaded into the initial state of the LFSR. You can see that the first two bytes are 16 bits plus leading one, that's 17 bits overall, whereas the second LFSR is 24 bits plus one, which is 25 bits. And you notice we used all five bits of the key. So then these LFSRs are basically run for eight cycles, so they generate eight bits of output, and then they go through this adder that does basically addition modulo 256. Yeah, so this is an addition box modulo 256. There's one more technical thing that happens. In fact, what's actually also added is the carry from the previous block, but that is not so important. That's a detail that's not so relevant. Okay, so every block, you notice we're doing addition modulo 256, so we're ignoring the carry, but the carry is basically added either at zero or one to the addition of the next block. Okay, and then basically this output one byte uh, per round. Okay, and this byte is then of course used, it's XORed with the appropriate byte of the movie that's being encrypted. Okay, so it's a very simple stream cipher, it takes very little hardware to implement, it'll run fast even on very cheap hardware, and it will encrypt movies. So it turns out this is easy to break in time roughly 2 to the 17. In roughly 2 to the 17 time. And let me show you how. So suppose you intercept a movie. So here we have uh, an encrypted movie that you want to decrypt. So let's say that this is all encrypted. So you have no idea what's inside of here. However, it so happens that just because DVD encryption is using MPEG files, it so happens that you know a prefix of the plain text. Let's just say maybe this is 20 bytes. Well, we know that if you XOR these two things together, so in other words, you do the XOR here, what you'll get is the initial segment of the PRG. So you'll get the first 20 bytes of the output of CSS, the output of this PRG. Okay, so now here's what we're gonna do. So we have the first 20 bytes of the output. And now we do the following. We try all two to the 17 possible values of the first LFSR, okay, so 2 to the 17 possible values. So for each value, so for each of these 2 to the 17 initial values of the LFSR, we're going to run the LFSR for 20 bytes, okay? So we'll generate 20 bytes of outputs from this first LFSR, assuming for each one of the 2 to the 17 possible settings. Now, remember, we have the full output of the CSS system. So what we can do is we can take this output that we have and subtract it from the 20 bytes that we got from the first LFSR. And if, in fact, our guess for the initial state of the first LFSR is correct, what we should get is the first 20 byte output of the second LFSR, right? Because that's, by definition, what the output of the CSS system is. Now, it turns out that looking at a 20-byte sequence, it's very easy to tell whether this 20-byte sequence came from a 25-bit LFSR or not. If it didn't, then we know that our guess for the 17-bit LFSR was incorrect. And then we move on to the next guess for the 17-bit LFSR, and the next guess, and so on and so forth, until eventually we hit the right initial state for the 17-bit LFSR, and then we'll actually get, we'll see that the 20 bytes that we get as the candidate output for the 25-bit LFSR is in fact a possible output for a 25-bit LFSR. And then not only will we have learned the correct initial state for the 17-bit LFSR, we will have also learned the correct initial state of the 25-bit LFSR. And then we can predict the remaining outputs of CSS. And of course, using that, we can then decrypt the rest of the movie. We can actually recover the remaining plain text. Okay, this is things that we talked about before. So I said this a little quick, but hopefully it was clear. We are also going to be doing a homework exercise on this type of stream ciphers, and uh, you'll kind of get the point of how these attack algorithms work. And I should mention that there are many open source systems now that actually use this method to decrypt CSS encrypted data. Okay, so now that we've seen two weak examples, let's move on to better examples. And in particular, the better pseudo-random generators are, come from what's called the eStream project. This is a project that concluded in 2008, and they qualified basically five different stream ciphers. But here I want to present just one. So first of all, the parameters for these stream ciphers are a little different from what we're used to. So these stream ciphers, as normal, they have a seed, 
But in addition, they also have what's called a nonce. And we'll see what a nonce is used for in just a minute. So they take two inputs, a seed and a nonce. We'll see what the nonce is used for in just a second. And then, of course, they produce a very large output. So n here is much, much, much bigger than s. Now, when I say nonce, what I mean is a value that's never going to repeat as long as the key is fixed. And I'll explain that in more detail in just a second. But for now, just think of it as a unique value that never repeats as long as the key is the same. And so, of course, once you have this PRG, you would encrypt, you get a stream cipher just as before, except now, as you see, the PRG takes as input both the key and the nonce. And the property of the nonce is that the pair K comma R, so the key comma the nonce, is never, never repeats. It's never used more than once. So the bottom line is that you can reuse the key, reuse the key, because the nonce makes the pair unique, because K and R are only used once. I'll say they're unique. Okay, so this nonce is kind of a cute trick that saves us the trouble of moving to a new key every time. Okay, so the particular example from the E stream that I want to show you is uh, called Salsa 20. It's a stream cipher that's designed for both software implementations and hardware implementations. It's kind of interesting. You realize that some stream ciphers are designed for software, like RC4, Everything it does is designed to make software implementation run fast, whereas some other stream ciphers are designed for hardware, like CSS, using an LFSR, that's particularly designed to make hardware implementations very cheap. Salsa, the nice thing about that is that it's designed so that it's both easy to implement it in hardware, and its software implementation is also very fast. So let me explain how Salsa works. Well, Salsa takes either 128 or 256-bit keys. I'll only explain the 128-bit version of Salsa. So this is the seed. And then it also takes a nonce, just as before, which happens to be 64 bits, and then it'll generate a large output. Now, how does it actually work? Well, the function itself is defined as follows. Basically, given the key and the nonce, it will generate a very long, well, a long pseudo-random sequence as long as necessary. And it'll do it by using this function that I'll denote by h. This function h takes three inputs, basically the key, the, well, the seed k, the nonce r, and then a counter that increments from step to step. So it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, as long as we need it to be. Okay, so basically by evaluating this h on this kr, but using this incrementing counter, we can get a sequence that's as long as we want. So all I have to do is describe how this function h works. And let me do that here for you. The way it works is as follows. Well, we start off by expanding the state into something quite large, which is 64 bytes long. And we do it as follows. Basically, we stick a constant at the beginning. So there's tau zero. These are four bytes. It's a four byte constant. So the spec for salsa basically gives you the value for tau zero. Then we put k in, which is 16 bytes. Then we put another constant. Again, this is four bytes. And as I said, the spec basically specifies what this fixed constant is. Then we put the nonce, which is eight bytes. Then we put the index. This is the counter zero, one, two, three, four, which is another eight bytes. Then we put another constant, tau two, which is another four bytes. Then we put the key again. This is another 16 bytes. And then finally, we put a third constant, tau3, which is another four bytes. OK, so as I said, if you sum these up, you see that you get 64 bytes. So basically, we've expanded the key and the nonce and the counter into 64 bytes. Basically, the key is repeated twice, I guess. And then what we do is we apply a function. I'll call this function little h. OK, so we apply this function little h. And this is a function that's one to one, so it maps 64 bytes to 64 bytes. And it's a completely invertible function. Okay, so this function h is, as I say, it's an invertible function. So given the input, you can get the output, and given the output, you can go back to the input. And it's designed specifically so it's a easy to implement in hardware, and b on an x86, it's extremely easy to implement because x86 has this SSE2 instruction sets which supports all the operations you need to do for this function. It's very, very fast. As a result, Salsa is a very fast stream cipher. And then it does this basically again and again. So it applies this function h again, it gets another 64 bytes, and so on and so forth. Basically, it does this 10 times. Okay, so the whole thing here, I'll say, repeats 10 times. So basically, 
apply h 10 times and then by itself this is actually not quite random it's not going to look random because like we said h is completely invertible so given this final output it's very easy to just invert h and go back to the original input and then test that the input has the right structure so you do one more thing which is to basically xor the input and the final output actually sorry it's not an xor it's actually an addition so you do an addition word by word so there are 64 bytes you do a word by word addition four bytes at a time and finally you get the 64 byte output that's it that's the whole pseudo random generator so that's the whole function little h and as i explained this whole construction here is the function big h and then you evaluate big h by incrementing the counter i from 0 1 2 3 onwards and that will give you a pseudo random sequence that's as long as you need it to be and basically, there are no significant attacks on this. This has security that's very close to 2 to the 128. We'll see what that means more precisely later on. But it's a very fast stream cipher, both in hardware and in software. And as far as we can tell, it seems to be unpredictable as required for a stream cipher. So I should say that the eStream project actually has five stream ciphers like this. I only chose Salsa because I think it's the most elegant. But I can give you some performance numbers here. So you can see these are performance numbers on a 2.2 gigahertz, you know, x86 type machine. And you can see that RC4 actually is the slowest because essentially, well, it doesn't really take advantage of the hardware. It only does byte operations. And so there's a lot of wasted cycles that aren't being used. But the eStream candidates, both Salsa and another candidate called Sosa Manuk, I should say these are eStream finalists. These are actually stream ciphers that are approved by the eStream project. You can see that they achieve a significant rates. This is 643 megabytes per second on this architecture, more than enough for a movie, and uh, these are actually quite impressive rates. And so now you've seen examples of two old stream ciphers that shouldn't be used, including attacks on those stream ciphers. You've seen what the modern stream ciphers look like with this nonce and you see the performance numbers for these modern stream ciphers. So if you happen to need a stream cipher, you could use one of the eStreams finalists. In particular, you could use something like Salsa. My goal for the next two segments is to show you that if we use a secure PRG, we get a secure stream cipher. The first thing we have to do is define what does it mean for a stream cipher to be secure. So whenever we define security, we always define it in terms of what can the attacker do and what is the attacker trying to do. In the context of stream ciphers, remember these are only used with a one-time key and as a result, the most the attacker is ever going to see is just one ciphertext encrypted using the key that we're using. And so we're going to limit the attacker's abilities to basically obtain just one ciphertext. And in fact, later on, we're going to allow the attacker to do much, much, much more. But for now, we're just going to give him one ciphertext. And we want to define what does it mean for the cipher to be secure. So the first definition that comes to mind is basically to say, well, maybe we want to require that the attacker can't actually recover the secret key. Okay, so given the ciphertext, you shouldn't be able to recover the secret key. But that's a terrible definition because think about the following brilliant cipher. So you'll hear, but the way we encrypt a message using a key K is basically we just output the message. Okay, this is a brilliant cipher. Yeah, of course, it doesn't do anything. Given a, a message, it just outputs the message as the ciphertext. So this is not a particularly good encryption scheme. However, given the ciphertext, namely the message, the poor attacker cannot recover the key because he doesn't know what the key is. And so as a result, this cipher, which clearly is insecure, would be considered secure under this uh, requirement for security. So this definition will be no good. Okay, Just recovering the secret key is the wrong way to define security. So the next thing we can try and attempt is basically to say, well, maybe the attacker doesn't care about the secret key. What he really cares about is the plaintext. So maybe it should be hard for the attacker to recover the entire plaintext. But even that doesn't work, because let's think about the following encryption scheme. So suppose what this encryption scheme does is it takes two messages, so I'm going to use uh, two lines to denote the concatenation of two messages. M0 line line M1 means concatenate M0 and M1. And imagine what the scheme does is really it outputs M0 in the clear and concatenates to that the encryption of M1, perhaps even using the one-time pad. Okay? And so here the attacker is going to be given one ciphertext and his goal would be to recover the entire plaintext. But the poor attacker can't do that because here maybe we encrypted M1 using the one-time pad, so the attacker can't actually recover M1 because we know the one-time pad 
is secure given just one ciphertext. So this construction would satisfy the definition, but unfortunately, clearly, this is not a secure encryption scheme because we just leaked half of the plaintext. M0 is completely available to the attacker. So even though he can't recover all of the plaintext, he might be able to recover most of the plaintext, and that's clearly insecure. So of course, we already know the solution to this, and we talked about Shannon's definition of security, perfect secrecy, where Shannon's idea was that in fact, when the attacker intercepts a ciphertext, he should learn absolutely no information about the plaintext. He shouldn't even learn one bit about the plaintext, or even he shouldn't learn, uh, he shouldn't even be able to predict a little bit about a bit of the plaintext. Absolutely no information about the plaintext. So let's recall very briefly Shannon's concept of perfect secrecy. Basically, we said that, you know, given a cipher, uh, we said the cipher has perfect secrecy. If given two messages of the same length, it so happens that the distribution of ciphertexts, yeah, if we pick a random key and we look at the distribution of ciphertexts, we encrypt M0, we get exactly the same distribution as when we encrypt M1. The intuition here was that if the adversary observes the ciphertext, then he doesn't know whether it came from the distribution, the result of encrypting M0, or it came from the distribution as the result of encrypting M1. And as a result, he can't tell whether we encrypted M0 or M1. And that's true for all messages of the same length. And as a result, the poor attacker doesn't really know what message was encrypted. Of course, we already said that this definition is too strong in the sense that it requires really long keys. If cipher that has short keys can't possibly uh, satisfy this definition, and in particular, stream ciphers can satisfy this definition. Okay, so let's try to weaken the definition a little bit, and let's think to the previous segment, and we can say that instead of requiring that the two distributions be absolutely identical, what we can require is that the two distributions just be computationally indistinguishable. In other words, a poor, uh, efficient attacker cannot distinguish the two distributions, even though the distributions might be very, very, very different. But just given a sample for one distribution and a sample from another distribution, the attacker can't tell which distribution he was given a sample from. It turns out this definition is actually almost right, but it's still a little too strong. This still cannot be satisfied. So we have to add one more constraint, and that is that instead of saying that this definition should hold for all M0, M1, it needs to hold for only pairs M0, M1 that the attacker can actually exhibit. Okay, so this actually leads us to the definition of semantic security. And so, again, this is semantic security for a one-time key. In other words, when the attacker is only given one ciphertext. And so the way we define semantic security is by defining two experiments. Okay, we'll define experiment zero and experiment one. And more generally, we'll think of these as experiment parenthesis B, where B can be zero or one. Okay, so the way the experiment is defined is as follows. We have an adversary that's trying to break the system, an adversary A. That's kind of the analog of a statistical test in the world of pseudo-random generators. And then the challenger does the following. So really we have two challengers, but the challengers are so similar that we can just describe them as a single challenger that in one case takes as inputs the bit set to zero, and the other case takes as input the bit set to one. And let me show you what these challengers do. The first thing the challenger is gonna do is it's gonna pick a random key, and then the adversary basically is gonna output two messages, M0 and M1. Okay, so this is an explicit pair of messages that the attacker wants to be challenged on. And as usual, we're not trying to hide the length of the messages. We require that the messages be uh, equal length. And then the challenger basically will output either the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. Okay, so in experiment zero, the challenger will output the encryption of M0. In experiment one, the challenger will output the encryption of M1. Okay, so that's the difference between the two experiments. And then the adversary is trying to guess, basically, whether he was given the encryption of M0 or given the encryption of M1. Okay, so here's a little bit of notation. Let's define the event WB to be the event that in experiment B, the adversary output one. Okay, so that's just an event that basically in experiment zero, W0 means that the adversary output one. In experiment one, W1 means the adversary output one. And now we can define the advantage of this adversary, basically to say what well, this is called the semantic security advantage of the adversary A against the scheme E to be the difference of the probability of these two events. In other words, we're looking at whether the adversary behaves differently when he was given the encryption of M0 from when he was given the encryption of M1. 
And I want to make sure this is clear, so I'm going to say it one more time. So in experiment 0, he was given the encryption of M0. In experiment 1, he was given the encryption of M1. Now, we're just interested in whether the adversary output 1 or not in these experiments. If in both experiments, the adversary output 1 with the same probability, that means that the adversary wasn't able to distinguish the two experiments. Experiment 0 basically looks to the adversary the same as experiment 1, because in both cases it output 1 with the same probability. However, if the adversary is able to output 1 in one experiment with significantly different probability than in the other experiment, then the adversary was actually able to distinguish the two experiments. Okay? So, to say this uh, more formally, essentially the advantage, again, because it's a difference of two probabilities, the advantage is a number between 0 and 1. If the advantage is close to 0, that means that the adversary was not able to distinguish experiment 0 from experiment 1. However, if the advantage is close to 1, that means the adversary was very well able to distinguish experiment 0 from experiment 1, and that really means that he was able to distinguish an, an encryption of M0 from an encryption of M1. Okay, so that's our definition. Actually, th that's just the definition of the advantage. And then the definition is just what you would expect. Basically, we'll say that a symmetric encryption scheme is semantically secure. If for all efficient adversaries, here I'll put this in quotes again, for all efficient adversaries, the advantage is uh, negligible. In other words, no efficient adversary can distinguish the encryption of M0 from the encryption of M1. And basically this is what it says repeatedly that for these two messages that the adversary was able to exhibit, uh, he wasn't able to distinguish these two distributions. Now, I want to show you, this is actually a very elegant definition. It might not seem so right away, but I want to show you some implications of this definition, and you'll see exactly why the definition is the way it is. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So the first example is, suppose we have a broken encryption scheme. In other words, suppose we have an adversary A, that somehow, given the ciphertext, he's always able to deduce the least significant bit of the plaintext. Okay, so given the encryption of M0, this adversary is able to deduce the least significant bit of M0. So that's a terrible encryption scheme, because it basically leaks the least significant bit of the plaintext, just given the ciphertext. So I want to show you that the scheme, is therefore, is not semantically secure. So that kind of shows that if a system is semantically secure, then there is no attacker of this type. Okay, so let's see why is the system not semantically secure. Well, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically use our adversary, who's able to learn the least significant bits, we're going to use him to break semantic security. So we're going to use him to distinguish experiment 0 from experiment 1. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're algorithm B. We're going to build algorithm B. And this algorithm B is going to use algorithm A in its belly. Okay, so the first thing that's going to happen is of course the challenger is going to choose a random key. The first thing that's going to happen is we need to output two messages. The messages that we're going to output basically are going to have different least significant bits. So one message is going to end with zero and one message is going to end with one. Now what is the challenger going to do? The challenger is going to give us the encryption of either M0 or M1, depending on whether we're in experiment zero or in experiment one. And then we just forward this ciphertext to the adversary. Okay, to so adversary A. Now, what's the property of adversary A? Given the ciphertext, adversary A can tell us what the least significant bit of the plaintext is. In other words, the adversary is going to output the least significant bit of M0 or M1. But lo and behold, that's basically the bit B. And then we're just going to output that as our guess. So let's call this thing B prime. Okay, so now this describes the semantic security adversary. And now you tell me, what is the semantic security advantage of this adversary? Well, so let's see. So in experiment 0, what's the probability that adversary B outputs 1? Well, in experiment 0, it's always given the encryption of M0. And therefore, adversary A was always output the least significant bit of M0, which happens to be 0. In experiment 0, B always outputs 0. So the probability that it outputs 1 is 0. However, in experiment 1, we're given the encryption of M1. So how likely is adversary B to output 1 in experiment 1? Well, it always outputs 1, again, by the properties of algorithm A. And therefore, the advantage basically is 1. So this is a huge advantage. It's as big as it's going to get, which means that this adversary completely broke the system.
Okay, so we consider, so under semantic security, basically just deducing the least significant bits is enough to completely break the system under a semantic security definition. Okay, now the interesting thing here, of course, is that this is not just about uh, the least significant bit. In fact, take any predicate of the message, for example, the most significant bit, you know, bit number seven, maybe the XOR of all the bits in the message, and so on and so forth. Any kind of information, any bits about the plain text that can be learned basically would mean that the system is not semantically secure. So basically all the adversary have to do would be to come up with two messages, M0 and M1, such that under one thing that A learns, it's the value zero, and under the other thing, the value is one. So for example, if A was able to learn the XOR of all the bits of the message, then M0 and M1 would just have different XORs for all the bits of their messages, and then this adversary A would also be sufficient to break semantic security. Okay, so basically if a cipher is semantically secure, then no bit of information is revealed to an efficient adversary. Okay, so this is exactly the concept of perfect secrecy, only applied just to efficient adversaries rather than all adversaries. So the next thing I want to show you is that, in fact, the one-time pad, in fact, is semantically secure. It better be semantically secure because it's, in fact, it's more than that. It's perfectly secure. So let's see why that's true. Well, so again, it's one of these experiments. So suppose we have an adversary that claims to break semantic security of the one-time pad. The first thing the adversary is going to do is he's going to output two messages, M0 and M1, of the same length. Now, what does he get back as a challenge? As a challenge, he gets either the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1 under the one-time pad. And he's trying to distinguish between those two possible ciphertexts that he gets, right? In experiment 0, he gets the encryption of M0. In experiment 1, he gets the encryption of M1. Well, so let me ask you, so what is the advantage of adversary A against the one-time pad? So remember, the property of the one-time pad is that KXOR M0 is distributed identically to KXOR M1. In other words, these distributions are absolutely identical distribution. Distributions, identical. This is a property of XOR. If we XOR the random pad K with anything, either M0 or M1, we get uniform distribution. So in both cases, algorithm A is given as input exactly the same distribution, namely the uniform distribution on ciphertexts. And therefore, it's going to behave exactly the same in both cases, because it was given the same distribution as input. And as a result, its advantage is zero, which means that the one-time pad is semantically secure. Now, the interesting thing here is not only is it semantically secure, it's semantically secure for all adversaries. We don't even have to restrict the adversaries to be efficient. No adversary, it doesn't matter how smart you are, no adversary will be able to distinguish KX or M0 for KX or M1, because the two distributions are identical. Okay, so the one-time pad is semantically secure. Okay, so that completes our definition of the, a semantic security. And the next thing we're going to do is prove that a secure PRG, in fact, implies that the stream cipher is semantically secure. So now that we understand what a secure PRG is, and we understand what semantic security means, we can actually argue that a stream cipher with a secure PRG is, in fact, semantically secure. So that's our goal for this uh, segment. It's a fairly straightforward proof, and we'll see how it goes. So the theorem we want to prove is that basically given a generator G that happens to be a secure uh, pseudorandom generator, in fact, the stream cipher that's derived from this generator is going to be semantically secure. Okay, and I want to emphasize that there was no hope of proving a theorem like this for perfect secrecy, for Shannon's concept of perfect secrecy, because we know that a stream cipher cannot be perfectly secure because it has short keys. And perfect secrecy requires keys to be as long as the message. So this is really kind of the first example that we see where we're able to prove that a cipher with short keys has security. The concept of security is semantic security, and this actually validates that really this is a very useful concept. And in fact, you know, we'll be using semantic security many, many times throughout the course. Okay, so how do we prove a theorem like this? What we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be proving the contrapositive. What we're going to show is the following. So we're going to prove this statement down here, but let me parse it for you. Suppose you give me a semantic security adversary A, what we'll do is we'll build PRG adversary B that satisfies this inequality here. Now, why is this inequality useful? Basically, what do we know? We know that if B is an efficient adversary, then we know that since G is a secure generator, we know that this advantage is negligible. 
right? A secure generator has a negligible advantage against any efficient statistical test. So the right-hand side basically is going to be negligible, but because the right-hand side is negligible, we can deduce that the left-hand side is negligible, and therefore the adversary that you looked at actually has negligible advantage in attacking the stream cipher E. Okay, so this is how this, this will work. Basically, all we have to do is given an adversary A, we're going to build an adversary B. We know that B has negligible advantage against the generator, but that implies that A has negligible advantage against the stream cipher. Okay, so let's do that. So all we have to do again is given A, we have to build B. So let A be a semantic security adversary against the stream cipher. So let me remind you what that means. Basically, uh, there's this challenger. The challenger starts off by choosing a key K. And then the adversary is going to output two messages, two equal length messages, and he's going to receive the encryption of M0 or M1, and then he outputs B prime. Okay, that's what a semantic security adversary is going to do. So now we're going to start playing games with this adversary, and that's how we're going to prove our lemma. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the challenger also choose a random R, okay, a random string R. So, well, you know, the adversary doesn't really care what the challenger does internally. The challenger never uses R, so this doesn't affect the adversary's advantage at all. The adversary just doesn't care that, that the challenger also picks R. But now comes the trick. What we're going to do is, we're, instead of encrypting using GK, we're going to encrypt using R. And you can see, kind of basically, what we're doing here. Essentially, uh, we're changing the challenger, so now the challenge ciphertext is encrypted using a truly random pad, as opposed to the pseudo-random pad GK. Okay. Now, the property of the pseudo-random generator is that its output is indistinguishable from truly random. So, because the PRG is secure, the adversary can't tell that we made this change. The adversary can't tell that we switched from a pseudo-random string to a truly random string. Again, because the generator is secure. Well, but now look at the game that we ended up with. So the adversary's advantage couldn't have changed by much because he can't tell the difference. But now look at the game that we ended up with. Now this game is truly a one-time pad game. This is a semantic security game against the one-time pad because now the adversary is getting a one-time pad encryption of M0 or M1. But in the one-time pad, we know that the adversary's advantage is zero because you can't beat the one-time pad. The one-time pad is secure, unconditionally secure. And as a result, because of this, Essentially, since the adversary couldn't have told the difference when we moved from pseudo-random to random, but he couldn't win the random game, that also means that he couldn't win the pseudo-random game. And as a result, the stream cipher, the original stream cipher, must be secure. So that's the intuition for how the proof is going to go. But I want to do it rigorously once. From now on, we're just going to argue by playing games with a challenger, and uh, we won't be doing things as formal as I'm going to do next. But I want to do formally and precisely once, just so that you see how these proofs actually work. Okay, so I'm going to have to introduce some notation. And I'll do the usual notation. Basically, in the original semantic security game, when we're actually using a pseudo-random pad, I'm going to use W0 and W1 to denote the event that the adversary outputs 1 when he gets the encryption of M0 or gets the encryption of M1, respectively. Okay, so W0 corresponds to outputting 1 when receiving the encryption of M0, and W1 corresponds to outputting 1 when receiving the encryption of M1. So that's the, as in the standard definition of semantic security. Now, once we flip to the random pad, I'm going to use R0 and R1 to denote the event that the adversary outputs 1 when receiving the one-time pad encryption of M0 or the one-time pad encryption of M1. So we have four events. W0, W1 from the original semantic security game, and R0 and R1 from the semantic security game once we switched over to the one-time pad. So now let's look at relations between these variables. So first of all, R0 and R1 are basically events from a semantic security game against a one-time pad. So the difference between these probabilities is, as we said, is basically the advantage of algorithm A, of adversary A, against the one-time pad, which we know is zero. Okay, so that's great. So that basically means that probability of R0 is equal to the probability of R1. So now let's put these events on a line, on a line segment between 0 and 1. So here are the events W0 and W1 are the events we're interested in. We want to show that these two are close. Okay? And the way we're going to do it is basically by showing, oh, and I should say, well, here is probability R0 and R1, and since they're both the same, I just put them in the same place. What we're going to do is we're going to show that both W0 and W1 are actually close to the probability of RB, and as a result, they must be close to one another. 
Okay, so the way we do that is using a second claim. So now we're interested in the distance between probability of WIB and probability of RB. Okay, so we'll prove the claim in a second. Let me just state the claim. The claim says that there exists an adversary B such that the difference between these two probabilities is basically the advantage of B against the generator G. And this is for both Bs. Okay, so given these two claims, the theorem is done because basically, what do we know? We know that this distance is now less than the advantage of B against G. That's from claim two. And similarly, this distance is less, actually it's even equal to, I don't have to say less, it's equal to the advantage of B against G. And as a result, you can see that the distance between W0 and W1 is basically almost twice the advantage of B against G. That's basically the theorem we were trying to prove. Okay, so the only thing that remains is just proving this claim 2. And if you think about what claim 2 says, it basically captures the question of what happens in experiment 0, what happens when we replace the pseudo-random pad GK by a truly random pad R, right? Here in experiment 0, say, we're using a pseudo-random pad, and here in experiment 0, we're using a truly random pad. And we're asking, can the adversary tell the difference between these two? And we want to argue that he cannot because the generator is secure. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So let's prove claim two. So we want to argue that, in fact, there is a PRG adversary B that has exactly the difference of the two probabilities as its advantage. Okay, and since the point is, since this is negligible, this is negligible, and that's basically what we wanted to prove. Okay, so let's look at the statistical test B. So what is statistical test B? It's going to use adversary A in its belly. So we get to build statistical test B however we want. As we said, it's going to use adversary A inside of it for its operation. And it's a regular statistical test. So it takes an n-bit string as input, and it's supposed to output, you know, random or not random, 0 or 1. Okay, so let's see. So it's going to, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to run adversary A. And adversary A is going to output two messages, M0 and M1. And then what adversary B is going to do is basically going to respond with m0 xor, the string that it was given as input. All right, that's the statistical test. And then whatever a outputs, it's going to output uh, as its output. And now let's look at its advantage. So what can we say about the advantage of this statistical test against the generator? Well, so by definition, it's the probability that if we choose a truly random string, so here r is in 0, 1 to the n, it's the probability that, r, that b outputs 1 minus the probability that when we choose a pseudo-random string, B outputs 1. Okay. Okay, but let's think about what this is. So what can you tell me about the first expression? So what can you tell me about this expression over here? Well, by definition, that's exactly, if you think about what's going on here, that's this is exactly the probability R0, right? Because this game that we're playing with the adversary here is basically he outputs M0, M1, Right here, he outputted M0, M1, and he got the encryption of M0 under a truly one-time pad. Okay, so this is basically a probability of R0. Here, let me write this a little better. This is basically a probability of R0. Now, what can we say about the, the next expression? Well, what can we say about what happens when B is given a pseudo-random string Y as input? Well, in that case, this is exactly experiment zero in the true stream cipher game, because now we're computing M XOR, M0, XOR GK. So this is exactly W0. Okay, and that's exactly what we had to prove. So it's a kind of a trivial proof. Okay, so that completes the proof of claim two. And again, just to make sure this is all clear, once we have claim two, we know that W0 must be close to W1, and that's, that's the theorem, that's what we had to prove. Okay, so now we've established that a stream cipher is in fact semantically secure, assuming that the PRG is secure. Now that we understand stream ciphers, we're going to move on and talk about a more powerful primitive called a block cipher. So a block cipher is made up of two algorithms, E and D. These are encryption and decryption algorithms. And both of these algorithms take as input a key K. Now the point of a block cipher is that it takes an n-bit plain text as input and it outputs exactly the same number of bits as output. So it maps n bits of input to exactly n bits of output. 
Now, there are two canonical examples of block ciphers. The first one is called triple des. In triple des, the block size, namely the number of input bits, is 64. So triple des will map 64-bit blocks to 64-bit blocks, and it does it using a key that's 168 bits long. We're going to talk about how triple des is built in the next segment. Another block cipher, which is more recent, is called AES. Now, AES has slightly different parameters. So here, the block size is 128 bits. So AES will map 128 bits of input to 128 bits of output. And it actually has three possible sizes of keys. And I wrote down these sizes over here. Basically, the longer the key, the slower the cipher is. But presumably, the more secure it is to break. And we're going to talk about what it means for block ciphers to be secure in just a minute. Now, block ciphers are typically built by iteration. They take in as input a key k. For example, in the case of AES, the key could be 128 bits long. And the first thing that happens to the key is it gets expanded into a sequence of keys, k1 to kn, called round keys. Now, the way the cipher uses these round keys is by iteratively encrypting the message again and again and again using what's called a round function. So here we have this function r that takes two inputs. This function r is going to be called the round function. It takes as input the round key, and it takes as input the current state of the message. So here we have our input message. Say for AES, the message would be 128 bits exactly, because each block in AES is exactly 128 bits. And then the first thing that happens is we apply the first round function using the key k1 to the message. And we get some new message out as a result. Then we take this message m1, we apply the next round function to it using a different key, using the key k2, and we get the next round message out, and so on and so forth, until all the rounds have been applied. And then the final output is actually the result of the cipher. And again, this would be also in the case of AES, this was 128 bits. And the resulting cipher text would also be 128 bits. Now, different ciphers have different number of rounds, and they have different round functions. So for example, for triple des, the number of rounds is 48. And we're going to see exactly how the round function for triple des works. For AES, for example, the number of rounds is only 10. And again, we're going to look at how the round functions for AES work as well in just a minute. Before we do that, I just wanted to mention performance numbers. So you can see here, these are the performance numbers for the two typical block ciphers, triple des and AES. And these are the corresponding numbers for the stream ciphers that we looked at in the previous module, RC4, Salsa, and Sosa Manuk. And you can see that the block ciphers are considerably slower than stream ciphers, but we'll see that we can do many things with block ciphers that we couldn't do very efficiently with uh, constructions like RC4. Now, my goal for this week is to show you how block ciphers work. But more importantly, I want to focus on showing you how to use block ciphers correctly for either encryption or integrity or whatever application you have in mind. So to show you how to use block ciphers correctly, it actually makes a lot of sense to abstract the concept a little bit so that we have kind of an, a clean abstract concept of a block cipher to work with. And then we can argue and reason about what constructions are correct and what constructions are incorrect. And so an abstraction, it's a very elegant abstraction of a block cipher, is what's called a pseudo-random function and a pseudo-random permutation. So let me explain what these things are. So a pseudo-random function basically is defined over a key space, an input space, and an output space. And all it is is basically a function that takes a key and an input as inputs and outputs some element in the output space. Okay, so it takes an element in k and an element in x and outputs an element in y. And the only requirement, essentially, is that there's an efficient way to evaluate the function. For functions, we're not requiring that they be invertible. We just need them to be evaluatable given the key and the input x. Now, a related concept that more accurately captures what a block cipher is, is called a pseudo-random permutation. So a pseudo-random permutation is, again, defined over a key space and then just a set x. And what it does is it takes an element in the key space and an element in x and outputs, basically, one element in x. Now, as usual, the function e should be easy to evaluate. So there should be an algorithm to evaluate the function e. But more importantly, once we fix the key k, it's important that this function e be one to one. In other words, if you think of the space x as a set here, and here's the same set x again, then basically the function e, what it does is it's a one to one function. So every element in x gets mapped to exactly one element uh, in x. And then because it's one-to-one, -one, of course, it's also invertible. 
So given some output, there's only one input that maps to that output, and the requirement is that there's an efficient inversion algorithm, call it D, that given a particular output, will output the original pre-image that mapped to that output. So really a pseudo-random permutation captures very accurately and syntactically what a block cipher is, and often I'll use the terms interchangeably, either a block cipher or a pseudo-random permutation, I'll use whichever term depending on the context that where we're discussing things. Okay, so we have two examples, as we said, of pseudo-random permutations, triple DES and AES. Say for AES 128, the key space would be 128 bits, and the output space would be 128 bits. For triple DES, as we said, the block size is only 64 bits, and the key size is 168 bits. Okay, so we'll use these running examples actually throughout, so whenever I say a PRP, Concretely, you should be thinking AES or triple DES. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out is that, in fact, any pseudo-random permutation, namely any block cipher, you can also think of it as a PRF. In fact, a PRP is a PRF that has more structure. In particular, PRP is a PRF where the input space and the output space are the same, so X is equal to Y, and, in fact, is efficiently invertible once you have the secret key K. Okay, so in some sense, a PRP is a special case of a PRF, although that's not entirely accurate, and we'll see why in just a second. So, so far we just described the kind of the syntactic definition of what is a pseudorandom permutation and a pseudorandom function. So now let's talk about what it means for a PRF or a PRP to be secure, and this concept will essentially capture what it means for a block cipher to be secure. Okay, so this is why I wanted to show you these definitions before we look at actual block cipher constructions, so at least it's clear in your mind what it is we're trying to construct. Okay, so here we have a PRF, and I'm going to need a little bit of notation, not too much though, so I'm going to need to define the set funds of XY. This is basically the set of all functions from the set X to the set Y, uh, denoted here as a big circle, funds of XY. Now the set is gigantic, its size is basically, you know, the size of Y to the size of X. So for example, for AES, remember both X and Y would be 2 to the 128. So for AES, the size of the set is enormous. It'll be 2 to the 128 times 2 to the 128. So it's kind of a double exponential. So this is a gigantic number. This is more particles than there are in the universe. But regardless, we can kind of think of, of this set abstractly. We never have to kind of write it down. We can just keep it in our head and not worry about computing on it. So this is a particular gigantic set of the set of all functions from X to Y. Now we're going to look at a much smaller set of functions, namely I'll call this set S sub F, and that's going to denote the set of all functions from X to Y that are specified by the PRF as soon as we fix a particular key K. Okay, so we fix the key K, we let the second argument float, and that basically defines a function from X to Y. And we're going to look at a set of all such functions for all possible keys in the key space. Okay, so if you think about it again, for AES, if we're using 128-bit keys, the size of this, uh, I'll say SAES, is basically going to be 2 to the 128. So much, much, much smaller than the set of all possible functions from X to Y. And now, we say that a PRF is secure, basically, if a random function in, from X to Y, so we literally we pick some arbitrary function in this gigantic set of all functions from X to Y, and we say that the PRF is secure if, in fact, a random function from X to Y is indistinguishable from a pseudo-random function from X to Y, namely, when we pick a random function from the set SF. Okay, so more precisely, basically, again, the, the uniform distribution on the set of pseudo-random function is indistinguishable from the uniform distribution on the set of all functions. Let me be just a little bit more precise, just to give you a little bit more intuition about what I mean by that, and then we'll move on to actual constructions. So let me be a bit more precise about what it means for a PRF to be secure. And so what we'll do is basically the following. So we have our adversary just trying to distinguish truly random function from a pseudo-random function. So what we'll do is we'll let him interact with one of the two. So here in the top cloud, we're choosing a truly random function. In the bottom cloud, we're just choosing a random key for a pseudo-random function. And now what this adversary is going to do is he's going to submit points in X. So he's going to submit a bunch of X's. In fact, he's going to do this again and again and again. So he's going to submit X1, X2, X3, X4. And then for each one of those queries, we're going to give him either the value of the truly random function at the point X or the value of the pseudo-random function at the point X. 
Okay, so the adversary doesn't know which one he's getting. By the way, for all queries, he's always getting either the truly random function or the pseudo random function. In other words, he's either interacting with a truly random function for all his queries, or he's interacting with a pseudo random function for all his queries. And we say that the PRF is secure if this poor adversary can't tell the difference. He cannot tell whether he's interacting with a truly random function or interacting with a pseudo random function. Okay, and we're gonna come back actually later on and define PRFs more precisely. But for now, I wanted to give you the intuition for what it means for a PRF to be secure so you'll understand what it is that we're trying to construct when we construct the pseudo-random functions. And I should say that the definition for a pseudo-random permutation is pretty much the same, except instead of choosing a random function, we're gonna choose a random permutation on the set X. In other words, a random one-to-one -one function on the set X the adversary can either query this random function on the set X, or he can query a pseudo-random permutation, and the PRP is secure if the adversary cannot tell the difference. Okay, so again, the goal is to make these functions and permutations look like truly random functions or permutations. Okay, so let's look at a simple question. So suppose we have a secure PRF. So we know that this PRF F happens to be defined on the set X, and it so happens, you know, it outputs 128 bits every time. It so happens that this PRF cannot be distinguished from a truly random function from x to 0, 1 to the 128. Now we're going to build a new PRF. Let's call this PRF G. And the PRF G is going to be defined as follows. We say if x is equal to 0, always output 0. Otherwise, if x is not equal to 0, just output the value of f. So my question to you is, do you think this G is a secure PRF? Well, so the answer, of course, is that it's very easy to distinguish the function G from a random function. All the adversary has to do is just query the function at x equals 0. For a random function, the probability that the result is going to be 0 is 1 over 2 to the 128. Whereas for the pseudo-random function, he's always going to get 0. Because at 0, the function is always defined to be 0, no matter what the key. And so all he would do is he would say, hey, I'm interacting with a pseudo-random function if he gets 0 at x equals 0, and he'll say I'm interacting with a random function if he gets non-zero at x equals 0. So it's very easy to distinguish this g from random. So what this example shows is that even if you have a secure PRF, it's enough that on just one known input, the output is kind of not random, the output is fixed, and already the entire PRF is broken, even though you realize everywhere else the PRF is perfectly indistinguishable from random. Okay, so just to show you the power of uh, PRF, let's look at a very easy application. I want to show you that in fact pseudo-random functions directly give us a very simple pseudo-random generator. Okay, so let's assume we have a pseudo-random function. So this one happens to go from n bits uh, to n bits, and then Let's define the following generator. Its seed space is going to be the key space for the PRF, and its output space is going to be basically t blocks of n bits each. Okay, so you can see the output is a total of n times t bits for some parameter t that we can choose. And it turns out basically you can do this very simple construction. This is sometimes called counter mode, where essentially you take the PRF and you evaluate it at 0, you evaluate it at 1, you evaluate it at 2, at 3, at 4, up to t, and you concatenate all these values. That's the generator, okay? So we basically took the key for the PRF and we expanded it into n times t bits, okay? A key property of this generator is that it's parallelizable. And what I mean by that is if you have two processors or two cores that you can compute on, then you can have one core compute the even entries of the output and you can have another core compute the odd entries of the output. So basically, if you have two cores, you can make this generator run twice as fast as it would if you only have a single core. So the nice thing about this is, of course, we know that uh, pseudo-random generators give us stream ciphers, and so this is an example of a parallelizable stream cipher. And I just wanted to point out that many of the stream ciphers that we looked at before, for example, RC4, those were inherently sequential. So even if you had two processors, you couldn't make the stream cipher work any faster than if you just had a single processor. Now, the main question is, why is this generator secure? And so here, I'm only going to give you a little bit of intuition, and we're going to come back and argue this more precisely later on. But I'll just say that security basically falls directly from the PRF property. And the way we reason about security is we say, well, this PRF by definition is indistinguishable from a truly random function on 128 bits. 
So in other words, if I take this generator and instead I define a generator using a truly random function, in other words, I'll write the output of the generator as f of 0 concatenated f of 1 uh, and so on and so forth, using a truly random function, then the output of the generator using the truly random function would be indistinguishable from the output of the generator using a pseudo-random function. That is the essence of the security property of a PRF. But with a truly random function, you notice that the output is just truly random, because for a truly random function, f of 0 is a random value, f of 1 is an independent random value, f of 2 is an independent random value, and so on and so forth. So the entire output is a truly random output. And so with a truly random function, this generator produces truly random output and is therefore a perfectly secure generator. And so you see how the PRF security property lets us argue security. Basically, we argue that when we replace the PRF with a truly random function, the construction is necessarily secure, and that says that the construction with a pseudo-random function is also secure. Okay, and we're going to see a couple more examples like this later on. So now you understand what a block cipher is, and you have intuition for what security properties it's trying to achieve. And in the next segment, we're going to look at uh, constructions for block ciphers. So now that we understand what block ciphers are, let's look at a classic example called the data encryption standard. So just a quick reminder, block ciphers basically map n bits of input to n bits of output. And we talked about two canonical examples, triple DES and AES. In this segment, we're going to talk about DES, and we'll talk about triple DES actually in the next segment. And then I also mentioned before that block ciphers are often built by iteration. In particular, we're going to look at block ciphers that are built by a form of iteration where a key K is first expanded into a bunch of round keys, and then a round function is applied to the input message again and again and again. And essentially, after all these round functions are applied, we obtain the resulting ciphertext. Okay, and again, we're going to look at how DES, the data encryption standard, uses this format. I just want to be clear that, in fact, uh, to specify a block cipher of this type, um, one needs to specify the key expansion mechanism, and one needs to specify the round function. In the segment here, I'm going to focus on the round function, and I'm not going to talk much about key expansion, but I just wanted to mention that, in fact, key expansion is also a big part of describing how a block cipher works. Okay, so let's talk about the history of DES. Essentially, in the early 1970s, IBM realized that their customers are demanding some form of encryption. And so they formed a crypto group, and the head of that group uh, was Horst Feistel, who in the early 70s designed a cipher called Lucifer. Now, it's interesting. In fact, Lucifer had a number of variations, but one of the later variations, in fact, had a key length that was 128 bits and a block length that's also 128 bits. Okay? In 1973, the government realized that it's buying many commercial off-the-shelf computers, and so it wanted its suppliers to actually uh, have a good crypto algorithm that they could use in products sold to the government. So in 1973, the National Bureau of Standards, as it was called at the time, put out a request for proposals for a block cipher that's going to become a federal standard. And in fact, IBM submitted a variant of Lucifer. That variant actually went through some modification during the standardization process, and then finally, in 1976, the National Bureau of Standard adopted DES as a federal standard. And in fact, for DES, it's interesting that the key length was far reduced from Lucifer. It's only 56 bits, and the block length was also reduced uh, to 64 bits. And in fact, these decisions, especially the decision to reduce the, the key length, is kind of the Achilles heel of DES and was a source of many complaints over its life. In particular, already back in 1997, DES was broken by exhaustive search meaning that a machine was able to search through all 2 to the 56 possible keys to recover a particular challenge key. And in fact, we're going to talk about exhaustive search quite a bit. It's quite an interesting question, and there are various ways to defend against exhaustive search. And basically, this 1997 experiment kind of spelled the doom of DES. It meant that DES itself is no longer secure, and as a result, the National Institute of Standards, as it became known, uh, issued a request for proposals for a next generation block cipher standard. And in 2000, it standardized on a cipher called Rindell, which became the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. And we'll talk about AES later on. But in this segment, I want to describe how DES works. Now, DES as a cipher, it's an amazingly successful cipher. It's been used in banking industry. 
In fact, there's a classic network called the Electronic Clearinghouse, which banks use to clear checks with one another, and DES is used for integrity in those transactions. It's also used in commerce. In fact, it was very popular up until recently as the main encryption mechanism for the web. Of course, now that's been replaced with AES and, uh, and other ciphers. Overall, it's a very successful cipher in terms of deployment. DES also has a very rich history of attacks, which we'll talk about in the next segment. Okay, so now let's talk about the construction of DES. So the core idea behind DES is what's called a Feistel network, due to Horace Feistel. And basically, it's a very clever idea for building a block cipher out of arbitrary functions f1 to fd. Okay, so imagine we have these functions f1 to fd that happens to map n bits to n bits. Now, these are arbitrary functions. They don't have to be invertible or anything. What we want to do is build an invertible function out of those uh, d functions. And the way we'll do it is by building a new function we'll call it capital F that maps two n bits to two n bits. And the construction is described right here. So here we have our input. You notice there are two blocks of n bits. In other words, the input is actually two n bits. The R and L stand for right and left. Typically, people describe a Feistel network from top to bottom, in which case these n bits really would be right and left. But here it's more convenient for me to describe it horizontally. So if we follow the R input, you realize it basically gets copied into the L output without any change at all. Okay? However, the L input uh, is changed somewhat. Basically, what happens is the R input is fed into the function F1, and the resultant is XOR with L0, and that becomes the new R1 input. Okay, so this is called one round of a Feistel network, and it's done using the function F1. Now we do this again with another round of the Feistel network with the function F2, and we do it again and again and again, so we get to the last round, and we do it again with the function FD, and finally the output is RD, uh, LD. Okay, so if you like, we can write this in symbols, that basically LI is simply equal to RI minus 1, and RI, let's see, that's the more complicated one, Ri is equal, well, let's just follow the lines here. Ri is just equal to Fi applied to uh, Ri minus 1 XOR Li. Okay? So then, and this is basically I goes from uh, 1 to D. So this is the uh, equation that defines a Feistel network mapping a 2n bit input to 2n bit output. So here we have the, again, I just copied the picture of the Feistel network. And the amazing claim is that, in fact, it doesn't matter which functions you give me. For any functions f1 to fd that you give me, the resulting Feistel network function is, in fact, invertible. And the way we're going to prove that is basically we're going to construct an inverse. Because not only is it invertible, it's efficiently invertible. So let's see. So let's look at one round of a Feistel network. So here, this is the input, ri, li. And this is the output, ri plus 1, li plus 1. And now what I'm going to ask you is to invert this. So let's see. So suppose now the input that we're given is ri plus 1, li plus 1. And we want to compute ri, li. So we want to compute the round in the reverse direction. So let's see if we can do it. Well, let's look at ri. So ri is very easy. Basically, ri is just equal to li plus 1. So li plus 1 just becomes ri. But now let me ask you uh, to write the expression for Li in terms of Ri plus 1 and Li plus 1. So I hope everybody sees that basically Li plus 1 is fed into the function Fi plus 1. The result is XORed with Ri plus 1. And that gives the Li input. So this is the inverse of one round of a Feistel network. And if we draw this as a diagram, let's just write the picture for the inverse. So here you notice the input is Ri plus 1, Li plus 1, and the output is Ri, Li, right? So we're computing, we're inverting the round. So you notice that the inverse of a Feistel round looks pretty much the same as the Feistel round in the forward direction. It's literally, just for a technical reason, it's kind of the mirror image of one another, but it's basically uh, the same construct. And when we put these inverted rounds back together, we essentially get the inverse of the entire Feistel network. So you notice... We start off with round number D, with the inverse of round number D, then we do the inverse of round number D minus 1, and so on and so forth, until we get to the inverse of the first round, and we get our final output, which is R0, L0. Right? This is the input, and we manage to invert, basically, RD, LD, and get R0, L0. And the interesting thing is that, basically, the inversion circuit looks pretty much the same as the encryption circuit, 
And the only difference is that the functions are applied in reverse order, right? We started with FD and ended with F1, whereas when we were encrypting, we started with F1 and ended with FD. So for hardware designers, this is very attractive because basically if you want to save hardware, you realize that your encryption hardware is identical to your decryption hardware. So you only have to implement one algorithm and you get both algorithms the same way. The only difference is that the functions are applied in reverse order. Okay, so this Feistel mechanism is a general method for building invertible functions from arbitrary functions F1 to FD. And in fact, it's used in many different block ciphers, although interestingly, it's not actually used in AES. So there are many other block ciphers that use a Feistel network. For of course, they differ from DES in the functions F1 to FD, but AES actually uses a completely different type of structure that's actually not a Feistel network. We'll see how AES works in a couple of segments. So now that we know what Feistel networks are, let me mention an important theorem about the theory of Feistel networks that shows why they're a good idea. This theorem is due to Lubin Rockoff uh, back in 1985, and it says the following. Suppose I have a function that is a secure pseudo-random function, okay? So it's indistinguishable from random and it happens to uh, act on n bits. So it maps n bits to n bits and uses a key k. Then it turns out that uh, if you use this function in three rounds of a Feistel network, what you end up with is a secure pseudo-random permutation. In other words, what you end up with is an invertible function that's indistinguishable from a truly random invertible function. And I hope you remember that the definition of a secure block cipher is that it needs to be a secure pseudo-random permutation. So what this theorem says is if you start with a secure pseudo-random function, you end up with a secure block cipher. Basically, that's what this says. Now let me explain in a little bit more detail what's actually going on here. So essentially, the PRF is used in every round of the Feistel network. So in other words, here what's actually computed is the PRF using one secret key, k0. Here what's computed is the PRF using a different secret key, of course applied to r1. And here we have yet another secret key, k1 applied, uh, k2 applied to r2. And you notice this is why basically this Feistel construction uses keys in k cubed. In other words, it uses three independent keys. So it's very important that the keys are actually independent. So really we need three uh, independent keys, and then we end up with a secure pseudo-random permutation. Okay, so that's the theory behind Feistel networks, and now that we understand that, we can actually look at the specifics of DES. So DES is basically a 16-round Feistel network. Okay, so there are functions F1 to F16 that map 32 bits to 32 bits, and as a result, the DES itself acts on 64-bit blocks, 2 times 32. Now, the 16 round functions in DES are actually all derived from a single function f, just used with different keys. So in fact, uh, these are the different round keys. So ki uh, is a round key, and it's basically derived from the key k, derived uh, from uh, the 56-bit DES key k. Okay, now I'll describe what this function f is in just a minute. But basically, you see that by using 16 different round keys, we get 16 different round functions, and that gives us the Feistel network. So just at a high level, how the DES works, basically you have a 64-bit input. The first thing it does is this initial permutation that just permutes the 64 bits around, namely it maps bit number 1 to bit number 6, bit number 2 to bit number 17, and so on. This is not for security reasons, this is just specified in the standard. Well, then we go into the 16-round uh, Feistel network that actually you now know how it works. Basically, it uses the function f1 to f16 as specified before. And then basically we have another permutation. This is called the final permutation. That's just the inverse of the initial permutation. Again, it just permutes bits around. This is not necessary for security reasons. And then we finally get uh, the final output. Okay. Now, as we said, there's a key expansion step, which I'm not going to describe. But basically, this 56-bit uh, DES key is expanded into these round keys, where each round key uh, is 48 bits. Okay, so we have 16 48-bit round keys, and they're basically used in the 16 rounds of DES. And then when you want to invert the cipher, all you do is you use these uh, round keys, these 16 round keys, in reverse order. Okay, so now that we understand the DES structure, the only thing that's left to do is specify the function capital F. So let me explain how this function works. So basically it takes its inputs 
it's a 32-bit value, uh, let's call it x, but in reality, you remember this is r0, r1, r2, r3, uh, and so on and so forth. These are 32-bit values. And then it takes also a 48-bit round key. So here we have our key ki, which happens to be 48 bits. The first thing it does is it goes through an expansion box. And this expansion box it basically takes 32 bits and maps them into 48 bits. Now all the expansion box does is just replicate some bits and move other bits around. So for example, uh, bit number 1 of x is replicated into positions 2 and 48 in the output. Bit number 2 of x is positioned in as bit number 3 of the output. And so on and so forth, just by replicating some of the bits of x, we expand the input into 48 bits. The next thing we do is we compute an XOR with a round key. Sometimes people say that cryptographers only compute XORs. This is an example of that, where, well, we just do XORs in this function. And then comes the magic of DES, where actually these 48 bits are broken into eight groups of six bits. Six, seven, eight. And so let me draw, and then what happens is, uh, so yeah, so each one of these, each one of these wires is uh, six bits. And then the, they go into what, what are called S-boxes. And I'll explain the X-boxes in just a minute. The X-boxes are kind of the smarts of uh, DES, uh, S8. And then the S-boxes basically uh, map six bits to four bits. So the outputs of the S-boxes are these four bits. They're collected. This gives us 32 bits, right? Eight groups of four bits gives us 32 bits. And then finally, this is fed into yet another permutation, which just maps the bits around. So for example, bit number one will go to bit number nine, bit number two will go to bit number 15, and so on. So it just uh, permutes the 32 bits around, and that's the final 32 bits output of this f function. Okay? So by using different round keys, essentially we get different round functions, and that's how we form the 16 round functions of DES. Now, the only thing that's uh, left to specify are these S boxes. So the S boxes literally are just functions from six bits to four bits, and they're just implemented as a lookup table, right? So uh, describing a function from six bits to four bits basically amounts to writing the output of the function on all two to the six possible inputs. Two to the six is 64, so we just have a table that literally contains 64 values where each value is four bits. So here's an example. This happens to be the fifth S box. And you see that this is a table that contains 64 values, right? It's four uh, by 16. So 64 values. And for example, if you want to look at uh, the output that corresponds to 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, okay, then you, right, you look at these two bits, this is 0, 1, and you look at these four bits, this is 1, 1, 0, 1, and you see that the output is 1, 0, 0, 1, the four bits output one zero zero one okay so the s boxes are just implemented as these tables and now the question is how are these s boxes chosen how are these tables actually chosen by the designers of this to give you some intuitions for that let's start with a very bad choice for s boxes so imagine the s boxes were linear what do i mean by that i mean that imagine that these six bit inputs literally were just xored with one another in different ways to produce the four bits outputs Okay, another way of writing that is that we can write the S box as a matrix vector product. So here you have the matrix AI and the vector, the six bit vector X. And you can see that if we write this matrix vector product, basically we take the inner product of this vector with the input vector. Remember, these are all bits. So the six bit vector inner product, another six bit vector, and we do that modulo two, you realize basically what we're computing is X2, X or X3 right, because only position two and position three have ones in it. And similarly, the next uh, inner product will produce x1, x4, 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 x5, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can literally see that if the S boxes are implemented this way, then all they do is just apply the matrix A to the input vector X, which is why we say that in this case, the S boxes are completely linear. Now I claim that in fact, if the S boxes were linear, then DES would be totally insecure. And the reason is, if the S boxes are linear, then all that DES does is just compute XOR of various things and permute and shuffle bits around. So it's just XORs and bit permutations, which means that as a result, all of DES is just a linear function. In other words, 
there will be a matrix B of these dimensions. Basically, it's a matrix B that has width 832. Basically, what I would do is I would write the 64-bit message plus the 16 round keys as one long vector, right? So the message is 64 bits, and there are 16 round keys. Each one is 48, and that, if you do the math, it's basically 832. Okay, so I write these guys, the keys and the message as one long vector, and then there would be this matrix that essentially, when you compute these matrix vector products, essentially you get the different bits of the ciphertext. So there's 64 of these rows, and as a result, you get 64 bits of ciphertext. Okay, so this is what it means for DES to be linear. So if you think a little bit about this, you realize the S boxes are the only nonlinear part of DES. So if the S boxes were linear, then the entire circuit is linear, and therefore it can be expressed as this matrix. Now, if that's the case, then DES would be terrible as a secure pseudo-random permutation. And let me give you a very simple example. Basically, if you take the XOR of three outputs of DES, well, let's think what that means. Basically, we would be looking at B times the matrix B that defines DES times a one vector, XOR B times another vector, XOR B times a third vector. We could take the B out of the parentheses, so we'd be basically doing B times this vector over here, but of course K, X, or K, X, or K, X, or K, this is just K. And so if you think about what that means, basically we just got back DES of K at the point M1, X, or M2, X, or M3. But this means that now DES has this horrible relation that can be tested, right? So basically if you XOR the output of three values, M1, M2, M3, you'll get the value of DES at the point M1, X, or M2, X, or M3. Now, this is not a relation that's going to hold for a random function. A random function is not going to satisfy this equality, and so you get a very easy test to tell you that DES is not a random function. And in fact, it's not even, maybe you can take that as a small exercise, it's not even difficult to see that given enough input-output pairs, you can literally recover the entire secret key. Yeah, you just need 832 input-output pairs, and you'll be able to recover the entire secret key. And so if the X boxes were linear, DES would be completely insecure. It turns out, actually, even if the X boxes were close to being linear, in other words, the X boxes were linear most of the time, so maybe for 60 out of the 64 inputs, the X boxes were linear, it turns out that would also be enough to break DES, and we're going to see why uh, later on. In particular, if you choose the X boxes at random, it turns out they'll tend to be somewhat close to linear functions as a result, you'll be able to totally break the yes. You'll just be able to recover the key in basically uh, very little time. And so the designers of DES actually specified a number of rules they use for choosing the S boxes. And it's not surprising, the first rule is that these functions are far away from being linear. Okay, so in other words, there is no function that agrees with a large fraction of the outputs of the S box. And then there are all these other rules. For example, there are exactly four to one maps, right? So every output has exactly four pre-images and so on and so forth. So we understand now why they chose the S boxes the way they did. And in fact, it's all done to defeat certain attacks on DES. Okay, so that's the end of the description of DES. And then in the next two segments, we're going to look at the security of DES. Now that we understand how DES works, let's look at a few attacks on DES. And we're going to start with an attack called exhaustive search. So our goal here is basically that given a few input-output pairs, MICI, our goal is to find the key that maps these M's to the C's. In other words, our goal is to find the key that maps M1, M2, M3 into uh, C1, C2, C3. And as I said, our goal is to find the key that does this mapping. The first question is, how do we know that this key is unique? And so let's do a little bit of analysis to show that, in fact, just one pair is enough to completely constrain a DES key. And that's why this question makes sense. Okay, so let's see. So we're going to prove the simple lemma. Now let's assume that DES is what's called an ideal cipher. So what is an ideal cipher? Basically, we're going to pretend like DES is made up of random invertible functions. In other words, for every key, DES implements a random invertible function. Since there are 2 to the 56 keys in DES, we're going to pretend like DES really is a collection of 2 to the 56 functions that are invertible from 0, 0, 1, 64 to 0, 1, 64. Okay, so of course DES is not a collection of 2 to the 56 uh, random functions, but we can idealize the, the cipher and pretend that it is such a collection. Then, what can we say? 
then in fact, it turns out that just given one message and ciphertext, you just give me one pair message and ciphertext, there's already only one key that maps this message to that ciphertext. So already just given one pair M and C, I can ask you, find me the key that maps M to C, and the solution is very likely to be unique. In fact, it's going to be unique with probability roughly 99.5%. I should say that the statement is true for all M and C, and the probability is just over the choice of the random permutation that make up the cipher. So let's do the proof. This is fairly straightforward. So what we're basically asking is, what's the probability that there exists some key that's not equal to K, such that, well, C we know is equal to DS of K comma M, by definition of C and M, but we're asking how likely is it that there's this other key k prime that also satisfies this equality. You realize that if this is true, if such a key k prime exists, then just given m and c, you can't decide whether the right key is k or k prime, because both of them work. Okay, but I want to argue that this happens with low probability. Well, so what does it mean that there exists a key k prime that's, that satisfies this relation? Well, we're asking, what's the probability that the first key you know, the all zero key satisfies it, or the second key satisfies it, or the third key satisfies it, and so on and so forth. So by the union bound, we can bound this probability by the sum over all keys k prime, over all 56-bit keys, of the probability that des km is equal to des k prime m. Okay, so we're asking basically, what is this probability for a fixed key k prime that it happens to collide with the key k at the message m. Well, let's think about this for a second. Let's fix this value. Let's suppose it's some fixed value. And then we're asking, how likely is it that a random permutation pi k prime at the point m happens to produce exactly the same output as the key uh, k at the point m? Well, it's not difficult to answer and see that, in fact, this is the, for a single key k prime, the probability is at most 1 over 2 to the 64, right? There are 2 to the 64 possible outputs for the permutation. What's the probability that it lands exactly on this output? Well, it's 1 over 2 to the 64. And we're summing over all 2 to the 56 keys. So we just multiply the two. We get 1 over 2 to the 8, which is basically 1 over 256, okay? So the probability that the key is not unique is 1 over 256. Therefore, the probability that it is unique is 1 minus that, which is 99.5%. Okay, so already, if you give me one plain text effort to spare, the key is completely determined. There's only one key that will map that plain text to that ciphertext, and the question is just, can you find that key? Now, it turns out, in fact, if you give me two pairs, so you give me M1 and M2, and their corresponding outputs, C1 and C2, the probability basically just do exactly the same analysis the probability basically becomes one, that there's only one such key. Okay, essentially, this is very, 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 very close to one. And basically, it says given two pairs, it's very, very likely that only one key will map this pair of messages to this pair of ciphertexts. And as a result, again, we can ask, well, find me that unique key. And by the way, the same is true for AES. If you look at AES uh, 128, again, just given two input-output pairs, there's going to be only one key with very high probability. So essentially now we can ask for this exhaustive search problem. I give you two or three pairs and I ask you, well, find me the key. So how are you going to do it? Well, you're going to do it by exhaustive search, essentially by trying all possible keys one by one until you find uh, the right one. So this is what's known as the DES challenge. So let me explain how the DES challenge worked. The, the challenge was issued by a company called RSA. And what they did is basically they published a number of ciphertexts but three of the ciphertexts had known plaintexts. So in particular, what they did is they took the message here. The unknown message is colon, and you can see they broke it up into blocks. If you look at these, these are basically eight byte blocks. Eight bytes, as you know, is 64 bits, right? So each one of these is 64 bits. And then they encrypted them using a secret key. They encrypted all using the same secret key to get kind of three ciphertexts. So this gives us three plaintext ciphertext pairs. And then they gave us a whole bunch of other ciphertexts, you know, C4, C5, C6. And the challenge was decrypt these guys using the key that you found from an exhaustive search over the first three pairs that you were given. Okay, 
So that was called the DES challenge. And let me tell you a little bit about how long it took to solve it. So interestingly, in 1997, using an internet search, uh, using uh, distributed.net basically, they were able to search through enough of the key space to find the correct key in about three months. You realize the key space has size 2 to the 56, but on average you only have to search through half the key space to find the key, and so it took them three months. Then a kind of a miraculous thing happened. Uh, the EFF actually contracted Paul Kocher to, to build special purpose hardware to break the ES. This was a machine called uh, Deep Crack. It cost about $250,000 and it broke the next DES challenge in only three days. Interestingly, by the way, RSA said that they would pay $10,000 for each uh, solution of the challenge. So you can see that this is not quite economical. They spent 250K, they got $10,000 for solving the challenge. The next thing that happened is in 1999, RSA issued another challenge and they said, well, you gotta solve it in half the time of the previous solution. And so using both deep crack and the internet search together, they were able to break DES in 22 hours. So the bottom line here is essentially DES is completely dead. Essentially, if you forget or you lose your DES 56-bit key, don't worry. Within 22 hours, you can actually recover it. And uh, in fact, anyone can recover it. And so DES essentially is dead and no longer secure. And just kind of a final nail in the coffin, as hardware technology improved, there was another project uh, called Copacabana. They used uh, FPGAs, just off the shelf FPGAs, only 120 uh, FPGAs. Uh, it only cost $10,000 and they were able to break to do an exhaustive key search in about seven days. So very, very cheap hardware, just off the shelf. You can break those already very quickly. So the lesson from all this is essentially 56 bit ciphers are totally, totally dead. And so the question is what to do. People really liked DES. It was just deployed in a lot of places. There were a lot of implementations. There was a lot of hardware support for it. So the question was what to do. And so the first thing that came to mind is, well, maybe we can take DES and we can kind of artificially expand the key size so we strengthen it against this exhaustive search attack. And the first idea that comes to mind is basically, well, let's iterate the block cipher a couple of times. And this is what's called triple DES. So triple DES is a general construction. Basically, it says the following. Suppose you give me a block cipher E. So here, it has a key space K, and it has a message space M, and an output space, of course, M as well. Let's define the triple construction, which now uses three keys. And it's defined as follows. Basically, here, the triple construction is uses three independent keys, encrypts the same message block as before. And what it does is it will encrypt using the key K3, then it will decrypt using the key K2, and then it will encrypt again using the key K1. Okay, so it's basically encrypting three times using three independent keys. You might be wondering why is it doing E, D, E? Why not just do E, E, E? Why do we have to have a D in the middle? Well, that's just for a kind of a hack. You notice what happens if you set up K1 equals K2 equals K3? What happens if all three keys are the same? Well, basically, what would happen is one E and one D would cancel, and you would just get normal DES out. So it's just a hack so that if you have a hardware implementation of triple DES, you can set all three keys to be the same, and you'll get a hardware implementation of single DES. Of course, it'll be three times as slow as a regular implementation of single DES, but nevertheless, it's still an option. Okay, so for triple DES, in fact, now we get a key size that's three times 56, which is 168 bits. So this is 168 bits is way too long to actually do exhaustive search on. That will take time two to the 168, which is more than all the machines on earth working for 10 years would be able to do. Unfortunately, of course, the cipher is three times slower than DES. So this is a real problem with triple DES. Now I wanna mention that in fact, you might think that triple DES has security two to the 168, but in fact, there is a simple attack that actually runs in time two to the 118, and I want to show you uh, how that attack works. Okay, so, but in fact, 2 to the 118 is still a, a large number. In fact, anything that's uh, kind of bigger than 2 to the 90 is considered uh, sufficiently secure. 2 to the 118 is definitely sufficiently secure against exhaustive search, and generally is considered a, a high enough level of security. So clearly, triple DES is three times as slow as DES. So the question is, why did they repeat the cipher three times? Why not repeat the cipher just two times? Or in particular, the question is, what's wrong with double DES? 
So here we have double devs. Basically, you see it uses only two keys, and it uses only two applications of the block cipher. And as a result, it's only going to be twice as slow as DES, not three times as slow as DES. Well, the key length for double DES is 2 times 56, which is 112 bits. And in fact, doing exhaustive search on a space of 112 bits is too much. 2 to 112 is too big of a number to do exhaustive search over such a large space. So the question is, what's wrong with this construction? Well, it turns out this construction is completely insecure, and I want to show you an attack. So suppose I'm given a bunch of inputs, say M1 to M10, and I'm given the corresponding outputs C1 to C10. What's my goal? Well, my goal is basically to find keys, uh, you know, a pair of keys K1, K2, such that if I encrypt the message, you know, the message capital M using these keys, in other words, if I do this encryption, this double des uh, encryption, then I get the ciphertext vector that was given to me. Okay, so our goal is to solve this equation here. Now you stare at this equation a little bit and you realize, hey, wait a minute, I can rewrite it in kind of an interesting way. I can apply the decryption algorithm and then what I'll get is that I'm really looking for uh, keys K1, K2 that satisfy this equation here. Where basically all I did is I applied the decryption algorithm using K1 to both sides. Okay, now Whenever you see an equation like this, what just happened here is that we separated our variables into two sides. The variables now appear on independent sides of the equation, and that usually means that there is a, a faster attack than exhaustive search. And in fact, this, this attack is called a meet-in-the-middle attack, where really the meet-in-the-middle is going to somehow attack this particular point in the construction. Okay, so we're going to try and find a key that maps M to a particular value here and maps C to the same value. Okay, so let me show you how the attack works. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a table. Here, let me clear up some space here. The first step is to build a table that for all possible values of K2 encrypts M under that value. Okay, so here we have this table. So you notice these are all, I'll say it like this, these are all 2 to the 56 DES keys, single DES uh, keys. Okay, so the table has 2 to the 56 entries. And what we do is basically for each entry, we compute the encryption of M under the appropriate key. So this is the encryption of M under the O0 key, the encryption of M under the 1 key. And then at the bottom, we have the encryption of M uh, under the O1 key. Okay, so there are 2 to the 56 entries, and we sort this table based on the second column. Okay, so far so good. So by the way, this takes time to build this table, takes time 2 to the 56, and I guess we also want to sort. Sorting takes n log n time, so it's 2 to the 56 times log 2 to the 56. Okay, so now that we have this table, we've essentially built all possible values in the forward direction for this point. Now what we're going to do is this meet in the middle attack, where now we try to go in the reverse direction with all possible keys K. Essentially, we compute the decryption of C under all possible keys K1. Okay, so now for each potential decryption, remember, the table holds all possible values in the midpoint, so then for each possible decryption, we check, hey, is the decryption in the table, in the second column in the table. If it is in the table, then aha, we found a match. And then what do we know? We know that essentially, well, we found a match. So we know that, say, for example, a decryption using a particular key, K1, happened to match this entry in the table, you know, K sub 2 or more generally Ki. Then we know that the encryption of M under Ki is equal to the decryption of uh, C under K. Okay, so we kind of build this meet in the middle where the two sides, you know, the encryption of M under KI and the decryption of C under K collided. But if they collided, then we know that in fact this pair, KI and K, is equal to the pair that we're looking for. And so we've just solved our challenge. So now let's look at uh, what's the running time of this. Well, we had to build a table and then sort it. And then for all possible decryptions, we had to do a search through the table. So there were 2 to the 56 possible decryption. Each search in a sorted table takes log of 2 to the 56 time. If you just work it out, this turns out to be 2 to the 63, which is way, 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 way smaller than 2 to the 112. Okay, so this is a serious attack. It's probably doable today. Uh, that runs in a total time of 2 to the 63, which is about the same time as the exhaustive search attack on DES. So really, double DES really didn't solve the exhaustive search problem because, well, there's an attack on it that runs in about the same time 
as exhaustive search on single disk. Now, someone might complain that in fact this algorithm, well, we have to store this big table, so it takes up a lot of space, but you know, so be it. That's uh, nevertheless, the running time is still quite smaller, significantly smaller than two to the 112. Now you notice, by the way, this the same attack applies uh, to triple disk. What you would do is you would implement a man in the middle attack against this point. You would build a table of size two to the 56 of all possible uh, encryptions of M, and then you would try to decrypt with all 2 to the 112 keys until you find the collision, and when you find a collision, you've basically found K1, K2, K3. Okay, so even triple des has an attack that basically explores only 2 to the 112 possible keys. But 2 to the 112 is a large enough number, so triple des, in fact, as far as we know, is sufficiently secure. I should mention that triple des is actually a NIST standard, and so triple des is actually used quite a bit. And in fact, DES should never, ever, ever be used. If for some reason you're forced to use some version of DES, use triple DES, not DES. Okay, I want to mention one more method for strengthening DES against exhaustive search attacks. This method actually is not standardized by NIST because it doesn't defend against more subtle attacks on DES. But nevertheless, if all you're worried about is exhaustive search and you don't want to pay the performance penalties of triple DES, then this is an interesting idea. So let me show you how it works. So let E be a block cipher that operates on n-bit blocks. We're going to define the EX construction, and for DES we're going to get DESX to be the following. So we use three keys, K1, K2, K3. And then basically before encryption, we XO with K3. Then we encrypt using K2. And then after encryption, we XO with K1. That's it. That's the whole construction. So basically, you notice it doesn't slow the block cipher much because all we did is we applied the cipher plus two additional XORs, which are super fast. The key length for this is in fact, uh, well, we got two keys that are as long as the block size, and we got one key that's as long as the key size, so the total is 184 bits. Now, it turns out actually the best attack that's known is actually an attack that takes time 2 to the 120, and it's actually fairly simple. So it's a generic attack on EX. It will always take time, basically, the block size plus the key size, and it's a simple homework problem for you to try to figure out this attack. I think this is a good exercise. Okay, in fact, there's some analysis to show that uh, there is no exhaustive search attack on this type of construction. So it's a fine construction against exhaustive search, but there are more subtle attacks on DEF that we'll talk about in the next segment that basically this construction will not uh, prevent. One thing that I want to point out, unfortunately, I found this uh, mistake in a number of products, is if you just decide to XOR on the outside, or if you just decide to XOR on the inside, as opposed to XORing on both sides, which is what DESX does, you notice DESX XORs both on the outside and on the inside. If you just do one of them, then basically this construction does nothing to secure your cipher. It'll still be as vulnerable to uh, exhaustive search as the original block cipher E. Okay, so this is another homework problem, and actually you'll see that as part of our homeworks. Okay, so this basically concludes our discussion of exhaustive search attacks. And next we'll talk about more sophisticated attacks on DES. There is an immense literature on attacking block ciphers. In this segment, I just want to give you a, a, a taste for what these attacks look like, and I hope I'll convince you that you should never, ever, ever design your own block cipher and just stick to the standards like triple DES and AES. The first set of attacks I want to talk about are attacks on the implementation of the block cipher. As an example, imagine you have a smart card that's uh, implementing a block cipher. So the smart card, for example, could be used for credit card payments. It might have a secret key inside of it to authenticate your credit card payments as you stick the card into a payment terminal, say. So now if an attacker obtains your smart card, what he could do is he could actually take the smart card to a lab and then run the card and measure very precisely how much time the card took to do encryption and decryption. Now if the amount of time that the implementation took to do encryption depends on bits of the secret key, then by measuring the time, the attacker will learn something about your secret key, and in fact, he might even be able to completely extract your secret key. And there are many examples of implementations that simply by measuring the time very precisely for many operations of encryption algorithm, you can completely extract the secret key. Another example is rather than just measuring the time, you could actually measure the power consumption of the card as it's operating. So literally, you can connect it to a device that will measure the current that the card is drawing and then graph the current very, very precisely. Now, these cards are not very fast, and as a result, you can actually measure the exact amount of power consumed at every clock cycle as the card was executing. 
When you do that, you actually get graphs of this form. So this is an example of a smart card operating uh, while it's doing the DES computation. So you can see very clearly, here's when it was doing the initial permutation, here's when it's doing the final permutation, and then here you can count there are actually 16 hills and troughs corresponding to the 16 rounds. And essentially when you zoom in on a graph like this, you can basically read the key bits off one by one just by looking at how much power the card consumed as it was doing the different operations. It turns out that even cards that take steps to mask this type of information are still vulnerable. There's an attack called a differential power analysis, where basically you measure the power consumed by the card over many, many, many uh, runs of the encryption algorithm. And as long as there's any even small dependence between uh, the amount of current consumed and the bits of the secret key, basically that dependence will show up after enough runs of the encryption algorithm, and as a result, you'll be able to completely extract uh, the secret key. Okay, so these attacks were actually discovered by Paul Kocher and his colleagues up at Cryptography Research, and there's actually a fairly large industry devoted to just defending against these power attacks. As far as timing attacks are concerned, I want to mention that these are real. They're not just about smart cards. For example, you can imagine a multi-core processor where the encryption algorithm is running on one core and the attacker code happens to be running on another core. Now, these cores actually share the same cache, and as a result, an attacker can actually measure, can actually look at the exact cache misses that the encryption algorithm uh, incurred. It turns out that by looking at cache misses, you can completely figure out the secret key used by the algorithm. So one core can essentially extract information uh, from the other core just by looking at cache misses. So implementing these block ciphers is actually quite subtle because you have to make sure that the side channel attacks don't leak information about your secret key. Another type of attack that's uh, been discussed in the literature is what's called a fault attack. So here, basically, if you're attacking a smart card, you can actually cause the smart card to malfunction, perhaps by overclocking it, perhaps by warming it up. Essentially, you can cause the processor to uh, malfunction and output erroneous data. It turns out that if during encryption there are errors in the last round of the encryption process, that the resulting ciphertexts that are produced are enough to actually expose the secret key K. It's quite an interesting result that in fact if you have any errors, if you ever output a wrong result, that actually could completely compromise your secret key. So of course the defense against this means that before you output the result of your algorithm, you should check to make sure that the correct result was computed. Now, of course, that's non-trivial, because how do you know that the error didn't happen in your checking algorithm? But there are known ways around that. So basically, you can actually compute something three or four times, take majority over all those results, and be assured that the output really is correct, as long as not too many faults occurred inside of your computation. These are attacks on the implementation. I hope these examples kind of show you that not only should you not invent your own block ciphers, you should never even implement these crypto primitives yourself, because A, you have to make sure there are no side channel attacks on your implementation, and B, you have to make sure that the implementation is secure against fault attacks. Okay, so instead, you should just use standard libraries like the ones available in OpenSSL and many other libraries out there. So don't implement these primitives yourself, just use existing libraries. All right, so now I want to turn to kind of more sophisticated attacks on block ciphers, and I'll particularly talk about how these attacks apply to DES. Okay, so these attacks were discovered by uh, Biham and Shamir back in 1989, and I'll particularly describe a version of the attack discovered by Matsui in uh, 1993. So the goal here is basically, given many, many, many input-output pairs, can we actually recover the key better than exhaustive search? So anything that runs better than exhaustive search already counts as an attack on the block cipher. Okay, so the example I want to give you is what's called linear cryptanalysis. And here, uh, imagine it so happens that, you know, C is the encryption of M using key K. And suppose it so happens that if I look at a random key and a random message, somehow there's a dependence between the message, ciphertext, and the key bits. In particular, if I XOR a subset of the message bits, so this is just a subset of the message bits, if I XOR that with a certain subset of the ciphertext bits, so these two, the attacker sees. The attacker has the message and the attacker has the ciphertext. And then you compare that to an XOR of a subset of the key bits. Now, if the two were completely independent, which is what you'd like, you definitely don't want 
your message and your cipher text to somehow predict your qubits. If the two are like completely independent, then this equality will hold with probability exactly one half. But suppose it so happens that there's a bias and this probability holds with probability half plus epsilon for some small epsilon. It so happens that in fact for DES, there is such a relation. It, the relation holds specifically because of a bug in the design of the fifth S box. It turns out the fifth S box happens to be too close to a linear function. And that linear function basically as it propagates through the entire dead circuit, generates a relation of this type. You notice this is basically a linear relation that's being computed here. So this small, tiny, tiny linearity in the fifth S box generates this relation over the entire circuit where the epsilon is tiny. Epsilon is one over two to the 21. And I wrote down what that is. So the bias is really, 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 really small. But nevertheless, there is a bias using these particular subsets of bits. Now, I'm not going to show you how to derive this relation, or I'm not going to show you even what it is. I'll just tell you how to use a relation like this once you find it. OK, so here's our relation that we have. And the question is how to use it. So with a little bit of statistics, you can actually use an equation like this to determine some of the key bits. And here's how you do it. Suppose you were given 1 over epsilon squared message ciphertext pairs. And these have to be independently random messages and the corresponding ciphertexts. What you would do is you would use the formula above. In fact, you would use the left-hand side of the formula above to compute this relation between the message and ciphertext for all the pairs you were given. Now, what do you know? You know that for half plus epsilon of these values, you know that these things will be equal to uh, an XOR of the key bits. So if you take majority over all the values you've computed, it turns out it's not so difficult to see that, in fact, you'll get the correct prediction for the XOR of the key bits with probability 97.7%. In other words, if this relation happens to be correct more than half the time, then the majority will be right. And because there's a bias, there's an epsilon bias, the probability that you will be correct more than half the time is in fact 97.7%, in which case the majority in fact will give you the correct XOR of the key bits. Okay, so this is kind of cool. Within one over epsilon squared time, you can figure out an XOR of a bunch of qubits. So now let's apply this to, to DES. So for DES, we have epsilon, which is 1 over 21, which means that if you give me 2 to the 42 input-output pairs, I can figure out an XOR of the qubits. And now it turns out, I'm not going to exactly show you how, roughly speaking, using this method, you don't just get one qubit. In fact, you get two qubits. You can kind of use this relation, one's going in a forward direction and one's going in the backwards direction. So that gives you two XORs of bits of the secret key. Okay, so that's two bits of information about the secret key. And then it turns out you can get 12 more bits because essentially you can figure out what the inputs are to the fifth S box. Okay, so I'm not going to exactly show you how, but it turns out you can get 12 more bits, which is a total of 14 bits overall. So now using this method, you've recovered 14 bits of the secret key. And of course, it took you time two to the 42. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, so the rest of it is easy. Now what you're going to do is you're going to do exhaustive search on the remaining bits. Well, how many remaining bits are there? Well, there are 42 remaining bits, so the exhaustive search would take you time 2 to the 42. So what's the total attack time? Well, the first step of the algorithm to determine the 14 bits took 2 to the 42 time. And the remaining brute force search also took 2 to the 42 time. So overall, the attack took 2 to the 43 time. Okay, so now this is much better than exhaustive search. Within 2 to the 43 time, we broke DES, but of course this required 2 to the 42 random input-output pairs, whereas exhaustive search only required three pairs. Okay, so this is a fairly large number of input-output pairs that are needed, but given such a large number, you can actually uh, recover the, the key faster than exhaustive search. Okay, so what's the lesson in all this? The lesson is firstly, any tiny bit of linearity, basically in, this, in the fifth S box, which was not designed as well as the other S boxes, basically led to an attack on the algorithm. Okay, a tiny bit of linearity already introduced this uh, linear attack. And I want to emphasize again, that this is not the sort of thing you would think of when you design a cipher. And so again, the conclusion here is, there are very subtle attacks on block ciphers, one which you will not be able to find yourself. And so just stick to the standards, don't ever, 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 ever design your block cipher. Okay, so that's all I want to say about sophisticated attacks. Now let's move on to the last type of attack that I want to mention, which, which I'll call uh, quantum attacks, which are again, are, these are generic attacks on all block ciphers. 
So let me explain what I mean by this. So first of all, let's look at a generic problem. It's a generic search problem. Suppose I have a function on some large domain x that happens to be to output either 0 or 1. And it, it so happens that this function is mostly 0, and there's like maybe one input where the function happens to evaluate to 1. And your goal is basically, you know, find me the input where the function happens to be 1. Maybe there's only one such input, but your goal is to find it. Well, so on a classical computer, what can you do? The function is given to you. It's given to you as a black box. So the best you can do is just try all possible inputs. So this is going to take time, which is linear in the size of the domain. Now, it turns out there's an absolutely magical result that says that if you build a computer that's based on quantum physics as opposed to classical physics, you can solve this problem faster. So let me explain what I mean by this. So first of all, in the 70s and 80s, it was observed, I think it was actually uh, Richard Feynman who observed this initially, that said that it turns out to be very difficult to simulate quantum experiments on a classical computer. So Feynman said, hey, if that's the case, maybe these quantum experiments are computing things that a classical computer can't compute. So they're somehow able to compute very quickly things that are very difficult to do classically. And that turned out to be correct. And in fact, the example I want to show you is one of these amazing things that, in fact, if you could build a quantum computer that's using quantum physics, then, it's, in fact, you can solve this search problem not in time x, but in time square root of x. So somehow, even though the computer doesn't know anything about the function f, it's treating it as a black box, nevertheless, it's able to find a point where the function is 1 in time square root of x. I'm not going to explain this here, but at the end of the class, we're going to have an advanced topics lecture. And if you'd like me to explain how this algorithm works, I can explain it in that advanced topics lecture. It's actually quite interesting. And in fact, quantum computers have quite an impact on crypto. And again, as I said, I can explain this in the very last lecture. All right. So what does this have to do with breaking block ciphers? So far, it's just a generic uh, search problem. Well, oh, actually, I guess I should say before I show you the application, I should mention that, well, you might be wondering, well, can someone build a quantum computer? And this is still completely unknown. But at this point, nobody really knows if we can build large enough uh, quantum computers to actually take advantage of this beautiful algorithm due to Grover. All right, so what does this have to do with block ciphers? Well, so suppose I give you a message and a ciphertext pair, just one or just a few. We can define a function as follows. It's a function on k. It's a function on uh, the key space. And the function will basically output 1 if it so happens that the encryption of m with k maps to c, and it will output 0 otherwise. Now, we argue that basically this is exactly the type of function that's 1 at one point in the key space, and that's it. So by Grover's algorithm, we can actually find the secret key in time square root of k. So what does that mean? For des, this would totally destroy des. This would say that in time 2 to the 28, you can find uh, a key. 2 to the 28 is about 200 million, so 200 million steps, which is, you know, this takes a millisecond on a modern computer. This would totally uh, destroy DES. But even AES with 128-bit keys, you would be able to find the secret key in time roughly 2 to the 64. And 2 to the 64 is these days considered insecure. That's within the realm of exhaustive search. And so basically, if somebody was able to build a quantum computer, we would then say that AES-128 is no longer secure. Instead, if somebody, you know, if tomorrow you open up the newspaper and you read an article that says, you know, so-and-so built a quantum computer, the conclusion, the consequence of all that is that you should immediately move to, to block ciphers that use uh, 256 bits, because then the running time of Grover's algorithm is 2 to the 128, which is more time than we consider feasible. And the, basically, there are example ciphers with 256 bits. For example, AES 256. This is one of the reasons why AES was designed with 256 bits in mind. But to be honest, this is not the only reason. There are other reasons why you wanted to have uh, larger key sizes. OK, so this is, as I said, just a taste of the different attacks on block ciphers. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that. If we decide on quantum for the last topic of the course, then we'll cover that in the very last lecture. Over the years, it became clear that DES and triple DES are simply not designed for modern hardware and are too slow. As a result, NIST started a new process to standardize in a new block cipher called the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES for short. 
NIST started its effort in 1997 when it requested uh, proposals for a new block cipher. It received 15 submissions a year later. And finally, in the year 2000, it adopted the cipher called Rindel as the advanced encryption standard. This was a cipher designed in Belgium. And we already said that its block size is 128 bits. And it's got three possible key sizes, 128 bits, 192, and 256. And now the assumption is that the larger the key size is, the more secure the block cipher is as a pseudo-random permutation. But because it also has more rounds involved in its operation, the slower the cipher becomes. So the larger the key, supposedly the more secure the cipher, but also the slower it becomes. So for example, AES-128 is the fastest of these uh, ciphers, and AES-256 is the slowest. Now, AES is built as what's called a substitution permutation network. It's not a Feistel network. Remember that in a Feistel network, half the bits were unchanged from round to round. In a substitution permutation network, all the bits are changed in every round. And the network works as follows. So here we have the first round of the substitution permutation network, where the first thing we do is we XOR the current state with the round key, in this case, the first round key. Then we go through a substitution layer where blocks of state are replaced with other blocks based on what the substitution table says. And then we go through a permutation layer where bits are permuted and shuffled around. And then we do this again. We XOR with the next round key, we go through a substitution phase, and we permute the bits around. And so on and so on and so forth until we reach the final round where we XOR with the very last round key, and then out comes the output. Now, an important point about this design is that, in fact, because of how it's built, every step in this network needs to be reversible so that the whole thing is reversible. And so the way we would uh, decrypt, essentially, is we would take the output and simply apply each step of the network in reverse order. So we start with the permutation step, and we have to make sure that step is reversible. Then we look at the substitution layer, and we have to make sure this step is reversible. And this is very different from DES. In DES, if you remember, the substitution tables were not reversible at all. In fact, they mapped six bits to four bits, whereas here, everything has to be reversible, otherwise it would be impossible to decrypt. And of course, the XOR with the round key uh, is reversible as well. Okay, so inversion of a substitution permutation network is simply done by applying all the steps in the reverse order. So now that we understand the generic construction, let's look at the specifics of AES. So AES operates on a 128-bit block, which is 16 bytes. So what we do with AES is we uh, write those 16 bytes as a 4x4 four four matrix. Each cell in the matrix contains one byte. And then we start with the first round. So we XOR with the first round key. And then we apply a certain function that uh, includes substitutions and permutations and other operations on the state. And again, these three functions that are applied here have to be invertible so that, in fact, the cipher can be decrypted. And then we XOR with the next round key, and we do that again. Again, we apply the round function and XOR with the round key, and we do that again and again and again. We do it 10 times, although interestingly, in the last round, the mixed column step is actually missing. And then finally, we XOR with the last round key, and uh, out comes the output. Again, at every phase here, we always, always, always keep this 4x4 four four array, and so the output is also 4x4, four four, which is 16 bytes, which is 128 bits. Now, the round keys themselves, of course, come from a 16-byte AES key uh, using key expansion. So the key expansion maps us from a 16-byte AES key into 11 keys, each one being 16 bytes. So these keys themselves are also a 4x4 four four array, uh, that's XORed into the current state. Okay, so that's the schematic of how AES works, and the only thing that's left to do is specify these three functions, byte sub, shift row, and mix column. And those are fairly easy to explain, so I'm just going to give you the high-level description of what they are, and uh, those interested in the details can look it up online. So the way byte substitution works is literally it's one S box containing 256 bytes, and essentially what it does is it uh, applies the S box to every byte in the current state. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the current state is going to be this 4x4 four four, uh, table. So here we have the 4x4 four four table. And to each element in this table, we apply the S box. So let's call it the A table. And then what we do is essentially for all 4x4 four four entries, essentially the next step, AIJ, 
becomes the current step evaluated at the lookup table. So we use the current cell as an entry, as an index into the lookup table, and then uh, the value of the lookup table is what's output. Okay, so that's the first step. The next step that happens is a shift row step, which is basically just a permutation. So essentially we kind of do a cyclic shift on each one of the rows. So you can see the second row is cyclically shifted by one position. The third row is cyclically shifted by two positions. And the third row is cyclically shifted by three positions. And the last thing we do is mix columns, where literally we apply a linear transformation to each one of these columns. So there's a certain matrix that multiplies each one of these columns and it becomes uh, the next column. So this linear transformation is applied independently to each one of the columns. Now I should point out that so far uh, shift rows and mixed columns are very easy to implement in code. And I should say that the by substitution itself is also easily computable so that you can actually write code that takes less than 256 bytes to write and you can kind of shrink the description of AES by literally storing code that computes the table rather than hardwiring the table into your implementation. And in fact, this is kind of a generic fact about AES that if you kind of allow no pre-computation at all, including computing the S box on the fly, then in fact you get a fairly small implementation of AES. So it, it could fit on very constrained environments where there isn't enough room to hold uh, complicated code. But of course, this would be the slowest implementation because everything is computed now on the fly. And as a result, the implementation obviously is going to be uh, slower than uh, if things were pre-computed. And then there's this trade-off. For example, if you have a lot of space and you can support large code, you can actually pre-compute quite a bit of the three steps that I just mentioned. In fact, there are multiple options of pre-computations. You can build a table that's only 4 kilobyte big. Or you can build a table that's even longer, maybe 24 kilobytes. So basically, you'll have these big tables in your implementation, but then your actual performance is going to be really good because all you're doing is just table lookups and XORs. You're not doing any other complicated arithmetic. And as a result, if you can do a lot of pre-computation, these three steps here, byte sub, shift rows, and mixed columns, can be converted just into a number, a small number of table lookups and some XORs. All you can do is just compute the S box. So now your implementation would just have 256 bytes hard coded. The rest would just be code that's actually computing these three functions. The performance would be slower than in the previous step, but the code footprint would also be smaller. So, and overall, there's this nice trade off between code size and performance. So, on high end machines, on high end servers, where you can afford to have a lot of code, you can pre compute and store these big tables and get the best performance. Whereas on low-end machines like 8-bit smart cards or think of like an 8-bit wristwatch, you would actually have a relatively small implementation of AES, uh, but as a result, of course, it won't be so fast. So here's an example that's a little unusual. Suppose you wanted to implement AES in JavaScript so you can send an AES library to the browser and have the browser actually do AES by itself. So in this case, what you'd like to do is you'd like to both shrink the code size so that on the network, there's minimum traffic to send the library over to the browser. But at the same time, you'd like the browser performance to be as fast as possible. Uh, so this is something that uh, we did a while ago. Essentially, the idea is that the code that actually gets sent to the browser doesn't have any pre-computed table. And as a result, it's fairly small code. But then the minute it lands on the browser, what the browser will do is it will actually pre-compute all the tables. So in some sense, the code goes from this being small and compact it gets bloated with all these pre-computed tables, but those are stored on the laptop, which presumably has a lot of memory. And then once you have the pre-computed tables, you actually encrypt using them, and that's how you get the best performance. Okay, so if you have to send an implementation of AES over the network, you can kind of get the best of all worlds, where the code over the network is small, but when it reaches the target client, it can kind of inflate itself and then get the best performance as it's doing encryption on the client. Now, AES is such a popular block cipher. Now, essentially, when you build crypto into products, essentially, you're supposed to be using AES. And as a result, Intel actually put AES support into the processor itself. So since Westmere, uh, there are special instructions in the Intel processor to help accelerate AES. And so I listed these instructions here. They come in two pairs, AES Enc and AES Enc Last. And then there's AES Key Gen Assist. So let me explain what they do. So AES Enc essentially implements one round of AES, namely apply the three functions in the XOR with the round key. 
an AES in class basically implements the last round of AES. Remember, the last round didn't have the mixed columns phase. It only had the subs, bytes, and uh, shift rows. And so that's what AES in class does. And the way you call these instructions is using 128-bit registers, which correspond to the state of AES. And so you would have one register containing the state and one register containing the current round key. And then when you call AES enc on these two registers, basically they would run one round of AES and place the result inside of this XMM1 state register. And as a result, if you wanted to implement the whole AES, all you would do is you would call AES enc nine times, and then you would call AES enc class one time, and these 10 instructions are basically the entire implementation of AES. That's it, it's that easy to implement AES on this hardware. And they claim because these operations are now done inside the processor, not using external instructions, they're implemented in the processor, they claim that they can get a 14x speed up over, say, an implementation that's running on the same hardware, but implementing AES without these special instructions. So this is quite a significant speed up, and in fact, there are now lots of products that make use of these special instructions. And let's just say that this is not specific to Intel. If you're an AMD fan, AMD also implemented exactly kind of similar instructions in their bulldozer architecture and further in future architectures. Okay, so let's talk about the security of AES. I want to mention just two attacks here. Obviously, AES has been studied quite a bit, but the only two attacks on the full AES are the following two. So first of all, if you wanted to do key recovery, the best attack uh, basically is only four times uh, faster than exhaustive search, which means that instead of 128-bit key, really you should be thinking of AES as 126-bit key, because exhaustive search really is kind of four times faster than it should. Of course, two to the 126 is still more time than we have to compute, and this really does not hurt the security of AES. The more significant attack actually is on AES-256. It turns out there's a weakness in the key expansion uh, design of AES, which allows for what's called a related key attack. So what's a related key attack? Essentially, if you give me about two to the 100 input-output pairs for AES, but from four related keys, so these are keys that are very closely uh, related, namely key number two is the same as key number one, except that a few bits of key number one have been flipped. Similarly, key number three is the same as key number one, except that a few bits are flipped, and the same for key number four. These are very closely related keys. If you like, their hamming distance is very short. But if you do that, then in fact, there is a 2 to the 100 attack. Now you should say, well, 2 to the 100 is still impractical. This is still more time than we can actually run today. But nevertheless, the fact that it's so much better than an exhaustive search attack is so much better than 2 to the 256 is kind of a limitation of the cipher. But generally, it's not a significant limitation because it requires related keys. And so in practice, of course, you're supposed to be choosing your keys at random so that you have no related keys in your system, and as a result, this attack wouldn't apply. But if you do have related keys, then there's a problem. So this is the end of the segment, and in the next segment, we're going to talk about more provably secure constructions for block ciphers. In this segment, we ask whether we can build block ciphers from simpler primitives like pseudorandom generators. And we're going to show that the answer is yes. So to begin with, let's ask whether we can build pseudorandom functions as opposed to pseudorandom permutations from a pseudorandom generator. Okay, can we build a PRF from a PRG? Our ultimate goal, though, is to build a block cipher, which is a PRP. And we'll get to that at the end. Okay, for now we build a PRF. So let's start with a PRG that doubles its input. Okay, so the seed uh, for this PRG is an element in K, and the output is actually two elements in K. So here we have a schematic of this generator that basically takes as input a seed in K and outputs two elements in K as its output. And now what does it mean for this PRG to be secure? Recall this means that essentially the output is indistinguishable from a random element inside of K squared. Now it turns out it's very easy to define basically what's called a one-bit PRF from this PRG. So what's a one-bit PRF? It's basically a PRF whose domain is only one bit. Okay, so it's a PRF that just takes one bit as input. Okay, and the way we'll do it is we'll say if the input bit x is zero, output the left outputs, and if the input bit x is one, output the right outputs of the PRF. Okay, in symbols, basically, we have uh, what we wrote here. 
Now it's straightforward to show that in fact if G is a secure PRG, then this one bit PRF is in fact a secure PRF. If you think about it for a second, this is really a tautology. It's really just uh, seeing the same thing twice. So I'll leave it for you to think about this briefly and see and convince yourself that in fact this theorem is true. The real question is whether we can build a PRF that actually has a domain that's bigger than just one bit. Ideally, we'd like the domain to be 128 bits, just say as a yes has. So the question is, can we build a 128-bit PRF from a pseudo-random generator? Well, so let's see if we can make progress. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, well, again, let's start with a PRG that doubles its input. Let's see if we can build a PRG that quadruples its input. Okay, so it goes from k to k to the fourth instead of k to k squared. Okay, so let's see how to do it. So here we start with our original PRG that just doubles its input. But now remember, the fact that this is a PRG means that the output of the PRG is indistinguishable from two random values in K. Well, if the output looks like two random values in K, we can simply apply the generator again to those two outputs. So let's say we apply the generator once to the left output and once to the right output. And we're going to call the output of that, this quadruple of elements, we're going to call that G1K. And I wrote down in symbols what uh, this generator does, but you can see basically from this figure exactly how the generator works. Okay, so now that we have a generator from k to k to the fourth, we actually get a 2-bit PRF. Namely, what we'll do is we'll say, given 2 bits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1, we'll simply output the appropriate block that's the output of G1k. Okay, so now we can basically have a PRF that takes four possible inputs as opposed to just two possible inputs as before. So the question you should be asking me is, why is this G1K secure? Why is it a secure PRG? That is, why is this quadruple of outputs indistinguishable from random? And so let's do a quick proof of this. We'll just do a simple proof by pictures. So here's our generator that we want to prove is secure. And what that means is we want to argue that this distribution is indistinguishable from a random four tuple in k to the fourth. Okay, so our goal is to prove that these two are indistinguishable. Well, let's do it one step at a time. We know that the generator is a secure generator. Therefore, in fact, the output of the first level is indistinguishable from random. In other words, if we replace the first level by truly random strings, these two are truly random picked in the key space, then no efficient adversary should be able to distinguish these two distributions. In fact, if you could distinguish these two distributions, it's easy to show that you would break the original PRG. Okay, but essentially you can see that the reason we can do this a replacement, we can replace the output of G with truly random values, is exactly because of the definition of the PRG, which says that the output of the PRG is indistinguishable from random, so we might as well just put random there, and no efficient adversary can distinguish the resulting two distributions. Okay, so far so good. But now we can do the same thing again to the left-hand side. In other words, we can replace these two pseudo-random outputs by truly random outputs. And again, because the generator G is secure, no efficient adversary can tell uh, the difference between these two distributions. Put differently, if an adversary can distinguish these two distributions, then we would also get an attack on the generator G. And now finally, we're going to do this one last time. We're going to replace this pseudo-random pair by a truly random pair, and then lo and behold, we get the actual distribution that we were shooting for. We will get a distribution that's really made of four independent blocks. And so now we've proved this transition, basically, that these two are indistinguishable, these two are indistinguishable, and these two are indistinguishable, and therefore, these two are indistinguishable, which is what we wanted to prove. Okay, so this is kind of uh, the high-level idea for the proof. It's not too difficult to make this rigorous, but I just wanted to show you kind of the intuition for how the proof works. Well, if we were able to extend the generator's output once, there's nothing preventing us from doing it again. So here's the generator G1 that outputs four elements in the key space. And remember, the output here is indistinguishable from a random four tuple. That's what we just proved. And so there's nothing preventing us from applying the generator again. So we'll take the generator, apply it to this random looking thing, and we should be able to get this random looking thing, this pair over here that's random looking. And we can do the same thing again and again and again. And now basically we've built a new generator that outputs elements in k to the eighth as opposed to k to the fourth. And again, the proof of security is pretty much the same as the one 
I just showed you, essentially you gradually change the outputs into truly random outputs. So we would change this to a truly random output, then this, then that, then this, then that, and so on and so forth. Until finally we get something that's truly random, and therefore the original two distributions we started with, G2K and truly random, are indistinguishable. Okay, so far so good. So now we have a generator that outputs elements in K to the eighth. Now if we do that, basically we get a 3-bit PRF. In other words, at 0, 0, 0, this PRF would output this block, and so on and so forth, until 1, 1, 1, it would output this block. Now, the interesting thing is that, in fact, this PRF is easy to compute. So, for example, suppose we wanted to compute the PRF at the point 1, 0, 1. Okay, it's a 3-bit PRF. So, 1, 0, 1. How would we do that? Well, basically, we would start from the original key K, and now we would apply the generator G, but we would only pay attention to the right output of G, because the first bit is 1. And then we will apply the generator again, but we would only pay attention to the left output of the generator, because the second bit is 0. And then we would apply the generator again and only pay attention to the right outputs because the third bit is one and that would be the final output, right? So you can see that that led us to one, zero, one. And in fact, because the entire generator is pseudo-random, we know in particular that this output here is pseudo-random. Okay, so this gives us a three-bit PRF. Well, if it worked three times, there's no reason why it can't work uh, n times. And so if we apply this transformation again and again, we arrive at what's called the GGM PRF. GGM stands for Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Mikali. These are the inventors of this PRF. And the way it works is as follows. So we start off with a generator that just doubles its output. And now we're able to build a PRF that acts on a large domain, namely a domain of size 0, 1 to the n, where n could be as big as 128 or even more. So let's see. Suppose we're given an input in 0, 1 to the n. Let me show you how to evaluate the PRF. Well, by now you should actually have a good idea for how to do it. Essentially, we start from the original key, and then we apply the generator, and we take either the left or the right side, depending on the bit x0. And then we arrive at the next key, k1. And then we apply the generator again, and we take the left or the right side, uh, depending on x1, and we arrive at the next key. And then we do this again and again, until finally we arrive at uh, the output. So we've processed all n bits, and we arrive at the output of this function. And basically, we can prove security, again, pretty much along the same lines as uh, we did before. And we can show that if G is a secure PRG, then in fact we get a secure PRF on uh, 0, 1 to the n, on a very large domain. So that's fantastic. So now we have, essentially, we have a PRF that's provably secure, assuming the underlying generator is secure. And a generator is supposedly much easier to build than an actual PRF. And in fact, it works on blocks that could be very large, in particular 0, 1 to the 128, which is what we needed. So you might ask, well, why is this thing not being used in practice? And the reason is that it's actually fairly slow. So imagine we plug in as a generator, imagine we plug in the salsa generator. So now to evaluate this PRF at 128-bit inputs, we would basically have to run the salsa generator 128 times, one time per bit of the input but then we would get a PRF that's 128 times slower than uh, the original salsa, and that's much, much, much slower than AES. AES is a heuristic PRF, but nevertheless, it's much faster than what we just got here. And so even though this is a very elegant construction, it's not used in practice to build pseudo-random functions, although in a week we will be using this type of construction to build a message integrity mechanism. So the last step is basically, now that we have built a PRF, the question is whether we can actually build a block cipher. In other words, can we actually build a secure PRP from a secure PRG? Everything we've done so far is not reversible. Again, if you look at this construction here, we can't decrypt. Basically, given the final output, it's not possible to go back, or at least we don't know how to go back to the original input. So now the question of interest is, can we actually solve the problem we wanted to solve initially? Namely, can we actually build a block cipher from a secure PRG? So I'll let you think about this for a second and mark the answer. So, of course, I hope everybody said the answer is yes, and you already have all the ingredients to do it. In particular, you already know how to build a PRF from a pseudo-random generator. And we said that once we have a PRF, we can plug it into the luby rockoff construction, which, if you remember, was just a three-round Feistel. So we said that if you plug a secure PRF into a three-round Feistel, you get a secure PRP. So combining these two together basically gives us a secure PRP 
from pseudo random generator. And this is provably secure as long as the underlying generator is secure. So it's a beautiful result, but unfortunately, again, it's not used in practice because it's considerably slower than heuristic constructions like AES. Okay, so this completes our module on constructing pseudo random permutations and pseudo random functions. And then in the next module, we're going to talk about how to use these things to do proper encryption. Now that we know what block ciphers are and we know how to construct them, let's see how to use them for secure encryption. But before that, I want to briefly remind you of an important abstraction called a pseudo-random function and a pseudo-random permutation. So as we said in the last module, block ciphers map n bits of inputs to n bits of outputs, and we saw two examples of block ciphers, uh, triple des and AES. Now, an important abstraction of the concept of a block cipher is captured by this idea of a PRP and a PRF. And remember that a pseudo-random function, a PRF, basically is a function that takes two inputs. It takes a key and an element in some set x, and it outputs an element in some set y. And for now, the only requirement is that there's an efficient algorithm to evaluate this function. We're going to talk about security for PRFs in just a minute. And then similarly, there's a related concept called a pseudo-random permutation, which is similar to a PRF. In fact, there's also an efficient algorithm to evaluate uh, the pseudo-random permutation. However, there's an additional requirement that there's also an algorithm D that will invert this function E. So a PRP is basically a PRF, but where the function is required to be one-to-one -one for all keys, and there's an efficient inversion algorithm. So now let's talk about how to define secure PRFs. So we already said that essentially the goal of a PRF is to look like a random function from the set x to y. So to capture that more precisely, we defined this notation funds xy to be the set of all functions from the set x to the set y. Similarly, we defined the set s sub f to be the set of all functions from the set x to y that are defined by the PRF. In other words, once you fix the key k, you obtain a function from the set x to the set y, and the set of all such functions given a particular PRF would be the set s sub f. So as we said last time, uh, funds xy is generally a gigantic set of all functions from x to y. I think I mentioned that, in fact, for AES, where x and y are 2 to the 128, the size of this set is 2 to the 128 times 2 to the 128. It's a double exponential, which is an absolutely enormous number. On the other hand, uh, the number of functions defined by the AES block cipher is just 2 to the 128, namely one function from each key. And what we'd like to say is that a random choice from this huge set is indistinguishable from a random choice from this small set. And what do we mean by indistinguishable? We mean that an, an adversary who can interact with a random function in here can't distinguish that interaction from an interaction with a random function in here. Now let's define that more precisely. So we're going to, as usual, define two experiments, experiment 0 and experiment 1, and our goal is to say that the adversary can't distinguish these two experiments. So in experiment 0, the challenger basically is going to choose a random pseudo-random function. Okay, so he's going to fix the key k at random, and that's going to define this function little f over here to be one of the functions implemented by the PRF. In experiment 1, on the other hand, the challenger is going to choose a truly random function from the set x to the set y, and again, we're going to call this truly random function little f. Either way, in either experiment 0 or experiment 1, the challenger ends up with this little function f that's either chosen from the PRF, or chosen as a truly random function from x to y. Now, the adversary basically gets to query this function little f. So he gets to submit a query x1, and he obtains the value of f at the point x1. Then he gets to submit an x2, and he obtains the value of f at the point x2. And so on and so forth, he makes q queries, and so he learns the value of the function little f at those q points. And now his goal is to say whether the function little f is chosen truly at random from funds x, y, or chosen just from the set of functions implemented by the PRF. So he outputs a certain bit b prime, and we'll refer to that output as the output of experiment, either experiment 0 or experiment 1. And as usual, we say that the PRF is secure if, in fact, the adversary can't distinguish these two experiments. In other words, the probability that he outputs 1 in experiment 0 is the same, pretty much the same, as the probability that he outputs 1 in experiment 1. In other words, the difference of these two probabilities is negligible. So this captures nicely the fact that the adversary couldn't distinguish a pseudo-random function from a truly random function from the set x to y. Now the definition for a secure 
pseudo-random permutation, a secure PRP, which is basically a secure block cipher, is pretty much the same. In experiment zero, the adversary is going to choose a random instance of the PRP, so he's going to choose a random k and define little f to be the function that corresponds to little k within the pseudo-random permutation. In experiment one, the adversary is going to choose not a truly random function from x to y, but a truly random one-to-one -one function from x to x. Okay, so the goal of our PRP is to look like a random permutation from x to x, namely a random one-to-one -one function from the set x to itself. So the little function little f here is again going to be a random function from the set x to itself. And again, the challenger ends up with this function little f. As before, the adversary gets to submit queries, and he gets to see the results of those queries, and then he shouldn't be able to distinguish, again, experiment 0 from experiment 1. So again, given the value of the function f at q points chosen by the adversary, he can't tell whether the function f came from a PRP or whether it's a truly random permutation from x to x. So let's look at a simple example. Suppose the set x contains only two points, 0 and 1. In this case, perms x is really easy to define. Essentially, there are two points, and we're looking at you know, 0, 1, and we're asking, what is the set of all invertible functions on the set 0, 1? Well, there are only two such functions. One function is the identity function, and the other function is basically the function that does crossovers, namely this function here. These are the only two invertible functions on the set 0, 1. So really, perms x only contains two functions in this case. Now, let's look at the following PRP. The key space is going to be 0, 1, and of course x is going to be 0, 1. And let's define the PRP as basically x, x, or k. Okay, so that's our PRP. And my question to you is, is this a secure PRP? In other words, is this PRP indistinguishable from a random function on perms x? I hope everybody said uh, yes, because essentially the set of functions implemented in this PRP is identical to the set of functions in perms x. So a random choice of key here is identical to a random choice of function over here, and as a result, the two distributions, either pseudo-random or random, are identical. So clearly an adversary can't distinguish the two distributions. Now, we already said that we have a couple of examples of secure PRPs, uh, triple DES and AES, and I just wanted to mention that if you want to make things very concrete, here's a concrete security assumptions about AES. Just to give an example, say that all algorithms that run in time 2 to the 80 have advantage against AES, of at most 2 to the minus 40. This is a reasonable assumption about AES, and I just wanted to state it for concreteness. So let's look at another example. Consider again the PRP from the previous question, namely x, x, or k. Remember the set x was just one bit, namely the value 0 and 1. And this time we're asking, is this PRP a secure PRF? In other words, is this PRP indistinguishable from a random function from x to x? Now, the set of random functions from x to x, funds xx, in this case, contains only four elements. There are the two invertible functions, which we already saw, namely the identity function and the negation function, the function that sends 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. But there are two other functions, namely the function that sends everything to 0 and the function that sends everything to 1. Okay? These are four functions inside funds of xx. And the question is, is this PRP that we just looked at, is it also indistinguishable from a random choice from funds xx? So I hope everybody said no, and the reason it's not a secure PRF is because there's a simple attack. Namely, the attacker is supposed to distinguish whether he's interacting with this PRP or is he interacting with a random function from funds xx. And the distinguisher is very simple. Basically, we're going to query the function at both x equals 0 and x equals 1. And then if we get a collision, in other words, if f of 0 is equal to f of 1, then for sure we're not interacting with a PRP, in which case we can just output 1. In other words, we're interacting with a random function. In other words, we say 0. So let's look at the advantage of this distinguisher. Well, when it's interacting with a PRP, will never output a 1 because f of 0 can never be equal to f of 1. In other words, the probability of outputting 1 is 0. However, when we interact with a truly random function in funds xx, the probability that f of 0 is equal to f of 1 is exactly 1 half, because half the functions satisfy f of 0 is equal to f of 1, and half the functions don't. So then we'll output 1 with probability 1 half. So the advantage of this distinguisher is 1 half, which is non-negligible, and as a result, this PRP here is not a secure PRF. 
Now it turns out this is only true because the set X is very small, and in fact there's an important lemma called the PRF switching lemma that says that a secure PRP is in fact a secure PRF whenever the set X is sufficiently large. And by sufficiently large, I mean, say, the output space of AES, which is 2 to the 128. So by this lemma, which we'll state more precisely in a second, AES, if it's a secure PRP, it is also a secure PRF. So the lemma basically says the following. If you give me a PRP over the set X, then for any adversary that queries the PRP at the most Q points, so it makes it most Q queries into the challenge function, then the difference between its advantage in attacking the PRP when compared to a random function is very close to its advantage in distinguishing the PRP from a random permutation. In fact, the difference is bounded by this quantity here. And since we said that x is very large, this quantity q squared over 2x is negligible. Okay, that's going to be our goal. So essentially, when again, when x is large, say 2 to the 128, Q, say, is going to be 2 to the 32, that that's a billion queries that the adversary makes, then still the ratio is going to be negligible, in which case we say that the adversary's advantage in distinguishing the PRP from a random function is pretty much the same as its advantage in distinguishing the PRP from a random permutation. So again, if basically, if E is already a secure PRP, then it's already a secure PRF. So for AES, AES we believe is a secure PRP, and therefore AES we can also use it as a secure PRF. And so as a final note, I just want to mention that really from now on, you can kind of forget about the inner workings of AES and triple DES. We're simply going to assume that both are secure PRPs, and then we're going to see how to use them. But whenever I say PRP or PRF, you should be thinking in your mind basically AES or triple DES. So as our first example, let's look at a very simple way of using a block cipher for encryption. In particular, we'll see how to use a block cipher with a one-time key. So in this segment, we're just going to use the block cipher to encrypt using keys that are used one time. In other words, all the adversary gets to see is one ciphertext, and his goal is to break semantic security of that ciphertext. Now in the next segment, we're going to turn into more uh, interesting applications of block ciphers, and we're going to see how to encrypt using keys that are used many, many times to encrypt many messages. So before we start, I want to mention that there is like a classic mistake in using a block cipher. Unfortunately, there are some products that actually work this way, and they are badly broken, so I want to make sure that none of you guys actually make this mistake. So this mode of operation is called an electronic codebook, and it works as follows. It's the first thing that comes to mind when you want to use a block cipher for encryption. What we do is we take our message, we break it into blocks, each block as big as the block cipher block. So in the case of AES, we would be breaking our message into 16-byte blocks. And then we encrypt each block separately. So this mode is often called electronic codebook. And unfortunately, it's terribly insecure because you realize if two blocks are equal, for example, here, these two blocks happen to be equal, then necessarily the resulting ciphertexts are also going to be equal. So an attacker who looks at the ciphertext, even though he might not know what's actually written in these blocks, will know that these two blocks are equal. And as a result, he learns something about the plaintext that he shouldn't have learned. And if this isn't clear enough for you abstractly, the best way to explain this is using a picture. And so here's this guy here that uh, you know, has this really dark black hair. And when we encrypt this image, this bitmap image, using electronic codebook mode, you see that his hair that contains lots of ones basically always gets encrypted the same way so that his silhouette actually is completely visible even in the encrypted data. Okay, so this is a nice example of how the electronic codebook mode can actually leak information about the plaintext that could tell something to the attacker. So the question is how to correctly use block ciphers to encrypt long messages. And so I just want to briefly remind you of the notion we're trying to achieve, which is basically semantic security using a one-time key. So the adversary outputs two messages, M0 and M1, and then he gets either the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. These are two different experiments. And then our goal is to say that the adversary can't distinguish between these two experiments. So he can't distinguish the encryption of M0 from the encryption of M1. And the reason we call this security for a one-time key is that the key is only used to encrypt a single message, and as a result, the adversary will ever only see one ciphertext encrypted using this key. Okay, so the first thing we want to show is that, in fact, the mode that we just looked at, electronic codebook, in fact, is not semantically secure. And this is true as long as you're encrypting more than one block. So here's an example. Suppose we encrypt two blocks using a block cipher. Let me show you that, in fact, electronic codebook would not be secure. So here's what we would do. So we're the adversary. 
So we would output two messages, M0 and M1, where in one message the blocks are distinct, and in the other message the blocks are the same. The two blocks are equal to one another. Well, so what is the challenger going to do? The challenger is going to encrypt either M0 or M1. Either way, we're going to get two blocks back. So the ciphertext actually contains two blocks. The first block is going to be an encryption of the word hello, and the second block is going to be either an encryption of the word hello or the word world. And then if the two ciphertext blocks are the same, then the adversary knows that he received an encryption of the message hello, hello. And if they're different, he knows that he received an encryption of the message hello, world. Okay, so he just follows a simple strategy here. If you think about it for a second, you'll see what his advantage is. So what is the advantage? Well, this adversary, when he receives an encryption of the message M1, he will always output 0. And when he receives an encryption of the message M0, he will always output 1. And because of that, the advantage basically is 1, which means that the scheme is not secure, which again shows you the electronic codebook is not semantically secure and should never ever be used to encrypt uh, messages that are more than one block long. So what should we do? Well, so here's a simple example. What we could do is we could use what's called the deterministic counter mode. So in the deterministic counter mode, basically we build a stream cipher out of the block cipher. So suppose we have a PRF, F. So again, you should think of AES when I say that. So AES is also a secure PRF. And what we'll do is basically we'll evaluate AES at the point 0, at the point 1, at the point 2, up to the point L. This will generate a pseudo-random pad and uh, we'll XOR that with all the message blocks and recover the ciphertext as a result. Okay, so really this is just a stream cipher that's built out of a PRF like AES and triple DES, and it's a simple way to do encryption. I wanted to just very quickly show you the security theorem. In fact, we've already seen the security theorem when it applied to uh, stream ciphers using pseudo-random generators, so I'm not going to repeat this again. I'll just remind you that uh, essentially uh, for every adversary A that's trying to attack deterministic counter mode, we prove that there's an adversary B that's trying to uh, attack the PRF. And since this quantity is negligible because the PRF is secure, we obtain that this quantity is negligible, uh, and therefore the adversary has negligible advantage in defeating deterministic counter mode. And the proof in pictures is a really simple proof, so I'll just show it to you one more time for completeness. So basically what we want to show is when the adversary is given the encryption of the message M0, here this is the encryption of the message M0, M0 XOR counter applied to the PRF, versus in giving the encryption of the message M1, we want to argue that these two distributions are computationally indistinguishable. So the way we do that is basically we say, well, the top distribution, if instead of a PRF, we use a truly random function, namely here f is a truly random function, then the adversary, because of the property of the PRF, the adversary cannot distinguish these two experiments, right? A PRF is indistinguishable from a truly random function, therefore when we replace the PRF on the left with a truly random function on the right, the adversary is going to behave the same. Basically, he can't distinguish these two uh, distributions. But now because f is a truly random function, the pad here is a truly one-time pad, and therefore, no adversary can distinguish an encryption of M0 from an encryption of M1 under the one-time pad. So again, these two distributions are the same. In fact, here there's an actual equality. These two distributions literally are the same distribution. And similarly, again, when we go back from a truly random function here to a PRF, because the PRF is secure, the adversary can't distinguish these two bottom distributions, the left from the right. And so by following these three qualities, Basically, we've proven that the things we wanted to prove equal are actually computationally indistinguishable. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, proof to show that uh, the deterministic counter mode is in fact secure, and it's basically the same proof as uh, we had uh, when we proved that a, a stream cipher gives us semantic security. Okay, so that completes this segment, and in the next segment we'll talk about modes that enable us to use a key to encrypt multiple messages. In this segment, we will look at how to use block ciphers to encrypt multiple messages using the same key. This comes up in practice, for example, in file systems where the same key is used to encrypt multiple files. It comes up in networking protocols where the same key is used to encrypt multiple packets. So let's see how to do it. The first thing we need to do is to define what does it mean for a cipher to be secure when the same key is used to encrypt multiple messages. When we use the key more than once, the result of that is that the adversary gets to see many ciphertexts encrypted using the same key. As a result, when we define security, we're going to allow the adversary to mount what's called a chosen plaintext attack. In other words, the adversary can obtain the encryption of arbitrary messages of his choice. 
So, for example, if the adversary is interacting with Alice, the adversary can ask Alice to encrypt arbitrary messages of the adversary's choosing, and Alice will go ahead and encrypt those messages and give the adversary the resulting ciphertexts. You might wonder, why would Alice ever do this? How can this possibly happen in real life? But it turns out this is actually very common in real life, and in fact, this modeling is quite a conservative modeling of real life. For example, the adversary might send Alice an email. When Alice receives the email, she writes it to her encrypted disk, thereby encrypting the adversary's email using her secret key. If later the adversary steals this disk, then he obtains the encryption of an email that he sent to Alice under Alice's secret key. So that's an example of a chosen plaintext attack where the adversary provided Alice with a message and she encrypted that message using her own key and then later the attacker was able to obtain the resulting ciphertext. So that's the adversary's power and then the adversary's goal is basically to break semantic security. So let's define this more precisely. As usual we're going to define semantic security under a chosen plaintext attack using two experiments, experiment 0 and experiment 1, that are modeled as a game between a challenger and an adversary. When the game begins, the challenger is going to choose a random key k, and now the adversary basically gets to query the challenger. So the adversary begins by submitting a semantic security query, namely he submits two messages, m0 and m1, I added another index, but let me ignore that extra index for a while. So the adversary submits two messages, m0 and m1, that happen to be of the same length, and then the adversary receives the encryption of one of those messages, either of m0 or of m1. In experiment 0, he receives the encryption of m0. In experiment 1, he receives the encryption of m1. So, so far, this would look familiar. This looks exactly like a standard semantic security game. However, in a chosen plaintext attack, the adversary can now repeat this query again. So now he can issue a query with two other chosen plaintexts, again of the same length, and again he would receive the encryption of one of them. In experiment 0, he would receive the encryption of M0. In experiment 1, he would receive the encryption of M1. And the attacker can continue issuing queries like this. In fact, we'll say that he can issue up to Q queries of this type. Again, remember, every time he issues a pair of messages, that happen to be of the same length, and every time he either gets the encryption of the left side or the right side. Again, in experiment 0, he will always get the encryption of the left message. In experiment 1, he will always get the encryption of the right message. And then the adversary's goal is basically to figure out whether he is in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. In other words, whether he was constantly receiving the encryption of the left message or the encryption of the right message. So in some sense, this is a standard semantic security game just iterated over many queries that the attacker can issue adaptively one after the other. Now, the chosen plaintext attack is captured by the fact that if the attacker wants the encryption of a particular message M, what he could do is, for example, use query J for some J, where in this query J, he'll set both the zero message and the one message to be the exactly the same message M. In other words, both the left message and the right message are the same, and both are set to the message M. In this case, what he will receive, since both messages are the same, he knows that he's going to receive the encryption of this message M that he was interested in. So this is exactly what we meant by a chosen plaintext attack, where the adversary can submit a message M and receive the encryption of that particular message M of his choice. So some of his queries might be of this chosen plaintext flavor, where the message on the left is equal to the message on the right, but some of the queries might be standard semantic security queries, where the two messages are distinct, and that actually gives him information on whether he's in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. Now, by now, you should be used to this definition, where we say that the system is semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack, if for all efficient adversaries, they cannot distinguish experiment 0 from experiment 1. In other words, the probability that at the end the output B prime, which we're going to denote by the output of experiment B, this output will be the same whether they're in experiment 0 or experiment 1. So the attacker couldn't distinguish between always receiving encryptions of the left messages versus always receiving encryptions of the right messages. So in your mind, I'd like you to be thinking of an adversary that is able to mount a chosen plaintext attack, namely, be given the encryption of arbitrary messages of his choice, and his goal is to break semantic security for some other challenge ciphertexts.
And as I said, this game models the real world where the attacker is able to fool Alice into encrypting for him messages of his choice, and then the attacker's goal is to somehow break some challenge ciphertext. So I claim that all the ciphers that we've seen up until now, namely deterministic counter mode or the one-time pad, are insecure under a chosen plaintext attack. More generally, suppose we have an encryption scheme that always outputs the same ciphertext for a particular message M. In other words, if I ask the encryption scheme to encrypt the message M once, and then I ask the encryption scheme to encrypt the message M again, if in both cases the encryption scheme outputs the same ciphertext, then that system cannot possibly be secure under a chosen plaintext attack. And both deterministic counter mode and the one-time pad were of that flavor. They always output the same ciphertext given the same message. And so let's see why that cannot be chosen plaintext secure. And the attack is actually fairly simple. What the attacker is going to do is he's going to output the same message twice. This just says that he really wants the encryption of M0. So here the attacker is given C0, which is the encryption of M0. So this was his chosen plaintext query, where he actually received the encryption of the message M0 of his choice. And now he's going to break semantic security. So what he does is he outputs two messages, M0 and M1 of the same length and he's going to be given the encryption of MB. But lo and behold, we said that the encryption system always outputs the same ciphertext when it's encrypting the message M0. Therefore, if B is equal to 0, we know that C, this challenge ciphertext, is simply equal to C0, because it's the encryption of M0. However, if B is equal to 1, then we know that this challenge ciphertext is the encryption of M1, which is something other than C0. So all the attacker does is he just checks if C is equal to C0, he outputs 0. In other words, he outputs 1. So in this case, the attacker is able to perfectly guess this bit B, so he knows exactly whether he was given the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. And as a result, his advantage in winning this game is 1, meaning that the system cannot possibly be CPA secure. 1 is not a negligible number. So this shows that deterministic encryption schemes cannot possibly be CPA secure, but you might wonder, well, what does this mean in practice? Well, in practice, this means, again, that every message is always encrypted to the same ciphertext. What this means is if you're encrypting files on disk and you happen to be encrypting two files that happen to be the same, they'll result in the same ciphertext, and then the attacker, by looking at the encrypted disk, will learn that these two files actually contain the same content. The attacker might not learn what the content is, but he will learn that those two encrypted files are an encryption of the same content, and he shouldn't be able to learn that. Similarly, if you send two encrypted packets on the network that happen to be the same, the attacker will not learn the content of those packets, but he will learn that those two packets actually contain the same information. Think, for example, of an encrypted voice conversation. Every time there's quiet on the line, the system will be sending encryptions of zero. But since encryptions of zero are always mapped to the same ciphertext, an attacker looking at the network will be able to identify exactly the points in the conversation where there is quiet, because he will always see those exact same ciphertexts every time. So these are examples where deterministic encryption cannot possibly be secure. And as I say, formally we say that deterministic encryption cannot be semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack. So what do we do? Well, the lesson here is if the secret key is going to be used to encrypt multiple messages, it had better be the case that given the same plaintext to encrypt twice, the encryption algorithm must produce different ciphertexts. And so there are two ways to do that. The first method is what's called randomized encryption. Here the encryption algorithm itself is going to choose some random string during the encryption process, and it's going to encrypt the message M using that random string. So what this means is that a particular message M0, for example, isn't just going to be mapped to one ciphertext, but it's going to be mapped to a whole ball of ciphertexts, where on every encryption, basically we output one point in this ball. So every time we encrypt, the encryption algorithm chooses a random string, and that random string leads to one point in this ball. Of course, the decryption algorithm, when it takes any point in this ball, will always map the result to M0. Similarly, the ciphertext M1 will be mapped to a ball, and every time we encrypt M1, we basically output one point in this ball, and these balls have to be disjoint, so that the encryption algorithm, when it obtains a point in the ball corresponding to M1, will always output the message M1. 
In this way, since the encryption algorithm uses randomness, if we encrypt the same message twice, with high probability we'll get different ciphertexts. But unfortunately, this means that the ciphertext necessarily has to be longer than the plaintext, because somehow the randomness that was used to generate the ciphertext is now encoded somehow in the ciphertext. So the ciphertext takes more space. And roughly speaking, the ciphertext size is going to be larger than the plaintext by basically the number of random bits that were used during encryption. So if the plaintexts are very big, if the plaintexts are gigabytes long, the number of random bits is going to be on the order of 128, so maybe this extra space doesn't really matter. But if the plaintexts are very short, maybe they themselves are 128 bits, then adding an extra 128 bits to every ciphertext is going to double the total ciphertext size, and that could be quite expensive. So as I say, randomized encryption is a fine solution, but in some cases it actually introduces quite a bit of cost. So let's look at a simple example. So imagine we have a pseudo-random function that takes inputs in a certain space R, which is going to be called a nonce space, and it outputs outputs in the message space. And now let's define the following randomized encryption scheme. When we want to encrypt a message M, what the encryption algorithm is going to do is first it's going to generate a random R in this uh, nonce space R, and then it's going to output a ciphertext that consists of two components. The first component is going to be this value r, and the second component is going to be an evaluation of the pseudo-random function at the point r, XORed with the message m. And my question to you is, is this uh, encryption system semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack? So the correct answer is yes, but only if the non-space r is large enough so that little r never repeats with very, very high probability. And let's quickly argue why that's true. So first of all, because f is a secure pseudo-random function, we might as well replace it with a truly random function. In other words, this is indistinguishable from the case where we encrypt the message m using a truly random function little f evaluated at the point r and then XORed with m. But since this little r never repeats, every ciphertext uses a different little r, what this means is that the values of f of r are random, uniform, independent strings every time. So every time we encrypt a message, we encrypt it essentially using a new uniform random one-time pad. And since XORing a uniform string with any string simply generates a new uniform string, the resulting ciphertext is distributed as simply two random uniform strings. I'll call them R and R prime. And so both in experiment 0 and in experiment 1, all the attacker gets to see are truly uniform random strings, R comma R prime. And since in both experiments the attacker is seeing the same distribution, he cannot distinguish the two distributions. And so since security holds completely when we're using a truly random function, it's also going to hold when we're using a pseudo-random function. Okay, so this is a nice example of how we use the fact that a pseudo-random function behaves like a random function to argue security of this particular encryption scheme. Okay, so now we have a nice example of randomized encryption. The other approach to building chosen plaintext secure encryption schemes is what's called nonce-based encryption. Now, in a nonce-based encryption system, the encryption algorithm actually takes three inputs rather than two. As usual, it takes the key and the message, but it also takes an additional input called a nonce. And similarly, the decryption algorithm also takes the nonce as input and then produces the resulting decrypted plaintext. So what is this nonce value n? This nonce is a public value. It does not need to be hidden from the adversary. But the only requirement is that the pair key comma nonce is only used to encrypt a single message. In other words, this pair k comma n must change from message to message. Then there are two ways to change it. One way to change it is by choosing a new random key for every message. And the other way is to keep using the same key all the time, but then we must choose a new nonce for every message. And, and as I said, I want to emphasize again, this nonce need not be secret and it need not be random. The only requirement is the nonce is unique. And in fact, we're going to use this term throughout the course. A nonce for us means a unique value that doesn't repeat. It does not have to be random. So let's look at some examples of choosing a nonce. Well, the simplest option is simply to make the nonce be a counter. So for example, in networking protocol, you can imagine the nonce being a packet counter that's incremented every time a packet is sent by the sender or received by the receiver. This means that the encryptor has to keep state 
from message to message, namely it has to keep this counter around and increment it after every message is transmitted. Interestingly, if the decryptor actually has the same state, then there's no need to include the nonce in the ciphertext since the nonce is implicit. Let's look at an example. The HTTPS protocol is run over a reliable transport mechanism, which means that packets sent by the sender are assumed to be received in order at the recipient. So if the sender sends packet 5 and then packet 6, the recipient will receive packet number 5 and then packet number 6 in that order. This means that if the sender maintains a packet counter, the recipient can also maintain a packet counter and the two counters basically increment in sync. In this case, there's no reason to include the nonce in the packets because the nonce is implicit between the two sides. However, in other protocols, for example, in IPsec, IPsec is a protocol designed to encrypt the IP layer. The IP layer does not guarantee in-order delivery, and so the sender might send packet number 5 and then packet number 6, but those will be received in reverse order at the recipient. In this case, it's still fine to use a packet counter as a nonce, but now the nonce has to be included in the packet so that the recipient knows which nonce to use to decrypt the received packet. So as I say, nonce-based encryption is a very efficient way to achieve CPA security, and in particular, if the nonce is implicit, it doesn't even increase the ciphertext length. Of course, another method to generate a unique nonce is simply to pick the nonce at random, assuming the nonce space is sufficiently large so that with high probability the nonces will never repeat for the life of the key. Now in this case, nonce-based encryption simply reduces to randomized encryption. However, the benefit here is that the sender does not need to maintain any state from message to message. So this is very useful, for example, if encryption happens to take place on multiple devices. For example, I might have both a laptop and a smartphone. They might both use the same key. But in this case, if I required stateful encryption, then my laptop and the smartphone would have to coordinate to make sure that they never reuse the same nonce. Whereas if both of them simply pick nonces at random, they don't need to coordinate because with very high probability, they'll simply never choose the same nonce. Again, assuming the nonce space is big enough. So there are some cases where stateless encryption is quite important, in particular where the same key is used by multiple machines. So I want to define more precisely what security means for nonce-based encryption. And in particular, I want to emphasize that the system must remain secure when the nonces are chosen by the adversary. The reason it's important to allow the adversary to choose the nonces is because the adversary can choose which ciphertext it wants to attack. So imagine the nonce happens to be a counter, and it so happens that when the counter hits the value 15, maybe at that point it's easy for the adversary to break semantic security. So the adversary will wait until the 15th packet is sent, and only then he will ask to break semantic security. So when we talk about nonce-based encryption, we generally allow the adversary to choose the nonce, and the system should remain secure even under those settings. So let's define the CPA game in this case. And it's actually very similar to the game before. Basically, the attacker gets to submit pairs of messages, MI, MI0 and MI1. Obviously, they both have to be of the same length. And he gets to supply the nonce. And in response, the adversary is given the encryption of either MI0 or MI1, but using the nonce that the adversary chose. And of course, as usual, the adversary's goal is to tell whether he was given the encryption of the left plaintext or the right plaintext. And as before, the adversary gets to iterate these queries, and he can issue as, as many queries as he wants. We usually let Q denote the number of queries that the adversary issues. Now, the only restriction, of course, which is crucial, is that although the adversary gets to choose the nonces, he's restricted to choosing distinct nonces. The reason we force him to choose distinct nonces is because that's the requirement in practice. Even if the adversary fools Alice into encrypting multiple messages for him, Alice will never use the same nonce again. As a result, the adversary will never see messages encrypted using the same nonce, and therefore, even in the game, we require that all the nonces be distinct. And then, as usual, we say that the system is a nonce-based encryption system that's uh, semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack, if the adversary cannot distinguish experiment 0, where he's given encryptions of the left messages, from experiment 1, where he's given encryption of the right messages. So let's look at an example of a nonce-based encryption system. As before, we have a secure PRF that takes inputs in the nonce space R and outputs strings in the message space M. 
Now, when a new key is chosen, we're going to reset our counter R to be zero. And now when we encrypt a particular message M, what we'll do is we'll increment our counter R and then encrypt the message M using the pseudorandom function applied to this value R. And as before, the ciphertext is going to contain two components, the current value of the counter and then the one-time pad encryption of the message M. And so my question to you is whether this is a secure, non-spaced encryption system. So the answer as before is yes but only if the non-space is large enough. So as we increment the counter R, it will never cycle back to zero so that the nonces will always, always be unique. We argue security the same way as before. Because the PRF is secure, we know that this encryption system is indistinguishable from using a truly random function. In other words, if we apply a truly random function to the counter and XOR the results with uh, the plain text M, but now, since the nonce R never repeats, every time we compute this F of R, we get a truly random, uniform, and independent string, so that we're actually encrypting every message using the one-time pad. And as a result, all the adversary gets to see in both experiments are basically just a pair of random strings. So both in experiment 0 and in experiment 1, the adversary gets to see exactly the same distribution, namely the responses to all his chosen plaintext queries are just pairs of strings that are just uniformly distributed. And this is basically the same in experiment 0 and experiment 1, and therefore the attacker cannot distinguish the two experiments. And since he cannot win the semantic security game with a truly random function, he also cannot win the semantic security game with the secure PRF. And therefore, the scheme is secure. So now we understand what it means for a symmetric system to be secure when the key is used to encrypt multiple messages. The requirement is that it be secure under a chosen plaintext attack. And we said that basically the only way to be secure under a chosen plaintext attack is either to use randomized encryption or to use non-spaced encryption where the nonce never repeats. And then in the next two segments, we're going to build two classic encryption systems that are secure when the key is used multiple times. Now that we understand chosen plaintext security, let's build encryption schemes that are chosen plaintext secure. And the first such encryption scheme is going to be called uh, cipher block chaining. So here's how ch cipher block chaining works. Cipher block chaining is a way of using a block cipher to get chosen plaintext security. In particular, we're going to look at a mode called cipher block chaining with a random IV. CBC stands for cipher block chaining. So suppose we have a block cipher, so ED is a block cipher. And let's define ECBC to be the following encryption scheme. So the encryption algorithm, when it's asked to encrypt the message M, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to choose a random IV that's exactly one block of the block cipher. So IV is one cipher block. So in the case of AES, the IV would be 16 bytes. And then we're going to run through uh, the algorithm here. The IV basically that we chose is going to be XORed into the first plain text block. And then the result is going to be encrypted using the block cipher and output is the first block of the cipher text. And now comes the chaining part where we actually use the first block of the cipher text to kind of mask the second block of the plain text. So we XOR the two together and the encryption of that becomes the second cipher text block. And so on and so on and so forth. So this is cipher block chaining. You can see that each cipher block is chained and XORed into the next plain text block. And the final cipher text is going to be essentially the IV, the initial IV that we chose along with all the cipher text blocks. I should say that IV stands for initialization vector. And we're going to be seeing that term used quite a bit every time we need to pick something at random at the beginning of the encryption scheme. Typically, we'll call that an IV for initialization vector. So you notice that the ciphertext is a little bit longer than the plaintext because we have to include this IV in the ciphertext, which basically captures the randomness that was used during encryption. So the first question is, how do we decrypt the result of CBC encryption? And so let me remind you again that if when we encrypt the first message block, we XOR it with the IV, encrypt the result, and that becomes the first ciphertext block. So let me ask you, how would you decrypt that? So given the first ciphertext block, how would you recover the original first plaintext block? So decryption is actually very similar to encryption. Here I wrote down the decryption circuit. And you can see basically it's almost the same thing except the XOR is on the bottom instead of on the top. And again, you realize that essentially we chopped off the IV as part of the decryption process and we only output the original message back. The IV is dropped by the decryption algorithm. 
Okay, so the following theorem is going to show that, in fact, CBC mode encryption with a random IV is, in fact, semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack. And so let's state that more precisely. Basically, if we start with a PRP, in other words, a pure block cipher E, that's defined over a space X, then we're going to end up with an encryption algorithm ECBC that takes messages of length L and outputs ciphertext of length L plus 1. And then suppose we have an adversary that makes Q chosen plaintext queries. Then we can state the following security fact that for every such adversary that's attacking ECBC, there exists an adversary that's attacking the PRP, the block cipher, with the following relation between the two algorithms. In other words, the advantage of algorithm A against the encryption scheme is less than the advantage of algorithm B against uh, the original PRP plus some noise term. So let me interpret this theorem for you, as usual. So what this means is that, essentially, since E is a secure PRP, this quantity here is negligible. And our goal is to say that adversary's A's advantage is also negligible. However, here we're prevented from saying that because we got this extra error term. This is often called an error term. And to argue that CBC is secure, we have to make sure the error term is also negligible. Because if both of these uh, terms on the right are negligible, their sum is negligible, and therefore uh, the advantage of A against ECBC would also be negligible. So this says that, in fact, for ECBC to be secure, it had better be the case that Q squared L squared is much, much, much smaller than the value X. So let me remind you what Q and L are. So L is simply the length of the messages that we're encrypting. Okay, so L could be like, say, 1,000, which would mean that we're encrypting messages that are at most 1,000 AES blocks. Q is the number of ciphertexts that the adversary gets to see under the CPA attack. But in real life, what Q is, is basically the number of times that we've used the key K to encrypt messages. In other words, if we use a particular AES key to encrypt 100 messages, Q would be 100. It's because the adversary would then see at most 100 messages encrypted under this key K. Okay, so let's see what this means in the real world. So here I rewrote the error bounds from the theorem. And just to remind you, Q is the number of messages encrypted with K, and L is the length of the messages. And so suppose we want the adversary's advantage to be less than 1 over 2 to the 32. This means that the error term had better be less than 1 over 2 to the 32. Okay, so let's look at AES and see what this means. For AES, AES, of course, uses 128-bit blocks. So x is going to be 2 to the 128. The size of x is 2 to the 128. And if you plug this into the expression, you see that basically the product q times l had better be less than 2 to the 48. This means that after we use a particular key to encrypt 2 to the 48 AES block, we have to change the key. Okay, essentially, CBC stops being secure after the key is used to encrypt 2 to the 48 different AES blocks. So it's kind of nice that the security theorem tells you exactly how long the key can be used and then how frequently, essentially, you have to replace the key. Now, interestingly, if you apply the same analysis to DES, DES actually has a much shorter block, namely only 64 bits. You see the key has to be changed much more frequently, namely after all, every 65,000 DES blocks, essentially, you need to generate a new key. So this is one of the reasons why AES has a larger block size, so that, in fact, modes like CBC would be more secure and one can use the key for a longer period of time before having to replace it. What this means is after you encrypt 2 to the 16 blocks, each block, of course, is 8 bytes, so after you encrypt about half a megabyte of data, you would have to change the DES key, which is actually quite low. And you notice with AES, you can encrypt quite a bit more data before you have to change the key. So I want to warn you about a very common mistake that people have made when using CBC with a random IV. And that is that the minute that the attacker can predict the IV that you're going to be using for encrypting a particular message, the cipher, this ECBC, is no longer CPA secure. So when using CBC with a random IV like we just shown, it's crucial that the IV is not predictable. But let's see an attack. So suppose it so happens that given the encryption of a particular message, the attacker can actually predict the IV that will be used for the next message. Well, let's show that in fact the resulting system is not CPA secure. So the first thing the adversary is going to do is he's going to ask for the encryption of a one block message. And in particular, that one block is going to be zero. So what the adversary gets back is the encryption of one block, which namely is the encryption of the message, namely zero, XOR the IV. Okay, and of course the adversary also gets the IV. 
Okay, so now the adversary by assumption can predict the IV that's going to be used for the next encryption. Okay, so let's say that IV is called, well, IV. So next the adversary is going to issue his semantic security challenge, and the message M0 is going to be the predicted IV XOR IV1, which was used in the encryption of C1. And then the message M1 is just going to be some other message. It doesn't really matter what it is. So now let's see what happens when the adversary receives the resulting semantic security challenge. Well, he's going to get the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. So when the adversary receives the encryption of M0, tell me what is the actual plaintext that's encrypted in the ciphertext C. Well, so the answer is that what's actually encrypted is the message, which is IV XOR IV1, XOR the IV that's used to encrypt that message, which happens to be IV, and this of course is IV1. So when the adversary receives the encryption of M0, he's actually receiving the block cipher encryption of IV1. And lo and behold, you notice that he already has that value from his chosen plaintext query. And then when he's receiving the encryption of the message M1, he just receives a normal CBC encryption of the message M1. So you realize that now he has a simple way of uh, breaking the scheme. Namely, what he'll do is he'll say, he's going to ask, is the second block of the ciphertext C equal to the value that I received in my CPA query? If so, I'll say that I received the encryption of M0. Otherwise, I'll say that I received the encryption of M1. So really, his test is, uh, C1, he refers to the second block of C, and C11 refers to the second block of C1. If the two are equal, he says 0, and otherwise he says 1. So the advantage of this adversary is going to be 1, and as a result, he completely breaks CPA security of the CBC encryption. So the lesson here is, if the IV is predictable, then, in fact, there is no CPA security. And... Unfortunately, this is actually a very common mistake in practice. In particular, even in SSL protocol, in TLS 1.1, it turns out that the IV for record number I is in fact the last ciphertext block of record number I minus 1. That means that exactly given the encryption of record number I minus 1, the adversary knows exactly what IV is going to be used for record number I. Very recently, just last summer, this was actually converted into a pretty devastating attack on SSL. We'll describe that attack when we talk about SSL in more detail, but for now I wanted to make sure you understand that when you use CBC encryption, it's absolutely crucial that the IV be random. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the non-space version of CBC encryption. So in this mode, the IV is replaced by a non-random but unique nonce. For example, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, could all be used as a nonce. And now the appeal of this mode is that if the recipient actually knows what the nonce is supposed to be, then there's no reason to include the nonce in the ciphertext. In which case, the ciphertext is exactly the same length as the plaintext. Unlike CBC with a random IV, where we have to expand the ciphertext to include the IV, here, if the nonce is already known to the recipient, there's no reason to include it in the ciphertext, and the ciphertext is exactly the same length as the plaintext. So it's perfectly fine to use a non-random but unique nonce. However, it's absolutely crucial to know that if you do this, there's one more step that you have to do before you use the nonce in the CBC chain. In particular, in this mode now, we're going to be using two independent keys, K and K1. The key K is, as before, going to be used to encrypt the individual message blocks. However, this key K1 is going to be used to encrypt the non-random but unique nonce so that the output is going to be a random IV which is then used in the CBC chain. So this extra step here of encrypting the nonce with the key K1 is absolutely crucial. Without it, CBC mode encryption would not be secure. In particular, if you just directly use the nonce, feed that into CBC encryption, in other words, you use the nonce as the IV, then we already know that a non-random nonce would not be CPA secure. We saw that on the previous slide. But in fact, even if you set K to be equal to K1, in other words, you just encrypt the nonce using the key K, that also will, is not going to be CPA secure and can lead to significant attacks. So I want to make sure you understand that if the nonce in CBC mode encryption is not random, this extra encryption step has to take place. And, you know, so I'll make this extra step kind of dance here just to make sure you never forget to put it in. 
And I'll tell you that this is an extremely common mistake in practice. There are many real-world products and crypto libraries that actually forget to encrypt the non-random nonce before using it in the CBC chain, and that actually leads to a practical and significant attack. For example, this was not done in TLS. TLS, as we said, used predictable IVs, and that led to a significant attack on TLS. Moreover, the reason this is so important to know is that in fact many crypto APIs are set up to almost deliberately mislead the user into using CBC incorrectly. So let's look at how CBC is implemented inside of OpenSSL. So here are the arguments to the function. Basically, this is the plain text. This is the place where the ciphertext will get written to. This is the length of the plain text. This is the AES key. Finally, there's an argument here that says whether you're encrypting or decrypting. And the most important parameter that I wanted to point out here is the actual IV. And unfortunately, the user is asked to supply this IV, and the function uses the IV directly in the CBC encryption mechanism. It doesn't encrypt the IV before using it. And as a result, if you ever call this function using a non-random IV, the resulting encryption system won't be CPA secure. Okay, so it's very important to know that when calling functions like this uh, CBC encryption and OpenSSL, either supply a truly random IV, or if you want the IV to be a counter, then you have to encrypt the counter using AES before you actually call a CBC encrypt, and you have to do that yourself. So again, it's very important that the programmer knows that it needs to be done, otherwise the CBC encryption is insecure. One last technicality about CBC is what to do when the message is not a multiple of the block cipher block length. That is, what do we do if the last message block is shorter than the block length of AES, for example? So the last message block is less than 16 bytes. And the answer is that we add a pad to the last block so that it becomes as long as 16 bytes, as long as the AES block size. And this pad, of course, is going to be removed during encryption. So here's a typical pad. This is the pad that's used in TLS. Basically, if you pad with n bytes, then essentially what you do is you write the number n n times. So for example, if you pad with 5 bytes, you pad with the string 55555. Five, 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 five. So 5 bytes, where each byte is the value 5. And the cute thing about this pad is basically when the decryptor receives the message, what he does is he looks at the last byte of the last block, so suppose that value is 5, then he simply removes the last 5 bytes of the message. Now the question is what do we do if in fact the message is a multiple of 16 bytes, so in fact no pad is needed. If we don't pad at all, then that's a problem because the decryptor is going to look at the very last byte of the last block, which is now part of the actual message, and he's going to remove that many bytes from the plain text. So that actually would be a problem. So the solution is, if in fact there is no pad that's needed, nevertheless we still have to add a, a dummy block and since we add this dummy block, this would be a block that basically contains uh, 16 bytes, each one containing the number 16. Okay, so we add essentially 16 dummy blocks. The decryptor, that when he's decrypting, he looks at the last byte of the last block. He sees that it, the value is 16, therefore he removes the entire block. And whatever's left is the actual plain text. So it's a bit unfortunate that in fact, if you're encrypting short messages with CBC, and the messages say happen to be, say, 32 bytes, so they are a multiple of 16 bytes, then you have to add one more block and make all these ciphertexts be 48 bytes just to accommodate uh, the CBC padding. I should mention that there's a variant of CBC called CBC with ciphertext stealing that actually avoids this problem, but I'm not going to describe that here. If you're interested, you can look that up online. Okay, so that's the end of uh, our discussion of CBC, and in the next segment, we'll see how to use counter mode to encrypt multiple messages using a single key. In this segment, we're going to look at another method to achieve chosen plaintext security that's actually superior to CBC. And this method is called randomized counter mode. Unlike CBC, randomized counter mode uses a secure PRF. It doesn't need a block cipher. It's enough for counter mode to just use a PRF because we're never going to be inverting this function F. So we're going to let F be the secure PRF, and it acts on n-bit blocks. Again, if we use AES, n would be 128. And the way the encryption algorithm works in counter mode is it starts off by choosing a random IV. It's a 128-bit random IV in the case of AES. And then essentially we start counting from this random IV. So you notice the first encryption is of IV, then of IV plus 1, up to uh, IV plus L. So we generate this random pad. We XOR the result with the message, and that gives us the ciphertext. And as usual, you notice that the IV here is included along with the ciphertext, so that in fact the ciphertext is a little longer than the original plaintext. 
And the point, of course, is that the encryption algorithm chooses a new IV for every message, and so even if I encrypt the same message twice, I'm going to get different resulting ciphertexts. One thing to note is that this mode is completely parallelizable, unlike CBC. CBC was sequential, in other words, you couldn't encrypt block number five until you've encrypted blocks number one to four. So hardware companies who might have multiple AES engines working in parallel cannot actually use those AES engines when using CBC because CBC is inherently sequential. So even though you might have two or three or four AES engines, you can only use one of them when doing CBC encryption. With counter mode, everything is completely parallelizable. If you have three AES engines, encryption basically will work three times as fast. So that's the beauty of counter mode. And counter mode also has a corresponding uh, non-spaced counter mode where the IV is not truly random, but rather is just a nonce, which could be a counter. And the way you would implement non-space counter mode is you would take the 128 bits block that's used in AES, and then you would split it in two. You would use the left 64 bits as the nonce, so the counter, say, would count from 0 to 2 to the 64, and then that would be the nonce part of it. And then once you specify the nonce, the lower order 64 bits would be doing the counting inside of the counter mode encryption. Okay, so nonce goes on the left and the counter mode encryption counter goes on the right. And it's perfectly fine if this uh, nonce is unpredictable. The only restriction is that you encrypt the most 2 to the 64 blocks using one particular nonce. The danger is that you don't want this counter to reset to zero so that then you will have two blocks, say this guy and this guy, that are encrypted using the same one-time pad, namely this one and this one. So let's quickly state the security theorem for randomized counter mode. By now you should be used to these kind of theorems. Basically we are given a secure PRF. What we end up with is an encryption scheme, we'll call it E sub CTR, E sub counter mode, which is semantically secure under a chosen plain test attack. It encrypts messages that are L blocks long and produces ciphertexts that are L plus one blocks long, because the IV has to be included in the ciphertext. This is for randomized counter mode. And then the error bounds are stated over here. It's basically the same bounds as in the case of CBC encryption. Uh, as usual, we argue that this term is negligible because the PRFF is secure. And we would like to deduce from that that this term is negligible so that ECTR is secure. Unfortunately, we have this error term here. And so we have to make sure this error term is negligible. And for that, we have to make sure that Q squared L is less than the size of the block. We remember Q is the number of messages encrypted under a particular key, and L is the maximum length of those messages. Now, interestingly, in the case of CBC, we had Q squared L squared had to be less than X, which is actually worse than we have for counter modes. In other words, counter modes can actually be used for more blocks than uh, CBC could. And let's see a quick example of that. So here's again the error term for counter mode. Remember Q is again the number of messages encrypted with the key and L is the length of those messages. And as before, just as in the case of CBC, suppose we want the adversary's advantage to be at most one and two to the 32. That basically requires that this Q squared L over X be less than one over two to the 32. And so for AES, what happens is if you plug in the values, X is two to the 128, 128 bit blocks. So Q times square root of L should be less than two to the 48. This is basically the bound you get from plugging in two to the 128 into this bound here. And as a result, you can see if you're encrypting messages that are each two to the 32 blocks, then after two to the 32 such messages, you have to replace your secret key, otherwise randomized counter mode is no longer CPA secure. So this means we could encrypt a total of two to the 64 AES blocks using a single secret key. Remember for CBC, corresponding value was 2 to the 48 blocks. So in fact, because counter mode has a better security parameterization, in fact, we can use the same key to encrypt more blocks with counter mode than we could with CBC. So I wanted to do a quick comparison of counter mode and CBC and argue that in every single aspect, counter mode is superior to CBC. And that's actually why most modern encryption schemes actually are starting to migrate to counter mode and abandon CBC, even though CBC is still quite widely used. So let's look at the comparison. First of all, recall that CBC actually had to use a block cipher because if you look at the decryption circuit, the decryption circuit actually ran the block cipher in reverse. It was actually using the decryption capabilities of the block cipher. Whereas counter mode, we only need a PRF. We never ever use the decryption capabilities of the block cipher. We only use it in the forward direction, only encrypt with it. 
Because of this, counter mode is actually more general, and it can use primitives like salsa, for example. Salsa 20, if you remember, is a PRF, but is not a PRP. So counter mode can use salsa, but CBC cannot. And in that sense, counter mode is more general than CBC. Counter mode, as we said, is actually parallel, whereas CBC is a very sequential process. We said that counter mode is more secure. The security bounds, the error terms are better for counter modes than they are for CBC, and as a result, you can use a key to encrypt more blocks in counter mode than you could with CBC. The other issue is, remember, in CBC, we talked about the dummy padding block. If you have a message that's a multiple of the block length, in CBC, we said that we had to add a dummy block, whereas in counter mode, this wasn't necessary. Although I did want to mention that there is a variation of CBC called CBC with ciphertext stealing that actually avoids the dummy block issue. So for standardized CBC, we actually need a dummy block, but in fact, there is a modification to CBC that doesn't need a dummy block, just like counter mode. Finally, suppose you're encrypting just a stream of one byte messages and using nonce-based encryption with an implicit nonce, so the nonce is not included in the ciphertext. In this case, every single one byte message would have to be expanded into a 16 byte block and then encrypted and the result would be a 16 byte block. So if you have like a stream of 100 one byte messages, each one separately would have to become a 16 byte block and you'll end up with a stream of 100 16 byte ciphertexts. So you get a 16x expansion on the length of the ciphertext compared to the length of the plaintext. In counter mode, of course, this is not a problem. You would just encrypt each one byte message by XORing it with the first byte of the stream that's generated in counter mode. So every ciphertext would just be one byte, just like the corresponding plaintext. And so no expansion at all uh, using counter mode. So you see that essentially in every single aspect, counter mode dominates uh, CBC, and that's why it's actually the recommended mode to be using today. Okay, so this concludes our discussion of chosen plaintext security. I want to just quickly summarize and remind you that we're going to be using these PRP and PRF abstractions of block ciphers throughout. This is actually the correct way of thinking of block ciphers, and so we'll always think of them as either pseudo-random permutations or pseudo-random functions. And then I wanted to remind you again, so far we saw two notions of security. Both only provide security against eavesdropping. They don't provide security against tampering with the ciphertext. One was used when the key is only used to encrypt a single message. The other one was used when the key was used to encrypt multiple messages. And as we said, because neither one is designed to defend against tampering, neither one provides data integrity. And we're going to see that this is a real problem. And as a result, in fact, I'm going to say in the next segment that these modes actually should never, ever be used. You should only be using these modes in addition to an integrity mechanism, which is our next topic. Okay, so, so far we've seen basically if you're using uh, the key once, uh, you can use stream ciphers or you can use deterministic counter mode. If you're going to use the key many times, you could use randomized CBC or randomized counter mode. And we're going to talk about how to provide integrity and confidentiality once we cover the topic of integrity, which is our next module. In this module, we're going to stop talking about encryption and instead discuss message integrity. Next, we will come back to encryption and show how to provide both encryption and integrity. So as I said, our goal here is to provide integrity without any confidentiality. And there are, in fact, many cases in the real world where this comes up. For example, you can think of operating system files on your disk. Say if you're using Windows, all the Windows operating system files on disk are not confidential. They're public and known to the world. But it is quite important to make sure that they're not modified by a virus or, or some malware. That's an example where you want to provide integrity, but you don't care about confidentiality. Another example is banner ads on web pages. The provider of the ads doesn't care at all if someone copies them and shows them to other people, so there's no confidentiality issue at all, but they do care about modifying those ads. So for example, they do want to prevent people from changing the ads into different types of ads. So that's another example where integrity matters, but confidentiality is not important at all. So how do we provide message integrity? The basic mechanism is what's called a MAC, a message authentication code, MAC. And the way we do it is as follows. So here we have our friends Alice and Bob. They have a shared key uh, K, which is not known to the attacker, but known to both of them. And there's a public message M that Alice wants to send to Bob, such that an attacker along the way cannot modify this message on its way to Bob. The way Alice does it is by using what's called a MAC signing algorithm, well denoted by S, where the MAC signing algorithm takes as input the key and the message and produces a very short tag. The tag could be like 90 bits or 100 bits or so on. 
Even though the message is gigabytes long, the tag is actually very, very short. And then she appends the tag to the message and sends the combination of the two to Bob. Bob receives the message and the tag, and then he runs what's called the Mac verification algorithm on this tag. So the Mac verification algorithm takes as input the key, the message, and the tag, and it says basically yes or no, depending on whether the message is valid or whether it's been tampered with. Okay, so more precisely, what is a Mac? Well, we said the Mac basically consists of two algorithms, a signing algorithm and a verification algorithm. As usual, they're defined over a key space, a message space, and a tag space. And as we said, it's a pair of algorithms. So the signing algorithm will output a tag in the tag space, and the verification algorithm, basically given the key, the message, and the tag, will output yes or no. And I want to remind you, as usual, there are these consistency requirements such that for every K in the key space and for every message in the message space, it so happens that if I sign the message using a particular key and then I verify the tag using the same key, I should get yes in response. So this is the standard consistency requirement, which is the analog of the one that we saw for encryption. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that integrity really does require a shared key between Alice and Bob. And in fact, there's a common mistake that people make where they try to provide integrity without actually a shared key. So here's an example. So consider CRC. CRC stands for Cyclic Redundancy Check. This is a classic checksum algorithm that's designed to detect random errors in messages. So imagine instead of using a key to generate a tag, Alice basically uses a CRC algorithm, which is keyless, doesn't take any key to generate a tag, and then she appends this tag to the message, she sends it over to Bob, Bob will basically verify that the CRC is still correct, in other words, Bob will still verify the tag is equal to CRCM, and if so, the verification algorithm would say yes, and otherwise, the verification algorithm will say no. So the problem with this is this is very easy for an attacker to defeat, in other words, an attacker can very easily modify the message and route and fool Bob into thinking that the new message is a valid one. The way the attacker will do it is he'll cancel the message and the tag, he'll simply block them, and then he'll produce his own message M prime and compute his own CRC on this message M prime and then send the concatenation of the two over to Bob. Bob will run the verification algorithm, verification will work properly because in fact the right hand side is in fact a valid CRC for the left hand side. And as a result, Bob would think that this message came from Alice, but in fact has been completely modified by the attacker and has nothing to do with the original message that Alice sent. Okay, so the problem is because CRC doesn't have a key, there's no difference between Alice and the attacker. And as a result, Bob doesn't know where the message came from. Once we introduce a key, now Alice can do something that the attacker can't do. And as a result, she might be able to compute a tag that the attacker can't uh, modify. So the point to remember is that CRC, as we said, is designed to detect random errors, not malicious errors. And here our goal is to make sure that even a malicious attacker cannot modify messages en route. So next we want to define what it means for a Mac system to be secure. So as usual, we define security in terms of the attacker's power, what can the attacker do, and the attacker's goal, what is he trying to do. So in the case of Macs, the attacker's power is what's called a chosen message attack. In other words, the attacker can give Alice arbitrary messages of his choice, M1 to MQ, and Alice will compute the tag for him on those messages and give him those tags. So again, you might wonder, why would Alice ever do that? Why would Alice ever compute the tag on a message that the attacker gave her? So just like in the case of chosen plaintiff's attack, it's very common in the real world that the attacker can give Alice a message, Alice will compute the tag on that message, and then the attacker will obtain the resulting tag. For example, the attacker might send Alice an email, Alice might want to save the email to disk in a way that will prevent someone from tampering with the disk, so she'll compute a tag on the message and save the message and the tag to disk. Later on, the attacker might steal Alice's disk, and now he's recovered Alice's tag on the message that he sent to Alice. So this is an example of a chosen message attack in the real world where the attacker actually obtains a tag on a message that he gave Alice. Okay, so that's what the attacker can do, basically this chosen message attack. And what is his goal? Well, his goal is to do something called an existential forgery. In other words, what he's trying to do is to produce some, some new valid message tag pair. Okay, so some message tag pair that's different from one of the pairs that were given to him during the chosen message attack. 
And if he can do that, then we say that the system is insecure, and if he can't, then we'll say the system is secure. So I want to emphasize that existential forgery means that the attacker cannot produce a new message tag pair, even for a message that's completely gibberish. And again, you might wonder, well, why do we care if the attacker computes a tag on a message that's gibberish? That's not of any value to the attacker. But we want to build Macs that are secure under any usage settings. And there are, in fact, cases where, for example, you might want to compute an integrity tag on a random secret key. In which case, even if the attacker is able to compute a tag on a completely random message, he might be able to fool a user into using the wrong secret key. And as a result, we want to make sure that if the Mac is secure, the attacker can't produce a valid tag for any message, whether it's gibberish or sensical. Another property that's implied by the security definition is if the attacker is given some message tag pair, he shouldn't be able to produce a new tag for the same message. In other words, even though there might be another tag T prime for the same message M, the attacker given M and T shouldn't be able to find this new T prime. And again, you might wonder, well, why do we care? If the attacker already has a tag on the message M, why does it matter if he can produce another tag for the message M? He already has one tag. But as we'll see, there are actually applications where it's really important that the attacker not be able to produce a new tag for a previously signed message. In particular, this will come up when we combine encryption and integrity. So that we're going to demand that given one tag in the message, it's impossible to find another tag for the same message. Okay, so now that we understand the intuition of what we're trying to achieve, let's define it as usual using a more precise game. So here we have two algorithms, S and V, and we have an adversary, A, and the game proceeds as follows. The challenger, as usual, just chooses a random key for the Mac, and then the adversary basically does his chosen message attack. So he submits an M1 to the challenger and receives the tag on that message M1. Then he submits an M2 to the challenger and receives the tag on that M2, and so on and so forth until you know he submits Q messages to the adversary and receives Q tags on all those messages. So that's the chosen message attack part. And then the adversary goes ahead and tries to do an existential forgery, namely he outputs a message tag pair, a new message tag pair, and we say that he wins the game, in other words, B is equal to 1 means that he wins the game, if, first of all, the message tag pair that he outputs is a valid message tag pair, so the verification algorithm says yes, and second of all, it's a fresh message tag pair. It's, in other words, it's not one of the message tag pairs that we gave him before. In other words, we say that the attacker lost the game, namely B is equal to 0. And as usual, we say we define the advantage of an adversary as the probability that the challenger outputs 1 in this game. And we say that a Mac system is secure if for all efficient adversaries, the advantage is negligible. Okay, in other words, no efficient adversary can win this game with non-negligible probability. All right, that's our definition of secure Macs, and our goal is to build a secure Max like this. Before we do that, I want to ask you two questions. So the first question is, suppose we have a Mac, and it so happens that the attacker can find two messages, M0 and M1, that happen to have the same tag for about half of the keys. In other words, if you choose a key at random with probability one half, the tag on the message M0 will be the same on the tag on the message M1. And my question to you is, can this be a secure Mac? So I want to emphasize the attacker doesn't know what the tag on M0 and M1 is, all he knows is that the two messages happen to have the same tag with probability one half. So the question is whether this is a secure Mac. So the answer is no, this is not a secure Mac. And the reason is because of the chosen message attack. Essentially, the attacker can ask for the tag on the message M0, and then he'll receive M0, T from the challenger. And in fact, T would be a valid tag for the message M0. And then what he would output as his existential forgery is M1, comma T. And you notice M1, comma T is different from M0, comma T, so this is a valid existential forgery. And as a result, the attacker wins the game with advantage one half. So we conclude that this Mac is not secure. The second question I'd like to ask you is suppose we have a Mac that happens to always output a five bit tag. In other words, the tag space for this Mac happens to be uh, zero, one to the five. So for every key and for every message, the signing algorithm will just output a 5-bit tag. And the question is, can this Mac be secure? Of course, the answer is no, because the attacker can simply guess 
the tag. So what he would do is he wouldn't ask any chosen message attacks. All he would do is he would output an existential forgery as follows. He would just choose a random tag. So choose a random uh, tag T at random in 0, 1 to the 5. And then he would just output his existential forgery as, say, the message 0 and the tag T. And now with probability 1 over 2 to the 5, uh, this uh, tag will be a valid tag for the message 0. And so the adversary's advantage is 1 over 32, which is non-negligible. So this basically says that tags can't be too short. They have to have some length to them. And in fact, a typical tag length would be, say, 64 bits, or 96 bits, or 128 bits. TLS, for example, uses tags that are 96 bits long. If you try to guess the tag for a message when the tag is 96 bits, the probability of guessing it correctly is 1 over 2 to the 96. So the adversary's advantage would just be 1 over 2 to the 96, which is negligible. So now that we understand what Macs are, I want to show you a simple application. In particular, let's see how Macs can be used to protect system files on disk. So imagine that when you install an operating system, say when you install Windows on your machine, one of the things that, that uh, Windows does is it asks the user for a password and then derives a, a key K from this password. And then for every file that it writes to disk, in this case, uh, the files would be F1, F2, up to Fn, what the operating system would do is it would compute a tag for that file and then store the tag along with the file. So here it concatenates the tag to each one of the files. And then it erases the key K. So it no longer stores the key K on disk or in memory or anywhere. OK, so now later, imagine that the machine gets infected with a virus, and the virus tries to modify some of the system files. The question is whether the user can detect which files were modified. So here's one way to do it. Basically, the user would reboot the machine into some clean OS, say you reboot from a USB disk or something. And then once the machine boots from this clean OS, the user would supply his password to this clean running operating system. And then this new clean running operating system would go ahead and check the Mac for each one of the system files. Now, the fact that the Mac is secure means that the poor virus couldn't actually create a new file, let's call it F prime, with a valid tag. So it couldn't actually create an F prime T prime, because if it could, then that would be an existential forgery on this Mac. And because well, the, the Mac is existentially unforgeable. The virus couldn't create any F prime, no matter what the F prime is. And consequently, because of the security of the Mac, the user will detect all the files that were modified by the virus. Now, there's one caveat to that. One thing that the virus can do is actually swap two files. So for example, he can swap this file, file F1, with the file F2 here, just literally swap them. So when the system or when the user tries to run file F1, instead they'll be running file F2. And of course that could cause all sorts of damage. And so the way to defend against that is essentially by placing the file name inside of the Mac area so that in fact we're computing an integrity check on the file name as well as on the contents of the file. And as a result, if the virus tries to swap two files, the system will say, hey, the file that's located in position F1 doesn't have the right name, and therefore it will detect that the virus did the swap, even though the Mac actually verifies. So it is important to remember that Macs can help you defend against file tampering or data tampering in general, but they won't help you defend against swapping of authenticated data, and that has to be done by some other means. Okay, so that concludes our introduction to Macs, and in the next segment, we'll go ahead and construct our first examples of secure Macs. Now that we know what Macs are, let's go ahead and build our first secure Macs. First, I want to remind you that a Mac is a pair of algorithms. The first is a signing algorithm that's given a message and a key will generate a corresponding tag. And the second is a verification algorithm that given a key, a message, and a tag will output 0 or 1 depending on whether the tag is valid or not. And we said that a Mac is secure if it is existentially unforgeable under a chosen message attack. In other words, the attacker is allowed to mount a chosen message attack where he can submit arbitrary messages of his choice and obtain the corresponding tags for those messages. And then despite the ability to generate arbitrary tags, the attacker cannot create a new message tag pair that was not given to him during the chosen message attack. Okay, so we've already seen this definition in the last segment, and now the question is, how do we build secure max? So the first example I want to give you is basically showing that any secure PRF directly gives us a secure Mac as well. So let's see how we do it. So suppose we have a pseudo-random function. So the pseudo-random function takes inputs in x and outputs outputs in y. And let's define the following Mac. 
So the way we sign a message m is basically by simply evaluating the function at the point m. So the tag for the message m is simply the value of the function at the point m. And then the way we verify a message tag pair is by recomputing the value of the function at the message m and checking whether that's equal to the tag that was given to us. We say yes if so and we say and we reject otherwise. So here you have it in pictures, basically when Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she computes a tag by evaluating the PRF, and then she appends this tag to the message. Bob receives the corresponding message tag pair, he recomputes the value of the function and tests whether the given tag is actually equal to the value of the function at the point M. So let's look at a bad example of this instruction. And so suppose that we have a pseudo-random function that happens to output only 10 bits. Okay, so this is a fine pseudo-random function. It just so happens that for any message m, it only outputs a 10-bit value. My question to you is, if we use this function f to construct a Mac, is that going to be a secure Mac? So the answer is no, this Mac is insecure, in particular because the tags are too short. So consider the following simple adversary. What the adversary will do is simply choose an arbitrary message m and just guess the value of the Mac for that particular message. Now, because the tag is only 10 bits long, the adversary has a chance of 1 in 2 to the 10 in guessing the Mac correctly. In other words, the advantage of this guessing adversary, one that simply guesses a random tag for a given message, that adversary is going to have advantage against the Mac that's basically 1 over 2 to the 10, which is 1 over 1024, and that's definitely non-negligible. So the adversary basically will successfully forge the Mac on a given message with probability 1 in 1,000, which is insecure. However, it turns out this is the only example that where things can go wrong. Only when the output of the function is small can things go wrong. If the output of the PRF is large, then we get a secure Mac out of this function. And let's, let's state the security theorem here. So suppose we have a function f that takes messages in x and outputs tags in y. Then the Mac that's derived from this PRF, in fact, is a secure Mac. And in particular, if you look at the security theorem here, you'll see very clearly the error bounds. In other words, since the PRF is secure, we know that this quantity here is negligible. And so if we want this quantity to be negligible, this is what we want. We want to say that no adversary can defeat the Mac I sub F. That implies that we want this quantity to be negligible. In other words, we want the output space to be large. And so, for example, taking a PRF that outputs 80 bits is perfectly fine. That will generate an 80-bit Mac and therefore the advantage of any adversary will be at most 1 over 2 to the 80. So now the proof of this theorem is really simple, so let's just go ahead and do it. So in fact, let's start by saying that suppose instead of a PRF, we have a truly random function from the message space to the tag space. So this is just a, a random function from x to y that's chosen at random from the set of all such functions. Now let's see if that function can give us a secure Mac. So what the adversary says is I want a tag on the message m1. What he gets back is the tag, which just happens to be the function evaluated at the point m1. Notice there's no key here, because f is just a truly random function from x to y. And then the adversary gets to choose a message m2, and he obtains the tag on m2. He chooses m3, m4, up to mq, and he obtains all the corresponding tags. Now his goal is to produce a message tag pair, and we say that he wins, remember, if this is an existential forgery. In other words, first of all, t has to be equal to f of m. This means that t is a valid tag for the message m. And second of all, the message m has to be new. So the message m had better not be one of m1 to mq. But let's just think about this for a minute. What does this mean? So the adversary got to see the value of a truly random function at the points m1 to mq. And now he's supposed to predict the value of this function at some new point m. However, for a truly random function, the value of the function at the point m is independent of its value at the points m1 to mq. So the best the adversary can do at predicting the value of the function at the point m is just guess the value, because he has no information about f of m. And as a result, his advantage, if he guesses the value of the function at the point m, he'll guess it right with probability exactly 1 over y, and then this tag that he produced will be correct with probability exactly 1 over y. Okay, again, he had no information about the value of the function at m, and so the best he can do is guess, and if he guesses, he'll get it right with probability 1 over y. And now, of course, because the function capital F is a pseudo-random function, the adversary is going to behave the same whether we give him the truly random function or the pseudo-random function. The adversary can't tell the difference, and as a result, even if we use a pseudo-random function, the adversary is going to have advantage at most 1 over y in winning the game.
Okay, so you can see exactly in the security theorem, let's go back there for just a second. Essentially, this is basically that why we got an error term of 1 over y because of the guessing attack, and that's the only way that the attacker can win the game. So now that we know that any secure PRF is also a secure MAC, we already know that we have our first example MAC. In particular, we know that AES, or at least we believe that AES is a secure PRF. Therefore, AES, since it takes 16-byte inputs, right, the message space for AES is 128 bits, which is 16 bytes. Therefore, the AES cipher essentially gives us a MAC that can MAC messages that are exactly 16 bytes. Okay, so that's our first example of a MAC. But now the question is, if we have a PRF for small inputs like AES that only acts on 16 bytes, can we build a MAC for big messages that can act on gigabytes of data? Sometimes I call this the McDonald's problem. Basically, given a small MAC, can we build a big MAC out of it? In other words, given a MAC for small messages, can we build a Mac for large messages? So we're going to look at two constructions for doing so. The first example is called a CBC Mac that again takes a PRF for small messages as inputs and produces a PRF for very large messages as outputs. The second one we'll see is HMAC, which does the same thing, again takes a PRF for small inputs and generates a PRF uh, for very large inputs. Now the two are used in very different contexts. CBC MAC is actually very commonly used in the banking industry. For example, there's a system called the Automatic Clearinghouse, ACH, which banks use to clear checks with one another. And in that system, CBC MAC is used to ensure integrity of the checks as they're transferred from bank to bank. On the internet, protocols like SSL and IPsec and SSH, those all use HMAC for integrity. Okay, so these are two different MACs and we're going to discuss them in the next couple of segments. And as I said, both of them start from a PRF for small messages and produce a PRF for messages that are gigabytes long. And in particular, they can both be instantiated with AES as the underlying cipher. So the last comment I want to make about these PRF-based Macs is that in fact their output can be truncated. So suppose we have a PRF that outputs n bit outputs. So again, for AES, this would be a PRF that outputs 128 bits as outputs. It's an easy lemma to show that in fact, if you have an n bit PRF, if you truncate it, in other words, if you only output the first t bits, the result is also a secure PRF. And just the intuition here is if the big PRF outputs n bits of randomness for any inputs that you give to the PRF, then certainly chopping it off and truncating it to uh, t bits is still going to look random. The attacker now gets less information, so his job in distinguishing the outputs from random just became harder. In other words, if the n bit PRF is secure, then the t less than n bit PRF, the truncated PRF, would also be secure. So this is an easy lemma. But since any secure PRF also gives us a secure MAC, what this means is if you give me a MAC that's based on a PRF, what I can do is I can truncate it to W bits. However, because of the error term in the uh, MAC-based PRF theorem, we know that truncating to W bits will only be secure as long as 1 over 2 to the W is negligible. So if you truncate the PRF to only 3 bits, the resulting MAC is not going to be secure. However, if you truncate it to say 80 bits or maybe even 64 bits, then a resulting MAC is still going to be a secure MAC. Okay, so the thing to remember here is that even though we use AES to construct larger PRFs and the output of these PRFs is going to be 128 bits, it doesn't mean that the MAC itself has to produce 128 bit tags. We can always truncate the output to 90 bits or 80 bits, and as a result, we would get still secure MACs, but now the output tag is going to be more reasonable size and doesn't have to be the full 128 bits. Okay, so in the next segment, we're going to look at how the CBC MAC works. In this segment, we're going to construct two classic MACs, the CBC MAC and the NMAC. Recall that in the last segment, we said that if you give me a secure PRF, then that secure PRF can actually be used to construct a secure MAC simply by defining the signature on a message M as the value of the function at the point M. The only caveat was that the output of the PRF F had to be large. For example, it could be 80 bits or 128 bits, and that would generate a secure MAC. Now, we also said that because AES is a secure PRF, essentially AES already gives us a secure MAC, except that it can only process 16-byte messages. And the question now is, given a PRF for short messages, like AES for 16-byte messages, can we construct a PRF for long messages that are potentially gigabytes long? And just a shorthand for what's coming, I'm going to denote by X uh, the set 0, 1 to the N, where N is the block size for the underlying PRF. So since we're always going to be thinking of AES as the underlying PRF, you can think of N as essentially 128 bits. So our first construction is called the encrypted CBC MAC. 
or ECBC for short, Encrypted CBC Mac. So ECBC uses a PRF that takes uh, messages in the set X, 0, 1 to the N, and outputs messages in the same set X. And what we're going to be building is a PRF that basically takes pairs of keys. It takes very long messages, in fact, arbitrarily long messages, and I'll explain this in just a second. And it outputs also tags in 0, 1 to the N. So that's our goal. Now, what is this X to the less than or equal to L? The point here is that, in fact, CBC Mac can take very long messages up to L blocks. L could be a million or a billion, but it can also take variable length messages as input. In other words, X less than or equal to L means that we allow the input to be messages that contain an arbitrary number of blocks between one and L. So ECBC can process messages that are one block long, two blocks long, 10 blocks long, 100 blocks long. It's perfectly fine to give it variable size inputs, but just to keep the discussion simple, we upper bound the maximum length by capital L. So let's see how ECBC works. Well, we start by taking our message and breaking it into blocks. Each block is as long as a block of the underlying function f. And then essentially we run through the CBC chain, except that we don't output intermediate values. So you notice we basically encrypt the first block and then feed the results into the XOR with the second block and then feed that into f again. And we do that again and again and again. And finally, we get a value out here which is called the CBC outputs of this long chain. And then I'd like to point your attention to the fact that we do one more encryption step, and this step is actually done using an independent key, K1, that's different and chosen independently of the key K. And finally, the output gives us a tag. So in this case, the tag would be n bits long, but we also mentioned in the previous segment that it's fine to truncate the tag to less than n bits long, as long as 1 over 2 to the n is negligible. So now you can see that FECBC takes a pair of keys as inputs, it can process variable length messages, and it produces an output in the set X. So you might be wondering what this last encryption step is for, and I'll tell you that the function that's defined without this last encryption step is called the raw CBC function. In other words, if we simply stop processing over here and we take that as the output, that's called raw CBC. And as we'll see in a minute, raw CBC is actually not a secure Mac. So this last step is actually critical for making the Mac secure. So another classic construction for converting a small PRF into a large PRF is called NMAC for nested Mac. Now the NMAC starts from a PRF that, uh, as before, takes inputs in X, but outputs element in the key space. And remember that for CBC, the output has to be in the set X. Here, the output needs to be in the key space K. And again, we basically obtain the PRF F NMAC, which takes pairs of keys as input, again, can process variable length messages up until L blocks, and the output is an element in the key space. And the way NMAC works is kind of uh, starts as before. We take our message and we break it into blocks. Each block is, again, as big as the block length of the underlying PRF. And now we take our key, and we feed our key as the key input into the function f, and the message block is given as the data input into the function f. What comes out is the key for the next block of NMAC. So now we have a new key for the next evaluation of the PRF, and the data for the next evaluation is the next message block. And so on and so forth until we reach the final output. The final output is going to be an element in K. Okay, And just as before, in fact, if we stop here, the function that we obtain is called a cascade function, and we're going to look at cascade in more detail in just a minute. So the cascade will output an element in K. However, that, as we'll see again, is not a secure Mac. To get a secure Mac, what we do is we need to map this element T, which is in K, into the set X. And so typically, as we'll see, NMAC is used with uh, PRFs where the block length, X, is much bigger than the key length. And so what we do is we simply append fixed pad. F pad is called a fixed pad that gets appended to this uh, tag T. And then this becomes, this input here, this block here, becomes an element of x. We feed this into the function. And again, notice here that there's an independent key that's being used for the last encryption step. And then finally, the last tag is an element of k, which we output as the output of nmac. So remember, without the last encryption step, the function is called the cascade. With the last encryption step, as we'll see, which is necessary for security, we actually get a PRF, which outputs elements in k and can process variable length messages that are up to L blocks long. All right, so that's the NMAC construction. So now we have two Macs that we can use to build a large PRF 
from AES, basically. So before we analyze the security of these MAC instructions, I'd like you to understand better what the last encryption step is for. So let's start with NMAC. So I claim that it's actually very easy to see that if we omitted the last encryption step, in other words, if we just used the cascade function, then the MAC would be completely insecure. Okay, so suppose we look at this MAC defined over here. In other words, all we do is we output directly the cascade applied to M without the last encryption step. Then let me ask you, how would you forge tags for this MAC? And I guess I've kind of given it away that this answer is incorrect. So I hope everybody sees that the answer is that in fact, given one chosen message query, you can mount an existential forgery. And the reason is, I'll show you in a second in the diagram, but let me write it out in symbols first. The reason is, if you give me the output of the cascade function applied to a message M, I can derive from it, me being the adversary, I can derive from it the cascade applied to the message M concatenated W for any message W, for any W. So first of all, it should be clear that this is enough to mount an existential forgery because essentially by asking for a tag on this message, I obtain the tag on this longer message, which I can then output as my forgery. Okay, so the MAC is insecure because I'm given a MAC on one message, I can produce the MAC on another message. But let's go back to the diagram describing Cascade and see why this is true. And so let's see what happens if this last step isn't there. As an attacker, what I can do, I can add one more block here, which we called W. And then basically I can take the output of Cascade, which is this value T, and I can simply apply the function F to it again. So here I'll take this T value, I'll plug it into F, and plug my last block W into it. And what I'll get is T prime, which is well, the evaluation of cascade on the message M concatenated W. And now I've calculated T prime, which I can use for my existential forgery. Okay, so this kind of shows you why this property of cascade holds. This is called an extension attack. Where given the tag of the message M, I can deduce the tag for an extension of M. And in fact, for any extension of my choice. So basically, cascade is completely insecure if we don't do this last encryption step. And the last encryption step here basically prevents this type of extension attack. I can tell you, by the way, that in fact, extension attacks are the only attacks on Cascade, and that can be made precise, but I'm not going to do that here. The next question is, why did we have the extra encryption block in the ECBC construction? So again, let me show you that without this extra encryption block, ECBC is insecure. So let's define a MAC that uses raw CBC. In other words, it's the same as CBC MAC, but without the last encryption step. And let's see that that MAC is also insecure, except now the attack is a little bit more difficult than a simple extension attack. So suppose the attacker is given this value, the raw CBC value for a particular message M, and now the attacker wants to extend and compute the MAC on some message M concatenated with some word W. So here's our W. Well, the poor attacker can take this value and try to XOR the two together, but now you realize he has to evaluate the function at this point but he doesn't know what this key k is, and as a result, he doesn't know what the output of the function is. So he simply can't just append a block w and compute the value of raw cbc on m concatenated w. However, it turns out that he can actually evaluate this function by using the chosen message attack, and I want to show you how to do that. Okay, so we said that basically, so our goal is to show that raw cbc is insecure. So let's look at a particular attack. So in the attack, the adversary is going to start by requesting the tag on a particular message M that's a one block message. So what does it mean to apply CBC to a one block message? Well, basically all you do is you just apply the function F directly. So what you get is uh, the tag, which is just the application of F directly to the one block message M. Good. So now the adversary has this value T. And now I claim that he can define this message M prime, which contains two blocks. The first block is M. The second block is TXORM, and I claim that the value T that he just received is a valid tag for this two block message M prime. So let's see why that's true. Well, so suppose we apply the raw CBC construction to this message M prime. So if you plug it in directly, what, let's see. So the way it would work is, first of all, the first message M is processed by encrypting it directly using the function F. Then we XOR the result with the second block, which is TXORM. And then we apply F to the result of that. That is the definition of raw CBC. Now, what do we know about FKM? FKM is simply this value T by definition. So the next step we get is essentially T X or T X or M. But this T X or T simply goes away. And what we get is FK of M, which is of course T. And as a result, 
t is a valid MAC for the two block message m comma t x or m. So the adversary was able to produce this valid tag t for this two block message that he never queried. And therefore, he was able to break the MAC. So let's look at the ECBC diagram for just one more second. And let me point out that if you don't include this last encryption step in the computation of the MAC, essentially the MAC would be insecure because of the attack that we just saw. And I'll tell you that there are many products that do this incorrectly. And in fact, there are even standards that do this incorrectly so that the resulting MAC is insecure. You now know that this needs to be done and you won't make this mistake yourself. So let's state this ECBC and NMAC security theorems. And so the statement is as usual for any message length that we'd like to uh, apply the MAC to. Essentially, for every PRF adversary A, there's an efficient adversary B, and uh, you know these are kind of the usual statements where the facts that you need to know are, are the error terms, which are kind of similar in both cases. By the way, I'd like to point out that the analysis for CBC actually uses the fact that F is a PRP. Even though we never had to invert F during the computation of ECBC, the analysis is better if you assume that F is actually a PRP. In other words, it's invertible, not just a function. For NMAC, the PRF need not be invertible. So what these error terms basically say is that these MACs are secure as long as key is not used to MAC more than square root of X or square root of K uh, messages. So for AS, of course, this would be a 2 to the 64. But I want to show you an example of how you would use these bounds. And so here I stated the security theorem again for the CBC MAC. And Q here, again, is the number of messages that are MACed with a particular key. So suppose we want to ensure that for all adversaries, the adversary has an advantage less than 1 over 2 to the 32 in distinguishing the PRF from a truly random function. Suppose that's our goal. Well, by the security theorem, what that means is we need to ensure that Q squared over X is less than 1 over 2 to the 32. Right? We want this term to be, well, I'm going to ignore this 2 here just for simplicity. We want to ensure this term is less than 1 over 2 to the 32. And this term, of course, is negligible, so we can just ignore it. Uh, and this would imply that this term is also less than 1 over 2 to the 32. Okay, so if we want to ensure that the advantage is less than 1 over 2 to the 32, we need to ensure that Q squared over X is less than 1 over 2 to the 32. For AES, basically, this means that after macking 2 to the 48 messages, you have to change your key. Otherwise, you won't achieve the security level. So you can mac at most 2 to the 48 messages. You notice that if I plug in triple des, which has a much shorter block, only 64 bits, the same result says you now have to change your key every 65,000 messages. So this basically is quite problematic, whereas this is fine. This is actually a, a very, fairly large number. This, for AES, yes, this means you have to change your key only every 16 billion messages, which is perfectly reasonable. And so this is one of the reasons why AES has a larger block uh, than triple des. These modes remain secure, and you don't have to change your key as often as you would with triple des. Okay, so I want to show you that, in fact, these attacks are not just in the statements in the security theorem. In fact, they really are real attacks that correspond to these values. Uh, the max really do become insecure after you sign, you know, square root of x or square root of k messages. So I'm going to show you an attack on both PRFs, so either ECBC or NMAC, assuming that the underlying function is a PRP, is actually a block cipher, like AES. Let's call F big. Let's say that F big is either F ECBC or F NMAC. It's a, F big means it's a PRF for large messages. Now, it turns out both constructions have the following extension property. Namely, if you give me a collision on messages X and Y, then in fact, that also implies a collision on an extension of X and Y. In other words, if I append W to both X and Y, I'll also get a collision on the resulting words. So it's fairly easy to convince yourself that this extension property holds, and you do it just by staring at the diagram for a second. And so imagine I give you two messages that happen to collide at this point. Now remember, I assumed that F is a PRP, so once you fix K1, it's a one-to-one -one function. So if the two messages happen to map to the same value at the output, this means they also happen to map to the same value at the output of the raw CBC function. But if they map to the same value at the output of the raw CBC function, that means that if I add another block, let's call it W, and I take this output here, then I'm computing the same value for both messages, and I'll get, for both messages, I'll get the same value at this point too. And when I encrypt, again, with K1, I'll also get, you know, so there's one more F here, I'll also get the same output, final output, after I've appended the block W. Okay, so if the two values happen to be the same for two distinct messages, 
If I append the block W to both messages, I'm still going to get the same value out. It's easy to convince yourself that the same is true for nmac as well. Okay, so both of these uh, PRFs have this extension property. So based on this, we can define an attack. So here's the extension property stated again, and the attack would work as follows. Suppose I issue a square root of Y chosen message queries. So for AES, remember the value of Y is basically 0, 1 to the 128. So this would mean that I would be asking 2 to the 64 chosen message queries for just arbitrary messages in the input space. Well, what will happen is I'll obtain, well, I'll obtain 2 to the 64 message MAC pairs. Now we're going to see in the next module actually that there's something called the birthday paradox. Some of you may have heard of it already. That basically says that if I have 2 to the 64 random elements of a space of size 2 to the 128, there's a good chance the two of them are the same. So I'm going to look for two distinct messages, MU and MV, for which the corresponding max are the same. Okay, and as I said, by the birthday paradox, these are very likely to exist. Once I have that, now I've basically found MU and MV that have the same MAC. And as a result, what I can do is I can extend MU with an arbitrary word W and ask for the tag for the word MU concatenated W. But because MU and MV happen to have the same output, I know that MU concatenated W has the same output as MV concatenated W. So now that I've obtained the output for MU concatenated W, I also have the output for MV concatenated W. And therefore, I've obtained my forgery. Okay, so now T is also a forgery for the message MV concatenated W, which I've never asked before, and therefore, this is a valid existential forgery. Okay, so this is kind of a cute attack. And the bottom line here is that, in fact, after square root of Y queries, I am able to forge a Mac with fairly good probability. Okay, so what does square root of Y mean if we go back to the security theorems? This means that basically for ECBC after square root of X or for NMAC after square root of K messages have been Mac'd, the Mac becomes insecure and the attacker can actually find new Macs for messages for which he was never given a Mac for. So again, this is a cute attack that shows that the bounds of the theorem really are real. And as a result, these bounds that we derived in this example are real and you should never use a single key to Mac more than, say, 2 to the 48 messages with AES based CBC. So to conclude, I'll just mention that we've seen two examples. We saw ECBC and NMAC. ECBC is, in fact, a very commonly used Mac that's built from AES. 802.11i, for example, uses ECBC with AES for integrity. There's also a NIST standard called CMAC that we'll talk about in the next segment that also is based on CBC Mac. NMAC, in contrast, is not typically used with a block cipher. And the main reason is you notice that in the NMAC construction, the key changes from block to block. That means that the whole AES key expansion has to be computed and recomputed on every block. And AES is not designed to perform well when you change its key very rapidly. And so typically when you use NMAC, you use block ciphers that are better at changing their keys on every block. And as a result, NMAC typically is not used with AES. But in fact, NMAC is a basis of a very popular Mac called HMAC, which we're also going to look at next. And you'll see very clearly the NMAC underlying the HMAC construction. Okay, so that's the end of this segment, and we'll talk about more Macs in the next segment. In the last segment, we talked about the CBC Mac and the NMAC, but throughout the segment, we always assumed that the message length was a multiple of the block size. In this segment, we're going to see what to do when the message length is not a multiple of the block size. So recall that the encrypted CBC Mac, or ECBC Mac for short, uses pseudo-random permutation f to actually compute the CBC function as we discussed in the last segment. But in the last segment, we always assumed that the message itself could be broken into an integer number of blocks for the block cipher. And the question is what to do when the message length is not a multiple of the block size. So here we have a message where the last block actually is shorter than the full block. And the question is how to compute the ECBC math in that case. So the solution, of course, is to pad the message. And the first pad that comes to mind is to simply pad the message with all zeros. In other words, we take the last block and just add zeros to it until the last block becomes as long as one full block size. And so my question to you is whether the resulting Mac is secure. 
So the answer is no, the Mac is not secure, and let me explain why. Basically the problem is that it's possible now to come up with messages so that the message M and the message M concatenated zero happen to have exactly the same pad. And as a result, once we plug in both M and M zero into ECBC, we'll get the same tag out, which means that both M and M concatenated zero have the same tag, and therefore the attacker can mount an existential forgery. He would ask for the tag on the message M, and then he would output as his forgery the tag on the message M concatenated zero. And it's easy to see why that's the case. Basically, uh, to be absolutely clear, here we have our message M, which after padding becomes M000. Say we had to add three zeros to it. And here we have the message M0, M, M that ends with zero. And after padding, we basically now only have to add two zeros to it. And lo and behold, they become the same pad so that they're going to have exactly the same tag which allows the adversary to mount the existential forgery attack. So this is not a good idea. In fact, appending all zeros is a terrible idea. And if you think about a concrete case where this comes up, imagine in the automatic clearinghouse system used for clearing checks, I might have a check for $100 and a tag on that check. Well, now the attacker basically could append a zero to my check and make it a check for $1,000, and that wouldn't actually change the tag. So this ability to extend the message without changing the tag actually could have pretty disastrous consequences. So I hope this example convinces you that the padding function itself must be a one-to-one -one function. In other words, it should be the case that two distinct messages always map to two distinct padded messages. We shouldn't actually have a collision on the padding function. Another way of saying it is that the padding function must be invertible. That guarantees that the padding function is one-to-one. -one. So a standard way to do this was proposed by the International Standards Organization, ISO. What they suggested is basically let's append the string 10000 to the end of the message to make the message be a multiple of the block length. Now to see that this padding is invertible, all we do is describe the inversion algorithm which simply is going to scan the message from uh, right to left until it hits the first one, and then it's going to remove all the bits to the right of this one, including the one. And you see that once we remove the pad in this way, we obtain the original message. So here's an example. So here we have a message where the last block happens to be shorter than the block length, and then we append the 100 string to it. It's very easy to see what the pad is. Simply look for the first one from the right, we can remove this pad and recover the original message back. Now there's one corner case that's actually quite important, and that is what do we do if the original message length is already a multiple of the block size? In that case, it's really very, very important that we add an extra dummy block that contains the pad 1000. And again, I can't tell you how many products and standards have actually made this mistake where they didn't add a dummy block. And as a result, the Mac is insecure because there's an easy existential forgery attack. And let me show you why. So suppose in case the message is a multiple of the block length, suppose we didn't add a dummy block and we literally Maced this message here. Well, the result now is that if you look at the message which is a multiple of the block size and a message which is not a multiple of the block size but is padded to the block size, and imagine it so happens that this message m prime 1 happens to end with 100. At this point, you realize that here, the original message here, let me draw it this way, you realize that the original message after padding would become identical to the second message that was not padded at all. And as a result, if I ask for the tag on this message over here, I would obtain also the tag on the second message that happened to end in 100. Okay, so if we didn't add the dummy block, Basically, again, the pad would be not invertible because two different messages, two distinct messages, happen to map to the same padded result. Again, as a result, the Mac becomes insecure. So to summarize, this ISO standard is a perfectly fine way to pad, except you have to remember to also add a dummy block in case the message is a multiple of the block length to begin with. Now, some of you might be wondering if there's a padding scheme that never needs to add a dummy block. And the answer is that if you look at the deterministic padding function, then it's pretty easy to argue that there will always be cases where we need to pad. And the reason is just literally the number of messages that are a multiple of the block length is much smaller than the total number of messages that need not be a multiple of the block length. 
And as a result, we can't have a one-to-one -one function from this bigger set of all messages to the smaller set of messages which are a multiple of the block length. There will always be cases where we have to extend the original message, and in this case, that would correspond to adding this dummy padding block. However, there is a very clever idea called CMAC, which shows that using a randomized padding function, we can avoid having to ever add a dummy block. And so let me explain how CMAC works. Uh, so CMAC actually uses three keys, and in fact, sometimes this is called a three key construction. So the first key, K, is used in the CBC, the standard CBC MAC algorithm. And then the keys K1 and K2 are used just for the padding scheme at the very, very last block. And in fact, in the CMAC standard, the keys K1, K2 are derived from the key K by some sort of a pseudo-random generator. So the way CMAC works is as follows. Well, if the message happens to not be a multiple of the block length, then we append the ISO padding to it, but then we also XOR this last block with a secret key, K1, that the adversary doesn't know. However, if the message is a multiple of the block length, then of course we don't append anything to it, but we XOR it with a different key, K2, that again, the adversary doesn't actually know. So it turns out, just by doing that, it's now impossible to apply the extension attacks that we could do on the cascade function and on raw CBC because the poor adversary actually doesn't know what is the last block that went into the function. He doesn't know K1 and therefore he doesn't know the value at this particular point and as a result he can't do an extension attack. In fact this is a provable statement. So that this construction here simply by XORing K1 or XORing K2 is really a PRF despite not having to do a final encryption step after the raw CBC function is computed. So that's one benefit, that there's no final encryption step. And the second benefit is that we resolve this ambiguity between whether padding did happen or padding didn't happen by using two different keys to distinguish the case that the message is a multiple of the block length versus the case where it's not, but we have a pad appended to the message. So the two distinct keys resolve this ambiguity between the two cases, and as a result, this padding actually is sufficiently secure. And as I said, there's actually a nice security theorem that goes with CMAC that shows that the CMAC construction really is a pseudo-random function with the same security properties as CBCMAC. So I wanted to mention that CMAC is a federal standard, uh, standardized by NIST, and if you now these days wanted to use a CBCMAC for anything, you would be actually using CMAC as the standard way to do it. Particularly in CMAC, the underlying block cipher is AES, and that gives us a secure CBC MAC derived from AES. So that's the end of the segment, and in the next segment, we'll talk about a parallel MAC. In the last two segments, we talked about the CBC MAC and NMAC to convert a PRF for small messages into a PRF for much larger messages. Those two constructions were sequential in the sense that if you had multiple processors, you couldn't make the construction work any faster. In this segment, we're going to look at a parallel MAC that also converts a small PRF into a large PRF, but does it in a very parallelizable fashion. In particular, we're going to look at a parallel MAC construction called PMAC that uses an underlying PRF to construct a PRF for much larger messages. In particular, the PRF can process much longer messages that can have variable length and have as many as L blocks in them. Now, the construction works as follows. We take our message and we break it into blocks, and then we process each block independently of the other. So the first thing we do is we evaluate some function p and we XOR the result into the first message block. And then we apply our function f using a key k1. We do the same for each one of the message blocks. And you notice that we can do it all parallel. All message blocks are processed independently of one another. And we collect all these results into some final XOR. And then we encrypt one more time to get the final tag value. Now, for a technical reason, actually, on the very last block, we actually don't need to apply the PRFF, but as I said, this is just for a technical reason, and I'm going to ignore that for now. Now, I want to explain what the function P is for and what it does. So imagine just for a second that the function P isn't actually there. That is, imagine we actually directly feed each message block into the PRF without applying any other processing to it. Then I claim that the resulting MAC is completely insecure. And the reason is that essentially no order is enforced between the message blocks. In particular, if I swap two message blocks, that doesn't change the value of the final tag. Because the XOR is commutative, the tag will be the same whether we swap the blocks or not. As a result, an attacker can request the tag for a particular message, and then he obtains a tag for a message where two of the blocks are swapped, and that counts as an existential forgery. So what this function p tries to do is essentially enforce order on these blocks. And you notice that the function 
takes, first of all, it's a keyed function, so it takes a key as input. And second of all, more importantly, it takes the block number as input. In other words, the value of the function is different for each one of the blocks. And that's actually ex exactly what's preventing this uh, blocks swapping attack. So the function p actually is a very easy to compute function. Essentially, given the key and the message block, all it is is just a multiplication in some finite field. So it's a very, very simple function to compute. It adds very little to the running time of pmac. And yet, it's enough to ensure that the pmac is actually secure. As we said, the key for pmac is this pair of keys, one key for the PRF and one key for this masking function p. And finally, I'll tell you that if the message length is not a multiple of the block length, that is, imagine the last block is shorter than full block length, then PMAC actually uses a padding that's similar to CMAC so that there is no need for an additional dummy block ever. So that's the PMAC construction, and as usual, we can state its security theorem. So the security theorem, by now, you should be used to it. Essentially, it says that if you give me an adversary attacking PMAC, I can construct an adversary attack in the underlying PRF plus an additional error term. And so since, again, the PRF is secure, we know that this term is negligible. And so if we want this term to be negligible, we know that uh, we need this error term to also be negligible. Here, as usual, Q is the number of messages that are mapped using a particular key. And L is the maximum length of all those messages. And PMAC is secure as long as this product is less than the square root of the block size. So for A, yes, this would be 2 to the 128. Uh, the square root, therefore, would be 2 to the 64. So the MAC would be secure as long as Q times L is less than 2 to the 64. And every time as it gets closer to that value, of course, you would have to change the key in order to continue macking more messages. So the main thing to remember is that PMAC also gives us a PRF and when it processes the message blocks independently of one another. Turns out that PMAC also has a very interesting property, namely that PMAC MAC is incremental. So let me explain to you what that means. So suppose the function f that's used to construct pmac is not just a PRF, but in fact a permutation, a PRP. So we can actually invert it when we need to. Now suppose we've already computed the MAC for a particularly long message m. And now suppose just one message block of this long message changes. So here m1 is changed into m prime 1. But the remaining message blocks all remain the same. For other MACs, like CBC MAC, even though only one message block changed, you would have to recompute the tag on the entire message. Recomputing the tag basically would take time that's proportional to the length of the message. It turns out with PMAC, if we only change one block or a small number of blocks, actually we can recompute the value of the tag for the new message very, very quickly. And let me ask you a puzzle to see if you can figure out how to do that yourself. And remember the function f is a PRP and therefore is invertible. So let's see if you can figure out how to compute the MAC and the new message by yourself. So it turns out this can be done, and you can quickly recompute the tag and the new message using this third line here. So just to make sure we all see the solution, let's quickly go back to the original diagram for PMAC, and I can show you what I mean. So imagine this one message block changed into some other block, say it changed into M prime 1. Then what we could do is we can take the tag on the original message before the change was made. So we can invert the function f and determine the value before the function f was applied. Now, well, since we now have an XOR of a bunch of blocks, what we can do is we can cancel out the XOR that came from the original message block, basically by XORing this value uh, that came from the original message block into this XOR accumulator. And then XORing again, the value that would come from the new message block back into the XOR accumulator, and then apply the function f again. And that would give us the tag for the new message where just one block was changed. So in symbols, basically, I wrote the formula over here. You can see, basically, we decrypt the tag, and then we XOR with uh, the block that comes from uh, the original message block. We XOR again with the block that comes from the new message block, and then we re-encrypt the final XOR accumulator to get the new tag for the message with a one block changed. So that's kind of a neat property. It kind of shows that if you have very large messages, you can very quickly update the tag. Of course, you would need the secret key to do the update, but you can quickly update the tag if just a small number of message blocks changed. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of PMAC. And now I want to switch topics a little bit and talk about the concept of a one-time MAC, which is basically the analog of the one-time pad, but in the world of integrity. So let me explain what I mean by that. So imagine we want to build a Mac 
that is only used for integrity of a single message. In other words, every time we uh, compute the integrity of a particular message, we also change the key. So that any particular key is used for only for integrity of one message. Then we can define the security game as basically saying the attacker is going to see one message, therefore we only allow him to do one chosen message attack. So he gets to submit one message query and he is given the tag corresponding to that one message query and now his goal is to forge a message tag pair. Okay, so you can see his goal is to produce one message tag pair that verifies correctly and is different from the pair that he was actually given. As we'll see, just like the one-time pad and stream ciphers were quite useful, it turns out one-time acts are also quite useful for the same applications where we only want to use a key to encrypt or to uh, provide integrity for just a single message. So as usual, we would say that a one-time act is secure if basically no adversary can win this game. Now the interesting thing is that one-time acts, just like the one-time pad, can be secure against infinitely powerful adversaries. And not only that, because they're only designed to be secure for one-time use, they can actually be faster than Macs that are based on PRFs. And so I just wanted to give you a quick example of one one-time Mac. This is a classic construction for a one-time Mac, and let me show you how it works. The first step is to pick a prime that's slightly larger than our block size. In this case, we're going to use 128-bit blocks, so let's pick the first prime that's bigger than 2 to the 128. This happens to be 2 to the 128 plus 51. And now the key is going to be a pair of random numbers in the range 1 to r prime, so 1 to q. So we choose two random integers in the range 1 to q. Now we're given a message, so we're going to take our message and break it into blocks, where each block is 128 bits. And we're going to regard each number as an integer in the range 0 to 2 to the 128 minus 1. Now the Mac is defined as follows. The first thing we do is we take our message blocks and we kind of construct a polynomial out of them. So if there are L blocks in our message, we're going to construct a polynomial of degree L. And you notice that the constant term of this polynomial is set to 0. And then we define the Mac very simply. Basically what we do is we take the polynomial that corresponds to the message. We evaluate it at the point K, that's one half of our secret key. And then we add the value A, which is the second half of our secret key. And that's it. That's the whole Mac. So just basically construct the polynomial that corresponds to our message, evaluate that polynomial at a half of the secret key, and add the other half of the secret key to the result, and of course reduce the final result modulo Q. Okay, so that's it. So that's the whole Mac. It's a one-time secure Mac. And the way we argue that this Mac is one-time secure, essentially by arguing that if I tell you the value of the Mac for one particular message, that tells you nothing at all about the value of the Mac at another message. And as a result, even though you've seen the value of the Mac on a particular message, you have no way of forging this Mac on some other message. Now I should emphasize that this is a one-time Mac, but it's not two-time secure. In other words, if you get to see the value of the Mac on two different messages, that actually completely compromises the secret key, and you can actually predict the Mac for a third or fourth message of your choice. So then the Mac becomes forgeable. But for one-time use, it is a perfectly secure Mac. And I'll tell you that, in fact, this is a very fast Mac to evaluate. So now that we've constructed one-time Macs, it turns out there's actually a general technique that will convert one-time Macs into many-time Macs. And I just wanted to briefly show you how that works. So suppose we have our one-time Mac. Let's call it S and V for signing and verification algorithms. And let's just assume that the tags themselves are n-bit strings. In addition, let's also look at a PRF, a secure PRF, that also happens to output n-bit strings, but also takes as inputs n-bit strings. So let's now define a general construction for a Mac. These Macs are called carter Wegman Macs. That works as follows. Basically, what we would do is we would apply the one-time Mac to the message M, and then we're going to encrypt the result using a PRF. So how do we encrypt the result? Well, we choose a random R. And then we compute kind of a one-time pad from this R by applying the PRF to it. And then we XOR the result with the actual one-time Mac. So the neat thing about this construction is that the fast one-time Mac is applied to the long message, which could be gigabytes long. And the slower PRF is only applied to this nonce R, which is then used to encrypt the final result of the Mac. And you can argue that if the Mac that was given to us as a building block is a one-time secure Mac, and the PRF is secure, then in fact we get a many times secure Mac that happens to output two n-bit tags. So we're going to see Carter Wagman Macs later on when we talk about authenticated encryption. And in fact, one of the NIST standard methods for doing encryption with integrity uses a Carter Wagman Mac for providing integrity. 
I wanted to mention that this Carter Wagman Mac is a good example of a randomized Mac where this nonce R is chosen afresh every time the tag is computed. And so, if, for example, if you try to compute tag for the same message twice, each time you'll choose a different R, and as a result, you'll get different tags both times. And so this is a nice example of a Mac that's actually not a pseudo-random function, not a PRF, because a single message could actually be mapped to many different tags, all of which are valid for that one message. To conclude our discussion of the Carter-Wagman Mac, let me ask you the following question. Here we have the equation for the Carter-Wagman Mac. As usual, you see the nonce R as part of the Mac. And the second part of the Mac I'm going to denote by T. This is basically the one-time Mac applied to the message M, and then encrypted using the pseudo-random function applied to the nonce R. So we'll, we'll denote the result of this XOR by T. So my question to you is, given the Carter-Wegman Mac pair, R comma T, for a particular message M, how would you verify that this Mac is valid? And recall that this algorithm V here is the verification algorithm for the underlying one-time Mac. So this is the right answer, and to see why, just observe that this XOR here decrypts the quantity t to its plain text value, which is basically the original underlying one-time Mac, and so we can directly feed that into the verification algorithm for the one-time Mac. The last type of Mac I wanted to tell you about is one that's very popular in internet protocols. It's called the HMAC. But before we talk about HMAC, we have to talk about hash functions, and in particular, collision-resistant hash functions, and we're going to do that in the next module. So this is the end of our first module on Macs, and I wanted to point out that there's really beautiful theory that went into constructing all the Macs that we saw. Uh, I kind of gave you the highlights and showed you the main constructions, but there's really quite a bit of theory that goes into constructing these Macs, and if you'd like to learn more about that, I kind of listed a couple of key papers that you might want to look at. Let me quickly tell you what they are. The first one is uh, what's called the three key construction, which is the basis of CMAC, a very elegant paper that gives a very efficient construction out of CBCMAC. Uh, the second paper is a more technical paper, but basically shows how to prove the bounds of CBCMAC as a PRF. Uh, the third paper uh, talks about PMAC and its construction, again, a very cute paper. The fourth paper talks about security of NMAC and HMAC as well. HMAC we're going to cover in uh, the next module, the last paper I listed asks an intriguing question. Recall that all of our constructions, we always assumed that AES is a pseudo-random function for 16-byte messages, and then we built a pseudo-random function, and therefore a MAC, for much longer messages. This paper says, well, what do we do if AES is not a pseudo-random function, but still satisfies some weaker security property called an unpredictable function? And then they ask, if AES is only an unpredictable function, but not a pseudorandom function, can we still build Macs for long messages? And so they succeed in actually giving constructions just based on the weaker assumption that AES is an unpredictable function, but their constructions are far less efficient than CBC Mac or NMAC or PMAC that we discussed in these segments. And so if you're interested in a different perspective on how to build Macs from block ciphers like AES, please take a look at this paper, and there are actually some nice open questions to work on in this area. So this concludes our first segment on integrity, and in the next segment, we're going to talk about collision resistance. In this module, we're going to talk about a new concept called collision resistance, which plays an important role in providing message integrity. Our end goal is to describe a very popular MAC algorithm called HMAC that's widely used in internet protocols. HMAC itself is built from collision resistant hash functions. Before we do that, let's do a quick recap of where we are. In the last module, we talked about message integrity, where we said that a MAC system is secure if it is existentially unforgeable under a chosen message attack. This means that even an attacker who is given the tag on arbitrary messages of his choice cannot construct a tag for some new message. And then we showed that, in fact, any secure PRF immediately gives us a secure MAC. And so then we turned around and said, well, can we build secure PRFs that take large messages as inputs? And so we looked at four constructions. The first construction was based on CBC. We called, when we looked at two variants of it, one called encrypted CBC and one called CMAC. And we said that these are commonly used with AES. In fact, in the 802.11i standard, a CBC MAC is used for message integrity, in particular with the AES algorithm. We looked at another mode called NMAC, which also converts a PRF for short inputs into a PRF that's capable of taking very large messages as input. And these two were both sequential MACs. We then looked at a parallelizable MAC called PMAC, 
which again was able to convert a PRF for small inputs into a PRF for very large inputs, but it did so in a parallel fashion, so a multiprocessor system would be more efficient with PMAC than, say, with CBC Mac. All three of these built a Mac for large messages by constructing a PRF for large messages. And then we looked at the Carter Wagman Mac, which actually is not a PRF, it's a randomized Mac, so a single message could actually have many, many different valid tags, and therefore a Carter Wagman Mac is actually not a PRF. And if you remember, the Carter Wagman Mac was built by, first of all, taking the bulk message and hashing it down to a small tag using a fast one-time Mac, and then encrypting that tag using a PRF. The benefit of the Carter Wagman Mac was that, as we said, the hashing of the bulk message is done using a fast one-time Mac. And then in this module, we're going to construct Macs from this new concept called collision resistance. And so the first thing we're going to do is construct collision resistant hash functions. So let's first of all start by defining what does it mean for a hash function to be collision resistant. So think of a hash function from some message space to a tag space T, and you should be thinking of the message space as much, much bigger than the tag space. So the messages could be gigabytes long, but the tags would only be like 160 bits. Now a collision for the function H is a pair of messages M0, M1 that happen to be distinct. However, when you apply the function H to them, you end up with the same output. So the image you should have in your mind is essentially there are two inputs, M0 and M1. They belong to this gigantic message space. However, when we apply the hash function to them, they happen to collide and they both map to the same output in the tag space. Now we say that the function h is collision resistant if it's hard to find collisions for this function. Now this should seem a little bit counterintuitive because we know that the output space is tiny compared to the input space. So by the pigeonhole principle, there must be lots and lots and lots of messages that map to the same output. Just because there isn't enough space in the output space to accommodate all the messages without collisions. And so we know that there are lots of collisions. And the question is, is there an efficient algorithm that finds any such collisions explicitly? So we say that the function is collision resistant if for all explicit efficient algorithms A, then these algorithms are not able to print a collision for the function H. Okay, and well, as usual, we'll define the advantage as the probability that the algorithm A is able to output a collision. Now, I'm not going to formalize the term explicit here. All I'll say is that it's not enough to just say that an algorithm exists, an algorithm that simply prints a collision, because we know many collisions exist. What we actually want is an explicit algorithm that we can actually write down and run on a computer to generate these collisions. There are ways to formalize that, but I'm not going to do that here. Now, a classic example of a collision-resistant hash function is uh, SHA-256, which happens to output uh, 256 bits, but can take arbitrary large inputs. For example, it can take gigabytes and gigabytes of data, and it'll map it all to 256 bits, and yet nobody knows how to find collisions for this particular function. So just to show you that this concept of collision resistance is very useful, let's see a very quick application for it. In particular, let's see how we can trivially build a Mac given a collision-resistant hash function. So suppose we have a Mac for short messages. So you should be thinking something like AES, which can Mac 16 byte messages. And then suppose we have a hash function, a collision resistant hash function from large message space that contains gigabyte messages into our small message space, say into 16 byte outputs. Then basically we can define a new Mac, let's call it iBig, which happens to be macking uh, large messages. And we'll define it simply by applying the small Mac to the output of the hash function. And how do we verify a Mac? Well, basically, the, given a tag, we verify it by rehashing the uh, given message and then checking that a small Mac actually verifies under the given tag. Okay, so this is a very simple way to show you how collision resistance can take a primitive that's built for small inputs and expand it into a primitive that's built for very large inputs. And in fact, we're going to see this not just for Macs. Later on, when we talk about digital signatures, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to build a digital signature scheme for small inputs, and then we're going to use collision resistance to expand the input space and make it as large as we want. So the security theorem basically is in some sense trivial here. Basically, it says if the underlying Mac is secure, and H is collision resistant, then the combination, which can actually Mac uh, large messages, is also a secure Mac. And as a quick example, let's apply this to AES. So let's use the one example that we mentioned, SHA-256. So in this case, SHA-256 outputs 256-bit outputs, which is 32 bytes. So we have to build a Mac that can Mac 32-byte messages. And the way we could do that is basically by applying the 16-byte AES plugging it into a two-block CBC. A two-block CBC 
would expand AES from a PRF on 16 bytes to a PRF on 32 bytes, and then take the output of SHA-256 and plug it into this uh, two-block CBC based on AES. And then we get a very, very simple uh, MAC, which is secure, assuming AES is a PRF, and SHA-256 is collision resistant. So one thing I wanted to point out is that, in fact, collision resistance is necessary for this construction to work. So in fact, collision resistance is not just a made-up term. Collision resistance really is kind of uh, the essence of why this combined MAC is secure. And so let's just assume for a minute that the function h, the hash function we're using, is not collision resistant. In other words, there is an algorithm that can find two distinct messages that happen to map to the same output. In this case, the combined MAC is not going to be secure because what the adversary can do is simply use the chosen message attack to get a tag for m0 and then output m1 comma that tag as a forgery. And indeed, t is a valid MAC for m1 because h of m1 happens to be equal to h of m0. And so in doing so, just with a one chosen message attack, the attacker was able to break this combined MAC simply because the hash function was not collision resistant. So it should be, again, I want to emphasize that if someone advertised even one collision for SHA-256, you know, two messages, just one pair of messages that happen to have the same output under SHA-256, that would already make this construction insecure because an attacker could then ask for the tag on one message, and in doing so, he would obtain the tag on the other message as well. And that would count as an existential forgery. Okay, so already we see the collision resistance is a very useful primitive in that it lets us expand the input space of uh, cryptographic primitives. I want to show you one more application where collision resistance is directly used for message integrity. Imagine again we have files that we want to protect. Let's imagine these files are actually software packages that uh, we want to install on our system. So here are three different software packages. You know, maybe one is GCC, one is uh, Emacs, and another one is, I don't know, uh, VI. Now the user wants to download the software package, and he wants to make sure that he really did get a version of the package that he downloaded, and it's not some version that the attacker tampered with and modified its contents. So what he could do is basically refer to a read-only public space that's relatively small. All it has to do is hold small hashes of uh, these software packages. So there isn't a lot of space needed here. The only requirement is that this space is read-only. In other words, the attacker cannot modify the hashes stored in the space. And then uh, once he consults this public space, he can very easily compute the hash of a package that he downloaded, compare it to the value in the public space, and if the two match, then he knows that the version of the package he downloaded is in fact a correct one. Why is that true? Well, because the function h is collision resistant, the attacker cannot find an f1 hat that would have the same hash as f1. And as a result, the attacker cannot modify f1 without being detected, because there's no way that the hash of his f1 hat would map to the value that's stored in the public space. So uh, the reason I brought up this example is I wanted to contrast this with the Mac example. We kind of saw a similar uh, situation with Macs. In the Mac example, we needed a secret key to verify the individual file tags, but we didn't need a resource that was a read-only public space. With collision-resistant hashes, we kind of get the exact complement, where in fact we don't need a key to verify. Anyone can verify. You don't need a secret key for it. However, now all of a sudden we need this extra resource, which is some space that the attacker cannot modify. And in fact, later on, we're going to see that with digital signatures, we can kind of get the best of both worlds, where we have both public verifiability and we don't need a read-only space. But so far, with either max or collision resistance, we can have one, but not the other. So I'll tell you that, in fact, this kind of scheme is very popular. In fact, uh, Linux distributions often use public spaces where they advertise hashes of their software packages, and anyone can make sure that they downloaded the right software package before installing it on their computer. So this is, in fact, something that's used quite extensively in the real world. Okay, so in the next segment, we'll talk about generic attack on collision resistance, and then we'll go ahead and build collision-resistant hash functions. The next thing I want to do is show you a general attack on collision-resistant hash functions. If you remember when we talked about block ciphers, we saw a general attack on block ciphers, which we called exhaustive search, and that attack forced the key size for a block cipher to be 128 bits or more. Similarly, on collision resistance, there's a general attack called the birthday attack, which forces the output of a collision-resistant hash functions to be more than a certain bound. And so let me show you the attack, and then we'll see what those bounds uh, come out to be. 
So here's a general attack that can work on arbitrary collision-resistant hash functions. So here we have our collision-resistant hash function, supposedly. But let's suppose that it outputs n bit values. In other words, the output space is roughly of size 2 to the n. Now the message space is going to be much, much larger than n bits. Let's just say that the messages that are being hashed are, say, you know, 100 times n bits. I want to show you an algorithm that can find a collision for this hash function h in time roughly 2 to the n over 2. Okay, so roughly the square root of the size of the output space. So here's how the algorithm is going to work. What we'll do is we'll choose random 2 to the n over 2 messages in our message space. Let's call them m1 to m2 to the n over 2. Now, because the messages themselves are much bigger than n bits, they're 100 times n bits, it's very likely that all these messages are distinct. So they'll be distinct with high probability. But for each one of these messages, we're going to apply the hash function and obtain a tag t sub i. So this is, of course, the t sub i's are n bit long strings. And now we're going to look for a collision among the t sub i's. In other words, we're going to find an i and a j such that t sub i equals to t sub j. And once we've done that, we've basically found a collision because, as we said, with very high probability, m i is not equal to m j. But the hash of m i is equal to the hash of m j. And therefore, we found the collision on the function h. Now, if it so happens that we look through all 2 to the n over 2 t sub i's and we don't find the collision, we go back to step one and try another set of 2 to the n over 2 messages. So the question is, how well will this work? In other words, how many times do we have to iterate this process until we actually find the collision? And I want to show you that, in fact, the number of iterations is going to be very, very small, which means that this algorithm will find the collision in time that's roughly proportional 2 to the n over 2. So to analyze this type of attack, I have to tell you a little bit about the birthday paradox. I imagine some of you have already heard of the birthday paradox. Here stated as a theorem, and I want to prove it to you because everybody should see a proof of the birthday paradox at least once in their lives. So here it is. So imagine we have n random variables, r1 to rn, in the interval 1 to b. And the only thing I'm going to assume about them is that they're actually independent of one another. That's crucial, that these n samples, r1 to n to rn, in this interval are independent of one another. And they also happen to be distributed identically. So for example, they might all be uh, uniform in the interval 1 to b. But again, these would be independently uniform variables. Now, it so happens that if we set n to be about the square root of b, in other words, if we sample roughly square root of b samples from the interval 1 to b, you know, to be precise, it's 1.2 times the square root of b, then the probability that two of those samples will be the same is at least a half. Okay, and then it turns out, in fact, the uniform distribution is the worst case for the birthday paradox. In other words, if the distribution from which the ris are sampled from is non-uniform, then in fact fewer than 1.2 times square root of b samples are needed. The uniform distribution is the worst case. So we're going to prove this for the uniform distribution, and that basically just also proves it for all other distributions. But the proof that I want to show you here will hold just for the uniform distribution. OK, so let's do the proof. It's actually uh, not difficult at all. So we're asking, what is the probability that there exists an i that's not equal to j, such that ri is equal to rj? Well, let's negate that. So that's basically 1 minus the probability that for all i not equal to j, we have that ri is uh, not equal to rj. This basically means that no collision occurred among the n samples that we chose. Well, let's try to write this out more precisely. Well, we're going to write this as 1 minus. And now when we choose R1, basically it's the first one we choose, so it's not going to collide with anything. But now let's look at what happens when we choose R2. When we choose R2, let me ask you, what is the probability that R2 does not collide with R1? Well, R1 takes one slot, so there are B minus 1 slots that if R2 falls into, it's not going to collide with R1. So in other words, the probability that R2 does not collide with R1 is b minus 1 slots divided by all b possible slots. Similarly, when we pick R3, what is the probability that R3 does not collide with either R1 or R2? Again, R1 and R2 take up two slots. And so there are b minus 2 slots that remain for R3. If it falls into either one of those b minus 2 slots, it's not going to collide with either R1 or R2. So I imagine you see the pattern now. So R4, its probability of not colliding with R1, R2, or R3 is b minus 3 over b, and so on and so forth until we get to the very last Rn. And the probability that Rn 
does not collide with the previous RIs, well, there are n minus 1 slots taken up by the previous RIs. So if Rn falls into any of the remaining b minus n plus 1 slots, it's not going to collide with any of the previous R1 to Rn minus 1. Now you notice that the reason I was able to multiply all these probabilities is exactly because the Ri's are all independent of one another. So it's crucial for the step that the Ri's are independent. So let me rewrite this expression a little bit. Let me write it as 1 minus the product of i goes from 1 to n minus 1 of uh, 1 minus i over b. Okay, all I did is I just rewrote this as a big product as opposed to uh, writing the terms individually. So now I'm going to use a standard inequality that says that for any positive x, 1 minus x is less than e to the minus x. And that's actually easy to see because e to the minus x, if you look at its Taylor expansion, is 1 minus x plus x squared over 2 minus and so on and so forth. And so you can see that we're basically ignoring this latter part of the Taylor expansion, which happens to be positive. And as a result, the left side here is going to be smaller than the right-hand side. Okay, so let's plug this inequality in. And what do we get? We get that this is greater than 1 minus the product of i goes from 1 to n minus 1 of e to the minus i over b. Okay, I simply plugged in x equals i over b for each one of those terms. Now the nice thing about exponentials is that we multiply them, the exponents add. As a result, this is simply equal to 1 minus e to the power of, here let me take the 1 over b out of the parentheses, sum of i goes from a 1 to n minus 1 of i. Okay, so all I did is I took the minus 1 over b out of the parentheses and we're left with a simple sum of 1 to n minus 1. And so the sum of the integers from 1 to n minus 1 is simply n times n minus 1 over 2, which I can bound by n squared over 2. And so really what I get at the end here is 1 minus e to the power of minus n squared over 2b. Okay, I literally bounded the sum here by n squared over 2. Okay, very good. Now, so what do we know about n squared over 2b? Well, we can derive exactly what n squared over 2b is from the relationship here. So if you think about it, uh, let's look at n squared over 2. Well, n squared over 2 is 1.2 squared over 2. 1.2 squared is 1.44 divided by 2 is 0.72 times the square root of b squared, which is b. Okay, so n squared over 2 is 0.72b, and as a result, n squared over 2b is just 0.72. So we get 1 minus e to the power of minus 0.72. Well, so now you just plug this into your calculator and you get 0 0.53, which as far as I know is always bigger than a half. So this proves the birthday paradox, and you notice it was crucial to assume that the samples are independent of one another. We only proved it for the uniform distribution, but as I said, it's actually fairly easy to argue now that any distribution that's away from the uniform distribution will satisfy this with even a lower bound. So if you have uh, 1.2 squared of b, the theorem will certainly hold for non-uniform distributions. The reason it's called a paradox is because it's very paradoxical that the square root function grows very slowly. In particular, if you try to apply this to birth dates, so let's assume that we have a number of people in a room, and let's assume that their birth dates are independent of one another and are uniform in the interval 1 to 365, then what the birthday paradox says is that we need roughly 1.2 times square root of 365, which I believe is uh, something like 23, which says we need roughly 23 people in a room, and then with probability 1 half, two of them will actually have the same birthday. The reason it's called a paradox is because the number 23 seems really small to people, and yet by the theorem that we just proved, with probability 1 half, there will be two people with the same birthday. By the way, the intuition for why this fact is true is because really what the collision is counting is it's looking at all possible pairs of people. And if you have a square root of b people, then there are square root of b squared pairs, roughly, which is roughly b pairs total. And so it's very likely that each pair collides with probability 1 over b. And if you have b pairs, it's likely that one of the pairs will collide. So hopefully this gives you intuition for where the square root comes from. It's basically from the fact that if you have n people in a room, there are n squared possible pairs. I should say, by the way, that even though the birthday paradox is often applied to birth dates, birth dates are actually not uniform at all. If you actually look at the birth dates of people, you see that there's a very clear bias towards being born in September. And for some bizarre reason, there's also a bias towards being born on a Tuesday. 
And so when we apply the birthday paradox to birthdays, in fact, the actual bound is going to be smaller than 1 minus 2 square root of b because we said that for non-uniform distributions, you need even fewer samples before you get a collision. So let me show you a graph of the birthday paradox. It's quite interesting how it behaves. So here I set b to be a million. In other words, we're picking random uniform samples in the range 1 to a million. And the x-axis here is the number of samples that we're picking. And the y-axis is the probability that we get a collision among those n samples. So we see that the probability of 1 half happens around 1.2 square root of b, roughly 1,200, 1.2 square root of b. And you see that if we look at exactly square root of b, the probability for a collision is around 0.4 or 0.41. And you notice the probability goes up to 1 extremely fast. For example, already at uh, roughly 2 square root of b, the probability of a collision is already 90%. Similarly, when we go below square root of b, the probability of a collision very, very quickly drops to zero. Okay, so there's kind of a threshold phenomena around square root of b where the probability for a collision goes to one very quickly above square root of b and drops to zero very quickly below square root of b. So now we can analyze our attack algorithm. So let me remind you, here we chose two to the n over two random elements in the message space. We hashed them. And so we started off with a random distribution in the message space. After we hash them, we end up with some distribution. This distribution over tags might not be uniform, but we don't care. The point is that these, all these tags, t1 to t2 to the n over 2, are independent of one another. And as a result, if we choose 2 to the n over 2 or 1.2 to the n over 2 tags, the probability that a collision will exist is roughly 1 half. So let me ask you then, in that case, how many times do we have to iterate this algorithm before we actually find a collision? Well, so since each iteration is going to find a collision with probability 1 half, we have to iterate about two times in expectation. And as a result, the running time of this algorithm is basically 2 to the n over 2 evaluations of the hash functions. OK, so notice also this algorithm takes a lot of space, but we're going to ignore the space issue. And we're just going to focus on the running time. OK, so this is kind of cool. This says that if your hash function outputs n bit outputs, there will always be an attack algorithm that runs in time 2 to the n over 2. So for example, if we output 128 bit outputs, then a collision could be found in time 2 to the 64, which is not considered sufficiently secure. OK, so this is why collision resistant hash functions generally are not going to output 128 bits. So let me show you some examples. The first three are actually federal standards, uh, SHA-1, SHA-256, and SHA-512. And the fourth one is an example from the designers of AES called uh, Whirlpool. And so you can see SHA-1 outputs 160 bits. And as a result, there's a generic attack on it that runs in time 2 to the 80. SHA-256 outputs 256 bits. So the generic attack will run in time 2 to the 128, uh, and so on and so forth. I also listed the speeds of these algorithms. And you notice that the bigger the block size, actually the slower the algorithm is. And so there's a performance penalty. But nevertheless, there's quite a bit of benefit in terms of security. Now you notice the SHA function is actually grayed out. The SHA function, although nobody has found collisions for SHA-1 yet, it's still recommended that in new projects and in hopefully in programming projects in this class, you don't use SHA-1, instead use uh, SHA-256. And in particular, there is actually a theoretical collision finder on SHA-1 that works in time 2 to the 51. So it's probably just a matter of time until finally someone finds a collision for SHA-1 and just kills altogether. But the current advice is SHA-1 is still a collision resistant hash function because nobody has found collisions for it. But it's probably just a matter of time, just a few months or a few years, until a collision is found. And as a result, in new products and new projects, SHA-1 should not be used and only use SHA-256. Or if you want to be even more cautious, then use SHA-512. So this is the end of this segment. And now we're going to turn to building collision-resistant hash functions. So now we're going to look at a very general paradigm called the merkle damgard paradigm that's used for constructing collision-resistant hash functions. Before we do that, let me just remind you what our goals are. So as usual, we say that h is a hash function that maps some large message space into a small tag space. And we say that a collision for the hash function is basically a pair of distinct messages that happen to map to the same value under this hash function. And our goal is to build collision-resistant hash functions, namely functions where it's hard to find even a single collision. Even though we know many collisions exist, no efficient algorithm can even output a single collision. So we're going to construct these hash functions, these collision-resistant hash functions, in two steps. The first step, which we're going to do in this segment, is to show that if you give me a collision-resistant hash function for short messages, 
we can extend it and build a collision-resistant hash function for much, much, much longer messages. In the next segment, we'll actually build collision-resistant hash functions for short messages. Okay, so let's look at the construction. The construction is actually very general, and in fact, all collision-resistant hash functions follow this paradigm. It's actually a very elegant paradigm, and let me show you how it works. So here we have our function h, which we're going to assume is a collision-resistant hash function for small size inputs. So the way we're going to use this uh, little function h, this h is sometimes called a compression function, is we're going to take a big message m and break this message into blocks. And then we use a fixed value called the iv. Here, in this case, the iv is fixed forever. And it's basically embedded in the code and in the standards. It's just a fixed iv that's part of the definition of the function. And then what we do is we apply the small compression function h to the first message block along with this iv. What comes out of that is what's called a chaining variable that's going to be fed into the next compression function, which compresses the next block along with the previous chaining variable, and out comes the next chaining variable, and the next message block is compressed, and so on and so forth, until we reach the final message block. And in the final message block, the one special thing that we do is we must append this padding block, this PB, which stands for padding block, and I'll explain what the padding block is in just a second. But after we append the padding block, we again compress the last chaining variable with the last message block, and the output of that is the actual output of the hash function. So just to summarize uh, in symbols, we have this compression function that maps elements in T. This is the output of the hash function plus message blocks. This x corresponds to message blocks and outputs the next chaining variable. So as I said, this is what the compression functions uh, do. And then from this compression function, we're able to build a hash function for large inputs, namely inputs in the space x to some power of l, namely up to l blocks of x. And of course, these are variable length, so we can have different length messages that are being given as input to this function h. And what comes out of it is basically a tag in the tag space. So the only thing that's left to define is the padding block. And so the padding block actually is very important, as we're going to see in just a minute. What it is is basically, well, it's a sequence of 1, 0, 0, 0, just to denote the end of the actual message block. And then the most important part of the padding block is that we encode the message length in this padding block. And the message length field is basically fixed to be 64 bits. So in all the SHA hash functions, so in all the SHA hash functions, the maximum message length is 2 to the 64 minus 1. So in fact, the message length fits into a 64-bit block. And an upper bound of 2 to the 64 minus 1 bits on the message length is actually sufficiently long to handle all the messages we're going to throw at it. OK, so that's the padding block. And of course, the question is, what do we do if the last block really is a multiple of the compression function block length? Where are we going to fit the padding block? And the answer, as usual, is basically if there's no space for the padding block in the last block of the message, then we're going to have to add another dummy block and stick the padding block in there, and of course, put the 1000 in the right place. OK, so the point is it's very, very important that the padding block contains the message length, as we'll see in just a minute. So this is the uh, merkle damgard construction. The last piece of terminology I'll say is that we have these chaining variables. So h0 is the initial value, h1, h2 h3 up to h4, which is the actual final output of this hash function. So as I said, all standard hash functions follow this paradigm for constructing a collision-resistant hash function from a compression function. The reason this paradigm is so popular is because of the following theorem, which says basically that if the little compression function is collision-resistant, then the big merkle damgard hash function is also collision-resistant. So in other words, if we're going to build collision-resistant functions for large inputs, all we have to do is just build compression functions that are collision resistant. So let's prove this theorem. It's an elegant proof, and it's not too difficult. So the way we're going to prove it is using the contrapositive. That is, if you can find me a collision on the big hash function, then we're going to deduce a collision on the little compression function. Therefore, if little h is uh, collision resistant, so will be the big H. So suppose you give me a collision on the big compression function, namely two distinct messages, m and m prime, that happen to hash to the same output. We're going to use m and m prime to build a collision on the little compression function. So the first thing is we have to remember how the merkle damgard construction works. And in particular, let's assign names to the chaining variables when we hash m versus when we hash m prime. So here are the chaining variables that come up when we hash the message capital M. So h0 is the fixed IV that starts the whole process. h1 would be the result of hashing the first message block with the IV 
and so on and so forth until h sub t plus 1 is the final chaining variable, which is the final output of the merkel damgard chain. And then similarly for m prime, let's define h0 prime to be the first chaining variable, h1 prime to be the result after compressing the first message block of m prime, and so on and so forth, up until we get to h prime of r plus 1, which is the final hash of the message m prime. Now you notice the uh, length of the messages m and m prime don't have to be the same. In particular, m has length uh, t, whereas m prime has length r. Now because the collision occurred, we know that these two values here are the same. h of m is equal to h of m prime. In other words, the last chaining variables are actually equal to one another. So now let's look carefully how ht plus 1 and h prime r plus 1 were calculated. Well, ht plus 1 is calculated as the compression function applied to the previous chaining variable along with the last message block of m, including the padding block. You notice here I'm assuming that the padding block fits with the last message block of m. Even if the last padding block is in its own block, it's not going to make any difference. So for simplicity, let's assume that the padding block fits with the last message block of capital M. So by hashing the last message block with the padding block and the last chaining variable, we obtain ht plus 1. And similarly, the same thing happens with m prime. By hashing the last message block, the last chaining variable, we obtain h prime r plus 1. And we know that since these two values are equal, all of a sudden we have a candidate collision for the compression function. Here, let me circle the candidate collision. This is one part of it, and this is the other part of it. Okay, so we have an equality between two arguments given to the compression function that happen to produce the same value. The only way we would not get a collision is if the arguments happen to be the same. In other words, what we're saying here is if the arguments to the compression function are distinct, then we get a collision for little h. So let's write it out more precisely. So if ht is not equal to h prime r, or mt is not equal to m prime r, or the padding blocks are distinct, then we have a collision for the compression function h, and we're done. We're done and we can stop. So the only way we need to continue is if this three-way disjunction doesn't hold. So what does it mean that this junction doesn't hold? Well, so the only reason we need to continue is if the second to last chaining variables are equal, the last blocks of the messages are equal, and the two padding blocks are equal. So what does it mean that the two padding blocks are equal? Remember that the message lengths were encoded in the padding block. So in particular, this means that the length of m and the length of m prime is the same, namely the t is equal to r. So from now on, I can assume t is equal to r, and whenever I wrote r, I'm just going to write t. But now we can apply exactly the same argument to the second to last chaining variables. In other words, how was ht computed? Well, ht is computed by hashing the previous chaining variable, namely ht minus 1, with the second to last message block. And similarly, ht prime was computed, you notice I replaced r by t, so ht prime was computed by hashing the previous chaining variable along with the second to last message block of m prime. And because these two are equal, now we get another candidate collision for the compression function. In other words, if ht minus 1 is not equal to ht minus 1 prime, or mt minus 1 is not equal to uh, m prime t minus 1, then basically we have a collision for h, and we can stop. We're done. So now the only case when we need to continue is if this condition over here doesn't hold, namely, so let's suppose that h t minus 1 is equal to h prime t minus 1, and we already know that, uh, let's see, so m t is equal to m t prime, and m t minus 1 is equal to m t minus 1 prime. Suppose it so happens that these two uh, condition holds. Well, you can see that now we can continue to iterate. In other words, we can now apply exactly the same argument to h t minus 1 and h t minus 1 prime. And so iterating this again and again, we can iterate all the way to the beginning of the message. Iterate to the beginning of the message, and one of two things must hold. Either we find the collision for the compression function, or it so happens that all the message blocks of m and m prime are the same. In other words, for all i, m i is equal to m i prime. But this means, because the messages we already proved, the messages are the same length, this means that m is actually equal to m prime. But then this contradicts the fact that you gave me a collision to begin with. 
So in other words, this condition over here can't actually happen because it contradicts the fact that M and M prime are actually a collision for the big merkel damgard function, capital H. And as a result, this means that we have to find a collision for the depression function so that as we work our way from the end of the message all the way to the beginning, at some point we must find the collision for a little h. Okay, so this basically completes the proof of the theorem, so I can put a little QED block here. So basically what this proves is that if the little compression function h is collision resistant, then the big merkel damgard function, capital H, must also be collision resistant. So again, the reason why people like this construction is it shows that to construct big hash functions, it suffices to construct just compression functions for small inputs. And we're going to do that in the next segment. So our goal for this segment is to build secure compression functions. So compression functions that are collision resistant. So just to remind you where we are, we looked at this merkel damgard construction, which takes a little compression function and makes and builds from it a hash function for much, much larger inputs. And we proved this Q theorem that says that, in fact, if the little compression function H is collision resistant, then plugging it into the merkel damgard construction gives us a collision resistant hash function for larger inputs. So now in this segment, our goal is basically to build a compression function that is collision resistant. So we're going to see a couple of constructions. And so the first question that comes to mind is, well, can we build compression functions from primitives that we already have? In particular, we spent a lot of work to build block ciphers. And the question is, can we build compression functions from block ciphers? And the answer is yes. And let me show you how to do it. So assume we have a certain block cipher. Here it operates on n-bit blocks. So the input is an in n-bit, output is n-bits. And then there's this classic construction called the davies meyer construction, which I wrote down in symbols here, basically says that what you would do is, given the message block and the chaining variable, all we do is we encrypt the chaining variable using the message block as a key, and then we kind of do one more XOR on the output. So this might seem a little bizarre, because remember the message block is something that's completely under the control of the adversary. He's trying to find a collision, so he can choose the message blocks however he wants and yet we're using this message block as a key into a block cipher, but nevertheless we can argue that this construction, at least when E is what's called an ideal cipher, we can argue that this construction, in fact, is as collision resistant as possible. So let me state the theorem. The theorem states that, as I said, if E is an ideal block cipher, meaning that it's a random collection of K random permutations from 0, 1 to the N to 0, 1 to the N, then under that assumption that E is an ideal block cipher, in fact, finding a collision for this uh, compression function H takes time 2 to the n over 2. In particular, we can show that anyone who's finding collisions has to evaluate the encryption decryption functions at least 2 to the n over 2 times. And if you think about what that means, since the output of this compression function is only n bits long, we know that there's always a generic birthday attack that finds collisions in time 2 to the n over 2. So basically, this theorem says that this collision-resistant function is as collision-resistant as possible. We can find the collision in time 2 to the n over 2 using the birthday attack, but there is no algorithm that will do better than 2 to the n over 2. So davies meyer is actually a very common compression function used in collision-resistant hashing. In fact, the SHA functions all use davies meyer It turns out there's something special about the davies meyer construction that makes it collision resistant. If you just try to guess a construction, very likely you'll end up with something that's not collision resistant. And so let me ask you the following puzzle. Suppose we actually define the compression function as follows. Namely, all we do is we encrypt the chaining variable h using the current message block as the key. So the difference is that we dropped this xor h in davies meyer we simply ignored it. So it's not there. And the puzzle for you is, show me that this compression function then is actually not collision resistant. So let's see, so we're trying to build a collision, namely a, a distinct pair of hm and h prime m prime that happen to collide under this little function h. And my question to you is, how would you do it? So I'm already going to tell you that you're going to choose h, m, and m prime arbitrarily. The only requirement is that m and m prime are distinct. And then my question is, how would you construct an h prime that would cause a collision to pop out? So the answer is the first choice, and the easy way to see it is if we apply the encryption function using m prime to both sides, then we get that this is basically e of m prime applied to h prime, right? This is what we get by applying encryption using m prime to the left-hand side. And if we apply encryption using m prime 
to the right-hand side, the decryption operator cancels out, and we simply are left with the encryption of M, H, which is exactly the collision that we wanted to find. So there, you can see that it's basically by using the decryption function D, it's very easy to build collisions for this compression function. Now, I should tell you that, in fact, davies Meyer is not unique. There are other ways to build collision-resistant compression functions from block ciphers. For example, here is a method called miyaguchi pernil miyaguchi pernil actually is used in Whirlpool uh, hash function that we saw earlier. Uh, here's another method that happens to uh, result in a collision-resistant compression function. And there are 12 variants like this, playing with XORs and placing the variables in different slots that will actually give a collision-resistant mechanism. But there are also many, many variants of this, uh, like we saw in the previous puzzle, that are not collision-resistant. So here's another example that's not collision-resistant, and I'm going to leave it as a homework problem to figure out a collision for this construction. So now basically we have all the ingredients to describe the SHA-256 hash function. I'll tell you that it's a merkel damgard construction exactly as the one that we saw before. It uses a davies meyer compression function. And so the only question is what's the underlying block cipher for davies meyer And that block cipher is called SHAKAL2. And I'll just tell you its parameters. It uses a 512-bit key. And remember the key is taken from the message block. So this is really uh, what the message block is and it so happens to be 512 bits, which means that SHA-256 will process its input message 512 bits at a time. And then the block size for this block cipher is 256 bits, and these are the chaining variables. So this would be HI-1, and this would be a successive chaining variable. So now you have a complete understanding of how SHA-256 works, modulo this block cipher sha 2 that I'm not going to describe here. So as I said, one class of compression functions is built from block ciphers. It turns out there's another class of compression functions that's built using hard problems for number theory, and I want to very briefly show you one example. And we call these compression functions provable because if you can find a collision on this compression function, then you're going to be able to solve a very hard number theoretic problem, which is believed to be intractable, and as a result, if the number theory problem is intractable, the resulting compression function is provably a collision resistant. So here's how this compression function works. Basically, we're going to choose a large prime P. So this is a gigantic prime, something like 700 digits, 2,000 bits. And then we're going to choose two random values, U and V, between 1 and P. And now let's define the compression function as follows. It takes two numbers between 0 and P minus 1, and it's going to output one number between 0 and P minus 1. So its compression ratio is 2 to 1. Yeah, it takes two numbers and outputs one number in the range 0 to P minus 1. And it does it basically by computing this double exponentiation. It computes U to the H times V to the N. And the theorem, which right now I'm just going to state as a fact, this fact actually turns out to be fairly straightforward to prove, and we're going to do it later on when we get to the number theoretic part of the course. The fact is that if you can find a collision for this compression function, then you can solve a standard hard problem in number theory called a discrete log problem. Everyone believes discrete log is hard, and as a result, this compression function is provably collision resistant. So you might ask me, why do people not use this compression function in practice? Why would we not use this for SHA-256? And the answer is that this gives very slow performance in comparison to what you get from a block cipher. So this is not really used for any compression functions. However, if for some reason you really only want to, say, MAC or sign just one long message and you have a whole day to do it, then certainly you can use this type of compression function. And even though it's slow, you'll get something that's provably collision resistant. OK, so that's the end of the segment. And now we're finally ready to talk about HMAC, which we're going to do in the next segments. So now that we understand what collision-resistant hash functions are, and we know how to construct them, we're ready to describe a very popular MAC called HMAC. So let me remind you what the merkel damgard construction is. Basically, we have a small compression function H from which we build a large hash function, which is collision-resistant, assuming the compression function is collision-resistant. The question we're going to ask this segment is, can we use the large uh, hash function to construct a MAC directly without having to rely on a PRF? So here's the first thing that comes to mind. Suppose I give you a merkel damgard hash function. So you notice it mapped, it hashes large messages into small digests. And we want to convert that directly into a MAC. So the first thing that comes to mind is, well, why don't we just hash the concatenation of the MAC key along with the message that we're trying to MAC? And it turns out this is completely insecure. And so let me ask you why this is insecure. 
The answer is the standard extension attack. And if you think back to the Merkle Damgard construction, you realize that if I tell you the tag for a particular message, in other words, I tell you the value at this point, it's very easy for the attacker to just add another block and then compute one more application of the compression function h, and now they will be able to get the tag for the original message, concatenated the padding block, concatenated their word w that they added themselves, and as a result, this is an existential forgery. Yeah, so basically this is exactly what we get here, where after concatenating the padding block, the attacker can actually concatenate whatever he wants, and he would get the tag on this combined message. So this is totally insecure, and I cannot tell you how many products have actually made this mistake where they assume that this is a secure Mac. This is completely insecure and should never, ever, ever be used. Instead, there is a standardized method to convert a collision-resistant hash function into a Mac, and that method is called HMAC. So in particular, we could use the SHA-256 hash function to build this Mac. The output is going to be 256 bits, and in fact, HMAC is believed to be a pseudo-random function. So in fact, out of SHA-256, we get a pseudo-random function that outputs 256-bit outputs. So let me show you the construction. Here is the construction in symbols, and it works as follows. First, we take our key K, and we concatenate what's called an internal pad to it, an iPad to it. This makes it into one block of the merkle damgard construction. So for example, this would be 512 bits in the case of SHA-256. We prepend this to the message M, and then we hash. Now this by itself, we just said, is completely insecure. However, what HMAC does in addition, it takes the output, which is 256 bits, it prepends to that the key again, XORed with a, what's called the outer pad, the O pad, this also becomes 512 bits, it's one block. And then it hashes the combination of these two to finally obtain the resulting tag on the message M. So it's more, rather than looking at this in symbols, it's more instructive to look at HMAC in pictures. And so you can see here are the two keys, K, XOR, inner pad, which is then fed into the merkle damgard chain. And then the resulting output of this chain is fed into another merkle damgard chain. And finally, the final output is produced. Okay, so this is how HMAC works in pictures. And now, I want to argue that we've already seen something very similar to this. In particular, if you can think of the compression function H as a PRF, where the key is the first, the top input, then what we're actually doing here is we're evaluating this PRF H at a fixed IV, and therefore the result here is a random value, which we're going to call K1. And then we apply the merkle damgard chain. And we can do the same thing on the outer pad. If you think of little h as a PRF, where the key is the upper input, again, we're applying this PRF using a different key to a fixed value IV. And as a result, we're going to get another random value, k2. So now when we compute HMAC using these keys, k1 and k2, this would actually look very familiar. This is basically NMAC. It's identical to NMAC that we discussed in a previous segment. And notice, to argue that this is an NMAC construction, we have to assume that the compression function, little h, is a PRF where the key is actually the lower input to the function. Now let me say that these pads, the iPad and the OPAD, these are fixed constants that are specified in the HMAC standard. So these are literally just 512-bit constants that never change. And so when we go back to look at the complete HMAC construction, you realize that the main difference between this and NMAC is that these keys here, since they're dependent, you notice they're both just the same key XORed with different constants. Essentially, the keys K1 and K2 are also somewhat dependent because they're computed by applying a PRF to the same fixed value, namely IV, but with dependent keys. And so to argue that K1 and K2 are pseudo-random and independent of one another, one has to argue that the compression function not only is a PRF where when the input, the top input, is the key input, but it's also a PRF when dependent keys are used. But under those assumptions, basically, the exact same analysis at NMAC would apply to HMAC, and we would get a security argument that HMAC is a secure MAC. And so as I said, HMAC can be proven secure under these PRF assumptions about the compression function H. The security bounds are just as they are for NMAC. In other words, you should not have to change the key as long as the number of messages you're macking is smaller than the size of the output tag to the one half. 
But for HMAX SHA-256, the output space is 2 to the 256. Square root of that would put us at 2 to the 128, which means that basically you can use HMAX SHA-256 for as many outputs as you want, and you'll always maintain security. And as a last point about HMAC, I'll tell you that TLS standard actually requires that one support HMAC SHA-196, which means HMAC built from the SHA-1 function and truncated to 96 bits. SHA-1, remember, outputs 160 bits, and we truncated to the most significant 96 bits. Now you might be wondering, remember we said before that SHA-1 is no longer considered a secure hash function, so how come we're using SHA-1 and HMAC? Well, it turns out it's actually fine because HMAC, the analysis of HMAC, doesn't need SHA-1 to be collision resistant. All it needs is that the compression function of SHA-1 be a PRF when either input is allowed to be the key. And as far as we know, that's still correct for the underlying compression function for SHA-1. Even though it might not be collision resistant, as far as we know, it's still fine to use it inside of HMAC. So this is the end of our discussion of HMAC, and in the next segment we're going to look at timing attacks on HMAC. In the last segment in this module, I want to show you a general attack that affects many implementations of Mac algorithms, and there's a nice lesson to be learned from an attack like this. So let's look at a particular implementation of HMAC verification. This happens to be an implementation from the Keysar library that happens to be written in Python. So here's the code that's used to verify a tag generated by HMAC. This code is actually simplified. I just wanted to kind of simplify it as much as I can to get the point across. So basically what the inputs are, the key, the message, and the tag bytes, the way we verify it is we recompute the HMAC on the message, and then we compare, say, the resulting 16 bytes to the actual given signature bytes. So this looks perfectly fine. In fact, anyone might implement it like this, and in fact, many people have implemented it like this. The problem is that if you look at how the comparison is done, the comparison, as you might expect, is done byte by byte. There's a loop inside of the Python interpreter that loops over all 16 bytes, and it so happens that the first time it finds an inequality, the loop terminates and says the strings are not equal. And the fact that the comparator exits when the first inequality is found introduces a significant timing attack on this library. So let me show you how one might attack it. So imagine you're the attacker, and you have a message M for which you want to obtain a valid tag. Now your goal is to attack a server that has an HMAC secret key stored in it, and the server exposes an interface that basically takes message MAC pairs, checks that the MAC is valid. If the MAC is valid, it does something with the message. And if the MAC is not valid, it says reject. OK, it sends back to the originator the message reject. So now this attacker has an opportunity to basically submit lots of message tag pairs and see if it can deduce the tag for the particular message for which it wants a tag. And here's how we might use the broken implementation from the previous slide to do just that. So what the attacker is going to do is submit many message tag queries where the message is always the same, but with the tag, he's going to experiment with lots and lots and lots of different tags. So in the first query, what he's going to do is just submit a random tag along with the target message. And he's going to measure how long the server took to respond. The next query that he's going to submit is he's going to try all possible first bytes for the tag. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the remaining bytes of the tag that he submits are just arbitrary. It doesn't really matter what they are. But for the first byte, what he'll do is he'll submit a tag starting with a byte 0. And then he's going to see whether the server took a little bit longer to verify the tag than before. If the server took exactly the same amount of time to verify the tag as in step 1, then he's going to try again, this time with byte set to 1. If still the server responded very quickly, he's going to try with a byte set to 2. If the server responded quickly, he's going to try with a byte set to 3, and so on, until finally, let's say, when the byte is set to 3, the server takes a little bit longer to respond. What that means is actually when it did the comparison between the correct MAC and the MAC submitted by the attacker, the two matched on this byte, and the rejection happened on the second byte. Aha, so now the attacker knows that the first byte of the tag is set to 3, and now it can mount exactly the same attack on the second byte. So here, it's going to submit a tag where the second byte, here, let me use a different color. So it's going to submit a tag where the second byte is set to 0, and it's going to measure whether this took a little bit longer than in step 2. If not, he's going to change this to be set to 1, and he's going to measure if the server's response time is a little longer than before. Eventually, let's say when he sets this, 
to, I don't know, when the byte is set to, uh, to 53, say, all of a sudden the server takes a little bit longer to respond, which means that now the comparator matched on the first two bytes, and now the attacker learned that the first two bytes of the Mac are 3 and 53, and now he can move on and do the exact same thing on the third byte, and then on the fourth byte, and so on and so forth, until finally the server says, yes, I accept you actually gave me the right Mac, and then it will go ahead and act on this bogus message that the attacker supplied. So this is a beautiful example of how a timing attack can reveal the value of a Mac, the correct value of the Mac, kind of byte by byte, until eventually the attacker obtains all the correct bytes of the tag, and then he's able to fool the server into accepting this message tag pair. The reason I like this example is, is this is a perfectly reasonable way of implementing a Mac verification routine, and yet if you write it this way, it'll be completely broken. So what do we do? So let me show you two defenses. The first defense, I'll write it in again in Python, is, uh, is as follows. And in fact, the keys are library exactly implemented this defense. This code is actually taken out of the updated version of the library. The first thing we do is we test if the signature bytes submitted by the attacker are of the correct length. Say for HMAC, this would be, say, you know, 96 bits or 128 bits. And if not, we reject that as an invalid MAC. But now if the signature bytes really do have the correct length, what we do is we implement our own comparator that always takes the same amount of time to compare the two strings. So in particular, this uses the zip function in Python, which will essentially, if you are giving it two 16-byte strings, it will create 16 pairs of bytes. So it will just create a, a list of 16 elements where each element is a pair of bytes, one taken from the left and one taken from the right. And then you loop, you know, you loop through this list of pairs. You compute the XOR of the first pair and you OR that into the result. Then you compute the XOR of the second pair and you OR that into the result. And you notice that if at any point in this loop two bytes happen to be not equal, then the XOR will evaluate to something that's non-zero. And therefore, when we OR it into the result, the result will also become non-zero and then we'll return false at the end of the comparison. So the point here is that now the comparator always takes the same amount of time. Even if it finds difference in byte number three, it will continue running down the, both strings until the very end, and only then will it return the result. So now the timing attack supposedly is impossible. However, this can be quite problematic because compilers try to be too helpful here. So an optimizing compiler might look at this code and say, hey, wait a minute, I can actually improve this code by making the for loop end as soon as an incompatible set of bytes is discovered. And so now optimizing compiler it could be your kind of uh, Achilles heel when it comes to making programs always take the same amount of time. And so a different defense, which is not as widely implemented, is to try and hide from the adversary what strings are actually being compared. So let me show you what I mean by that. So again, here we have our verification algorithm. So it takes as inputs a key, a message, and a candidate Mac from the adversary. And then the way we do the comparison is we first of all compute the correct MAC on the message, but then instead of directly comparing the MAC and the signature bytes from the adversary, what we're going to do is we're going to hash one more time. So we compute a hash here of the MAC, we compute a hash of the signature bytes. Of course, if these two happen to be the same, then the resulting HMACs will also be the same, so the comparison will actually succeed. But the point is now, if SIG bytes happen to equal MAC, on the first byte, but not on the remaining bytes, then when we do this additional hash layer, it's likely that the two resulting values are completely different, and as a result, the byte by byte comparator will just output on the first iteration. The point here is that the adversary doesn't actually know what strings are being compared, and as a result, he can't mount a timing attack that we discussed earlier. Okay, so this is another defense, at least now you're not at the mercy of an optimizing compiler. The main lesson from all of this is that you realize that people who even are experts at implementing crypto libraries get this stuff wrong. And they write code that works perfectly fine, and yet is completely vulnerable to a timing attack that completely undo all security of the system. So the lesson here is, of course, you should not be inventing your own crypto, but you shouldn't even be implementing your own crypto because most likely it'll be vulnerable to these side channel attacks. Just use the standard libraries like OpenSSL. Keysar is actually a fine library to use that would reduce the chances that you're vulnerable to these types of attacks. Now that we're done with message integrity, we're going to go back and talk about encryption, and we're going to show how to construct encryption schemes that provide much stronger security guarantees than what we had before. But first, let's do a recap of where we are. 
So in previous segments, we talked about confidentiality, in particular, how to encrypt messages such that we achieve semantic security against what's called a chosen plaintext attack. Now, I kept mentioning again and again that security against chosen plaintext attacks only provides security against eavesdropping. In other words, this only provides security against adversaries that listen to network traffic, but don't actually change any packets or don't inject their own packets and so on. In this module, our goal is actually to design encryption schemes that are secure against adversaries that can tamper with traffic by blocking certain packets and injecting other packets and so on. And then we also looked at how to provide message integrity where the message itself is not confidential. We just want to make sure that the message is not modified while it's en route. And so we talked about message authentication codes, MAC algorithms, that provide existential unforgeability against the chosen message attack. In other words, even though the attacker is able to obtain the max on arbitrary messages of his choice, he can't build max for any other messages. And we looked at a number of MAC constructions, in particular a CBC MAC, HMAC, a parallel MAC construction, and a fast MAC construction called a Carter Wagman MAC. In this module, we're going to show how to combine these confidentiality and integrity mechanisms to obtain encryption schemes that are secure against a much, much stronger adversary, namely an adversary that can tamper with traffic uh, while it's in the network, inject its own packets, block certain packets, and so on. And our goal is basically to ensure that even against such powerful adversaries, we maintain confidentiality. In other words, the adversary can't learn what the plain text is, and the adversary can't even modify the ciphertext and cause the recipient to think that a different plain text was actually sent. So before we do that, I want to give you a few examples of adversaries that can tamper with traffic and as a result completely break security of CPA secure encryption. This will show you that actually without providing integrity, confidentiality can also be destroyed. In other words, the two must go together, integrity and confidentiality, if we're going to achieve security against active adversaries. So let's look at an example from the world of networking. In particular, let's look at TCP IP. I'm going to use a highly simplified version of TCP IP just so we can quickly focus on the attack and not get bogged down by the details. So here we have two machines communicating with one another. A user sits at one machine and the other machine is a server. Now the server of course has a TCP IP stack that's receiving packets and then based on the destination field in those packets, it forwards the packets to the appropriate place. So here we have, for example, two processes listening to these packets, a web server, say, over here, and another user, we'll call him Bob, over here. The web server listens on port 80, and here this user Bob listens on port 25. Now when a packet comes in, the TCP IP stack looks at the destination port, in this case it would be destination 80, and as a result, uh, the stack forwards the packets over to the web server. If the destination port said port 25, the TCP IP stack would forward the packet over to Bob, who's listening on port 25. Now a fairly well-known security protocol called IPsec encrypts these IP packets between the sender and the recipient. So here the sender and the recipients basically have a shared key, and when the sender sends IP packets, those IP packets are encrypted using the secret key K. Now, when a packet arrives at the destination, namely it arrives at the server, the TCP IP stack will go ahead and decrypt the packet, and then look at the destination port and send it to the appropriate place, decrypted. You notice the data here is decrypted, so in this case it would send it to the web server because the destination port is port 80. If the destination port happens to be port 25, the TCP IP stack will decrypt the packet, look at the destination port, and send the data in the clear to the process who's listening on port 25. So now I want to show you that without integrity, in this setup, we can't possibly achieve any form of confidentiality. And let's see why. So imagine the attacker intercepts a certain packet that's intended for the web server. In other words, it's an encrypted packet intended for port 80. Remember that the attacker can actually receive the decryption of any packets that's intended for port 25 because the TCP stack will happily decrypt packets for port 25 and send them over to Bob who's listening over here. So what Bob is going to do, Bob here is the attacker, what he's going to do is he's going to intercept this packet en route, prevent the packet from reaching the server as is, and instead he's going to modify the packet so now the destination port is going to read like port 25. This is done on the ciphertext, and we're going to see how to do that in just a minute. 
when this packet now arrives at the server, the destination port says 25, the server will decrypt the packet, see that the destination is 25, and forward the data over to Bob. So now Bob was simply by changing the destination port, Bob was able to read data that was not intended for himself, but rather was intended for the web server. So if the data is encrypted using CBC encryption with a random IV, remember this is a CPA secure scheme, Nevertheless, if that's the case, I'm going to show you that it's trivial for the attacker to change the, the ciphertext so that now uh, he can obtain new ciphertext where the destination port is 25 instead of 80. The only thing that's going to change is just the IV field. In fact, everything else is going to remain the same. So let's see how to do it. So here, just remind yourself that in fact, what the attacker captured is a CBC encrypted packet where he knows the destination port is port 80, but he doesn't know what the data is. The attacker has no clue what the data is, but he does know this packet is intended for the web server. His goal is to build a new encrypted packet where now the destination port is port 25. So the way he's going to do it, as we said, is just by changing the IV. And let me remind you that the way you decrypt CBC encrypted data is essentially the first plaintext block is simply decryption of the first ciphertext block XORed with IV. And we know that in the original packet, this is going to read dest equals 80. Because in the original packet, the destination port is port 80. So now my question to you is, how would the attacker change the IV so now the destination port will read dest equals 25? So it's pretty easy to see that if the attacker simply takes the original IV, XORs it with here, there are a bunch of zeros over here, and a bunch of zeros over here. He XORs it with the zeros and then 80, XORs with zeros and then 25 in the appropriate place, namely in the port bytes in the encrypted packets, then it's easy to see that when this new IV prime is sent along with the original ciphertext, when the attacker decrypts, you can see that the original ciphertext would decrypt to port 80, but now the new IV will cancel out this 80. This 80 here cancels out the 80 that would be obtained in the original plaintext, and then by XORing with 25, essentially the destination now becomes 25. So this is a nice example where with a simple change to the IV field, the attacker was able to divert the packet so that now after decryption, the packet goes to the attacker instead of the actual web server. And as a result now, the attacker can read the plain text data that was intended for the server. So this nice example shows that without integrity, it's simply impossible for a CPA secure encryption to provide confidentiality when the attacker can modify packets and routes. CPA secure encryption only provides confidentiality if the attacker is only eavesdropping on data but can't actually modify ciphertext and routes. Whereas you see, if you can modify ciphertext, a simple modification completely reveals the plaintext. I want to show you another tampering attack that only requires network access to traffic. It doesn't actually require the attacker to be present on the decryption machine. So let's look at an example where there's a remote terminal application where every time the user hits a keystroke, basically an encrypted keystroke is sent over to the server. And let's pretend that the encrypted keystroke is encrypted using counter mode. So here you have the TCP IP packet. D here corresponds to the one byte uh, keystroke. And as we said, it's encrypted using counter mode. And as you probably know, every TCP packet actually contains a checksum. This is a 16-bit checksum that's just used to detect transmission errors. So the server, if it receives a packet that has the wrong checksum, it simply drops it on the floor and ignores it. Now the TCP header, including the checksum and the keystroke, all are encrypted using counter mode. Now the attacker wants to learn what the keystroke was, and let me show you what he can do. The attacker is gonna intercept this packet, and he's not actually gonna modify it. He's gonna send it over to the server, but he's gonna record the packet. Later on, he's going to modify the packet and send a modified packet over to the server. What he's going to do is he's going to XOR the encrypted checksum field with a value T, and he's going to XOR the encrypted data field with a value S. And he's going to do this for lots and lots of T's and S's. Now remember, a property of counter mode is that if you XOR the ciphertext with T, after decryption, the resulting plaintext is also XORed with T. Similarly, if you XOR the encrypted data with S after decryption, the resulting decrypted data will also be encrypted with S. Now, the server is going to decrypt this modified packet, and the resulting packet is going to have the checksum XORed with T and the data XORed with S. 
Now what happens? If the modified checksum is correct for this modified packet, the server will send an ACK back. If the modified checksum is incorrect for this modified packet, the server will just drop the packet on the floor and do nothing. So the attacker can simply observe, look for an ACK packet or not, and in doing so, he learns whether this particular XOR of T and XOR of S pairs corresponds to a valid checksum or not. Now the attacker is going to do this for lots and lots of T's and S's, and you notice what he learns is if I modify the data by XORing it with this particular value S, that changes the checksum by a particular value T. And he learns this for lots of T and S pairs. So it turns out for certain checksums, by looking at a sequence of equations of this type, you can actually figure out what the value D is. I should point out that for the TCP checksum, this actually uh, might not be true, but certainly there are easy checksums for which this is actually absolutely true. So again, by looking at a lot of equations of this type, the attacker can recover D. And this is a really nice example of what's called a chosen ciphertext attack. The attacker basically submitted ciphertext of his choice that was derived from the ciphertext that he wanted to decrypt. And then by looking at how the server responded, he was able to learn something about the resulting plaintext. And by repeating this for many different values of TNS, he was actually eventually able to recover what the actual full plaintext is. So in this segment, we're going to look at many more examples of attacks of this type. These are called active attacks, where the attacker is actually modifying traffic in route. And I hope that these two simple examples convinces you that all you provide is CPA security, in other words, security against eavesdropping. You can't even guarantee secrecy against an active attacker. Not only does your ciphertext not have integrity, in other words, the recipient might obtain a message different from the one sent by the sender, but you don't even have confidentiality. And we, I showed you two examples where without integrity, the attacker can simply decrypt the packet by using the recipient as an oracle for decrypting certain parts of the data. And so the lesson that I'm going to repeat again and again and again throughout this module is that if your message needs integrity but no confidentiality, just use a Mac. But if your message needs integrity and confidentiality, you have to use what's called an authenticated encryption mode, which is precisely the topic of this module. So the next thing we're going to do is define what authenticated encryption means, and we're going to build authenticated encryption systems. But the point I want you to remember is that the CPA security modes we discussed before should never actually be used to encrypt data by themselves. So CBC with a random IV is a building block towards authenticated encryption, but should never be used on its own. Okay, so we're going to define authenticated encryption in the next segment. In the last segment, we saw two active attacks that can completely destroy the security of CPA secure encryption. In this segment, we're going to define a new concept called authenticated encryption that remains secure in the presence of an active adversary. In later segments, we'll construct encryption schemes that satisfy this new authenticated encryption concept. So what is authenticated encryption? Authenticated encryption is a cipher where, as usual, the encryption algorithm takes a key, a message, and obsolently a nonce, and outputs a ciphertext. The decryption algorithm, as usual, outputs a message. However, here the decryption algorithm is allowed to output a special symbol called bottom. When the decryption algorithm outputs the symbol bottom, basically it says that the ciphertext is invalid and should be ignored. The only requirement is that this bottom is not in the message space so that in fact it is a unique symbol that indicates that the ciphertext should be rejected. Now what does it mean for an authenticated encryption system to be secure? Well, the system has to satisfy two properties. The first property is that it has to be semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack just as before. But now there's a second property which says that the system also has to satisfy what's called ciphertext integrity. What that means is that even though the attacker gets to see a number of ciphertexts, it should not be able to produce another ciphertext that decrypts properly. In other words, that decrypts to something other than bottom. More precisely, let's look at the ciphertext integrity game. So here, ED is a cipher with message space M. As usual, the challenger begins by choosing a random key K. And now the adversary can submit messages of his choice and receive the encryptions of those messages. So here, C1 is the encryption of M1, where M1 was chosen by the adversary. And the adversary can do this repeatedly. In other words, he submits M2 and obtains the encryption of M2 and so on and so forth. He submits many more messages up until NQ and obtains the encryptions of all those messages. So here the adversary obtained Q ciphertexts for messages of his choice, and then his goal is to produce some new ciphertext that's valid. So we'll say that the adversary wins the game 
is basically this new ciphertext that the adversary created decrypts correctly. In other words, decrypts to something other than bottom. And it's a new ciphertext. In other words, it's not one of the ciphertexts that was given to the adversary as part of his chosen plaintext attack. And then, as usual, we define the adversary's advantage in the ciphertext integrity game as the probability that the challenger outputs one at the end of the game. And we'll say that the cipher has ciphertext integrity if, in fact, for all efficient adversaries, their advantage in winning this game is negligible. So now that we understand what ciphertext integrity is, we can define authenticated encryption. And basically, we say that the cipher has authenticated encryption if, as we said, it's semantically secure under a chosen plaintext attack and it also has ciphertext integrity. So just as a bad example, uh, let me mention that CBC with a random IV does not provide authenticated encryption because it's very easy for the adversary to win the ciphertext integrity game. The adversary simply submits a random ciphertext. And since the decryption algorithm for CBC encryption never outputs bottom, it always outputs some message, the adversary just easily wins the game. Any old random ciphertext will decrypt to something other than bottom, and therefore the adversary directly wins the ciphertext integrity game. So this is just a trivial example of a CPA secure cipher that does not provide authenticated encryption. So I want to mention two implications of authenticated encryption. The first I'll call authenticity, which means that basically an attacker cannot fool the recipient Bob into thinking that Alice sent a certain message that she didn't actually send. So let's see what I mean by that. Well, here the attacker basically gets to interact with Alice and get her to encrypt arbitrary messages of his choice. So this is a chosen plaintext attack. And then the attacker's goal is to produce some ciphertext that was not actually created by Alice. And because the attacker can't win the ciphertext integrity game, he can't do this. And what this means is, when Bob receives a ciphertext that decrypts correctly under the decryption algorithm, he knows that the message must have come from someone who knows the secret key K. In particular, if Alice is the only one who knows K, then he knows the ciphertext really did come from Alice, and it's not some modification that was sent by the attacker. Now, the only caveat to that is that authenticated encryption doesn't defend against replay attacks. In particular, the attacker could have intercepted some ciphertext from Alice to Bob and could have replayed it, and both ciphertexts would look valid to Bob. So for example, Alice might send a message to Bob saying, transfer $100 to Charlie. Then Charlie could replay that ciphertext, and as a result, Bob would transfer another $100 to Charlie. So in fact, any encryption protocol has to defend against replay attacks, and this is not something that's directly prevented by authenticated encryption. And we'll come back and talk about replay attacks in two segments. The second implication of authenticated encryption is that it defends against a very powerful type of adversary, namely an adversary that can mount what's called a chosen ciphertext attack. And we're going to talk about that actually in the next segment. In the last segment, we defined authenticated encryption, but I didn't really show you why authenticated encryption is the right notion of security. In this segment, I want to show you that authenticated encryption, in fact, is a very natural notion of security. And I'll do it by showing you that it defends against a very powerful attack called a chosen ciphertext attack. So in fact, we already saw a number of examples of a chosen ciphertext attack. So imagine the adversary has some ciphertext C that it wants to decrypt. And what it can do is, for example, fool the decryption server into decrypting some ciphertext, but not actually the ciphertext C. So we already saw some examples of that. If you remember in the first segment, we looked at an adversary that can submit arbitrary ciphertext. And if the plaintext happened to start with destination equals 25, then the adversary is actually given the plaintext in the clear. So that's an example of an adversary that can obtain the decryption of certain ciphertexts, but not all ciphertexts. Another example we saw is an adversary that can learn something about the plaintext by submitting ciphertexts to the decryptor. So we had this example where the adversary submits encrypted TCP IP packets to the decryption server. And if the decryption server sends back an ACK, the adversary learns that the decrypted plaintext had a valid checksum. And otherwise, the decrypted plaintext didn't have a valid checksum. So this is, again, an example of a chosen ciphertext attack where the attacker submits ciphertext and learns something about the decryption of that ciphertext. So to address this type of threat, we're going to define a very general notion of security called chosen ciphertext security. So here, we're going to give the adversary a lot of power. Okay, So he can do both chosen plaintext attack and a chosen ciphertext attack. In other words, he can obtain the encryption of arbitrary messages of his choice. And he can decrypt any ciphertext of his choice 
other than some channel and ciphertext. And as I showed you before, this is actually a fairly conservative modeling of real life. In real life, often the attacker can fool the, the decryptor into decrypting certain ciphertexts for the attacker, but not all ciphertexts. So the model here is that the attacker has a certain ciphertext that it wants to decrypt. It can interact with the decryptor by issuing these chosen ciphertext queries to the decryptor, namely to decrypt various ciphertexts other than the challenge ciphertext. And then the adversary's goal is to break semantic security of the challenge ciphertext. So you notice that we're giving the adversary a lot of power, and all we're asking him to do is break semantic security. So it's going to be fairly difficult to design systems that are secure against such adversaries, and nevertheless, we're going to do it. So let's define the chosen ciphertext security model more precisely. So as usual, we have a cipher ED, and we're going to define two experiments, experiment 0 and experiment 1. So this should look somewhat familiar by now. The challenger is going to start off by choosing a random key, and now the adversary is going to submit queries to this challenger. Every query can be one of two types. It can be a chosen plaintext query, or it can be a chosen ciphertext query. So chosen plaintext queries, we already know, basically the adversary submits two messages, M0 and M1. They have to be the same length, and the adversary receives the encryption of either M0 if we're in experiment 0, or M1 if we're in experiment 1. So he receives the encryption of the left or the right, depending on whether we're in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. The second type of query is the more interesting one. This is where the adversary submits an arbitrary ciphertext of his choice, and what he gets back is the decryption of that ciphertext. So you notice the adversary is allowed to decrypt arbitrary ciphertext of his choice. The only restriction is that the ciphertext is not one of the ciphertexts that were obtained as a result of a CPA query. And of course, this wouldn't be fair otherwise, because the attacker can simply take one ciphertext that was obtained from a CPA query, that's going to be either the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. If he could submit a CCA query for that particular ciphertext, he will, in response, either obtain M0 or M1, and then he'll know whether he's in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. So this wouldn't be fair, so we say that the CPA ciphertexts that he received are the challenged ciphertexts, and he's allowed to decrypt any ciphertext of his choice other than these challenge ciphertexts. And as usual, his goal is to determine whether he's in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. So I'm going to emphasize again that this is an extremely powerful adversary, one that can decrypt any ciphertext of his choice other than the challenge ciphertext, and still he can't distinguish whether he's in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. So as usual, we say that the cipher is CCA secure, chosen ciphertext secure, if the adversary behaves the same in experiment 0 as it does in experiment 1, namely cannot distinguish the two experiments. So let's start with a simple example and show that in fact CBC with a random IV is not CCA secure, is not secure against chosen ciphertext attacks. So let's see why that's the case. So what the adversary is going to start by doing, he's going to simply submit two distinct messages, M0 and M1, and let's just pretend that these messages are one block messages. And what he's going to get back is the CBC encryption of either M0 or M1. You notice the ciphertext only has one block because the plaintext were only one block long. Now, what is the attacker going to do? Well, he's going to modify the ciphertext C that he was given into C prime simply by changing the IV. Okay, so he just takes the IV and XORs it with one. That's it. This gives a new ciphertext, C prime, which is different from C. And as a result, it's perfectly valid for the adversary to submit C prime as a chosen ciphertext query. So he asks the challenger, please decrypt this C prime for me. The challenger, because C prime is not equal to C, must decrypt C prime. And now let's see, what happens when he decrypts C prime? Well, what's the decryption of C prime? Let me ask you. So you probably remember from the first segment that if we XOR the IV by 1, that simply XORs the plaintext by 1. So now the adversary received M0 XOR1 or M1 XOR1, and now he can perfectly tell whether he's in experiment 0 or in experiment 1. So the advantage of this adversary is basically 1, because he can very easily tell which experiment he's in, and as a result he can win the chosen ciphertext security game. So if you think about it for a second, you'll see that this attack game exactly captured the first active attack that we saw, where the adversary slightly changed 
the cipher text that he was given, and then he got the decryptor to decrypt it for him, and therefore he was able to eavesdrop on messages that were not intended for the adversary. So I want to emphasize again that this chosen ciphertext game really does come up in real life, where the adversary can submit ciphertext to the decryptor, and the decryptor can reveal information about the plaintext, or can give the plaintext outright to the adversary for certain ciphertext, but not others. So this is a very natural notion of security, and the question is, how do we design crypto systems that are CCA secure? So I claim that this authenticated encryption notion that we defined before actually implies chosen ciphertext security, and this is why authenticated encryption is such a natural concept. Okay, so the theorem basically says, well, if you give me a cipher that provides authenticated encryption, the cipher can withstand chosen ciphertext attacks. And more precisely, the theorem says the following, if we have an adversary that issues Q queries, in other words, at most Q CPA queries and Q chosen ciphertext queries, then there are two efficient adversaries, B1 and B2, that satisfy this inequality here. So since the scheme has authenticated encryption, we know that this quantity is negligible because it's CPA secure, and we know that this quantity is negligible because the encryption scheme has ciphertext integrity. And as a result, since both terms are negligible, we know that adversary's advantage in winning the CCA game is also negligible. So let's prove this theorem. It's actually a very simple theorem to prove. And so let's just do it as proof by pictures. Okay, so here we have two copies of the CCA game. So this would be experiment zero, and the bottom one is experiment one. You can see the adversary is issuing CPA queries, and he's issuing CCA queries, and at the end he outputs you know, a certain guess B, let's call it B prime, and our goal is to show that this B prime is indistinguishable in both cases. In other words, the probability that B prime is equal to one in the top game is the same as the probability that B prime is equal to one in the bottom game. Okay, so the way we're gonna do it is the following. Well, first of all, we're gonna change the challenger a little bit so that instead of actually outputting the decryption of CCA queries, the challenger is just gonna always output bottom. So every time the adversary submits a CCA query, the challenger says bottom. And I claim that these two games are in fact indistinguishable. In other words, the adversary can't distinguish these two games for the simple reason that because the scheme has ciphertext integrity, the adversary simply cannot create a ciphertext that's not in C1 to CI minus one that decrypts to anything other than bottom. That is the definition of ciphertext integrity. And as a result, again, because of ciphertext integrity, it must be the case that every chosen ciphertext query that the adversary issues results in bottom. If the adversary, in fact, could distinguish between the left game and the right game, that would mean that at some point he issued a query that decrypted to something other than bottom, and that we could use to then break ciphertext integrity of the scheme. And since the scheme has ciphertext integrity, these left and right games are indistinguishable. Okay, so that's kind of a cute argument that shows that it's very easy to respond to chosen ciphertext queries when you have ciphertext integrity. And the same thing exactly applies on the bottom, where we can simply replace the chosen ciphertext responses by just always saying bottom. Okay, very good. But now, since the chosen ciphertext queries always respond in the same way, they're not giving the adversary any information. The adversary always knows that we're always going to just respond with bottom. So we might as well just remove these queries, because they don't contribute any information to the adversary. But now, once we remove these queries, the resulting game should look fairly familiar. The top right game and the top bottom game are basically the two games that come up in the definition of CPA security. And as a result, because the scheme is CPA secure, we know that the adversary can't distinguish the top from the bottom. And so now, by this chain of reasoning, we've proven that all these games are equivalent, and in particular, the original two games that we started with are also equivalent, and therefore, the adversary can't distinguish the top left from the bottom left, and therefore, the scheme is CCA secure. So this gives you the intuition as to why authenticated encryption is such a cool concept, because primarily, it implies security against chosen ciphertext attacks. Okay, so as we said, authenticated encryption ensures confidentiality, even if the adversary can decrypt a subset of the ciphertext, and more generally, even if he can mount a general chosen ciphertext attack, he still is not going to be able to break semantic security of the system. However, it is important to remember the two limitations. First of all, it does not prevent replay attacks on its own. We're going to have to do something in addition to defend against replay attacks. 
We're going to see several examples where if the decryption engine reveals more information about why a ciphertext is rejected, it doesn't just output bottom, but it actually outputs more information, say, by timing attacks, and that explains why the ciphertext is rejected, then, in fact, that can completely destroy security of the authenticated encryption system. So we'll see some cute attacks like this in a later segment. Okay, so in the next segment, we're going to turn to constructing authenticated encryption systems. In this segment, we're going to construct authenticated encryption systems. Since we already have CPA secure encryption and we have secure Max, the natural question is whether we can combine the two somehow in order to get authenticated encryption. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this segment. Authenticated encryption was introduced in the year 2000 in two independent papers that I point to at the end of this module. But before then, many crypto libraries provided an API that separately supported CPA secure encryption and macking. So there was one function for implementing CPA secure encryption, for example, CBC with a random IV, and another function for implementing a Mac. And then every developer that wanted to implement encryption had to himself call separately the CPA secure encryption scheme and the Mac scheme. In particular, every developer had to invent his own way of combining encryption and macking to provide some sort of authenticated encryption. But since the goals of combining encryption and macking wasn't well understood, since authenticated encryption hasn't yet been defined, it wasn't really clear which combinations of encryption and macking are correct and which aren't. And so every project, as I said, had to invent its own combination, and in fact, not all combinations were correct. And I can tell you that the most common mistake in software projects were basically incorrectly combining the encryption and integrity mechanisms. So hopefully by the end of this module, you will know how to combine them correctly and you won't be making these mistakes yourself. So let's look at some combinations of CPA secure encryption and Mac that were introduced by different projects. So here are three examples. So first of all, in all three examples, there's a separate key for encryption and a separate key for Mackie. These two keys are independent of one another and both are generated at session setup time. And we're gonna see how to generate these two keys later on in the course. So the first example is the SSL protocol. So the way SSL combines encryption and Mac in the hope of achieving authenticated encryption is the following. Basically, you take the plain text M and then you compute a Mac on the plain text M. So you use your Mac key, KI, to compute tag for this message M. And then you concatenate the tag to the message and then you encrypt the concatenation of the message and the tag. And what comes out is the actual final ciphertext. So that's option number one. The second option is what IPsec does. So here you take the message. The first thing you do is you encrypt the message. And then you compute a tag on the resulting ciphertext. So you notice the tag itself is computed on the resulting ciphertext. The third option is what the SSH protocol does. So here the SSH takes the message and encrypts it using a CPA secure encryption scheme. And then to it, it concatenates a tag of the message. The difference between IPsec and SSH is that in IPsec, the tag is computed over the ciphertext, whereas in SSH, the tag is computed over the message. And so these are three completely different ways of combining encryption and Mac. And the question is, which one of these is secure? So I will let you think about this for a second. And then when we continue, we'll do the analysis together. OK, so let's start with the SSH method. So in the SSH method, you notice that the tag is computed on the message and then concatenated in the clear to the ciphertext. Now, this is actually quite a problem because Macs themselves are not designed to provide confidentiality. Macs are only designed for integrity. And in fact, there's nothing wrong with a Mac that, as part of the tag, outputs a few bits of the plaintext, outputs a few bits of the message M. That would be a perfectly fine tag. And yet, if we did that, that would completely break CPA security here because some bits of the message are leaked in the ciphertext. And so the SSH approach, even though the specifics of SSH are fine and the protocol itself is not compromised by the specific combination, generally it's advisable not to use this approach simply because the output of the MAC signing algorithm might leak bits of the message. So now let's look at SSL and IPsec. As it turns out, the recommended method actually is the IPsec method because it turns out no matter what CPA secure system and MAC key you use, the combination is always going to provide authenticated encryption. Now let me very, very briefly explain why. Basically what happens is once we encrypt the message, well, the message contents now is hidden inside the ciphertext. 
And now when we compute a tag of the ciphertext, basically we're locking this tag, locks the ciphertext, and makes sure no one can produce a different ciphertext that would look valid. And as a result, this approach ensures that any modifications to the ciphertext will be detected by the decryptor simply because the Mac isn't going to verify. As it turns out, for the SSL approach, there actually are kind of pathological examples where you combine a CPA secure encryption system with a secure Mac, and the result is vulnerable to a chosen ciphertext attack so that it does not actually provide authenticated encryption. And basically, the reason that could happen is that there's some sort of uh, bad interaction between the encryption scheme and the MAC algorithm, such that, in fact, there will be a chosen ciphertext attack. So if you're designing a new project, the recommendation now is to always use encrypt that MAC, because that is secure no matter which CPA secure encryption and secure MAC algorithm you're combining. Now, just to set the terminology, the SSL method is sometimes called MAC then encrypt. And the IPsec method is called encrypt then MAC. The SSH method, even though you're not supposed to use it, is called encrypt and MAC. Okay, so I'll often refer to encrypt then MAC and MAC then encrypt to differentiate SSL and IPsec. Okay, so just to repeat what I've just said, the IPsec method encrypt and MAC always provides authenticated encryption. If you start from a CPA secure cipher and a secure MAC, you will always get authenticated encryption. As I said, MAC then encrypt, in fact, there are pathological cases where the result is vulnerable to CCA attacks and therefore does not provide authenticated encryption. However, the story is a little bit more interesting than that in that it turns out if you're actually using randomized counter mode or randomized CBC, then it turns out for those particular CPA secure encryption schemes, MAC then encrypt actually does provide authenticated encryption and therefore it is secure. In fact, there's even a more interesting twist here in that if you're using randomized counter mode, then it's enough that your MAC algorithm just be one time secure. It doesn't have to be a fully secure MAC, it just has to be secure when a key is used to encrypt a single message. Okay, and when we talked about message integrity, we saw that there are actually much faster MACs that are one time secure than MACs that are fully secure. As a result, if you're using randomized counter mode, MAC then encrypt could actually result in a more efficient encryption mechanism. However, I'm going to repeat this again. The recommendation is to use encrypt then MAC, and we're going to see a number of attacks on systems that didn't use encrypt then MAC. And so just make sure things are secure without you having to think too hard about this. Again, I'm going to recommend that you always use encrypt then MAC. Now, once the concept of authenticated encryption became more popular, a number of standardized approaches for combining encryption and MAC turned up, and those were even standardized by the National Institute of Standards. So I'm just going to mention three of these standards. Two of these were standardized by NIST, and these are called Galois counter mode and CBC counter mode. And so let me explain what they do. Galois counter mode basically uses counter mode encryption, so randomized counter mode, with a Carter Wagman Mac, so a very fast Carter Wagman Mac. The way the Carter Wagman Mac works in GCM is it's basically a hash function of the message that's being macked, and then the result is encrypted using a PRF. Now this hash function in GCM is already quite fast to the point where the bulk of the running time of GCM is dominated by the counter mode encryption. And it's even made more so in that Intel introduced a special instruction, PCLM ULQDQ, uh, specifically designed for the purpose of making the hash function in GCM run as fast as possible. Now, CCM counter mode is another NIST standard. It uses a CBC MAC and then counter mode encryption. So this mechanism, you notice, uses MAC then encrypt like SSL does. So this is actually not the recommended way of doing things, but because counter mode encryption is used, this is actually a perfectly fine encryption mechanism. One thing that I'd like to point out about CCM is that everything is based on AES. You notice it's using AES for the CBC MAC and it's using AES for the counter mode encryption. And as a result, CCM can be implemented with relatively little code because all you need is an AES engine and nothing else. And because of this, CCM actually was adopted by the Wi-Fi Alliance. And in fact, uh, you're probably using CCM on a daily basis. If you're using encrypted Wi-Fi 802.11i, then you're basically using CCM to encrypt traffic between your laptop and the access point. There's another mode called EAX that uses counter mode encryption and then CMAC 
So again, you notice encrypt and Mac, and that's a f another fine mode to use. We'll do a comparison of all these modes in just a minute. Now I wanted to mention that first of all, all these modes are nonce-based. In other words, they don't use any randomness, but they do take as input a nonce, and the nonce has to be unique per key. In other words, as you remember, the pair key comma nonce should never ever ever repeat, but the nonce itself need not be random, so it's perfectly fine to use a counter, for example, as a nonce. And the other important point is that, in fact, all these modes are what's called authenticated encryption with associated data. This is an extension of authenticated encryption that comes up very often in networking protocols. So the idea behind AEAD is that, in fact, the message that's provided to the encryption mode is not intended to be fully encrypted. Only part of the message is intended to be encrypted, but all of the message is intended to be authenticated. A good example of this is a network packet. Think of like an IP packet, where there's a header, and then there's a payload. And typically, the header is not going to be encrypted. For example, the header might contain the destination of the packet, but then the header had better not be encrypted, otherwise routers along the way wouldn't know where to route the packet. And so typically, the header is sent in the clear. The, the payload, of course, is always encrypted. But what you'd like to do is have the header be authenticated, not encrypted by authenticated. So this is exactly what these AEAD modes uh, do. They would authenticate the header and then encrypt the payload, but the header and the payload are bound together in the authentication, so they can't actually be separated. So this is not difficult to do. What happens is in these three modes, GCM, CCM, and EAX, basically the MAC is applied to the entire data, but the encryption is only applied to the part of the data that needs to be encrypted. So I wanted to show you what an API to these authenticated encryption with associated data encryption schemes look like. So here's what it looks like in OpenSSL. For example, just as a, an API for GCM, so what you do is you call the init function to initialize the encryption mode. And you notice you give it a key and the nonce. The nonce, again, doesn't have to be random, but it has to be unique. And after initialization, you would call this encrypt function, where you see that you give it the associated data that's going to be authenticated but not encrypted. You give it a data that's going to be both authenticated and encrypted. And it gives you back the full ciphertext, which is an encryption of the data, but of course does not include the AAD because the AAD is going to be sent in the clear. So now that we understand this mode of encrypt then Mac, we can go back to the definition of Mac security, and I can explain to you something that might have been a little obscure when we looked at that definition. So if you remember, one of the requirements that followed from our definition of secure Macs meant that given a message Mac pair on a message M, the attacker cannot produce another tag on the same message M. In other words, even though the attacker already has a tag for the message M, he shouldn't be able to produce a new tag for the same message M. And it's really not clear why does that matter. Who cares if the adversary already has a tag on the message M, who cares if he can produce another tag? Well, it turns out if the Mac didn't have this property, in other words, given a message Mac pair, you can produce another Mac on the same message, then that Mac would result in an insecure encrypt then Mac mode. And so if we want our encrypt and Mac to have ciphertext integrity, it's crucial that our Mac security would imply this strong notion of security, which of course it does because we defined it correctly. So let's see what would go wrong if in fact it was easy to produce this type of forgery. So what I'll do is I'll show you a chosen ciphertext attack on the resulting encrypt then Mac system. And since the system has a chosen ciphertext attack on it, it necessarily means that it doesn't provide authenticated encryption. So let's see. So the adversary is going to start by sending two messages, M0 and M1. And he's going to receive, as usual, the encryption of one of them, either the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. And since we're using encrypt then Mac, the adversary receives a ciphertext, we'll call it C0, and a Mac on the ciphertext C0. Well, now we said that given the MAC on a message, the adversary can produce another MAC on the same message. So what he's going to do is he's going to produce another MAC on the message C0. Now he has a new ciphertext, C0, T prime, which is a perfectly valid ciphertext. T prime is a valid MAC of C0. Therefore, the adversary now can submit a chosen ciphertext query on C prime. And this is a valid chosen ciphertext query because it's different from C. It's a new ciphertext. The poor challenger now is forced to decrypt this ciphertext C prime. 
So he's going to send back the decryption of C prime. It's a valid ciphertext. Therefore, the decryption of C prime is the message MB. But now the attacker just learned the value of B because he can test whether MB is equal to M0 or MB is equal to M1. As a result, he can just output B and he gets advantage uh, 1 in defeating the scheme. And so again, if our MAC security did not imply this property here, then there would be a chosen ciphertext attack on encrypt and MAC, and therefore it would not be secure. So the fact that we defined MAC security correctly means that encrypt and MAC really does provide authenticated encryption. And throughout all the MACs that we discussed actually do satisfy this strong notion of unforgeability. So interestingly, this is not the end of the story. So as we said before the concept of authenticated encryption was introduced, everyone was just combining MACs and encryption in various ways in the hope of achieving some authenticated encryption. After the notion of authenticated encryption became formalized and rigorous, people kind of started scratching their heads and said, hey, wait a minute, maybe we can achieve authenticated encryption more efficiently than by combining a MAC and an encryption scheme. In fact, if you think about how this combination of MAC and encryption works, let's say we combine counter mode with CMAC, then for every block of plaintext, you first of all have to use your block cipher for counter mode, and then you have to use your block cipher again for the CBC MAC. This means that if you're combining CPA secure encryption with a MAC, for every block of plaintext, you have to evaluate your block cipher twice, once for the MAC and once for the encryption scheme. So the natural question was, can we construct an authenticated encryption scheme directly from a PRP such that we would have to only evaluate the PRP once per block? And it turns out the answer is yes, and there's this beautiful construction called OCB that pretty much does everything you want and is much faster than constructions that are separately built from an encryption and a MAC. So I wrote down kind of a schematic of OCB. I don't want to explain it in detail. I'll just kind of explain it at a high level. So here we have our input plaintext here at the top. And you notice that first of all, OCB is parallelizable, completely parallelizable. So every block can be encrypted separately of every other block. The other thing to notice is that, as I promised, you only evaluate your block cipher once per plaintext block and then you evaluate it one more time at the end to build your authentication tag. And then the overhead of OCB beyond just a block cipher is minimal. All you have to do is evaluate a certain very simple function P. The nonce goes into this P, you notice. The key goes into this P. And then there's a block counter that goes into this P. So you just evaluate this function P twice for every block and you XOR the result before and after encryption using the block cipher. And that's it. That's all you have to do and then you get a very fast and efficient authenticated encryption scheme built from a block cipher. So OCB actually has a nice security theorem associated with it, and I'm going to point to a paper on OCB when we get to the end of this module where I list some further reading papers that you can take a look at. So you might be wondering if OCB is so much better than everything we've seen so far, all these three standards, CCM, GCM, and EAX, why isn't OCB being used, or why isn't OCB the standard? And the answer is a little sad. The primary answer that OCB is not being used is actually because of various patents. And I'll just leave it at that. So to conclude this section, I wanted to show you some performance numbers. So here on the right, I listed performance numbers for modes that you shouldn't be using. So this is for randomized counter modes, and this is for randomized CBC. And you can see also that the performance of CBC Mac is basically the same as the performance of CBC encryption. Okay, now here are the authenticated encryption modes. So th these are the ones that you're supposed to be using. These you're not supposed to be using on their own, right? These two, you should never ever use these two because they only provide CPA security. They don't actually provide security against active attacks. You're only supposed to use authenticated encryption uh, for encryption. And so I listed performance numbers for the three standards. Let me remind you that GCM basically uses a very fast hash and then it uses counter mode for actual encryption. And you can see that the overhead of GCM over counter mode is relatively small. CCM and EAX both use a block cipher based encryption and a block cipher based MAC. And as a result, they're about twice as slow as counter mode. And you see that OCB is actually the fastest of these uh, primarily because it only uses the block cipher once per message block. So based on these performance numbers, you would think that GCM is exactly the right mode to always use. But it turns out if you're on the space-constrained hardware, GCM is not ideal, primarily because its implementation requires larger code than the other two modes. However, as I said, Intel specifically added instructions 
to speed up GCM mode, and as a result, implementing GCM on an Intel architecture takes very little code. But on other hardware platforms, say in smart cards or other constrained environments, the code size for implementing GCM would be considerably larger than for the other two modes. But if code size is not a constraint, then GCM is the right mode to use. So to summarize this segment, I want to say it one more time, that when you want to encrypt messages, you have to use an authenticated encryption mode. And the recommended way to do it is to use one of the standards, namely one of these three modes for providing authenticated encryption. Don't implement the encryption scheme yourself. In other words, don't implement encrypt and Mac yourself. Just use one of these three standards. Many crypto libraries now provide standard APIs for these three modes. And these are the ones you should be using and nothing else. In the next segment, we're going to see what else can go wrong when you try to implement authenticated encryption by yourself. So I want to show you how authenticated encryption is used in the real world. So let's use TLS as an example and see how TLS works. So data encryption in TLS is done using a protocol called the TLS record protocol. In this protocol, every TLS record starts with a header. We'll see the structure of the header in just a minute, followed by encrypted data that is sent from one side to the other. In TLS, it so happens that the records are at most 16 kilobytes, and if more data than 16 kilobytes needs to be sent, then basically the record is fragmented into multiple records. Now, TLS uses what's called unidirectional keys, meaning that there's one key from browser to server, and there's a separate key from server to browser. So one key is used for sending messages from a browser to the server, and the other key is used from sending messages from the server to the browser. And of course, both sides, both the server and the browser, know both of these keys. And just to be clear, I'll say the browser will use this key to send data to the server, and will use this key to read data from the server. And the server basically does exactly the same thing, just with the opposite keys. Now these keys, both of these keys, are actually generated by the TLS key exchange protocol, which we're going to talk about in the second part of the course. Right now, I'm going to assume that these keys have already been established. They're known to both the server and the browser, and now the browser and server want to exchange information using those keys. So the TLS record protocol uses what's called stateful encryption, which means that the encryption of every packet is done using a certain state that's maintained inside of the browser and the server. In particular, the state that's of interest to us are these 64-bit counters. Again, there are two 64-bit counters, one for traffic from browser to server, and one from traffic from the server to the browser. These counters are initialized to zero when the session is first initialized, and they're incremented every time a record is sent. So every time the browser sends a record to the server, the browser will go ahead and increment this counter. When the server receives that record, it'll go ahead and increment the counter on its side. And when the server sends a record to the browser, it'll go ahead and increment the second counter. And again, when the browser receives this record, it'll go ahead and increment its copy of this counter. So the state, these two counters, basically the state exists both on the browser and on the server, and it's updated appropriately as records are sent from one to the other and received by the appropriate side. Now the purpose of these counters, as we'll see in just a minute, is to prevent replay attacks so that an attacker can't simply record a record and then replay it at a later time, because by then the counters would have to be incremented. Okay, so let's look at the details of how the record protocol works. In particular, I'll show you kind of the mandatory cipher suite, which is encryption using AES CBC and macking using HMAC SHA-1. Okay, so remember TLS uses mac then encrypt, where the mac algorithm is HMAC SHA-1 and the encryption algorithm is AES-128 in CBC mode. Okay, so let's look at how the browser sends data to the server, which, as I said, is done using the browser to server key. Now, the browser to server key itself is made up of a MAC key and an encryption key. Two separate keys that are, again, as I said, negotiated during session setup. And again, I want to be absolutely clear, there is a separate key for browser to server and a separate key from server to browser, so that overall there are four keys two Mac keys and two encryption keys, each one used in the appropriate direction. Okay, so here I wrote down the diagram of what a TLS packet looks like. Uh, it begins with a header that contains the type of the packet, the version number for the protocol, and the length of the packet. Notice the length of the packet is sent in the clear. Now, when encrypting data, a certain record, the encryption procedure works as follows. Of course, it takes key as input, and it takes the current state as input. And then it works as follows. What it would do is, first of all, is it would MAC the following data 
well, here is the actual payload that's macked, but the header is also macked. In addition, the counter, the current value of the counter is also macked, and of course, it's all the counters incremented to indicate the fact that one more record has been sent. Now, the interesting thing here is that even though the value of the counter is included in the tag, you notice the value of the counter is actually never sent in the record, and the reason it doesn't need to be sent in the record is that the server on the other side already knows what the value of the counter needs to be. So it doesn't need to be told in the record what the value of the counter is, it implicitly already knows what it is, and when it's going to verify the Mac, it could just use the value that it thinks the counter should be and verify the Mac in that fashion. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting approach where even though the two sides maintain these counters that function as nonces, there's no reason to send the nonces in the record because both sides actually already know what counters to expect in every record that they receive. Okay, so that's the tag. The tag is computed, as we said, over this triple of data. The next thing that happens is that the tag is concatenated to the data. Remember, this is Mac, then encrypt. So here we computed the Mac. Now we're going to encrypt the data along with the tag. So the header, the data, and the tag are padded to the AES block, and I think we already said that this pad, if the pad length is 5, then the pad is done by simply writing the byte 5 five times. So if the pad length needs to be 5, the pad will just be 55555. And then we CBC encrypt using the encryption key. We CBC encrypt the data and the tag, and we do that using an, a fresh random IV, which is later embedded in the ciphertext. And then we prepend the header, the type, the version, and the length, and that gives us the entire TLS record, which is then sent over to the server. So the grayed out fields in this diagram correspond to encrypted data, and the white fields correspond to plain text data. So you can see that this is TLS's implementation of Mac then encrypt. The only difference from basic Mac then encrypt is the fact that there is a state, namely this counter, is being included in the value of the Mac. And again, as I said, that's done to prevent replays. So let's see why that prevents replays. In particular, let's see how the record protocol decrypts an incoming record. So here comes an incoming encrypted record. And again, the server is going to use its own key that it corresponds to data from browser to server and its own browser to server counter. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to decrypt the record using the encryption key. After encryption, it's going to check the format of the pad. In other words, if the pad length is five bytes, it's going to check that it really is 55555. Five, five, five. And if it's not, it's going to send a bad record Mac alert message and terminate the connection so that a new session key would have to be negotiated if more records need to be sent. If the pad format is correct, then removing the pad is really easy. All the server does is it looks at the last byte of the pad, say the last byte is equal to 5, and then it removes the last 5 bytes of the record. By doing that, it strips off the pad. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to extract the tag from the record. So this would be the subsequent bytes inside of the record. So this would be the, the trailing bytes in the record after we remove the pad. And then it's going to verify the tag on the header, the data, and its value of the counter. And if the Mac doesn't verify, again, it's going to send an alert, bad record Mac, and tear down the connection. And if the pad does verify, it's going to remove the tag, remove the header, and the remaining part of the record is the plain text data that's given to the application. Now you can see that if a record is ever replayed, in other words, if an, an attacker records a particular record and then replays it to the server at a later time, then by then the value of the counter would have changed, and as a result, the tag on the replayed record would simply not verify because the tag was computed using one value of the counter, but when the replayed record is received at the server, the value of the counter at the server is different from the value that was used to compute the tag, and as a result, the tag would not verify. So these counters are a very elegant and simple way for preventing replays. And the nice thing about this is because both sides know the value of the counter implicitly, there's never a need to send the counter in the record itself. So the counter itself doesn't increase the length of the ciphertext at all. Now we already mentioned that this particular approach to uh, authenticated encryption, namely Mac then encrypt using CBC encryption, is in fact authenticated encryption. 
However, it's only authenticated encryption if no other information is leaked during decryption. And we're going to see some cute attacks on TLS if there is information being leaked during decryption. I should say that this bad record MAC alert basically corresponds to the decryption algorithm outputting this reject symbol, the bottom symbol, meaning that the ciphertext is invalid. And as long as there's no way to differentiate between why the ciphertext was rejected, in other words, the decryptor only exposes the fact that a rejection took place, but it doesn't say why the rejection happened, this is in fact an authenticated encryption system. However, if you differentiate and expose why the ciphertext was rejected, whether it was because of a bad pad or because of a bad Mac, then it turns out there's a very cute attack, which we're going to see in the next segment. What I showed you so far is called TLS version 1.1. It turns out that earlier versions of TLS actually had significant mistakes in it, and as a result, the earlier record protocol is vulnerable to a number of attacks. The first mistake is that the IV used in CBC encryption is predictable. And we said earlier that in CBC, if the IV is predictable, then the, the resulting CBC encryption is not CPA secure. Well, in this older version of TLS, TLS 1.0 and earlier, the IV for the next record is simply the last ciphertext block of the current record. And as a result, if the adversary can observe the current record, he knows the IV for the next record, and that will allow him to break semantic security of the next record. So the resulting scheme is not CPA secure, but not only is it not CPA secure, in fact, there's a very cute attack called the beast attack that's able to decrypt the initial part of a TLS record simply based on the fact that this scheme is not semantically secure. So I should say that this method of choosing the IV to be the last block of the previous record is called chained IVs. And you should remember that this actually should not be used in practice because it always, always leads to an attack. Because of this, TLS 1.1 moved to what's called explicit IVs, where every TLS record has its own random unpredictable IV. And that's fixed the problem. As soon as browsers and servers move to TLS 1.1, this will no longer be an issue. Now, another mistake that was done in TLS 1.0 and earlier enabled what's called a padding oracle, which is something that we're going to talk about in the next segment, where what happened was that if the ciphertext was rejected due to an invalid pad, the server would send back an alert message saying decryption failed. Whereas if the ciphertext was rejected due to a bad Mac, the server would send back a bad record Mac alert. As a result, an adversary who observes the alert sent back from the server can tell whether the pad in the ciphertext was valid or invalid. And this introduces a very significant attack called a padding attack, which we're going to talk about in the next segment. The solution to this in TLS 1.1 was basically to say that instead of reporting decryption failed here, we're going to report a bad record Mac even if the pad is incorrect. And as a result, simply looking at which alert is sent back from the server, an attacker can't tell if the ciphertext is rejected because of a bad pad or a bad Mac. So this tries to mask this information. Now the lesson from this is that when decryption fails, you should never ever explain why. I guess this is something that comes out of networking protocols, where if there's a failure, you want to tell the peer why the failure occurred. Well, in cryptography, if you explain why the failure occurred, that very often leads to an attack. In other words, when decryption fails, just output reject, and don't explain why the reject actually happens, just reject the ciphertext. Okay, so now that we've seen TLS 1.1, Let's see a broken protocol. So, of course, I always like to pick on 802.11b web, which pretty much got everything wrong. So let's see how not to provide authenticated encryption. So let me remind you how 802.11b web works. Basically, there's a message that the laptop wants to send to the access point. Uh, the first thing that happens is that the laptop computes a cyclic redundancy checksum on the message and concatenates the CRC checksum to the message then the result is encrypted using a stream cipher, in particular RC4. If you recall, the key that's used is the concatenation of an initial value IV, uh, the changes per packet, and the long-term key K, and then the IV along with the ciphertext are transmitted to the other side. Now, we already saw two problems with this approach. One was if the IV is ever repeated, and in fact it is going to be repeated, uh, then you get a two-time pad attack. And the other problem is that WEP uses very closely related keys in other words, the key is simply IV concatenated K, and the only thing that changes is the IV. So the key is always fixed, which means that these uh, PRG keys are very closely related to one another. 
And as we said, the PRG that's used here, RC4, is not designed for this type of use, and it completely breaks if you use it with related keys, and as a result, web has no security at all. What I want to show you is that even the CRC mechanism that's used here in an attempt to provide integrity and prevent an adversary from tampering with the ciphertext, even that mechanism is completely broken, and it's actually very easy to tamper with ciphertexts in root. So let's see how that's done. The attack uses a particular property of the CRC checksum, namely that CRC is linear. What that means is if I give you CRC of M, and I ask you to compute CRC of M, X, or P, then it's very easy to do. Basically, you just compute some well-known and public function of FP. You XOR these two together, and that, in fact, will give you CRC of M, X, or P. So in some sense, the XOR just comes out of the parentheses, and that basically means that CRC is linear. Now, here's how the attack works. Suppose the adversary intercepts a particular packet that's destined to the access point. Now the packet say, says it's destined for destination port 80, and the attacker knows that it's intended for destination port 80, and what he wants to do is modify the ciphertext such that the, now the destination port will say 25 instead of 80. And maybe the attacker can read messages for port 25, and that's how he actually obtains the actual data in the packet. So recall that the CRC checksum is there to make sure that exactly the attacker cannot change data inside of the ciphertext. But I want to show you that in fact it's really easy to modify data in the ciphertext and the CRC basically provides no security against tampering at all. So let's see how to do it. Well, what the attacker would do is he would basically XOR some, a certain value XX into the bytes that represent the 80 in the ciphertext. Now, what he'll XOR in will basically be the string 25 XOR 80. And you remember that if I XOR a certain string XX into the ciphertext that was created using a stream cipher, when that ciphertext is decrypted, the plaintext at this position will also be XORed by XX. And as a result, after decryption, the plaintext at this position basically will be the original 80, XOR 25 XOR 80, which gives us 25. Okay, so after decryption, the plaintext at this position will now be 25. The problem is that if that's all we did, then this attack would fail because the CRC checksum would now would not validate. The CRC checksum was built with 80 as a plaintext, but 25 is a different plaintext and needs a different CRC. But it's not a problem because what we can do is we can easily correct the checksum, the CRC checksum, even though the CRC checksum is encrypted. What we do is we XOR f of xx into the ciphertext at the place where the CRC is supposed to be. And as a result, when the ciphertext is decrypted, what will happen is we'll get the correct CRC checksum after decryption. So the interesting thing that happened here is even though the attacker doesn't know what the CRC value is, he's able to correct it using this linearity property such that when the ciphertext is decrypted, the correct CRC value appears in the plaintext. Okay, so the linearity property of CRC plays a critical role in making this attack works. The end conclusion here is basically that a CRC checksum provides absolutely no integrity at all against active attacks, and it should never, ever, ever be used as an integrity mechanism, and instead, if you want to provide integrity, you're supposed to use a cryptographic Mac, not an ad hoc mechanism like CRC. Okay, so now we've seen how authenticated encryption is implemented in a real-world protocol like TLS. In the next segment, we're going to look at real-world attacks on authenticated encryption implementations that happen to implement authenticated encryption incorrectly. In this segment and the next, I want to show you two very cute attacks on deployed authenticated encryption systems. But first, let's do a quick recap. So recall that authenticated encryption means that the system provides CPA security plus ciphertext integrity. And authenticated encryption means that we can preserve confidentiality in the presence of an active adversary, and moreover, the adversary can't modify the ciphertext in any way without being detected. We also showed that authenticated encryption prevents these very powerful chosen ciphertext attacks. Unfortunately, authenticated encryption has a pretty significant limitation in that it simply can't help a bad implementation. If you implement authenticated encryption incorrectly, then your implementation will be vulnerable to active attacks. And then we looked at standards constructions. I mentioned these three standards that provide authenticated encryption. And I want to point out, when you need to use authenticated encryption in practice, you should just be using one of these three standards. You shouldn't try to implement authenticated encryption by yourself. And I hope that the attack that I show you in this segment convinces you that this is not something you should do yourself. Just use one of GCM, CCM, or AEX. 
However, it's good for you to know that in general, when you want to provide authenticated encryption, the correct way to do things is encrypt then Mac, because then no matter which encryption and Mac algorithms you combine, the result will be authenticated encryption. Again, assuming the encryption and Mac algorithm are implemented correctly. Okay, so let's look at a very cute attack on the TLS record protocol, in particular when CBC encryption is used. Let me just briefly remind you that the way TLS decryption works is first of all, an incoming ciphertext is CBC decrypted. Then the next thing that happens is the implementation will check that the pad has the correct format. For example, if the pad is of length five, the format should be 55555. And if it's not of the correct format, then the ciphertext is rejected. So this basically checks that the ending of the decrypted record contains the correct pad. And then if the pad has the correct format, then the next thing that happens is that the Mac is checked, the tag is checked. And if the tag turns out to be incorrect, again, the record is rejected. If the tag is valid, then the remaining data is considered to be authentic and is given to the application. So what I wanted to point out is there are two types of errors in TLS decryption. One is a padding error and one is a Mac error. And it turns out it's very important that the adversary not be told which of these errors occurred. And let me briefly explain why. So suppose an attacker can actually differentiate the two types of errors. In other words, he can tell if a pad error occurred or a Mac error occurred. The result is what we call a padding oracle. Because now imagine the adversary has a certain ciphertext that it intercepted, and it wants to try and decrypt that ciphertext. What it could do is it could take that ciphertext as is and submit it to the server. The server is going to decrypt the ciphertext and then look to see if the pad has the correct format. If the pad doesn't have the correct format, we'll get one type of error. If the pad has the correct format, it's very likely, since this is just some random ciphertext that the adversary concocted himself, it's very likely the Mac will be incorrect. And then the adversary will observe a Mac error. So if the pad is invalid, we'll see a pad error, whereas the pad is valid, we'll see a Mac error. As a result, the adversary, after submitting the ciphertext to the server, the adversary can tell whether the last bytes in the decrypted ciphertext have a valid pad or not. In other words, whether the last bytes in the decrypted ciphertext are end with 1, or 2, 2, or 3, 3, 3, or 4, 4, 4, 4, and so on. So the adversary learns something about the decrypted ciphertext just by submitting the ciphertext to the server. So this is a beautiful example of what's called a chosen ciphertext attack, where again, the adversary submits a ciphertext and then he gets to learn something about the resulting plaintext. And now the question is whether he can use that information to completely decrypt a given ciphertext. And I wanna show you that a padding oracle can actually be used to completely decrypt a given ciphertext. But before I say that, I wanna remind you that older versions of TLS actually leaked the type of error simply in the alert message that was sent back to the peer different types of alerts were sent depending on which type of error occurred. As soon as this attack came out, SSL implementations simply always reported the same type of error, so just looking at the alert type wouldn't tell the adversary which error occurred. Nevertheless, there was still a padding oracle, so let me explain why. So this was observed by Canvel et al. Canvel et al. realized that the way TLS decryption is implemented is first of all, the record is decrypted, then the pad is checked, and if the pad is invalid, decryption is aborted and an error is generated. If the pad is valid, then the Mac is checked, and then if the Mac is invalid, decryption is aborted and an error is generated. As a result, this causes a timing attack. You realize that if pad is invalid, then the alert message is sent very quickly. And you notice here that in fact you see that within 21 milliseconds, the ciphertext is rejected. However, if the pad is valid, then now the Mac needs to be checked. And when it's discovered to be invalid, the alert is only generated at that point. In other words, then in that case, it takes a little bit longer until the alert is generated. And you see that on average, this takes about 23 milliseconds. So even though the same alert is sent back to the peer, the adversary can simply observe the time until the alert message is generated. If the time is short, it knows the pad was invalid. If the time is long, it knows the pad was valid, but the Mac was invalid. And as a result, the adversary still has a padding oracle that can tell it whether the pad was valid or invalid. So now let's see how to use a padding oracle. So I claim that if the attacker has a certain ciphertext C, he can completely decrypt that ciphertext just using the padding oracle. So let's see how to do it. And just as an example, suppose he wants to obtain M1. In other words, a decryption of the second block of the ciphertext. 
So let's see what he would do. So here we have the ciphertext that the attacker intercepted, and this just happens to be the decryption of that ciphertext. And the reason I wrote this down is I wanted you to remember how CBC decryption works. So you should keep in mind that one ciphertext block is directly XORed into the decryption of the next ciphertext block. Okay, so the adversary here wants to basically learn just this part of the plain text thing. So here's what he's going to do. So first of all, he's going to throw away uh, C2 so that the last block really is just C1, which is the one that he's interested in decrypting. Now let's suppose that he has a certain guess G for the last byte of M1. In other words, he just has a guess for this very, very, very last byte. G is a value between 0 and 255. What the attacker will do is the following. He will XOR the value G XOR 0 1 into the last byte of the block C0, the previous block. Yes, so all he did is he took the last byte of the previous block and XOR that with his guess XOR 0 1. Now let's think for just a second and see what happens when this two block ciphertext is decrypted. Well, C0 is going to get decrypted to whatever it's decrypted to. That's just going to be some garbage that we don't care about. But now when C1 is decrypted, the last byte is going to be XORed with this modified C0. And the result, the last byte of the plain text is going to be also XORed with this extra value that we stuck into C0. So what goes in here is the actual original last byte in the plain text M1. But now it gets XORed with G, XOR 0, X01. So now you see where I'm going with this. If the guess G for the last byte of M1 is correct, then these two guys will cancel one another. Last byte XOR G is just 0. And what we'll get is the last byte of the plain text is just 0, X01. I should mention, by the way, 0, X01 just means hex notation for 0, 1. So literally, this is just a one byte representation of the number 1. Good. So again, what this means is if our guess for the last byte of M1 is correct, then we get a pad that's well-formed. It's just the number 1. The number 1 is a well-formed pad, and therefore the pad is valid, and the padding oracle will say the pad is valid. If the guess is incorrect, then we'll get a value here that's not equal to 1, and then it's very likely that we have an invalid pad. And as a result, the padding oracle will say uh, the pad is invalid. So again, you see that if our guess for the last byte of M1 is correct, we learn that G was in fact a correct guess, whereas if our guess is incorrect, then we learn that G is an incorrect guess. So what the attacker is going to do is he's going to create his modified ciphertext. You notice he only modifies the second block of the ciphertext. We're going to send this to the padding oracle, and then based on the result of the padding oracle, we learn whether the last byte is equal to G or not. Well, now we can simply repeat this again and again for G from 0 to 255. This basically requires 256 chosen ciphertext queries. Actually, I guess on average we'll only have to do 128 chosen ciphertext queries until we find the right G. And then we learn the last byte of M1. Well, so now we know the last byte of M1. I claim that we can now use the exact same process to learn the second to last byte of M1. Let me ask you, what pad are we going to use to learn the second to last byte of M1? Well, it shouldn't be surprising that instead of just using the pad containing the byte 1, we're going to use a 2-byte pad containing the bytes 2-2. Two, two. That's a well-formed pad. And now we can always make sure, because we know the last byte of M1, when we do our XORing trick, we can always make sure that the last byte of the plaintext is, in fact, 0, 2. And now we can guess the second to last byte of M2 by simply trying lots of values on G until we find one that makes the pad, in fact, be 0, 2, 0, 2. And by issuing 256 additional queries to the padding oracle, we will get to learn the second to last byte of M1. And now we can iterate this again and again. And basically, since the length of the block is 16 bytes, after 16 times 256 queries, we get to learn all of M1. So this is a pretty significant attack that is able to decrypt blocks of the TLS record. So those of you who know the inner workings of TLS should complain that this attack isn't going to work. The problem is that when TLS receives a record with a bad pad or a bad Mac, it shuts down the connection and renegotiates a new key. As a result, the attacker is now stuck with a ciphertext encrypted using an old key, and that key is no longer used anywhere, so it cannot submit any more queries. So with TLS, basically, it can only submit one query, and that's it. 
Even a single query still leaks information about the plaintext to the attacker, but it doesn't expose the entire plaintext block M1. However, this attack is so cute that whenever there's a mistake like this in a protocol, there will be some settings in which it comes up. And in this case, the setting is in the case of an IMAP server. So IMAP is a popular protocol for reading email from an IMAP email server. And it's very common to protect the IMAP protocol by running it on top of uh, the TLS protocol. Now it turns out in IMAP, every five minutes, the IMAP client will connect to the IMAP server and check whether there's new email. And the way it does it is by first logging in to the IMAP server by sending this login username password message. And then it goes ahead and check if there's new email available. Well, what this means is that every five minutes, the attacker gets an encryption of exactly the same message. In particular, it gets an encryption of the password. And so every five minutes, it can mount one guess on the block that contains the password. And so if your password is eight characters long, the attacker simply needs to recover those eight characters, and he's going to recover them one byte at a time by doing one guess per five minutes. And so Canville and I'll show that within a few hours, you can basically recover the user's password just by mounting one guess every five minutes. So this is a pretty significant attack against an implementation of TLS. And the defense against this was to always check the Mac whether the pad is valid or invalid. And as a result, it takes the same amount of time to respond whether the pad is valid or invalid. So this removes the timing attack and makes this attack much harder to mount. So there are two lessons here. First of all, you notice that if TLS had used encrypt then Mac rather than Mac then encrypt, then this whole issue would be completely moot because in encrypt and Mac, the Mac is checked first and only then does decryption and pad checking take place. In encrypt and Mac, the cipher test is discarded because the Mac is invalid and we never even get to a pad check. As a result, any tampering or games with a ciphertext will be discarded immediately because the Mac is simply going to fail. The second lesson to remember is that, remember I told you that Mac then CBC actually does provide authenticated encryption, but only if you don't reveal why decryption failed. In this case, the padding oracle completely destroyed the authenticated encryption property, and basically I showed you an attack that shows that now this mode does not provide authenticated encryption. So let me ask you the following question. Suppose in TLS, instead of using Mac then CBC, TLS did Mac then counter mode encryption. Would the padding oracle attack still be possible or not? The answer is it wouldn't be possible simply because counter mode doesn't use any padding at all. So this padding oracle attack only affects CBC encryption modes in TLS. TLS also supports counter mode encryption and counter mode encryption modes are simply not affected by these padding attacks. So that's the end of the segment. In the next segment, I want to show you another very, very clever attack on authenticated encryption systems. In the last segment, we looked at a padding oracle attack that completely breaks an authenticated encryption system. I hope this attack convinces you that you shouldn't implement authenticated encryption on your own because you might end up exposing yourself to a padding oracle attack or a timing attack or any other such attack. Instead, you should be using standards like GCM or any other of the standardized authenticated encryption modes as implemented in many crypto libraries. In this segment, I'm going to show you another very clever attack on an authenticated encryption system. And I hope after you see this attack, you'll be completely convinced not to invent and implement your own authenticated encryption systems, but instead always use one of the standard schemes like GCM or others. So this particular attack that I want to show you is an attack on the SSH binary packet protocol. So SSH is a standard secure remote shell application that uses a protocol between a client and the server. It has a key exchange mechanism, and once two sides exchange keys, SSH uses what's called the binary packet protocol to send messages back and forth between the client and the server. Now here's how SSH works. So recall that SSH uses what we called encrypt and MAC. Okay, so technically what happens is every SSH packet begins with a sequence number, and then the packet contains the packet length, the length of the CBC pad, the actual payload follows, then the CBC pad follows. Now this whole red block here is CBC encrypted also with a chained IV, so this is also vulnerable to the CPA attack that we discussed before. But nevertheless, this whole red packet is encrypted using CBC encryption. And then the entire clear text packet 
is MACed, and the MAC is sent in the clear along with the packet. So I want you to remember that the MAC is computed over plain text packet, and then the MAC is sent in the clear. This is what we call encrypt and MAC. And we said that this is not a good way to do things because Macs have no confidentiality requirements and by sending the Mac of the clear text in the clear, you might be exposing information about the clear text. But this is not the mistake that I want to show you here. I want to show you a much more clever attack. So first let's look at how decryption works in SSH. So what happens is, first of all, the server decrypts the encrypted packet length field only. So it only decrypts these particular first few bytes. Then it will go ahead and read from the network as many bytes as specified in the packet length field. It's going to decrypt the remaining ciphertext blocks using CBC decryption. Then once it's recovered the entire SSH packet, it will go ahead and check the MAC of uh, the plain text and report an error if the MAC happens to be invalid. Now the problem here is that the packet length field is decrypted and then used directly to determine the length of the packet before any authentication has taken place. In fact, it's not possible to verify the MAC of the packet length field because we haven't recovered the entire packet yet and as a result we cannot check the MAC. But nevertheless, the protocol uses the packet length before verifying that the MAC is valid. So it turns out this introduces a very, very cute attack, and I'm only going to describe a very simplified version of this attack just to get the idea across. So here's the idea. Suppose the attacker intercepted a particular ciphertext block, namely the direct AES encryption of the message block M, and now he wants to recover this M. And I emphasize that this intercepted ciphertext is only one block length. It's one AES block. So here's what the attacker is going to do. Well, he's going to send the packet to the server that starts off as normal. It basically starts off with a sequence number, and then he's going to inject his capture ciphertext as the first ciphertext block that's uh, sent to the server. Now, what is the server going to do? The server is going to decrypt the first few bytes of this first AES block, and he's going to interpret the first few bytes as the length field of the packet. The next thing that's going to happen is the server is going to expect this many bytes before it checks that the MAC is valid. And so what the attacker is going to do is he's going to feed the server one byte at a time. So the server will read one byte and then another byte and then another byte. Eventually the server will read as many bytes as the length field specifies, at which point it will check that the MAC is valid. And of course the attacker was just feeding the server junk bytes and as a result the MAC is not going to verify and the server will send a MAC error. But you realize that what happened here, the attacker was counting how many bytes it sent to the server, and so it knows exactly how many bytes were sent at the time that it receives the MAC error from the server. So that tells it that the decryption of the first 32 bits of its ciphertext C are exactly equal to the number of bytes that were sent before it saw the MAC error. So this is a very clever attack. So let me say it one more time to make sure this is clear. So again, the attacker has a one-block ciphertext C that it wants to decrypt. And let's pretend that when C is decrypted, the 32 most significant bits of the plaintext happen to be the number 5. In this case, what the attacker will see is the following behavior. The server is going to decrypt the challenge block C, and he's going to obtain the number 5 as the length field. So now the attacker is going to feed the server one byte at a time, and after the attacker feeds the server five bytes, the server says, hey, I've just recovered the entire packet, let me check the MAC. The MAC is likely to be false, and then it will send bad MAC error. So after five bytes are read off the network, the attacker is going to see a bad MAC error, and then the attacker learns that the most significant 32 bits of the decrypted block is equal to the number 5. So there, so he just learned the 32 most significant bits of C. So this is a very significant attack because the attacker just learned 32 bits of the decrypted ciphertext block. And since he can apply this attack to any ciphertext block he wants, he can basically learn the first 32 bits of every ciphertext block in a very long message. So what just happened here? Well, there are actually two things that were wrong in this design. The first one is the decryption operation is non-atomic. In other words, the decryption algorithm doesn't take a whole packet as input and respond with a whole plaintext as output or with the word reject. Instead, the decryption algorithm partially decrypts the ciphertext, namely to obtain the length field, 
and then it waits to recover as many bytes as needed, and then it completes the decryption process. So these non-atomic decryption operations are fairly dangerous, and generally they should be avoided. In this example, this non-atomic decryption happens to break authenticated encryption. The other problem that happened is that the length field was used before it was properly authenticated. And this is another issue that uh, should never be done. So a decryption field should never be used before the field is actually authenticated. So let me ask you, if you had the option of redesigning SSH, what is the minimum change you would do to make SSH resist this attack? And let me tell you that multiple answers might be correct. One option is to send the length field in the clear, just as in the case of TLS. In this case, there's no opportunity for an attacker to submit chosen ciphertext attack because, well, the length field is never decrypted, and so there's no decryption taking place that the attacker can abuse. Replacing encrypt and MAC by encrypt then MAC doesn't have any impact because this attack would apply either way. The problem is that the length field is used before it's authenticated, and that would have to happen either way. So a better mode of encryption doesn't actually help. Another option is to MAC the length field separately so that now the server can read the length field, check that the MAC for just the length field is valid, and then it would know how many subsequent bytes to read before checking the MAC field on the entire packet. The last option is actually one that works but is terribly inefficient. It would expose the server to a denial of service attack, so I'm not going to mark it as a valid answer. So the main lesson to remember is don't implement or design your own authenticated encryption system. Just use the standards like GCM. But if for some reason you can't use the standards and you have to implement your own authenticated encryption system, then use encrypt then MAC and make sure not to repeat the mistakes of the last two segments, namely don't use a length field before the length field is authenticated and more generally don't use any decrypted field before that field is authenticated. Okay, so this is the end of our discussion of authenticated encryption. I wanted to point out a couple of papers on authenticated encryption that you could use as further reading. The first one is a very cute one on the order of encryption and authentication that talks about whether one should do encrypt and MAC or MAC then encrypt, and it shows that one is correct and one is incorrect. It's a good read and there's a lot of information in that paper. The second paper discusses OCB mode, which is a very efficient way of building authenticated encryption. In particular, it looks at a variant of OCB with associated data, as we discussed when we described OCB. The last three papers are attack papers. The first one describes the padding oracle attack that we discussed in the last segment. This one here describes the length attack that we just described in this segment. And the last one describes a number of attacks on encryptions that just use CPA security without adding integrity. So this last paper actually provides a number of good examples for why CPA security by itself should never, ever, ever be used for encryption. Remember, the only thing you're allowed to use is authenticated encryption for confidentiality, or if all you need is integrity with no confidentiality, then you just use a Mac. Well, we're almost done with our discussion of symmetric encryption. There are just a couple of odds and ends that I'd like to discuss before we move on to the next topic. So the first thing I'd like to mention is how we derive many keys from one key. And actually, this comes up all the time in practice. So I'd like to make sure you know how to do this correctly. So what's the settings that we're looking at? Well, imagine we have a certain source key that's generated by one of a number of methods. Imagine the source key is generated by a hardware random number generator or perhaps is generated by a key exchange protocol, which we're going to discuss later. But anyhow, there are a number of ways in which a source key might be generated between Alice and Bob, such that the attacker doesn't know what this source key is. But now, as we said, in many cases, we actually need uh, many keys to secure a session, not just one single source key. For example, if you remember in uh, TLS, there were unidirectional keys. We needed keys uh, in each direction. And in fact, in each direction, we needed multiple keys. We needed a MAC key, we needed an encryption key, we needed an IV, and so on. Similarly, in non-spaced encryption, you remember there were multiple keys that were being used, and so on. And so the question is, how do we use the one source key that we just derived, either by, from a hardware process or by key exchange, and generate a bunch of keys from it that we can then use to secure our session? The way that's done is using a mechanism called a key derivation function, KDF. And I want to talk a little bit about how KDFs are constructed. So first of all, suppose we have a secure PRF that happens to have key space uh, K. And now, suppose that it so happens that our source key SK is uniform in the key K. 
In this case, the source key is in fact a uniform random key for the secure PRFF, and we can use it directly to generate keys, all the keys that we need to secure the session. So in this case, the KDF is really simple. The key derivation function would just work as follows. It would take as input the source key. It would take an input a parameter context, which I'm going to describe in just a minute. And then it's going to take a length input as input as well. And then what it will do is it will basically evaluate the PRF on 0. Then it will evaluate the PRF on 1. Then it will evaluate the PRF on 2 up until L. And uh, we'll talk about what this context is in just a second. And then basically you would use as many bits of the output as you would need to generate all the keys for the session. So if you need unidirectional keys, you would generate you know, one key in each direction, where each key might include an encryption key and a Mac key. And so you would basically generate as many bits as you need, and then finally cut off the output at the time when you've generated enough keys to secure your session. OK, so this is a fairly straightforward mechanism. It's basically using the secure PRF as a pseudo-random generator. And the only question is, what is this context string? Well, I'll tell you that the context string is basically a unique string that identifies the application. So in fact, you might have multiple applications on the same system that's trying to establish multiple secure keys. Maybe you have SSH running as one process, you have a web server running as another process, IPsec as a third process, and all three need to have secret keys generated. And this context variable basically tries to separate the three of them. So let me ask you more precisely, what do you think the purpose of this context variable is? So I guess I've given it away, and this context variable is supposed to basically separate applications so that even if, for example, the three services that we just talked about, SSH, web server, and IPsec, if they all happen to obtain the same source key from the hardware random number generator, then the context, since it's different for the three apps, will make sure that they still get three independent uh, strings that they can then use to secure the sessions. I just want you to remember that even though this is actually fairly straightforward and we discussed this before, the context string is actually important and it does need to be specific to the application so that each application gets its own session keys even if multiple applications happen to sample the same SK. The next question is what do we do if the source key actually isn't uniform? Well, now we've got a problem. If the source key is not a uniform key for the pseudorandom function, then we can no longer assume that the output of the pseudorandom function is indistinguishable from random. In fact, if we just use the KDF that we just described, then the output might not look random to the adversary, and then he might be able to anticipate some of the session keys that we'll be using, and thereby break the session. So then we have a problem. Now, why would this source key not be uniform? Well, there are many reasons why this happened. For example, if you use a key exchange protocol, it so happens typically that key exchange protocols will generate a high entropy key, but the high entropy key is going to be distributed in some subspace of the key space. So it's not going to be a uniform string, it'll be uniform in some subset of a larger set. And we'll see examples of that as soon as we talk about uh, key exchange protocols. And so KDFs have to kind of accommodate for the fact that key exchange protocols actually don't generate uniform bit strings. The other problem is that, in fact, the hardware random number generator you're using might actually produce biased outputs. We don't want to rely on the non-bias of the hardware random number generator. And so all we want to assume is that it generates a high entropy string, but one that might be biased, in which case we have to somehow clean this bias. And so this introduces this, this paradigm for building KDFs. This is called the extract then expand paradigm, where the first step of the KDF is to extract a pseudo-random key from the actual source key. So in a picture, you can think about it like this. In some sense, these are the different possible values of the source key. This is the horizontal line. And the vertical axis is basically the probability of each one of these values. And you can see that this is kind of a bumpy function, which would say that the source key is not uniformly distributed in the key space. What we do in this case is we use what's called an extractor. So an extractor is something that takes a bumpy distribution and makes it into a uniform distribution over the key space. In our case, we're actually just going to be using what are called computational extractors, namely extractors that don't necessarily produce uniform distribution at the end, but look, they generate a distribution that's indistinguishable from uniform. Now, extractors typically take as input something called a salt. And a salt, just like in a salad, it kind of adds flavor to things. What it does is basically kind of jumbles things around so that uh, no matter what the input distribution is, 
the output distribution is still going to be indistinguishable from random. So a salt, basically, what is it? It's a non-secret string, so it's publicly known. It doesn't matter if the adversary knows what the salt is, and it's fixed forever. The only point is that when you chose it, you chose one at random. And then the hope is that the funny distribution that you're trying to extract from kind of doesn't inherently depend on the salt that you chose. And as a result, using your salt, you will actually get a distribution that looks indistinguishable from random. So essentially, the salt, you know, you can just bang on the keyboard a couple of times when you generate it, but it just needs to be something that's random initially, but then it's fixed forever, and it's fine if the adversary knows what it is. And nevertheless, the extractor is able to extract the entropy and output a, a uniformly random string k. In some sense, the salt is only there to defend against adversarially bad distributions that might mess up our extractor. Okay, so now that we have extracted a pseudo-random key, now we might as well just use it in a KDF that we just saw using a secure pseudo-random function to expand the key into as many bits as we need to actually secure the session. Okay, so there are these two steps. The first one is we extract a pseudo-random key, and then once we have a pseudo-random key, we already know how to extend it into as many keys as we need using a pseudo-random function. So the standardized way of doing this is called HKDF. This is a KDF, a key derivation function that's built from HMAC. And here HMAC is used both as the PRF for expanding and an extractor for extracting the initial pseudo-random key. So let me explain how this works. So in the extract step, we're going to use our salt, which you remember is a public value, just happened to be generated at random at the beginning of time, and we use this salt as the HMAC key. And then the source key, we're going to use as the HMAC data. So we're kind of using a public value as a key, and nevertheless, one can argue that HMAC has extraction properties such that uh, when we apply HMAC, the resulting key is going to look indistinguishable from random, assuming that the source key actually has enough entropy to it. And now that we have the pseudo-random key, we're simply going to use HMAC as a PRF to uh, generate a session key, uh, you know, as many bits as we need for the session keys. Okay, so that basically concludes our discussion of HKDF, and I just want you to remember that once you obtain a source key either from hardware or from a key exchange protocol, the way you convert it into session keys is not by using that sample directly. You would never use the source key directly as a session key in a protocol. What you would do is you would run the source key through a KDF, and the KDF would give you all the keys and output that you need for uh, the randomness, for the random keys to be used in your protocol. And a typical KDF to use is HKDF, which is actually getting quite a bit of traction out there. Okay, the last uh, topic I want to talk about in this segment is how do you extract keys from passwords? So these are called uh, password-based KDFs or PB KDFs. The problem here is that passwords have relatively low entropy. In fact, we're going to talk about passwords uh, later on in the course when we talk about user authentication. And so I'm not going to say too much here. I'll just say passwords generally have very little entropy. Estimate is something on the order of 20 bits uh, of entropy, say. And as a result, there's simply not enough entropy to generate session keys out of a password. And yet, we still need to do it very frequently. We still need to derive encryption keys and Macs and so on out of passwords. So the question is how to do it. The first thing is, you know, for this kind of purpose, don't use HKDF. That's not what it's designed for. What will happen is that the derived keys uh, will actually be vulnerable to something called a dictionary attack, which we're going to talk about much later in the course when we talk about user authentication. So the way PBKDFs defend against this low entropy problem that results in a dictionary attack is by two means. First of all, as before, they use a salt, a public random value that's fixed forever. But in addition, they also use what's called a slow hash function. And let me describe kind of the standard approach to deriving keys from passwords. This is called PKCS5, and in particular, the version I'll describe is what's called PBKDF1. And I should say that this mechanism is implemented in most crypto libraries, so you shouldn't have to implement this yourself. All you would do, you know, you would call a function, you know, derive key from password, you would give the password in as input, and you would get a key as output. But you should be aware, of course, that this key is not going to have high entropy, so in fact, it will be guessable. What these uh, PBKDFs try to do is make the guessing problem as hard as possible. Okay, so the way they work, first of all, is, as we said, they basically hash the concatenation of the password and the salt, and then the hash itself is designed to be a very slow hash function, and the way we build a slow hash function is by taking one particular hash function, say SHA-256, 
and we iterate it many, many times, C times. So you can imagine a thousand times, perhaps even a million times. And what do I mean by iterating it? So well, we take the password and the salt, and we put them inside of our one input to the hash function, and then we apply the hash function. Oops, let me write it like this. And then we apply the hash function and we get an output. And then we apply the hash function again and we get another output. And we do this again and again and again, maybe a, a thousand times or a million times, depending on how fast your processors are. And then finally we get uh, the final output that we actually output as, as the key output of this key derivation function. Now what is the point here? Iterating a function 10,000 times or even a million times is going to take very little time on a modern CPU and as a result it doesn't really affect the user's experience. The user types in his password, it gets hashed a million times and then it gets output. And maybe that could even take uh, you know, a tenth of a second and the user wouldn't even notice it. However, the attacker, all he can do is he can try all the passwords in a dictionary because we know people tend to pick passwords in dictionaries. And so he could just try them one by one. You remember the salt is public, so he knows what the salt is. And so uh, he can just try this hash one by one. However, because the hash function is slow, each attempt is going to take him a tenth of a second. So if he needs to run through a dictionary you know, with, a, with 200 billion passwords in it, because the hash function is slow, this is going to take quite a while. And by doing that, we slow down the dictionary attack and we make it harder for the attacker to uh, get our session keys. Not impossible, just harder. That's all this is trying to do. Okay, so this is basically what I wanted to say about password-based KDFs. As I said, this is not something you would build yourself. All crypto libraries have an implementation of a PKACS5 uh, mechanism, and you would just call uh, the appropriate function to convert a password into key and then use the resulting key. Okay, in the next segment, we're going to see how to use symmetric encryption in a way that allows us to search on the ciphertexts. In this segment, we're going to look at the concept of deterministic encryption that often comes up in practice. When I say deterministic encryption system, I mean an encryption system that will always map given message to exactly the same ciphertext. So if we encrypt the same message three times, every time we'll get exactly the same ciphertext. So there are no nonsense involved here. Literally, this is just a consistent encryption scheme that will always output the same ciphertext given a particular message. So let's see where this comes up in practice. And in particular, I want to show you the case of lookups into an encrypted database. So the settings are, imagine we have a server here that uh, is going to store information inside of an encrypted database. So what it'll store is records. And, and every record has an index and some data that's stored inside of the record. Now, the first thing the server is going to do is he's going to encrypt this record. So here the record became encrypted. And you notice that uh, the index became encrypted with K1 and the data is encrypted uh, with K2. And then the encrypted record is sent over to the database. And the same thing happens to many records so that the database overall holds many, many encrypted records where again, you can imagine that the index is encrypted using the key K1 and then the data in the records is encrypted using the key K2. Now, if encryption is deterministic, the nice thing about that is that at a later time when the server wants to retrieve a record from the database, all he needs to do is send to the database an encryption of the index that the server is interested in. So here it would send an encryption of the index Alice that again becomes encrypted and the resulting ciphertext is identical to the ciphertext that was generated when the record was first written to the database. And the database can then, you know, find a record that has this encrypted index in it and then send the result back to the server. The nice thing about this is that now the database is completely in the dark as to what data is stored in, in the database and it doesn't even know what records are being retrieved by the server since all it sees are basically requests for encrypted indices. And so this deterministic encryption mechanism lets us do a quick lookup in the database given an encrypted index, and we're guaranteed that because of the deterministic encryption property that the index is going to become encrypted in exactly the same way as it was when the record was created. And so this should be disturbing to many of you because we previously said that deterministic encryption simply cannot be chosen playtext secure. The problem is that an attacker can look at different ciphertexts, and if he sees the same ciphertext twice, he knows that the underlying encrypted messages must also be the same. So in other words, by looking at ciphertext, he can learn something about the corresponding plaintext because every time he sees the same ciphertext twice, he knows that the underlying messages are equal. In practice, this leads to significant attacks, and particularly when the message space is small. For example, if we're transmitting single bytes across the network, such as uh, keystrokes that are being transmitted one keystroke at a time, 
then in fact an attacker can simply build a dictionary of all possible ciphertexts. If it's only single bytes, then there will only be 256 possible ciphertexts. And then simply by learning what the decryptions of those ciphertexts are, he can actually figure out all future ciphertexts simply by looking them up uh, in this dictionary. And so there are many cases where the message space is small, where this deterministic encryption simply is insecure. Now concretely, in the case of an encrypted database, what the attacker would see is if there are two records that happen to have the same ciphertext in the index position, then now he knows that those two records correspond to the same index. So again, even though he doesn't know what the index is, he learns something about the corresponding plaintext. I wanted to briefly remind you that uh, formally we say that deterministic encryption cannot be CPA secure by describing an adversary that wins the CPA game, the chosen plaintext attack game. And let me quickly remind you how that works. The game starts by the adversary sending two messages, M0 and M0. And remember that in this game, the adversary is always going to be given the encryption of the left message or the encryption of the right message. In this case, since he used the same message in both cases, both on the left and on the right, he's simply going to get the encryption of the message M0. In the next step, he's going to send the messages M0, M1, and now he's either going to get the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1, and his goal is to tell which one he got. But because the encryption is deterministic, this is very easy for him to do. All he has to do is just test whether C is equal to C0. And if C is equal to C0, then he knows that he got the encryption of M0. If C is not equal to C0, he knows that he got the encryption of M1. So he can output 0 if C is equal to C0, and output 1 if C is not equal to C0. And his advantage in this, uh, in this particular game would be 1. So it would be a high, as high an advantage as possible, which means that the attacker completely defeats chosen plain text security. Okay, so this is just a formal way of saying that the attacker basically learns more information about the plaintext uh, than he should. So the question is, what do we do? And it turns out the solution is basically to restrict the type of messages that can be encrypted under a single key. And so the idea is to say that suppose the encryptor never, ever, ever encrypts the same message under a single key. In other words, uh, the message key pair is always different and never repeats. So that for every single encryption, either the message changes or the key changes, but, or both change. But it can't be that we encrypt uh, the same message twice under the same key. So why would this ever happen? Well, it turns out there are very natural cases where this happens. For example, if the messages happen to be random, say the encryptor is encrypting keys, and those keys, you know, say are 128-bit keys, so they'll never actually, with very high probability, they'll never repeat. In this case, when we're encrypting keys, in fact, it's very likely that all the messages that are encrypted under one master key are always distinct, because, again, these keys are very unlikely to ever repeat. The other reason why messages would never repeat is simply because of some structure in the message space. For example, if all we're encrypting are unique user IDs, so imagine in the database example, the index corresponds to a unique user ID. And if there's exactly one record in the database for each user, that says that every encrypted record basically contains an encrypted index where the index is distinct for all records in the database. Okay, so these are two reasons why messages might never repeat, and this is a fairly reasonable uh, thing that actually does uh, happen uh, quite often in practice. So now, if the messages never repeat, now maybe we can actually define uh, security and actually give constructions that satisfy our definitions. So this motivates the concept of uh, deterministic chosen plaintext attacks, and let me explain what they mean. So as usual, we have a cipher defined as an encryption and a decryption algorithm, so we have a key space, a message space and a ciphertext space. And we're going to define security just as normal using two experiments, experiment 0 and experiment 1. And the game actually looks very similar. It's almost an identical game to the standard chosen plaintext attack game, where basically the attacker issues queries. So you can see these queries consist of pairs of messages, M0 and M1. They, as usual, they have to be the same length. And for each query, the attacker either gets the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. And the attacker can do this again and again. He can do this Q times. And at the end of the game, he's supposed to say whether he got the encryptions of the left messages or the encryptions of the right messages. So this is the standard chosen plaintext attack game. But now there's one extra caveat, which is to say that if the bit is equal to 0, if B is equal to 0, in other words, the attacker always sees the encryption of the left messages, then it so happens that the left messages must all be distinct. In other words, he will never get to see the encryption of the same message twice 
because these left messages are always distinct. So if the bit B is equal to zero, again, he'll never see the same message encrypted under the same key because again, these zero messages, M10 to MQ0 are all distinct. Similarly, we require that all the one messages are also distinct. And so that again, if bit B happens to be equal to one, the attacker will never see two messages encrypted under the same key. Okay, so this requirement that the, all these messages are distinct, and similarly, all these Q messages are distinct, basically captures this use case that the encryptor will never encrypt the same message multiple times using one particular key. And as a result, the attacker simply can't ask for uh, the encryption of the same message multiple times using the same key. Now, I should point out, if you go back to, our, to the original attack here, so here we go back to uh, our CPA attack on deterministic encryption. You notice that here, in fact, this is not a deterministic CPA game because here the attacker did ask for the same message M0 to be encrypted twice. So in fact, this attack would be an illegal attack under the deterministic CPA game. And by ruling out this attack, we actually make it uh, plausible that we might be able to give constructions that are deterministic CPA secure. And so as usual, we say if the adversary cannot distinguish experiment zero when he's given the encryption of the left messages from experiment one when he's given the encryption of the right messages, then the scheme is semantically secure under a deterministic CPA attack. Okay, so as usual, we ask for what's the probability that the adversary outputs one in experiment zero, what's the probability that he outputs one in experiment one, and if these probabilities are close, then his advantage in attacking the scheme is negligible. And if that's true for all efficient adversaries, then we say that the scheme is semantically secure under a deterministic CPA attack. So the first thing I want to do is show you the cipher block chaining with a fixed IV, in fact, is not a deterministic CPA secure. And this is a common mistake that's used in practice. There are many products that should be using a cipher that's deterministic CPA secure, but instead they just use CBC with a fixed IV and assume that that's a secure mechanism. And in fact, it's not, and I want to show you why. So suppose we have a PRP that happens to operate on n-bit uh, blocks, and we're going to use this PRP in CBC mode. So you know, if there are uh, five blocks in the message, then this PRPE will be called five times to encrypt each one of those blocks. OK, so here's how the attack's going to work. Well, the first thing the adversary is going to do is he's going to ask for the encryption of the message uh, 0 and 1n. In other words, the first block is all zeros, and the second block is all ones. So the left message is equal to the right message here, which means that he just wants the encryption of this 0 and 1 to the n uh, message. So let's see what the ciphertext looks like. Well, for completeness, I'm going to write the IV, the fixed IV, as the first element in the ciphertext. And if you think about how CBC works, the second element in the ciphertext is going to be basically the encryption of the IV XOR, the first block of the message. Well, in our case, the first block of the message is all zeros, so really all we're encrypting is just a fixed IV. So the second block of the ciphertext is simply going to be the encryption of this fixed IV. So next, what the adversary is going to do is now he's going to output two messages that are a single block. So the first message is going to be, the message on the left is going to be the all zeros block, and the message on the right is going to be all ones block. So observe that this is a valid query because messages on the left are, are all distinct, and the messages on the right are also all distinct. So these are all valid deterministic CPA queries. Now what does the attacker get in response? Well, what he'll get in response is the following. If he gets the encryption of the message on the left, then, well, what's the encryption of the one block message zero to the n? It's simply the encryption of the fixed IV, just as we saw before. However, if he's getting the encryption of the message on the right, well, that's going to be the encryption of one XOR of the fixed IV. That's just the definition of uh, CBC encryption. And now you can see basically how the attack is going to proceed. You notice if, uh, here, I'll use a different color here. You notice if these two blocks happen to be the same, then we know that he received the encryption of the message on the left. In other words, b is equal to 0. If they're not the same, then he knows that b is equal to 1. OK, so he's going to output 0 if you know c of 1, which is this block, is equal to c1 of 1, which is this block, and he's going to output 1 otherwise. So this basically shows that CBC with a fixed IV is completely insecure, basically the first block can be very easily attacked. And in fact, if the messages are short, you can again build dictionaries and completely break systems that kind of use CBC with a fixed IV, hoping that it's going to be deterministic CPA secure. So don't do that. We're actually going to see secure deterministic CPA constructions in the next segment. So I'll say it one more time. If you need to encrypt a database index in a consistent manner, 
Don't use CBC with a fixed IV to do it. Use the schemes that I'm going to show you in the next segment. And so let me ask you the same question about counter mode with a fixed IV. Is this going to be a deterministic CPA secure system or not? And here I'm reminding you what counter mode with a fixed IV is. Basically, we concatenate the fixed IV, fixed IV plus 1, fixed IV plus L. We encrypt all these counters. We concatenate the results. We encrypt the message to get the ciphertext. So do you think this is going to be deterministic CPA secure? So I hope everybody said no, because basically this is a one-time pad encryption. And if we use this one-time pad to encrypt distinct messages, basically we'll be getting a two-time pad. And to see it more precisely, here I wrote down the deterministic CPA game. So you notice what the attacker would do is he would start off by asking for the encryption of uh, the message M. So he would get here uh, the message M XOR the encryption of the fixed IV. And then he's going to ask for some two distinct messages, M0 and M1, that's different from M. So M, M0, and M1 are all three are distinct messages. And then uh, what he'll get is the encryption of MB, and now he can simply mount a standard kind of two-time pad attack. And if this equality here of C X or C prime is equal to M X or M0, he knows that C prime is the encryption of M0. And otherwise, he knows that it's the encryption of M1. So again, he will completely win this game with advantage as usual with advantage uh, equals to one. Okay, so the, again, the deterministic CPA with a fixed IV is also completely insecure as a deterministic CPA cipher. So don't use any of those schemes. Instead, let's use the schemes that I'm gonna describe in the next segment. Now that we understand what is deterministic encryption, let's see some constructions that provide security against deterministic chosen plaintext attacks. So first, let me remind you that deterministic encryption is needed, for example, when encrypting a database index, and later we want to look up records using the encrypted index. Because the encryption is deterministic, we're guaranteed that when we do the lookup, the encrypted index is going to be identical to the encrypted index that was sent to the database when the record was written to the database. And so this deterministic encryption allows us uh, a very simple and fast way to do lookups based on encrypted indices. The problem was that we said deterministic encryption can't possibly be secure against a general chosen plaintext attack because if the attacker sees two ciphertexts that are equal, it learns that the underlying encrypted messages are the same. So then we define this concept of deterministic chosen plaintext security, which means that we have security as long as the encryptor never encrypts the same message more than once using a given key. In particular, this key comma message pair is only used once. For every encryption, either the key changes or the message changes. And then, as I said, formally we define this uh, CPA, deterministic CPA security game, and our goal in this segment is to actually give constructions that are deterministic CPA secure. So the first construction we're going to look at is what's called SIV, synthetic IVs. And the way this construction works is as follows. Imagine we have a general CPA secure encryption system. So here is the key and here is the message. And I'm going to denote by R the randomness that's used by the encryption algorithm. Remember that a CPA secure system that doesn't use nonces has to be randomized. And so we're explicitly going to write down this variable R to denote the random string that's used by the encryption algorithm as it's doing the encryption. For example, if we're using randomized counter mode, R would be the random IV that's used by randomized counter mode. And of course, C is the resulting ciphertext. Now, in addition, we're also going to need a pseudo-random function, F, that what it does is it takes arbitrary messages in the message space and outputs uh, strings R that can be used as randomness for the CPA secure encryption scheme. So the little R over here is actually a member of the big R set. Okay, and we're going to assume this is a, F is a pseudo-random function that maps messages to random string. Now the way SIV works is as follows. It's going to use two keys K1 and K2 to encrypt the message M. And what it does is the first thing is going to apply the pseudo random function F to the message M to derive randomness for the CPA secure encryption scheme E. And then it's going to encrypt the message M using the randomness that it just derived. And this is going to give us a ciphertext C and then it's going to output this ciphertext C. Okay, so that's how this SIV mode works. Basically, it first derives the randomness from the message being encrypted, and then it uses this derived randomness to actually encrypt the message to obtain the ciphertext. Now, I'd like to point out, for example, if the encryption scheme E happened to be randomized counter mode, then the randomness R would just be the random IV, which would be actually be output along with the ciphertext. So this means that the ciphertext is a little bit longer than the plaintext, 
But the point here isn't to generate a short ciphertext. Rather, the point here is to make sure that the encryption scheme is deterministic. So if we encrypt the same message multiple times, every time we should obtain the same ciphertext. And indeed, every time we'll obtain the same randomness R. And as a result, every time we'll obtain the same ciphertext C. So it's fairly easy to show that this encryption scheme really is semantically secure under a deterministic chosen plaintext attack. The reason that's so is because we apply the pseudorandom function f to distinct messages. Well, if we apply f to distinct messages, then the random string that f generates is going to look like just truly random strings, a different random string for every message. And as a result, the CPA secure encryption scheme, E, is always applied using truly random strings. And that's exactly the situation where it is CPA secure. So because these R's are just random indistinguishable from random strings, the resulting system is in fact going to be CPA secure. So this is just the intuition for why this works, and it's actually fairly straightforward to actually formalize this into a complete proof. Now, I should emphasize that this is actually well suited for messages that are more than one AES block. In fact, for short messages, we're going to see a slightly different encryption scheme that's actually better suited for these short messages. Okay, now the really cool thing about SIV is that actually we get ciphertext integrity for free. In fact, we don't have to use a special Mac if we want to add integrity. In a sense, uh, SIV already has a built-in integrity mechanism. And let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, our goal is to build what's called deterministic authenticated encryption, DAE, deterministic authenticated encryption, which basically means deterministic CPA security and ciphertext integrity. Remember, ciphertext integrity means that the attacker gets to ask for the encryption of messages of his choice, and then he shouldn't be able to produce another ciphertext that decrypts to a valid message. Okay, so I want to claim that, in fact, SIV automatically gives a ciphertext integrity without the need for an embedded Mac or anything else. So let's see why. In particular, let's look at a special case of SIV when the underlying encryption scheme is randomized counter mode. Okay, so we'll call this SIV-CTR, again, to denote SIV, where we're using randomized counter mode. All right, so let me remind you again how SIV works in this case. Well, so we take our message. Here we take our message. And then we apply a PRF to it, and that derives an IV. And then that IV is going to be used to encrypt the message using randomized counter mode. Okay, so in particular, we're going to use this PRF FCTR for F counter for randomized counter mode. And essentially, we evaluate this FCTR at IV, IV plus 1, up to IV plus L. And then we XOR that with the message, and that gives us the final ciphertext. Okay, so this is SIV with randomized counter mode. Now let's see how decryption is going to work. And during decryption, we're going to add one more check. And that's going to provide ciphertext integrity. So let's see how decryption is going to work. So here we have our input ciphertext. So it contains the IV and uh, the ciphertext. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to decrypt the ciphertext using the given IV. And that will give us candidate plaintext. Now we're going to reapply the PRFF from the definition of SIV to this message. Now, if the message is valid, we should be getting the same IV that the adversary supplied as part of the ciphertext. If we get a different IV, then we know that this message is not a valid message, and we simply reject the ciphertext. So this is really cute. It's a very simple kind of built-in check to make sure that the ciphertext is valid. Right? We simply check that after decryption, if we rederive the IV, we would actually get the correct IV. And if not, we reject the message. And I claim that this simple check during decryption is enough to actually provide ciphertext integrity and therefore deterministic authenticated encryption. So I'll state this in a simple theorem, basically to say that if F is a secure PRF and encounter mode that's derived from FCTR is uh, CPA secure, then the result, in fact, is a deterministic authenticated encryption system. Now, the proof for this is not too difficult. In two sentences, let me just show you the rough intuition for why uh, this is true. So all we have to argue is just ciphertext integrity. So we already argued before that the system has deterministic CPA security. All we have to argue is just ciphertext integrity. So to argue that the system has ciphertext integrity, let's think again how the ciphertext integrity game works. Adversary asks for the encryption of a bunch of messages of his choice and he gets the resulting ciphertexts. And then his goal is to produce a new valid ciphertext. Well, if that valid ciphertext upon decryption decrypts to some completely new message, 
then when we plug this new message into the PRFF, we're just going to get some random IV, and it's very unlikely to hit the IV that the adversary uh, supplied in the ciphertext that he output. So therefore, that says that when the adversary outputs his forged ciphertext, the message in that forged ciphertext basically should be equal to one of the messages in his chosen message queries. Otherwise, again, the IV that you get is simply not going to be equal to the IV in the forged ciphertext with very high probability. But if the message is equal to one of the messages that the adversary queried us on, well, then the ciphertext that we're going to get is also going to be equal to one of the ciphertexts that we supply to the adversary. But then his forgery is simply one of the ciphertexts that we gave to him, and therefore this is not a valid forgery. He has to give us a new ciphertext to win the ciphertext integrity game. But he gave us one of our old ciphertexts. So this is the rough intuition. I hope I kind of went through it quickly. I hope it kind of makes sense. If it doesn't, uh, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to reference the paper that describes SIV at the end of the module. And if you want to see this in more detail, you can read and take a look inside of that paper. But regardless, this is a very cute idea that I wanted to show you where kind of the fact that we derive the randomness for deterministic counter mode using a PRF also gives us an integrity check when we actually do the decryption. Okay, so this SIV is a good mode for doing deterministic encryption when you need to, particularly if the messages are long. If the messages are very short, say they're less than 16 bytes, in fact, there's a better way to do it, and that's the method that I want to show you now. So the second construction is actually trivial. All we're going to do is we're going to use a PRP directly. So here's what we do. So suppose ED is a secure PRP, so E will encrypt and D will decrypt. And I claim that if we use E directly, that already gives us deterministic CPA security. So let me show you very quickly why. So suppose F is a truly random invertible function from X to X. Okay, so remember a PRP is indistinguishable from a truly random invertible function. So let's pretend that we actually do have a truly random invertible function. Now in experiment zero, what the attacker is going to see, well, he submits a bunch of messages, you know, the messages on the left. And what he's going to see is basically the evaluation of F on the messages on the left that he supplied. Well, in the deterministic CPA game, all these messages are distinct. And so all he's going to get back are just Q distinct random values in X. That's all he sees. Yes, just Q distinct random values in X. Now let's think about experiment one. In experiment one, he gets to see the encryptions of messages on the right. Okay, the M11 to MQ1. Well, again, all these messages are all distinct, so all he gets to see are just Q random distinct values in X. Well, these two distributions in experiment zero and experiment one, therefore, are identical. Basically, in both cases, what he gets to see are just Q distinct random values in X. And as a result, he can't distinguish experiment zero from experiment one. And since he can't do this for a truly random function, he also can't do this for the PRP. Okay, so that explains why directly encrypting with a PRP already gives us a CPA secure system. Very, very, very simple to use. That says that if all we want to do is encrypt short messages, say less than 16 bytes, then all we need to do is just directly encrypt them using AES, and the result will in fact be deterministic CPA secure. So if your indices are less than 16 bytes, directly using AES is a fine thing to do. Notice, however, that's not going to provide any integrity, and we're going to see how to add integrity in just a minute. But the question for you is, what do we do if we have longer than 16-byte uh, messages? Well, one option is to use SIV, but what if we wanted to actually use this construction too? It's actually an interesting question. Can we construct PRPs that have message spaces that are bigger than just 16 bytes? If you remember, in the past, we constructed PRFs on, that had large message spaces from PRFs that had small message spaces. Here, we're going to construct PRPs with large message spaces from PRPs with small message spaces. So let's see how to do it. So suppose ED is a secure PRP that operates on n-bit blocks. There's a standard mode called EME that actually will construct a PRP that operates on capital n-bit blocks where capital N is much, much bigger than little n. So this would allow us to do deterministic encryption on much larger messages than just 16 bytes. In fact, it could be as long as we want. So let's see how EME works. It's a bit daunting at first, but it's not a difficult construction. So let's see how it works. So EME uses two keys, K and L. And in fact, in the real EME, L is derived from K. But for our purposes, let's just pretend that K and L are two distinct keys. 
The first thing we do is we take our message x and we break it up into blocks. And then we XOR each block with a certain padding function. Okay, so we use the secret key L to derive a pad uh, using this, you know, uh, function P that I'm not going to explain here. We derive a different pad for each one of the blocks and we XOR that pad into the block. But the next thing we do is we apply the PRP E using the key K to each one of these blocks and we're going to call these outputs PPP0, PPP1, and PPP2. The next thing we do is we XOR all these PPPs together and we call the result MP. Actually, this XOR doesn't need to be there. And we call the result of this XOR MP. The next thing we do is we XOR all these PPPs together and we call the result MP. We encrypt this MP using E and the key K. And we call the outputs of this encryption MC. Okay, so then we use, we XOR MP and MC, and this gives us another key M, which we use to derive one more pad, and then we XOR this output of this pad with all the PPPs to get these CCCs. <laughs> now we XOR all these CCCs together, that gives us a value CCC0, which we then encrypt one more time uh, with all these E's. We do one more padding with all these P's, and that actually finally gives us uh, the output of EME. Okay, so uh, like I said, this may look a little daunting, but in fact there's a theorem that shows that uh, if the underlying block cipher E is a secure PRP, then in fact this construction EME is a secure PRP on this larger block, you know, 0, 1 to the capital N. The nice thing about this construction is you notice that it's very parallel, and actually that's why it's a little complicated. Uh, kind of every block gets encrypted in parallel, so if you have a multi-core processor, you can use all your cores to encrypt all the blocks at the same time. And then uh, there would be one kind of uh, sequential step to compute this checksum on all the outputs, and then one more parallel round to encrypt one more time, and then finally you get the outputs. These function P's, by the way, that generate the pads are very, very simple functions. They take constant time, so we're just going to ignore them in terms of performance. So the bottom line is performance here, you notice, requires two applications of E per input block. And it turns out this can actually be slower than SIV. If SIV is implemented properly with a very fast PRF to derive the randomness, then in fact SIV can be twice as fast as uh, this particular mode of operation. For this reason, I say that the PRP construction is very good for short messages, whereas SIV is good if you, if you want to encrypt longer messages in a deterministic fashion. But now, what if we wanted to add integrity to this PRP-based mechanism? So can we achieve deterministic authenticated encryption uh, using the PRP mechanism, where we directly encrypt the message uh, using a PRP? And it turns out the answer is yes, and it's actually, again, a very simple encryption scheme that you should know about. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take our message, and we're going to append a bunch of zeros to this message, and then we're going to apply the PRP, and that's it. And that's going to give us the ciphertext. Now, very, very simple. Just append zeros and encrypt using a PRP. When we decrypt, we're going to look at these least significant bits of the resulting plaintext, and if they're not equal to zero, we're just going to reject the ciphertext. And if they are equal to zero, we're going to output the message as valid. Okay, so that's it. That's the whole system. Very, very simple. Simply append zeros during decryption, and then check that the zeros are there when you decrypt. And I claim that this very simple mechanism actually provides deterministic authenticated encryption, assuming, of course, that you've appended enough zeros. In particular, if you append n zeros, we need 1 over 2 to the n to be negligible. And if so, then in fact, this direct PRP-based encryption, in fact, provides deterministic authenticated encryption. So let me see why. Well, we already argued that the system is CPA secure, so all we have to argue is that it provides uh, ciphertext integrity. And again, that's easy to see. Let's look at the ciphertext integrity game. So the adversary is going to choose, uh, let's say, a truly random permutation, so a truly random invertible function on the input space. In this case, the input space is the message space and the n0 bits. And now, what does the adversary get to do? Well, he gets to submit Q messages, and then he receives the encryption of those Q messages. Namely, he receives the PRP at his chosen points concatenated with n zeros. Okay, that's what it basically means to query the uh, CPA challenger. So in case of a random permutation, he simply gets to see uh, the value of this permutation at Q points of his choice, but only concatenated with N zeros. And now what's his goal in the ciphertext integrity game? Well, his goal is to produce some new ciphertext that's different from the ciphertext that he was given 
that's going to decrypt properly. Well, what does it mean that it decrypts properly? It means that if when we apply uh, pi inverse uh, to the ciphertext C, it had better be the case that the n least significant bits of C are all zeros. And the question is, how likely is that to happen? Well, so let's think about this. Basically, we have a truly random permutation, and the adversary got to see the value of this permutation at q points. How likely is he to produce a new point that, when inverted, happens to have n zeros as the least significant bits? What we're doing here is basically we're evaluating the permutation pi inverse at the point c. And since pi inverse is a random permutation, how likely is it to have its n least significant bits be equal to zero? So it isn't hard to see that the answer is, is at most, the probability is in most 1 over 2 to the n, because again, basically the permutation is going to output a random element inside of uh, x times 0, 1 to the n, and that element is going to end with n zeros, but basically with the probability 1 over 2 to the n. And as a result, the adversary wins the game with negligible probability because uh, this value is negligible. So that's the end of this segment. I wanted you to see these two very cute deterministic authenticated encryption schemes. Uh, the first one we called SIV, where I say you would use randomized counter mode, and you just derive the randomness for randomized counter mode from a PRF applied to the message. And the very cute idea here is that during decryption, you can simply recompute the IV from the, from the decrypted message and verify that that IV is what's given to you in the ciphertext. And that simple check is actually enough to guarantee authenticated encryption, or rather deterministic authenticated encryption. So this mode is, uh, is the way you would encrypt an index in a database if the index was large. If the index happens to be short, maybe say it's 8 bytes, if it's an 8-byte user ID, then you can directly use a PRP, and the way you would do it is you would append uh, zeros to those 8 bytes, uh, and then those zeros would then be used as an integrity check when you decrypt, and again, if you append, are able to append enough zeros, then in fact uh, this also provides deterministic authenticated encryption. As an aside, I showed you that there's a way to build a wide block PRP from a narrow PRP, and that particular mode of operation is called uh, EME. So we're going to refer to EME actually in the next segment.